A History of the First World War. By. Little Heart. To John Brown and the Legion. Original Preface to the Real War. On finishing this book, I am conscious of its imperfections. Some consolation comes from the reflection that every book worth reading is imperfect. This book may at least claim one merit, and one contrast to most war histories. I have as little desire to hide its imperfections as to hide the imperfections of any who are portrayed in its pages. Hence in writing it my pursuit of the truth has not been interrupted by recourse to the pot of hypocritical varnish that is miscalled good taste. In my judgment of values it is more important to provide material for a true verdict than to gloss over disturbing facts so that individual reputations may be preserved at the price of another holocaust of lives. Taking a long view of history, I cannot regard the repute of a few embodied handfuls of dust as worth more than the fate of a nation and a generation. On the other hand, I have equally little desire to exaggerate the imperfections of individuals for the sake of a popular effect, or to shift onto them the weight of folly and error which should be borne by the people as a whole. The historian's rightful task is to distill experience as a medicinal warning for future generations, not to distill a drug. Having fulfilled this task to the best of his ability, and honesty, he has fulfilled his purpose. He would be a rash optimist if he believed that the next generation would trouble to absorb the warning. History at least teaches the historian a lesson. The title of this book, which has a duality of meaning, requires a brief explanation. Some may say that the war depicted here is not the real war dash that this is to be discovered in the torn bodies and minds of individuals. It is far from my purpose to ignore or deny this aspect of the truth. But for anyone who seeks, as I seek here, to view the war as an episode in human history, it is a secondary aspect. Because the war affected individual lives so greatly, because these individuals were numbered by millions, because the roots of their fate lay so deep in the past, it is all the more necessary to see the war in perspective and to disentangle its main threads from the accidents of human misery. Perhaps this attempt is all the more desirable by reason of the trend of recent war literature, which is not merely individualistic but focuses light on the past four years. Thus, in the chapter outlines, there is somewhat fuller treatment of the German advance into France in 1914, the Austro-German offensive against Russia and the Balkan situation in 1915 the Palestine situation in 1916, the spring campaign of 1917 on the Western Front, and the Allied discussions which preceded the German offensives of 1918. The main expansion, however, and most of the new material, will be found in the scenes, especially those which deal with Verdun, the Somme, Pasquende L, the first breakthrough and the breakthrough in Flanders. To a lesser extent, there is an infusion of fresh facts about the Bruce Lof, the Arras, the Messins and the Cambrai offensives, and the Second Battle of the Marne. The revision needed has been comparatively slight. But new evidence that has come out in the past four years has led me to modify my view of such questions as the German strategy at Verdun, the projected move against Austria, the cause of Nivelle's failure in 1917 the Versailles Committee and the preparations to meet the German offensive in 1918. On a number of points, fuller knowledge has amplified the earlier view, and while it has tended to illuminate the mistakes that were committed, it has also helped to elucidate their cause. I have also modified or omitted my original comments on certain episodes, and in their place have quoted from the evidence of those who were responsible leaving the facts to form the conclusion. Contents 1 The origins of the war 50 years were spent in the process of making Europe explosive. Five days were enough to detonate it. To study the manufacture of the explosive materials, which form the fundamental causes of the conflict, is within neither the scope nor the space of a short history of the world war. On the one side we should have to trace the influence of Prussia on the creation of the Reich the political conceptions of Bismarck, the philosophical tendencies in Germany, and the economic situation, a medley of factors which transmuted Germany's natural desire for commercial outlets, unhappily difficult to obtain, into a vision of world power. 
we should have to analyze that heterogeneous relic of the Middle Ages known as Austria-Hungary, appreciate her complex racial problems, the artificiality of her governing institutions, the superficial ambitions which overlay a haunting fear of internal disruption and frantically sought to postpone the inevitable end. On the other side we should have to examine the strange mixture of ambition and idealism which swayed Russia's policy, and the fear it generated beyond her frontiers especially among her German neighbors, perhaps the deadliest of all the ingredients in the final detonation. We should have to understand the constant alarms of fresh aggression which France had suffered since 1870, studied the regrowth of confidence which fortified her to resist further threats, and bear in mind the wounds left in her side by Germany's surgical excision of Alsace-Lorraine. Finally, we should have to trace Britain's gradual movement from a policy of isolation into membership of the European system and her slow awakening to the reality of German feeling towards her. In such a study of European history during half a century, a generalization can for once be closer to exactness than the most detailed history. The fundamental causes of the conflict can be epitomized in three words fear, hunger, pride. Beside them, the international incidents that occurred between 1871 and 1914 are but symptoms. All that is possible, and sensible, here is to trace the most significant turning points in the trail of causation which led to combustion. This trail runs through the structure of alliances which Bismarck built after 1871. Ironically, Bismarck intended it as a shelter for the peaceful growth of his creation, the German Empire and not as a magazine for explosives. For although his philosophy was epitomized in his 1868 phrase dash the weak were made to be devoured by the strong dash his own hunger was satiated, after three meals, by the war of 1870-71. It cannot be charged against him that his eyes were larger than his stomach, feeling that Germany now was, as he said, a saturated state his governing idea henceforth was not expansion but consolidation. And to secure time and peace for this consolidation of the new Germany he aimed to keep France in a state of permanent powerlessness to wage a war of revenge. But the result was to prove that two wrongs do not make a right. Apart from frequent direct menaces to France, he sought to counteract her annoyingly rapid recovery by the indirect method of depriving her of friends or supporters. To this end his first effort was to bring Austria and Russia together by forging a common link with Germany, while he strove to ensure peace in the Balkans as a means to avoid any dangerous strain on the link. For some years his policy was that of acting as the honest broker in the diplomatic exchange of Europe without committing himself to any party. But friction with the Russian Chancellor, Gorchakov, and the complications caused by the Russo-Turkish War of 1877 led him to make a defensive alliance with Austria in 1879, despite the objections of the old Emperor William I, who regarded it as treachery to Russia and even threatened to abdicate. This definite commitment was to have infinite consequences. Nevertheless, Bismarck temporarily regained his central position by his diplomatic masterstroke of 1881, the famous Three Emperors Alliance, whereby Russia, Austria and Germany undertook to act together in all Balkan affairs. And although it lapsed in 1887, Germany's connection with Russia was strengthened in compensation by the secret reinsurance treaty, by which the two powers agreed to maintain benevolent neutrality towards each other in case of war with the third. It was not, however, to apply if Germany attacked France or Russia attacked Austria. By this second masterstroke, Executed with great duplicity, Bismarck averted the risk, then imminent, of an alliance between Russia and France. Meantime, the alliance between Germany and Austria had been enlarged by the inclusion of Italy in 1882. The object was to safeguard Austria, against a stab in the back if at war with Russia, and in return Italy's new allies would come to her assistance if attacked by France but as a safeguard to her old friendship with Britain and to her own coasts, Italy had a special protocol appended to the treaty stating that it was in no case to be directed against Britain. In 1883, Romania, through her king's personal and secret act, was attached to the new Triple Alliance. 
Even Serbia was temporarily linked on by a separate treaty with Austria, and Spain by an agreement with Italy. In regard to Britain, Bismarck's aim seems to have been to keep her in friendly isolation from Germany and unfriendly isolation from France. His feelings towards Britain oscillated between friendship and contempt, and the political party system formed the pivot. For the old Jew, Disraeli, he had genuine respect, but he could not understand the point of view of the Gladstonian liberals, and their wavering actions he despised. While Disraeli was in power Bismarck toyed with the idea of linking Britain to his chain of alliances, but although Queen Victoria was plaintively sure that Germany would be the safest ally in every way, she was less sure of Bismarck's safety as a repository of trust, and Disraeli shared her doubts. Hence Bismarck continued, with equal satisfaction, his policy of playing off Britain against Russia and France in turn. And with shrewd calculation he favoured Britain's occupation of Egypt because it embroiled her with France, and resisted the growing clamour in Germany for colonial expansion dash our colonial jingo's greed is greater than we need or can satisfy dash because it threatened future trouble with Britain yet made his support to Britain in Egypt a means of extracting overseas concessions as morsels with which he could assuage the colonial hunger of a body of German interests too powerful even for him to ignore. The Conservatives' return to power in Britain, and the intensified friction with France, led to a fresh tightening of the links with Germany, and Bismarck's offer of a formal alliance was eagerly welcomed by Lord Salisbury's cabinet who seem only to have held back from fear of parliamentary objection to foreign entanglements. Bismarck, however, profited from the informal entente to secure cession of Heligoland, so vital to German naval operations a generation later, at a paltry price. Thus at the end of the 80s Bismarck's great structure seemed complete. Germany was buttressed by the Triple Alliance while the attached yet semi-detached position of Russia and Britain gave her advantages without encumbrances. From this secure base she was ready to develop her commercial expansion. And Bismarck had placed France in the combined solitude and circumscription of a political isolation ward. But with the beginning of the 90s the first crack appeared in the structure, close upon the dismissal of the builder. The accession in 1888 of the young Emperor William II was disagreeable to the Tsar, Alexander III, who disliked his aggressive amiability and distrusted his intentions. Yet the breach came not from Alexander, but from William. Bismarck's control irked him just as it irked the general staff, and in the soldiers, among whom he had been brought up. He so naturally found allies that in linking himself with them he did not realize that he was forging fresh fetters for himself. The first effect, after the dismissal of the pro Russian Chancellor, was his successor's refusal to renew the reinsurance treaty with Russia. The second effect, a natural sequel to the first, was that the Tsar swallowed his aversion to republicanism and, in 1891, made an agreement with France which, a year later, was developed into a military convention for mutual assistance in case of attack. In this convention a significant point was that if any member of the Triple Alliance mobilized its forces, both France and Russia were instantly to mobilize. The Tsar at least could not complain that he did not understand the meaning, for the French negotiator, General Boys took pains to explain that mobilization means declaration of war. In the Tsar's case, the draft was swallowed under the fear that Britain was about to ally herself with Germany, it lay heavy on his stomach, so that it was long in producing any diplomatic value for France. Nevertheless, France had left quarantine. Henceforth there was not one political group, but two, in Europe. Although one was loose, the other compact, the two groups formed a balance of power, if their power was not yet balanced evenly. A doubly significant sidelight upon Germany's renunciation of the Russian secret treaty is that the Council in Berlin, which reviewed the matter, decided against the treaty on the ground that it was disloyal not only to Austria but to Britain. Whatever the Kaiser's failings, he was more sincere than Bismarck, and the insincerity apparent in his contradictory utterances seems to have been due to his combination of excessive frankness with a quick changing mind. An essential difference between the two men was that the one sought security through consistent dishonesty, 
and the other gained in security through spasmodic honesty. The consideration shown for Britain was in accord with the Kaiser's views. For, although he had reversed Bismarck's attitude towards Russia, he maintained Bismarck's policy of friendship towards Britain, perhaps owing to more sincere, and less political motives. The one personal source of cleavage lay in the mutual antipathy of the Kaiser and his uncle, the Prince of Wales, later King Edward VII. And, curiously, it was the Bismarck family who worked to widen this personal breach. But this could not have developed into a national cleavage without greater causes being at work. More truly, it was one cause with sundry accretions. Its origin and its foundation lay in Germany's change of policy from internal to external expansion. The growth of her commerce and influence to a worldwide scale inevitably brought her interests and those of Britain into contact at many points. Under tactful or even Bismarckian guileful handling this contact might not have caused such friction as to strike sparks, for British statesmanship was peculiarly insensitive. The party most conscious of Britain's imperial estate happened to be the party most sympathetic to imperial Germany. But Bismarck had gone and tact did not fill his place. As so commonly happens with great men, his disciples forgot his principles and remembered only his method, the mailed fist. Yet the Kaiser himself could also exert charm, and through it succeeded not only in maintaining his popularity in England despite repeated irritation, but in gaining a strong hold on the new and weakly amiable Tsar Nicholas II. For a time he thereby acquired influence without obligation. The first friction with Britain came over Turkey, a shadow cast on the future. A liberal government was in power again in 1892, when, as Gray relates, suddenly there came a sort of ultimatum from Berlin, requiring us to cease competition with Germans for railway concessions in Turkey. And in the years that followed the Kaiser lost no opportunity to emphasize that the spreading web of German commerce had a sharp-fanged spider at its center. In 1895 his intervention made it possible for Russia to deprive Japan of her spoils in the war with China. In 1896 came the next, and more serious, friction with Britain. Ironically, its source was an Englishman's too ardent admiration for Bismarckian imperialism. The Kaiser, unsoothed by Rhodes' equal admiration for himself, became more and more irritated by Rhodes' schemes of British expansion in South Africa, frustrating his own. After several sour complaints, and sweet encouragement of the Transvaal Boers, he found a tempting pretext in the Jameson raid into the Transvaal. At a council on January 3, 1896, he suggested that Germany should proclaim a protectorate over the Transvaal and send troops thither. When the Chancellor, Hohenlohe, objected that would be war with England, the Kaiser ingenuously replied, yes, but only on land. As a less drastic alternative the Kaiser was encouraged to send a congratulatory telegram to President Kruger, so worded as not only to be highly offensive to Britain but to deny her suzerainty over the Transvaal. Popular feeling boiled over in both countries, due in the one case to ill-suppressed jealousy and in the other to paint surprise at discovering a fresh rival in a traditional friend. Germans felt a natural chagrin that Britain, with already so many colonies, should be gaining more in the one part of the world where a latecomer might hope to stake a claim. Englishmen had made such a habit of colonization that they blandly assumed it could only fit John Bull's figure, and could not understand that anyone, save the traditional rivals, France and Russia, might be anxious. However unconsciously provoking in ordinary intercourse, this calm assurance was a sedative in a crisis, and it largely saved this one. Warlike measures were actually ordered by Germany and she suggested to France and Russia a combination against Britain. But lack of response from these countries, the calmness of Lord Salisbury's government, and a sense of her own naval weakness, restrained Germany and averted the immediate danger to peace. But a danger put off by lack of power is not a danger removed. From this moment dates the real growth of German naval ambition, expressed in the Kaiser's words of 1897 – The trident must be in our fist – and in the Kaiser's action of summoning Admiral Tirpitz to manufacture the trident. 
The next year saw the first large naval program. It also heard the Kaiser proclaim himself, during his visit to Damascus, the protector of all Mohammedans throughout the world, a direct provocation to Britain and France. And not only to them. For the Kaiser's undisguised assumption of the role of patron saint of Turkey was fatal to his accord with Russia. His shadow now obscured Russia's view of Constantinople, the goal of her dreams. Like the opponents whom Napoleon derided, the Kaiser failed in policy because he saw too many things at once, and forced the other powers, whom Bismarck had played off against each other, to see only one thing, the fist of Germany, wherever they looked. Nevertheless, the affront to Britain in South Africa was followed, in 1898, by the offer from Chamberlain of the very alliance which Bismarck had sought in vain. But it was now the turn of Germany to be suspicious of the offer. On the British side the offer was impelled by a new and uncomfortable consciousness of isolation and weakness, while based on the old consciousness of natural affinity with Germany. But it looked, as it was in part, a confession of weakness, and weakness was not a quality to appeal to the new Germany. And one of Bismarck's few legacies to his successors was the habit of underrating Britain's strength and overrating Russia. Apostrophe's. In Germany's repeated rejections of Chamberlain's proposals between 1898 and 1901, the dominant factor was a personal factor, the concealed figure of Holstein. This crabbed, suspicious, and miserly official of the Foreign Office, who loved obscurity because its dimness enhanced his real power in the pursuit of real policy who would not buy himself a new suit although he did not shrink from using his official knowledge for private speculation, who had intrigued for his master's dismissal while posing as his pupil, was now viewed with or as the spiritual heir of Bismarck when he had only inherited his immoral methods. Above all, he lacked Bismarck's confidence. In consequence, although he would have liked to accept the British offers he shrank back from fear that Germany would become Britain's cat's paw and be converted into her shock absorber against Russia. On the other hand he felt that Britain's weakness might now be exploited for Germany's benefit by holding Britain at arm's length and wringing concessions from her, while still keeping her hopeful of closer ties. In this view at least he was supported by the Chancellor, Bullough, and the Kaiser, whose outlook was well summed up in his words to Bullough dash I have now got the British, despite their twisting and wriggling, where I want them and the German navy, expanded afresh in 1900, was the means of putting the screw on harder dot during the next few years, and especially during the South African crisis and war, the British government had to pay heavily, not for German support, but merely for the privilege that German threats and insults should not be pressed to action. Over the Portuguese colonies, over Samoa, over China. Lord Salisbury's government showed such contemptible weakness as almost to justify the Kaiser's description of them as unmitigated noodles. The revelations from the diplomatic archives of these years are sorry reading. To them, indeed, can be traced an indirect responsibility for the eventual conflict, for it was natural that the Kaiser and his advisers should be confirmed in their good opinion of the mailed fist method. He can be acquitted of a desire to press his method as far as actual war, not only because of the evidence of his distaste for it, but because of his tendency to superficial judgment. The limited menace was so obviously yielding the profits of war without the hazards, that the too obvious deduction was just the one to appeal to his mentality. His responsibility for the war lies in these years. And it is a large responsibility, indeed, the largest by the distrust and alarm which his bellicose utterances and attitude created everywhere he filled Europe with gunpowder. It is as irrational to fix the chief blame on those who eventually struck the sparks as it is to concentrate investigation of the war's origins on the brief month when the sparks were struck. In reaction from the unhistorical propaganda which pictured the Kaiser as seeking, or even planning the war, the pendulum has swung too far the other way. To recognize his erratic good intentions should not lead us to underestimate his bad effects. And they came essentially from the fact that he was too well pleased with the reflection of his acts and himself. He saw himself arrayed in shining armor when actually he was wearing the garb of Puck. 
he proved that making mischief makes war. In delaying any acceptance of British overtures, the Kaiser and Bullo felt secure. They underrated the effect of a common uneasiness in making easy bedfellows. With undue assurance, they argued that there could be no real union between the whale and the bear, and by their acts, they compelled this union. In retrospect, the most extraordinary feature is the number of kicks required to drive Britain away from Germany and into the awkward embrace of the dual alliance. Germany had at least full warning, for Chamberlain warned her in 1898 and again in 1901 that the period of England's splendid isolation is past. We should prefer adherence to Germany and the Triple Alliance. But if this proves impossible then we, too. Contemplate a rapprochement with France and Russia. The German belief in its impossibility proved a fallacy. That belief was summed up in Holstein's words dash the threatened understanding with Russia and France is purely an English swindle. A reasonable agreement with England can, in my opinion, only be attained when the feeling of compulsion over there has become more general. He was too clever. By his reasonable agreement he meant not an alliance between equals but their relation of master and servant. Weakly as the British government had behaved, and weaker still as it appeared to one imbued with the blood and iron philosophy, this weakness is not sufficient to explain Holstein's amazing presumption. This is, indeed, an illustration that the real trouble in Germany, and the cause of her troubles, was not any true Machiavellian design but merely the complaint summed up in the schoolboy phrase swelled head. Britain's first attempt to strengthen her position in other directions was her alliance with Japan in 1902. Its European significance is that it did not carry Britain away from Germany, but tended to raise a fresh barrier between Britain and the dual alliance. It sprang from Chamberlain's original proposal of a treaty between Britain, Germany, and Japan, in close touch with the United States. Germany held back and so almost did Japan. For the Japanese statesman, Marquis Ito, preferred to seek an alliance with Russia, and was only turned from his purpose because his arrival in St. Petersburg was outstripped by the progress of the negotiations in London between Baron Hayashi, the Japanese ambassador, and Lord Lansdowne, the foreign secretary. Even then, the Japanese Council of Elder Statesmen wavered, under Ito's pressure, before accepting the British alliance, whose indirect result was thus to precipitate the Russo-Japanese war, a result neither desired by nor palatable to Britain. For by 1904 a dramatic change had occurred in the European situation. Only five years before, France had been so bitter against Britain over Fashoda that she had almost forgotten Alsace-Lorraine. But fear of Germany, more deep-seated, made her statesman open to approach when, in 1901, Chamberlain fulfilled his warning to Germany. The first step in the eventual negotiations between Lansdowne and Paul Cambon, the French ambassador, was to remove causes of friction at the most sensitive point, overseas. The greatest obstacle was Egypt, still a cherished object of French ambition and it was no mean diplomatic feat that recognition of Britain's actual occupation was exchanged for recognition of French right to occupy Morocco if she could. The agreement was signed in April, 1904. Although the popular idea of King Edward VII's responsibility for the agreement is purely legendary, still more so the popular German idea of him as spinning a Machiavellian web around Germany his visit to Paris created the atmosphere in which agreement was possible. At first his reception was frigid, but his tact and understanding of the French combined with their truly republican love of royalty to hasten a thaw, and succeeding visits uncovered common ground. Thus if it is not true that he made the new entente, he undoubtedly made it cordial. But the Kaiser also helped. Deeply chagrined that the lover whose advances Germany had spurned had dared to woo another his mischief-making was now redoubled. His efforts were directed to break up the Franco-British Entente. And the coincident Russo-Japanese War provided the opportunity. His first move was a failure, for the peace-loving Tsar rejected his advice to send the Black Sea Fleet through the Dardanelles in defiance of Britain. But when the Baltic Fleet, Russia's last naval trump, 
sailed for the Far East it received false information, the Russians later alleged that it came from German sources, that Japanese torpedo craft were lying in wait in the North Sea. Through a panic mistake they fired on British trawlers, and made no efforts to redeem their error, which brought Russia and Britain momentarily to the brink of war. For some days the British Channel fleet shadowed the Russians, until the tension was eased by a message of regret from the Tsar, against the wishes of the war party in Russia. The Tsar, bitter at his humiliation, now, to the Kaiser's delight, proposed a combination of Russia, Germany, and France to abolish English and Japanese arrogance and insolence. The Kaiser promptly dispatched a draft treaty between Russia and Germany, but urged the Tsar not to divulge it to the French, arguing that the treaty wants a fact. Our combined powers will exert a strong attraction on France, and adding that an excellent expedient to cool British insolence and overbearing would be to make some military demonstration on the Perso-Afghan frontier. But it was the Tsar who cooled, on reflection. The next German move was singularly inapt, and for it the Kaiser was not responsible. Now, too late, he wanted to woo France instead of trying to separate her from Britain by threat. But he was sent off by Bolo and Holstein to Tangiers, the to throw down the glove to France by a speech which challenged French claims in Morocco. Bolo followed it up by calling for a conference to review the future of Morocco. The challenge came at an awkward moment. The French army was suffering one of its periodical crises, Russia was entangled with Japan, and the French Prime Minister, Rouvia, doubted both the assurance and value of British support. Thus the foreign minister, Delcas, was sacrificed and France accepted the demand. The mailed fist had scored afresh, but the alarm had driven Britain and France closer together. The third move was the Kaiser's own. In July, 1905, when on board the Tsar's yacht at Joko, he suddenly produced the draft treaty, and in his hybrid Willy Nicky English, asked Dash should you like to sign it? It would be a very nice souvenir of our interview. The Kaiser relates that, when Nicholas answered yes, I will, tears of joy filled my eyes, a thrill ran down my spine, and he felt that all his ancestors including Grandpapa and the old Prussian god were giving him their benediction. This phase of royal diplomacy, however serious its implication, was not without its humorous relief. There is a delightful commercial touch in one of his letters to dearest Nicky Dash now that the program for the renewal of your fleet has been published, I hope you won't forget to remind your authorities to remember our great firms at Stettin, Kiel, etc. They will, I am sure, furnish fine specimens of line of battleships. Melodrama marks his aggrieved letter to Bolo who, as the treaty ran counter to his own anti-French aims in Morocco, threatened resignation dash the morning after your resignation reaches him, the Kaiser will no longer be in this world. Think of my poor wife and children. But when the Tsar's ministers saw the treaty, they objected that it could not be reconciled with the French alliance, and sufficient hint of it leaked out to cause strong protests from France. Thus the masterpiece was quietly dropped into the diplomatic waste paper basket. In justice to the Kaiser it must be mentioned that at the time he had some cause for personal grievance against Britain, even though it was largely the reaction to his long-standing habit of seeking his end by threats. His forceful impulsiveness had a counterpart in Sir John Fisher, just become First Sea Lord who constantly talked of a preventive war and freely aired suggestions that if Germany would not limit her naval expansion her fleet should be Copenhagen dash on the Nelson model. Such wild suggestions naturally made more impression in Berlin than in London. King Edward VII's share as a cause of irritation was social and personal rather than political. A little more tolerance towards his nephew's gaucherie might have helped to make relations smoother. Lord Lansdowne records that the king talks and writes about his royal brother in terms which make one's flesh creep. These personal antipathies and pinpricks, of little account on the British side, where the king was a constitutional ruler and also had a sense of humour, had a deeper reaction on the German side of the North Sea, where the ruler could influence policy decisively and had no sense of humour. 
and by inciting the Kaiser to further mischief-making intrigues and menaces they had an ultimate reaction in Britain, where even the new liberal government of Campbell Bannerman could not ignore them, and was unwillingly forced closer into the arms of France. While the government refused to commit Britain to a formal alliance with France, it held out the hope that British public opinion might favour intervention if France was attacked. And when the French logically argued that emergency aid would be no use unless its method of application had been thought out, Campbell Bannerman authorized discussions between the two general staffs. While these had no effect upon the eventual decision for war, they were to have a great influence on the conduct of the war. It is significant also that in 1905 the new German war plan made allowance for a British expeditionary force of 100,000 men the very figure the French asked for. Being present on the French side. Balked of his idea of drawing France, with Russia, into a combination against Britain, the Kaiser now reverted to the idea of action against France over Morocco. He decided, however, that from a technico-military standpoint conditions were not suitable, and that an alliance with Turkey, which would place the forces of Mohammedanism to the furthest extent, under Prussian leadership, at my disposal, and a secure internal position were necessary preliminaries. This illuminating example of his unbalanced mind is contained in a letter of December 31, 1905, to Bolo, which concludes dash first shoot the socialists down, behead them, render them impotent, if necessary per blood bath, and then war abroad. But not before and not a tempo. Yet the next change in the European situation was not to strengthen his foundations, but to weaken them, by weakening his influence over Russia in the person of the Tsar. With supreme irony the change came in the most unlikely way, by the drawing together of the new British government and its antipathy. Despotic Russia. Impelled partly by its general pacifism and partly by its natural reaction to German menaces, the Liberal government continued the effort begun by Lansdowne to remove the traditional sources of friction with Russia. And in 1907 the points of difference at the points of contact were settled by an arrangement. While there was no definite agreement, the natural effect was to smooth the way to cooperation in Europe. Although Britain was not tied either to France or Russia by any formal agreement she was tied to their side by the bonds of loyalty and so could no longer impose a check upon them without suspicion of disloyalty. Thus her old independent influence in a crisis had slipped away. The dilemma was realized and well summed up by the Foreign Secretary, Sir Edward Grey, in a memorandum of February 20, 1906 coal on the wood, I think, be a general feeling in every country that we had behaved meanly and left France in the lurch. The United States would despise us, Russia would not think it worthwhile to make a friendly arrangement with us about Asia, Japan would prepare to reinsure herself elsewhere, we should be left without a friend and without the power of making a friend and Germany would take some pleasure in exploiting the whole situation to our disadvantage. On the other hand the prospect of a European war and of our being involved in it is horrible. Henceforth the great powers were in fact, if not in name divided into two rival groups. During the next few years Germany, whose aggressive and impolitic policy had created the counter-group, so curiously assorted, was also to help and be helped by Austria in hardening it, as a snowball is hardened when squeezed. But she was also to suffer from her own creation. Britain's adhesion to the new group weakened the old, by making Italy a doubtful partner. Hence Germany was compelled to cling more closely to her other partner, Austria, whom formerly she had led. If Germany wished for war, this bondage was an advantage, but if she wished for peace she would be hampered even as Britain was hampered. The new grouping of Europe was not the old balance of power but merely a barrier between powers. That barrier, moreover, was charged with explosives, the armaments which the several countries, now driven more by fear than by ambition, hurriedly augmented. Another ill consequence was that fear of a sudden detonation led the autocratic powers at least to give the military custodians of these armaments a dangerously free hand in disposing them. Fear had taken charge of reason long before July 1914. The first spark came from the Balkans in 1908. 
The revolution in Turkey was seized upon by Bulgaria to throw off Turkish suzerainty and by Austria to annex the provinces of Bosnia and Herzegovina, which she had administered since 1879. This annexation had been discussed between the Austrian and Russian foreign ministers, Ahrent Arl and Izvolsky, and Izvolsky had been willing to assent to it in return for Austrian support in securing the opening of the Dardanelles. But before Izvolsky could sound France and Britain, the annexation was declared. In Italy it was justly felt to be an affront, and in Serbia to be a menace. But in Russia the effect was made worse by the German ambassador's peremptory demand that Russia should recognize it under pain of a combined Austrian and German attack. Russia, caught when she had been acting single-handed, and threatened by a two-handed combination, gave way from fear, and was left with resentment, aggravated by the sense of having forfeited her standing in the Balkans. Izvolsky felt that he had been not only browbeaten but duped, and resigning soon after, went to the Paris embassy as an embittered foe of the Germanic powers. Another personal factor. And Austria, flattered by this first success in imitating Germany's mailed fist method of diplomacy, was encouraged to continue it. This Bosnian deceit of Arles stands out predominantly among the immediate origins of the war. Its intervention was the more unfortunate because the years 1906-14 saw an improvement in Germany's official relations, at least, with France and Britain. It would have been more marked but for the continued ominous increase in the German navy. It is easy to appreciate now that the Kaiser's encouragement to Tirpitz's anti-British naval ambitions was due largely to vanity, but then it looked more naturally a consistently designed challenge and even when he tried to repair the damage the Kaiser was unhappy in his method. His way of conciliating British feeling was to declare, in the famous Daily Telegraph interview of 1908, that the British were mad as much hares not to recognize his friendship, and that he was in a minority in a land not friendly to England. Without soothing British fears, it caused an outcry in Germany, a public repudiation by Bullo and it thus weakened the Kaiser's own power to check the war party in Germany. But it at least led to the Kaiser's replacement of Bullo as Chancellor by the well-meaning Bethmann Holweg, who was more desirous of peace if less capable of preserving it. He promptly opened negotiations for an Anglo-German agreement, and met with an eager response from the Liberal government, now renewed in power by the elections of 1910. But practical results were barred, first, by Tirpitz's opposition to any naval adjustment and, second, by the German demand that any agreement must be so worded as to bar Britain from coming to the aid of France. This was too obviously a strategic move. Sir Edward Grey made the only possible reply one does not make new friendships worth having by deserting old ones. Nevertheless, the tension was eased. The German public, present Kaiser, as shown by his documentary comments, still suffered from Anglophobia, owing largely to the feeling of thwarted aims and the much propagated idea that King Edward VII had planned a vast hostile encirclement of Germany. Perhaps the most illuminating reaction was the belief that the King's 1908 visit to the Emperor Francis Joseph was a move to detach Austria from Germany, whereas we now know from the Austrian archives that the King actually asked Francis Joseph's assistance towards reducing the friction between Britain and Germany, and valued the alliance as a common link. But the discussions helped the relations between the British and German foreign ministries and led them to cooperate in settling several points of dispute. Relations were also helped by the settlement between France and Germany over Morocco. Characteristically, this settlement followed a new crisis. The crisis, curiously enough, was provoked by the otherwise Pacific foreign minister, Keidelin Wachter, and opposed by the Kaiser. Another instance of that incalculable double-headedness which was so dangerous a feature of German policy. As a means of encouraging France to grant concessions in Africa, in June, 1911, Keidelin walked a dispatch to gunboat to Agadir. In reply, Lloyd George, the former opponent of the Boer War and the leading pacifist in the British cabinet, warned Germany in a public speech against such threats to peace. The effect in conjunction with firm indications of a readiness to support France, was to damp the spark. 
but resentment made public opinion in Germany more combustible than ever, and it enthusiastically approved yet another increase in the German navy. Nevertheless, the subsequent settlement over Morocco removed a serious source of friction between France and Germany, and thus indirectly contributed to the better official atmosphere in which Haldane's 1912 mission to Germany took place. Yet even Haldane had to confess that his spiritual home had become a powder magazine, although he communicated his fears only to his colleagues in the cabinet. The growth of the war party in Germany, however, was accompanied by a consolidation of the peace elements, most marked among the socialists, and the presence of a pacifically minded chancellor kept open a possible avenue for further negotiations. But at this very time a fresh powder trail was laid, in the Balkans. The weakness of Turkey, and the example of Italy in occupying Tripoli, encouraged Bulgaria, Serbia, and Greece to claim autonomy for Macedonia as a step to ejecting the Turks from Europe. The Turks were quickly defeated. Serbia's share of the spoils was to be northern Albania. But Austria, already fearful of Serb ambitions, had no intention of allowing a Slav state to gain access to the Adriatic. She mobilized her troops and her threat to Serbia was naturally answered by Russia's similar preparations. Fortunately, Germany joined with Britain and France to forestall the danger. Less fortunately, their settlement was the cause of a fresh crisis. For, by setting up Albania as an independent state, they upset the division of the spoil. Serbia now claimed part of Macedonia, Bulgaria refused not only by word but by blow, only to be overcome by the combined weight of Serbia and Greece, while Romania joined in, and Turkey slipped back to recover her lost property under cover of the dust raised by the dogfight. As a result Serbia was the chief gainer and Bulgaria the chief loser. This was much to Austria's distaste and in the summer of 1913 she proposed an immediate attack on Serbia. Germany restrained her, counseling moderation but herself gave Russia a fresh cause of offense by extending German control of the Turkish army. Russia saw her dream of the Dardanelles fading, and her ministers came to the conclusion that it could only be revived if a general European war occurred, a dangerful attitude of mind. Their immediate aim was now to recover their shaken influence in the Balkans, and they sought to win over Romania as a first step towards building a new Balkan alliance. The prospect created fresh alarm in Austria, already distracted by the internal strain of her diverse racial parts. Force was her method to suppress the dissatisfaction of her Serb and Croat subjects in the annexed provinces and of her Romanian subjects in Transylvania. And her desire was to apply the same remedy in time to the external state, Serbia, which formed a natural rallying point for all the dissatisfied elements within. Her leaders felt that war beyond her frontiers would be the best way to silence discord within. In this feeling they were not alone. The popular unrest in Russia, only half stifled by the use of and exile, and the clamor for universal suffrage in Germany, made the war parties in both countries look to war as a safety valve. During the last year incitements multiplied on all sides, bellicose speeches, articles, rumors frontier incidents. President Wilson's confidant, Colonel House, left Berlin with the conviction that the military party was determined on war, at the earliest opportunity, and would force the Kaiser to abdicate if he opposed their desire. Their excitement was certainly aggravated by the Three Years Service Act which France had passed as a remedy for her inferior manpower in face of recent developments in the German army. But the German ambassador reported to Bethmann Holweg that, in spite of the chauvinistic attitude of many circles and the general dream of a recovery of the lost provinces, the French nation as a whole could be described as desirous of peace. The most that could be said, even of Poincare, the president, was what Poincare himself expressed, that France did not want war, but did not fear it. Elsewhere, however, the surface of the continent was now strewn with powder and everywhere the air was heavy with fatalism. The fatal spark was struck at Sarajevo, the Bosnian capital, on June 28, 1914. Its first victim marked the irony of destiny. The fiery Slav nationalists who sought to advance their cause by murdering the Archduke Franz Ferdinand, 
the heir to Francis Joseph, singled out the one man of influence in Austria who was their friend. For Franz Ferdinand also had dreams, of a reconstructed empire in which the several nationalities were held together not in bondage but in federation. But to most of the Bosnian Slavs he was merely the symbol of the oppressor, and to the extreme nationalists who plotted his death he was the more to be hated because his dream of reconciliation within the empire might thwart theirs of breaking away from the empire to join with Serbia in creating a wider Yugoslav state. The handful of youthful conspirators sought and received help from the Serbian secret society known as the Black Hand. This was largely composed of army officers, who formed a group hostile to the existing civil government in Serbia. Rumors of the conspiracy seemed to have reached the ears of ministers, and orders were sent to the frontier to intercept the conspirators. But as the frontier guards were members of the Black Hand the precautions naturally failed. It seems also, but is not certain, that a vague warning was sent to Vienna. What is certain is the amazing carelessness of the Austrian authorities in guarding the Archduke, and their cynical indifference to the fate that befell this highly unpopular heir to the throne. Potirek, the military governor of Bosnia and future commander of the offensive against Serbia could not have done more to facilitate the task of the assassins if he had connived at it. Hence there must always be a suspicion that he did. After a first attempt, on the Archduke's passage to the city hall, had failed, Potiorek so clumsily directed the return journey that the Archduke's car had to pull up, and two shots rang out, mortally wounding the Archduke and his court despised morganatic consort. He died at 11 a.m a prophetic hour. The news of the crime caused horror and indignation in all countries save two, Austria and Serbia. The Serbian press made little effort to conceal its pleasure, and the Serbian public still less, while the government which, exhausted by the Balkan wars, had every incentive for peace in order to consolidate its gains, was foolishly remiss in making or offering an investigation into the complicity of its subjects. Austrian police investigation was also leisurely, and after a fortnight, Wiesner, who was deputed to conduct it, reported that while Serbian societies and officials were implicated, there were no proofs of the complicity of the Serbian government. On the contrary, there are grounds for believing it quite out of the question. But Austrian decision was prompt. Although any outward appearance of action was long delayed. Count Birch told, the foreign minister, who had added an air of elegance to the tradition of deceit bequeathed by A. Renthal, gracefully and gratefully seized the opportunity to retrieve Austria's and his own lost prestige. The day after the crime, he declared to the chief of the general staff that the time had come to settle with Serbia once for all, words that seemed to Konrad von Horzendorf the echo of his own repeated promptings to war. But Birch told met an unexpected obstacle in Count Tissa, who objected strongly, on the score of expediency, not of morality. Dash there can be no difficulty in finding a suitable casus billy whenever it is needed. Conrad also considered expediency and remarked to Birch told Dash we must above all ask Germany whether she is willing to safeguard us against Russia. Birch told, too, had no wish to meet a rebuff from Germany such as so damaged his prestige two years before. Hence the aged emperor was induced to sign a memorandum for the Kaiser, accompanied by a personal letter. But the Kaiser needed no appeal. For when the German ambassador, Shushki, had sent off a report of his conversation with Birch told on June 30, saying that he had given a warning against hasty steps, the Kaiser scribbled in the margin dash who authorized him to do this. It is idiotic. It is none of his business. Shushki must be good enough to stop this lunacy. We must clear the Serbians out of the way, and that too forthwith. Poor Shushki, he was not equal to his master's somersaults. Formerly energetic in incitement, he presumably remembered his master's voice, urging restraint two years before, and now thought that he was fulfilling the Kaiser's wish by changing his own tune, only to find that the Kaiser had also changed. How shall we explain it? Most probably by the Kaiser's fear of being again reproached with weakness and by his characteristic indignation that royal blood had been shed 
if also by the more creditable motive of his friendship with the murdered man. Thus to Count Hoyos, the Austrian letter bearer, he gave the assurance, on July 5, that Austria could depend on the complete support of Germany. In the Kaiser's opinion there must be no delay. If it was to come to a war between Austria Hungary and Russia she could be assured that Germany would stand at her side, although he added that Russia was in no way ready for war. Germany was, so he was assured. In a series of hasty consultations with his military and naval advisers, various precautionary measures were ordered. Meantime, the Kaiser left, as arranged, to visit Norway. A few days later, on the 17th, Walder C., the assistant chief of the general staff, reported to the foreign minister Dash I shall remain here ready to jump. We are all prepared. This blank check, endorsed by the Chancellor and given with full recognition of the consequences, stands out predominant among the immediate causes of the war. Austria hurried to cash it, and Chushki was only too eager to repair his blunder in urging caution. Unlike later decisions this was taken in a calm if not a cool atmosphere, a fact which gives it special significance in assessing the will to war. Significant also is the care taken by Germany and Austria to lull suspicion of any impending move, in Conrad's words, peaceful intentions should be simulated. While giving no advice to Austria to keep her demands within moderation, the German government showed its anxiety that the support of Italy, Bulgaria, Romania and Turkey should be insured for a war. Italy was to be given no hint of the action intended, but Austria was urged to be ready with a price for her support when war came. Now assured of Germany's backing, Berchtold's next problem is so to draft the ultimatum to Serbia that it will be unacceptable. This takes some thought and on July 10 Berchtold confesses to Chishki that he is still considering what demands could be put that it would be wholly impossible for Serbia to accept. The only dissenting voice is that of Tisza, but he is told dash a diplomatic success would be valueless. He threatens to withhold his support, but suddenly veers round, after Berchtold has warned him of the military difficulties which would be caused by a delay and has impressed the fact that Germany would not understand any neglect on our part to use this opportunity for striking a blow. Austria might forfeit her partnership with Germany if she showed weakness. The ultimatum is drawn up, and after reading it the old emperor says dash Russia cannot accept this. This means a general war. But its delivery is delayed until various war preparations are complete, and Poincare has sailed from St. Petersburg where he has been visiting the Tsar. The Russian ambassador in Vienna is also induced by peaceful assurances to go on leave. But the German steamship lines are warned of the date on which the Austrian note would be delivered, and that they must be ready for swift developments. At 6 p.m. on July 23 the ultimatum is presented to the Serbian government, when the Prime Minister is away. Its terms not only demand the repression of all propaganda against Austria, but Austria's right to order the dismissal of any Serbian officials that she cares to name and to post her own officials in Serbia. This directly violates Serbia's status as an independent country. Only 48 hours are allowed for acceptance. Next day the German government delivers notes in St. Petersburg, Paris and London, which state that the Austrian demands are moderate and proper. Dash the German government had not even seen the ultimatum when it lightheartedly wrote this and add the threat that any interference would be followed by incalculable consequences. In London the note caused stupefaction, in Russia fierce indignation. But, two minutes before the ultimatum expired the Serbian reply was handed to the Austrian ambassador. Without waiting to read it, he broke off relations and caught the train from Belgrade, in accordance with his instructions. Formal orders were issued three hours later for Austria's partial mobilization, on the Serbian front. Simultaneously preparatory measures for mobilization took place in Germany and Russia. Yet the Serbian note had accepted all the Austrian demands except the two which definitely violated her independence. When the Kaiser read it, on July 28, after his return, he wrote the comment a brilliant performance for a time limit of only 48 hours. A great moral victory for Vienna, but with it every reason for war drops away. 
and in reference to Austria's partial mobilization he adds dash on the strength of this I should never have ordered mobilization. Once more the mailed fist has triumphed and the Kaiser, having shown the doubters that he is a strong man, is eager to rest on his laurels. Royal honor is satisfied. But he unwisely suggests that Austria might well occupy part of Serbia until her demands are fulfilled, an act that Russia could never be expected to permit. Bethmann Holweg agreed with the Kaiser's view, and on the morning of the 28th the advice was sent to Vienna, adding that, if Austria continues her refusal to all proposals for mediation or arbitration, the odium of being responsible for a world war will in the eyes of the German people fall on the German government. But the changed tone was fatally belated. Germany had herself blocked these proposals during the most auspicious period. When the German note was delivered, on July 24, Russia was at once assured of France's support, and Gray was pressed by his allies to declare Britain's solidarity with them. But his parliamentary responsibility and the divided views of the cabinet, as well as the uncertainty of public support, hindered any such declaration. He feared, too, that any such action might strengthen the war parties in Russia and Germany. Instead, he tried to open a path to mediation. His first move, on the 24th, was to urge through Berlin an extension of the Austrian time limit. It received no support in Berlin and was tardily passed on to Vienna where it arrived two hours before the expiration. When it was at once rejected. On the 25th and 26th he made further proposals for joint mediation by Germany, Britain, France and Italy, while Austria, Russia, and Serbia were to abstain from military operations. Prompt acceptance came at once from Paris and Rome. Sazanov in St. Petersburg, who had originally mooted the idea, now agreed in principle but preferred first to try direct discussions with Vienna. Berlin refused. The Kaiser scribbled his usual incendiary comments on the reports that came to him dash that is a tremendous piece of British insolence. I am not called upon to prescribe a la greater the Emperor, of Austria, how to preserve his honor. There is much evidence that German opinion was encouraged by Britain's attitude to count on her neutrality in case of war. But in the newspapers of July 27 the British government published the news that the fleet, assembled for maneuvers, had been ordered not to disperse. This hint in combination with the nature of Serbia's reply caused a change of official tone in Berlin, where, the day before, the general staff had sent to the foreign office the ultimatum they had drafted in readiness for delivery to Belgium. Thus, later on July 27, the German government decided to pass Gray's proposals on to Vienna. They sent Gray word that this action implied that they associate themselves to a certain extent with your hope. But after seeing the German foreign minister, the Austrian ambassador telegraphed to Vienna dash the German government offers the most unqualified assurances that it in no way identifies itself with them, but on the contrary is decidedly opposed to their consideration, and only communicates them in order to satisfy the English. The German government is so acting because its point of view is that it is of the utmost importance that England, at the present moment, should not make common cause with Russia and France. On the 28th, after the Kaiser had seen Serbia's reply, there was a further cooling of tone as we have seen. But Bethmann Holweg's cautionary message, his first, to Vienna that day was too late and too tepid. For at 11 a.m., again. Dash on July 28, Austria's telegraph declaration of war was delivered to Serbia. And the same day Birch told refused Sazanov's proposal for direct conversations, giving as his reason the fact that war was now declared. A grim humor underlies both the cause and method of Austria's precipitate decision. Militarily there was every reason for delay in the actual declaration, as the army could not be ready to move until August 12. But messages from Germany had been inciting Austria to haste. Birch told and Conrad feared to lose her support and the chance of war if they dallied. 
Birch told cynically summed up the position to the Emperor on July 27 – I think that a further attempt by the Entente powers to bring about a peaceful solution remains possible only so long as a new situation has not been created by the declaration of war. And in obtaining the Emperor's signature to the declaration of war, he quenched any doubts by incorporating the justification that Serbian had attacked Austrian troops. Having achieved his end, he then deleted the sentence referring to this imaginary attack. The rush to the abyss now gathered unbreakable speed, driven by the motor of military necessity. In constructing their huge and cumbrous machines the general staffs of Europe had forgotten the first principle of war, elasticity. Alike in mobilization and in use the conscript armies of the continent were almost unmanageable. Events were soon to show that they could be set in motion but could not be effectively guided, their steering lock was inadequate. In this deficiency, now a danger to peace, they afforded a contrast both to the fleets of the time and to the small professional armies of the past. The one thought of the generals during these critical days was to start their machines. Desire for war, and fear, of being caught at a disadvantage, reacted on each other. Thus in Germany and Russia, as already in Austria, any desire among the statesmen for peace suffered the counterpull of the general's entreaties to action, and predictions of dire consequences if their technical advice was disregarded. Already in Austria, the generals shared with Birch told the somber distinction of having initiated the war. Their next success was in Russia, also a land of military mediocrity. There, the news of the Austrian declaration of war ought to decisive change. Hitherto Sazanov had kept the generals in hand. Now he begins to succumb to inevitability, and suggests that partial mobilization shall be carried out, of the troops on the Austrian front only. The general staff argue that for technical reasons this is impracticable, and urge that only a general mobilization can avoid upsetting the machine. Unwilling to yield to their arguments, yet unwilling to override them, Sazanov makes a compromise. Two Yukuses are prepared for the Tsar's signature, one for partial and one for general mobilization, and a decision between them is put off. But the general staff are working on the second. Next morning, the chief of the mobilization branch receives the order for general mobilization signed provisionally by the Tsar, and goes round to obtain the necessary signature of the ministers. One of them cannot be found until the evening. Meantime the German ambassador calls on Sazanov, about 6 p.m., and gives him a message from Bethman Holweg, that dash if Russia continues her mobilization measures Germany will mobilize, and mobilization means war. The message is delivered with the assurance that it is not a threat, but a friendly opinion, to Sazanov it sounds more like a threat, and it seems to prohibit even partial mobilization on the Austrian frontier. His opposition to his own clamorous general staff weakens, and after a conference with its chief, Yanushkevich, he apparently consents to general mobilization and obtains the Tsar's approval. Let us shift our gaze for a moment to Berlin. There the same nervous tension exists and the same tug of wills is in progress. But the Kaiser and his political advisers are now seriously alarmed that Austria's action will make them appear the guilty party and so cost them the support of Italy while ensuring the entry of Britain against them. Thus a demand of the general staff for immediate mobilization is refused, and later in the evening Bethman Holweg sees the British ambassador. He tries to bargain for Britain's neutrality and suggests that in return Germany would not annex any part of France, but he cannot give him such an assurance as regards the French colonies. The ambassador tells him that acceptance of the offer is highly improbable, wherein he proves a true prophet. Like Nosky's warnings from London, that British opinion is hardening, send the Kaiser into a paroxysm of frightened rage. He scrawls abusive epithets about English Phryseism, calling Graham in deceiver, and, rather oddly in view of Bethman Holweg's offer, terms the British a pack of base hucksters. But like Nosky's report of Gray's renewed proposals for mediation at least induces Bethman Holweg to send a string of telegrams to Vienna exhorting the Austrians not to continue their open refusal, lest they drag Germany into war at a disadvantage. The Kaiser, also, 
telegraphs to the Tsar saying that he is trying to persuade Vienna to agree to frank negotiations. It crosses a similar conciliatory telegram from the Tsar, and is answered by a second, suggesting that Dashid would be right to give over the Austro-Serbian problem to the Hague Conference. I trust in your wisdom and friendship. The fact that the Kaiser's marginal comment is rubbish casts a doubt upon his sincerity. But the Kaiser has also sent a second telegram of appeal to check military measures which would precipitate a calamity. This produces an actual effect. The Tsar, about 10 p.m., rings up the chief of staff, and despite Yanushkevich's horrified protests that the orders have now gone out, directs him to cancel them and substitute a partial mobilization. But the general staff, though discomfited, are not defeated. Next morning, in order to retrieve the position, they bring fresh arguments and all their weight to bear. First they try to approach the Tsar, but he takes refuge from their pressure by refusing to see the Minister of War. Yanushkevich then seeks out Sazanov, and insists that any further delay in general mobilization will dislocate the army organization and endanger Russia's safety. He further contends that partial mobilization will give the French the impression that, when war came, Russia will be unable to help her in resisting Germany's onslaught. Sazanov, now resigned to the certainty of war, agrees to visit the Tsar that afternoon. The Tsar, pale and worried, gives way and gives the order, after Sazanov has soothingly assured him that whatever happens his conscience will be clear. Sazanov telephones the order to Yanushkevich, and advises him to disappear for the rest of the day, as a safeguard against the Tsar's vacillation. Sazanov first thinks of trying to keep the general mobilization as secret as possible, without issuing any proclamation, but finds it technically impossible, and the Ukaz is posted up next morning, July 31st. That same day, but a few hours later, the Austrian order for general mobilization is given. Henceforth the statesmen may continue to send telegrams, but they are merely waste paper. The military machine has completely taken charge. Indeed, it had done so on the 30th, not only in Russia. At 2 p.m., Moltke, the chief of the German general staff, had sent a message to the Austrian general staff through their attache that Russia's military measure will develop into a casus federis for Germany. Decline the renewed advances of Great Britain in the interest of peace. A European war is the last chance of saving Austria Hungary. Germany is ready to back Austria unreservedly. Subsequently he sent a telegram direct to Conrad Dash mobilize at once against Russia. Germany will mobilize. Persuade Italy, by offering compensation, to do her duty as an ally. Thus Molt counteracted the irresolute telegrams of Bethmann Holweg. The Austrian military and civil leaders needed no urging, merely the assurance of Germany's support and had no intention of acceding to any proposals for mediation unless Germany threatened to withdraw that support. And Germany now meant the general staff. As soon as news reached Berlin of the Russian order, a state of danger of war was proclaimed, which comprised the first step of mobilization, a neat military device to gain a lead without giving away a trick. At the same time ultimatums were dispatched both to St. Petersburg and Paris. The ultimatum to Russia demanded that she must suspend every war measure against Austria and ourselves within 12 hours, and definitely notify us of this. Sazanov, in reply, said that it was technically impossible to stop the mobilization but that, so long as negotiations continued, Russia would not attack. The Tsar reinforced this statement with another telegram to the Kaiser Dash understand that you are obliged to mobilize but wish to have the same guarantee from you as I gave you that these measures do not mean war, and that we shall continue negotiating. But, without waiting to hear the reply to their ultimatum, the German government dispatched a formally worded declaration of war to their ambassador in St. Petersburg, who duly delivered it, after the expiry of the time limit, in the early evening of August 1st. Almost coincidentally German mobilization began. Yet General von Chilius had shrewdly reported from St. Petersburg. Dash people have mobilized here through fear of coming events with no aggressive purpose, and are already terrified at the result. And the Kaiser had made the note. Dash right, 
that is the truth. But the Kaiser, now equally frightened, and willing, could not stop his own military machine. For Moltke was insistent that the unusually favorable situation should be used to strike, pointing out that France's military situation is nothing less than embarrassed, that Russia is anything but confident, moreover, the time of year is favorable. The rashness of the Russian general staff might at least be excused by nerves, but hardly Moltke's. If three men can be singled out as the main personal causes of the war, at this time, they are Birch told, Conrad and Moltke. But Moltke was really a limited company, the great general staff. Yet, if their action was deliberate, fear was the background of their thought, not merely militaristic ambition. Fear, among the Austrian general staff, of the doubling of the Serbian army in consequence of Serbia's gain of territory in the Balkan War. Fear, among the German general staff, of the Russian army's unexpectedly rapid recovery, from its 1905 sickness under the ministrations of Sukhumlanov. Like a hard pressed hero of the talk path, Moltke now pushed Austria into war so that he could jump into her rescue, and then be sure of a help in return. The German ultimatum to France demanded to know whether France would remain neutral in a Russo German war gave her 18 hours for a reply, and added the menace, mobilization will inevitably mean war. In case she offered to remain neutral, the German ambassador was instructed to make the impossible demand that France must hand over the fortresses of Verdun and Toul as a pledge. For Moltke's plans were made for a two-front war, and his aim would be upset if only one target appeared. Could military folly go further? The German ambassador called for his answer on August 1, and was simply told that France would act as her interests required. That afternoon the French mobilization was ordered, but in Republican France the civil government was still superior to the general staff, and since July 30 the frontier forces had been withdrawn to a line 10 kilometers inside the frontier as a pacific gesture and a safeguard against the danger that a frontier skirmish might provide an excuse for war. If a military handicap, the political wisdom of this withdrawal was seen in the fact that German patrols crossed the actual frontier on the 30th and again, by German official admission, on the 31st. Thus when, on August 3rd Germany declared war on France, she could only allege the one concrete excuse that a French aviator had thrown bombs on the railway near Karlsruhe and Nuremberg – rumor already contradicted in Germany before the declaration was delivered. Why was the actual declaration delayed two days in delivery? First, because of the fresh suggestion from Gray that so long as there was any chance of agreement between Russia and Austria, Germany and France should refrain from any attack. The suggestion was vaguely worded and Lyknowski, in his eager desire for peace, enlarged it in telegraphing to Berlin that this would appear to mean that in case we did not attack France, England would remain neutral and would guarantee France's neutrality. The Kaiser and his Chancellor clutched at the straw. The former said to Moltke – we march, then, with all our forces, only towards the east. Moltke, as his memoirs relate, replied, that this was impossible. The advance of armies formed of millions of men. Was their result of years of painstaking work. Once planned, it could not possibly be changed. The Kaiser bitterly retorted Dash your uncle would have given me a different reply. Moltke gained his way as regards the continued concentration against France, but a 24-hour break was ordered to be put on the actual crossing of the frontier of France and Luxembourg. Moltke pathetically records, Dash it was a great shock to me, as though something had struck at my heart. However his heart attack was soon relieved, for late that evening further telegrams from London showed that Britain was not promising neutrality. The break was released. And if it had caused some check on Moltke's arrangements, some of his advanced troops had actually entered Luxembourg that day in advance of timetable. Nevertheless the British cabinet was still wavering. A majority of its members were so anxious for peace and uncertain of the public attitude that they had failed to give a clear warning which might have strengthened Bethman Holweg in his feeble efforts to withstand his own war party. Now it was too late and the military machine was in control. Nothing could have averted war after July 31. 
Thus the British cabinet's continued uncertainty, however natural and creditable, merely increased the anxiety of France, fearful of desertion. Germany came to the rescue. Her long prepared ultimatum to Belgium, demanding a free passage for her troops as required by her still longer prepared war plan, was delivered on the evening of August 2. The Belgian government sturdily refused to allow its neutrality to be violated. On the morning of August 4, the German troops began their invasion. The threat, even before the act was known, was decisive in hardening British opinion to the point of intervention, even though that intervention was already inevitable, as the German staff had correctly calculated. An ultimatum was delivered that Germany should respect Belgian neutrality, and was received by Bethman Holweg with the pitiful complaint that Britain was going to war just for a scrap of paper. At 11 p.m., by German time, the ultimatum expired. Britain also was in the war, and Italy was out of it, having already decided for neutrality on July 31 SD. Thus in the final act, as in the earlier acts, technical military arguments were decisive. The German army must go through Belgium, even though with the certainty that Britain would thereby be drawn in against Germany. Military technique, how competent in peace to gain war, how impotent in war to gain victory, so it was soon to prove exclamation mark to the opposing forced nations entered upon the conflict with the conventional outlook and system of the 18th century merely modified by the events of the 19th century. Politically, they conceived it to be a struggle between rival coalitions based on the traditional system of diplomatic alliances, and militarily a contest between professional armies, swollen, it is true, by the continental system of conscription, yet essentially fought out by soldiers while the mass of the people watched, from seats in the amphitheatre, the efforts of their champions. The Germans had a glimpse of the truth, but, one or two prophetic minds apart, the nation in arms theory, evolved by them during the 19th century, visualized the nation as a reservoir to pour its reinforcements into the army, rather than as a mighty river in which are merged many tributary forces of which the army is but one. Their conception was the nation in arms, hardly the nation at war. Even today this fundamental truth has yet to be grasped in its entirety and its full implications understood. Progressively throughout the years 1914 to 18 the warring nations enlisted the research of the scientist, the inventive power and technical skill of the engineer, the manual labor of industry, and the pen of the propagandist. For long this fusion of many forces tended to a chaotic maelstrom of forces, the old order had broken down the new had not yet evolved. Only gradually did a working cooperation emerge, and it is a moot point whether even in the last phase cooperation of forces had attained to the higher level of coordination, direction by unity of diversity. The German army of 1914 was born in the Napoleonic Wars, nursed in infancy by Neisner and Schoenhorst, and guided in adolescence by the elder Moltke and Rune. It reached maturity in the War of 1870, when it emerged triumphantly from a trial against the ill-equipped and badly led Long Service Army of France. Every physically able citizen was liable to service, the state took the number it desired, trained them to arms for a short period of full-time service, and then returned them to civil life. The feature, as also the object, of the system, was the production of a huge reserve by which to expand the active army in war. A man served two or three years full time, according to his branch of the service, followed by five or four years in the regular reserves. He then served in the land for twelve years, and finally passed into the Landsturm from the age of thirty nine till forty five. Further, an ersatz reserve was formed of those who were not called on for service with the colors. In this organization and in the thoroughness of the training lay the secret of the first great surprise of the war, one which almost proved decisive. For instead of regarding their reservists as troops of doubtful quality, fit only for an auxiliary role or garrison duty, the Germans during mobilization were able to duplicate almost every first line army corps with a reserve corps and had the courage, justified by events, to use them in the opening clash. 
this surprise upset the French calculations and thereby dislocated their entire plan of campaign. The Germans have been reproached for many miscalculations, less than justice has been done to the correctness of many of their intuitions. They alone realized what is today an axiom, that, given a highly trained cadre of leaders, a military machine can be rapidly manufactured from short-time levies, like molten liquid poured into a mold. The German mold was a long-service body of officers and NCOs who in their standard of technical knowledge and skill had no equal on the continent. But if the machine was manufactured by training it gained solidity from another process. The psychological element plays an even greater part in a national than in a professional army. Esprit de corps is not enough, the stimulus of a great moral impulse to action is necessary, a deep-rooted belief in the policy for which citizens are called on to fight. The leaders of Germany had worked for generations to inspire their people with a patriotic conviction of the grandeur of their country's destiny. And if their opponents went forth to battle in 1914 with as intense a belief in their country's cause, this flaming patriotism had not the time to consolidate such a disciplined combination as years of steady heat had produced in Germany. The German people had an intimacy with and a pride in their army, notwithstanding the severity of its discipline, that was unknown elsewhere. This unique instrument was handled by a general staff which, by rigor of selection and training, was unmatched for professional knowledge and skill, if subject to the mental grooves which characterize all professions. Executive skill is the fruit of practice, and constant practice, or repetition, tends inevitably to deaden originality and elasticity of mind. In a professional body, also, promotion by seniority is a rule difficult to avoid. The Germans, it is true, tended towards a system of staff control which in practice usually left the real power in the hands of youthful general staff officers. As war memoirs and documents reveal, the chiefs of staff of the various armies and corps often took momentous decisions with hardly a pretense of consulting their commanders. But such a system had grave objections, and from it came the grit in the wheels which not infrequently marred the otherwise well-oiled working of the German war machine. Tactically the Germans began with two important material advantages. They alone had gauged the potentialities of the heavy howitzer, and had provided adequate numbers of this weapon. And if no army had fully realized that machine guns were concentrated essence of infantry, nor fully developed this preponderant source of firepower, the Germans had studied it more than other armies, and were able to exploit its inherent power of dominating a battlefield sooner than other armies. In this anticipation of the value of heavy artillery and machine guns the German general staff seems to have been largely influenced by the acute diagnosis of Captain Hoffmann, its youthful attaché with the Japanese army in Manchuria. Strategically, also, the Germans had brought the study and development of railway communications to a higher pitch than any of their rivals. The Austro Hungarian army, if patterned on the German model, was a vastly inferior instrument. Not only had it a tradition of defeat rather than of victory, but its racial mixture prevented the moral homogeneity that distinguished its ally. This being so, the replacement of the old professional army by one based on universal service lowered rather than raised its standard of effectiveness. The troops within the borders of the empire were often racially akin to those beyond, and this compelled Austria to a politically instead of a militarily based distribution of forces, so that kinsmen should not fight each other. And her human handicap was increased by a geographical one, namely, the vast extent of frontier to be defended. Nor were her leaders, with rare exceptions, the professional equals of the Germans. Moreover, if common action was better understood than among the Entente powers, Austria did not accept German direction gladly. Yet, despite all its evident weaknesses, the loosely knit conglomeration of races withstood the shock and strain of war for four years, in a way that surprised and dismayed her opponents. The explanation is that the complex racial fabric was woven on a stout Germanic and Magyar framework. From the central, we turn to the Entente powers. France possessed but 60% of the potential manpower of Germany, 5,940,000 against 9,750,000.
and this debit balance had forced her to call on the services of practically every able-bodied male. A man was called up at 20, did three years full-time service, then 11 in the reserve and finally two periods of seven years each in the Territorial Army and Territorial Reserve. This system gave France an initial war strength of nearly 4 million trained men, compared with Germany's five but she placed little reliance on the fighting value of reservists. The French command counted only on the semi-professional troops of the first line, about one million men, for the short and decisive campaign which they expected and prepared for. Moreover, they assumed a similar attitude on the part of their enemy, with dire result. But this initial surprise apart, a more profound handicap was the lesser capacity of France for expansion in case of a long war, due to her smaller population, under 40 million compared with Germany's 65 million. Colonel Mangin, later to become famous, had advocated tapping the resources in Africa, the raising of a huge native army, but the government had considered the dangers to outweigh the advantages of such a policy, and war experience was to show that it had military as well as political risks. The French general staff if less technically perfect than the German, had produced some of the most renowned military thinkers in Europe, and its level of intelligence could well bear comparison. But the French military mind tended to lose in originality and elasticity what it gained in logic. In the years preceding the war, too, a sharp division of thought had arisen which did not make for combined action. Worse still, the new French philosophy of war, by its preoccupation with the moral element, had become more and more separated from the inseparable material factors. Abundance of will cannot compensate a definite inferiority of weapons, and the second factor, once realized, inevitably reacts on the first. In material, the French had one great asset in their quick-firing 75mm field gun, the best in the world, but its very value had led them to undue confidence in a war of movement and a consequent neglect of equipment and training for the type of warfare which came to pass. Russia's assets were in the physical sphere, her defects in the mental and moral. If her initial strength was no greater than that of Germany, her manpower resources were immense. Moreover the courage and endurance of her troops were famous. But corruption and incompetence permeated her leadership. Her rank and file lacked the intelligence and initiative for scientific warfare, they formed an instrument of great solidity but little flexibility, while her manufacturing resources for equipment and munitions were far below those of the great industrial powers. This handicap was made worse by her geographical situation, for she was cut off from her allies by ice or enemy bound seas and she had to cover immense land frontiers. Another radical defect was the poverty of her rail communications, which were the more essential as she relied for success on bringing into play the weight of her numbers. In the moral sphere Russia's condition was less clear. Her internal troubles were notorious and must be a break on her efforts unless the cause was such as to make a crusade-like appeal to her primitive and incoherent masses. Between the military systems of Germany, Austria, France and Russia there was a close relation, the differences were of detail rather than fundamental, and this similarity threw into greater contrast the system of the other great European power, Britain. Throughout modern times she had been essentially a sea power, intervening on land through a traditional policy of diplomatic and financial support to allies, whose military efforts she reinforced with eleven from her own professional army. This regular army was primarily maintained for the protection and control of the overseas dependencies, India in particular, and had always been kept down to the minimum strength for this purpose. The reason for the curious contrast between Britain's determination to maintain a supreme navy and her consistent neglect, indeed starvation, of the army lay partly in her insular position, which caused her to regard the sea as her essential lifeline and main defence, and partly in a constitutional distrust of the army, an illogical prejudice, which had its almost forgotten source in the military government of Cromwell. Small as to size, it enjoyed a practical and varied experience of war without parallel among the continental armies. Compared with them, 
Its obvious professional handicap was that the leaders, however apt in handling small columns in colonial expeditions, had never been prepared to direct large formations in La Grande Guerre. But the value of such practice, and the British handicap, are easily overrated by the layman. For experience has tended to show that the larger the force, the smaller the scope for generalship, and the less the call upon it. Compared with the manifold personal initiative of a Marlborough or a Napoleon before and during battle, the decisions of an army commander in 1914-18 were necessarily few and broad, his role was more akin to that of managing director of a vast department store. And in a war where all the leaders were soon out of their depth, and slow to recover, practical acumen counted for more than the theoretical technique acquired in peacetime exercises. These, especially in the French army, too often bred the delusion that the issue of an order at a distance was equivalent to its fulfillment on the spot. In the little British army which originally took the field, personality had for a time more scope. And much was to depend upon it. Unfortunately, the issue was to suggest that the process of selection had not succeeded in bringing to the fore the officers best fitted for leadership. It is significant that, on the way out to France, Haig spoke to Charteris, his military secretary and future chief intelligence officer, of his qualms concerning the commander-in-chief, Sir John French, whose right hand he had been in South Africa, D. H. unburdened himself today. He is greatly concerned about the composition of British GHQ. He thinks French quite unfit for high command in time of crisis. He says French's military ideas are not sound, that he has never studied war, that he is obstinate, and will not keep with him men who point out even obvious errors. He gives him credit for good tactical powers, great courage, and determination. He does not think Murray will dare to do anything but agree with everything French suggests. In any case he thinks French would not listen to Murray but rely on Wilson, which is far worse. D. H. thinks Wilson is a politician, and not a soldier, and politician with Douglas Haig is synonymous with crooked dealing and wrong sense of values. This judgment is similar to that of another general, eminent as a military historian, there could hardly have been worse selected GHQs than those with which we began the South African War in 1914. But apart from errors in selection, there is the question whether officers were miscast for their actual roles. In 1912, French himself had expressed the opinion that certainly Haig and perhaps Grierson would always shine more and show to greater advantage as superior staff officers than as commanders. Because of his unrivaled knowledge of the German army and cordial relations with the French, as well as his gift for putting juniors at their ease, Grierson would have been a peculiarly good chief of staff for French. Yet when Grierson, his chief staff officer at Manoeuvres, had pointed out to French the impracticability of some of his proposals, he had at once been replaced by Sir Archibald Murray. Grierson, instead, went to France as commander of an army corps. A man of full figure and sedentary habits, 55 years old, the combination of good living and hard work had undermined his constitution, he collapsed and died on his way to the front. If this was a great loss to the army, it was a less immediate danger than Murray's subsequent collapse on August 26, the critical day of La Cat. Worse still, Murray would recover sufficiently to think that he was functioning when actually he was still unfit. These were but two of the most prominent instances of the trouble caused by a system which brought officers to high position at an age when their energy was declining, and their susceptibility to the strain of war increasing. As a fortunate offset the enemy suffered at least as heavily from this handicap, indeed, the directing head of the German armies, Moltke, who had recently been undergoing treatment, caused alarm among his entourage in the very first days of war by his state of semi-collapse. The other British corps commander, Haag, had taken too good care of his health to cause any such anxiety. Physically, his fitness at 53 was exceptional. In the South African War, his thoroughness and methodicity had made him an ideal staff officer to French, but later, when given command of a mobile column, those qualities had not proved all sufficing. It is worth recalling that when Colonel Wool's Samson, 
the incomparable intelligence officer and fighting scout, was told of Hegg's appointment as column commander, he remarked, he's quite all right, but he's too, cautious, he will be so fixed on not giving the Boers a chance, he'll never give himself one. Thirteen years later Will Sampson's point was borne out. For the revised official history of 1914, published after a generation has passed, has revealed that at Haig's first serious test as a corps commander he was temporarily thrown off his balance by a trifling encounter in the dark, so that he reported situation very critical, and repeatedly called for help, from a neighbor who was really hard pressed. It is also revealed that Haig's excessive caution on reaching the AI allowed the day of opportunity to slip away, and the enemy to establish their four years tenure of the position beyond. Yet if command was not Haig's natural role, he had developed qualities which others lacked, and once the battlefront became static the conditions of warfare tended to change the role of a commander into that of a super staff officer. Errors of conception were to cost more than any errors of execution. Lessons of the South African War that went wider than the selection of leaders had been overlooked. Read in the light of 1914-18, the evidence taken before the Royal Commission on the War in South Africa offers astonishing proof of how professional vision may miss the wood for the trees. There is little hint, among those who were to be the leaders in the next war, that they had recognized the root problem of the future, the dominating power of fire defense and the supreme difficulty of crossing the bullet-swept zone. Sir Ian Hamilton alone gave it due emphasis, and even he was too sanguine as to the possibility of overcoming it. His proposed solution, however, was in the right direction. For he urged not only the value of exploiting surprise and infiltration tactics to nullify the advantages of the defense, but the need of heavy field artillery to support the infantry. Still more prophetically, he suggested that the infantry might be provided with steel shields on wheels to enable them to cross no man's land and make a lodgment in the enemy's position. Mr. Murray, author of the Times History of the War, probed a weak spot in the prevailing European theory by arguing that superior skill now counted more than superior numbers, and that its proportionate value would increase with material progress. The same note was struck by General Barden Powell who urged that the way to develop it was to give officers responsibility when young, he was left to find his channel for proving this in the Boy Scout movement, and not in the army. Two generals, Paget and Hunter, had a vision of the value and future use of motor vehicles in war, while Haig said that, rather than mounted infantry, he would prefer infantry on motors. In view of the development of the motor between 1903 and 1914 it is strange how little use of it was made at the outset of the next war, or even at the end. But the most remarkable feature of this royal commission was the way that French and Haig discoursed on the paramount value of the arme blanche, implying that so long as the cavalry charge was maintained all would be well with the conduct of war. An equally striking underestimate of firepower was contained in Haig's forecast that artillery seems only likely to be really effective against Rao troops. His confident opening declaration was that cavalry will have a larger sphere of action in future wars. And he went on to say, besides being used before, during, and after a battle as hitherto, we must expect to see it employed strategically on much larger scale than formerly. What a contrast there was to be between this expectation and the event. French, Germans, Russians, and Austrians certainly had unexampled masses of cavalry ready at the outbreak of war. But in the opening phase they caused more trouble to their own sides than to the enemy. From 1915 on, their effect was trivial, except as a strain on their own country's supplies, despite the relatively small number of British cavalry. Forage was the largest item of supplies sent overseas, exceeding even ammunition, and thus the most dangerous factor in aggravating the submarine menace, while, by authoritative verdict, the transport trouble caused in feeding the immense number of cavalry horses was an important factor in producing Russia's collapse. In the British Army, also, one unfortunate result of this delusion was that when the cavalry school came to the top in the years just before the war, 
there was the usual human tendency to penalize the careers of officers who propounded more realistic ideas, while a still larger circle were thereby induced to maintain silence. This was the greater pity because the cavalry sense of mobility was as vital a necessity as the cavalry means of mobility was decadent, and by undue emphasis on the old means the chance of recreating the means was hindered. But in other ways the bitter lessons of the South African War brought profit, exerting an influence which to some extent counteracted that inelasticity of mind and ritualism of method which have increased with the increasing professionalization of armies. For the progress in organization in the years before 1914, the British Army owed much to Lord Haldane, comma 1 and to him also was due the creation of a second line of partially trained citizens, the Territorial Force. Lord Roberts had pleaded for compulsory military training, but the voluntary principle was too deeply embedded in the national mind for this course to be adopted and Haldane wisely sought to develop Britain's military effectiveness within the bounds set by traditional policy. As a result, 1914 found England with an expeditionary force of some 160,000 men, the most highly trained striking force of any country, a rapier among scythes. To maintain this at strength the old militia had been turned into a special reserve for drafting. Behind this first line stood the territorial force, which if only enlisted for home defense had a permanent fighting organization, unlike the amorphous volunteer force which it superseded. The British Army had no outstanding asset in war armament, but it had developed a standard of rifle shooting unique among the world's armies. The reforms by which the army had been brought into line with continental models had one defect accentuated by the close relations established between the British and French general staffs since the Entente. It induced a continental habit of thought among the general staff, and predisposed them to the role, for which their slender strength was unsuited, of fighting alongside an allied army. This obscured the British Army's traditional employment in amphibious operations through which the mobility given by command of the sea could be exploited. A small but highly trained force striking out of the blue at a vital spot can produce a strategic effect out of all proportion to its slight numbers. The last argument brings us to a comparison of the naval situation, which turned on the balance between the fleets of Britain and Germany. Britain's sea supremacy, for long unquestioned, had in recent years been challenged by a Germany which had deduced that a powerful fleet was the key to that colonial empire which she desired as an outlet for her commerce and increasing population. This ambition was fostered, as its instrument was created, by the dangerous genius of Admiral von Tirpitz. To the spur of naval competition the British people eventually responded, determined at any cost to maintain their two-power standard. If this reaction was instinctive rather than reasoned, its subconscious wisdom had a better foundation than the catchwords with which it was justified, or even than the need of defense against invasion. The industrial development of the British Isles had left them dependent on overseas supplies for food, and on the secure flow of seaborne imports and exports for industrial existence. For the Navy itself this competition was a refining agency leading to a concentration on essentials. Gunnery was developed and less value attached to polished brasswork. Warship design and armament were transformed, the dreadnought ushered in the new era of the big gun battleship. By 1914 Britain had 29 such capital ships and 13 building, to the 18 built and 9 building, of Germany. Further, Britain's naval strength had been soundly distributed the main concentration being in the North Sea. More open to criticism in view of the forecasts of several naval authorities, was her comparative neglect of the potential menace of the submarine. Here German opinion was shown rather by the number building than those already in commission. It is to Germany's credit that though lacking a sea tradition, her fleet an artificial rather than a natural product, the technical skill of the German navy made it a formidable rival to the British ship for ship and perhaps it's superior in scientific gunnery. But in the first stage of the struggle the balance of the naval forces was to affect the issue far less than the balance on land. For a fleet suffers one inherent limitation, it is tied to the sea, 
and hence cannot strike direct at the hostile nation. The fundamental purpose of a navy is therefore to protect a nation's sea communications and sever those of the enemy, although victory in battle may be a necessary prelude, blockade is its ultimate purpose. And as blockade is a weapon slow to take effect, its influence could only be decisive if the armies failed to secure speedy decision on land, upon which all counted. In this idea of a short war lay also the reason for the comparative disregard of economic forces. Few believed that a modern nation could endure for many months the strain of a large scale conflict. The supply of food and of funds, the supply and manufacture of munitions, these were problems that had been only studied on brief estimates. Of the belligerents, all could feed themselves save Britain and Germany, and Germany's deficit of homegrown supplies could only be serious in the event of a struggle of years. But Britain would starve in three months if her outside supplies were cut off. In munitions and other war material, Britain's industrial power was greatest of all, though conversion to war production was a necessary preliminary, and all, again, depended on the security of her sea communications. France was weak, and Russia weaker still, but the former, unlike the latter, could count on outside supplies so long as Britain held the seas. As Britain was the industrial pivot of the one alliance, so was Germany of the other. A great manufacturing nation, she had also a wealth of raw material, especially since the annexation of the Lorraine iron fields after the 1870 war. But the stoppage of outside supplies must be a handicap in a long war, increasing with its duration, and serious from the outset in such tropical products as rubber. Moreover, Germany's main coal and iron fields lay dangerously close to her frontier, in Silesia on the east and in Westphalia and Lorraine on the west. Thus for the Central Alliance a quick decision and an offensive war were more essential than for the Entente. Similarly, financial resources had been calculated on a short war basis, and all the continental powers relied mainly on large gold reserves accumulated specially for war purposes. Britain alone had no such war chest, but she was to prove that the strength of her banking system and the wealth distributed among a great commercial people furnished the sinews of war in a way that few pre-war economists had realized. If the economic forces were neglected in the war calculations of the powers, the psychological forces were an unexplored region, except in their purely military aspect. And even here little study had been devoted to the moral element compared with the physical element. Arden Dupic, a soldier philosopher who fell in the 1870 war, had stripped battle of its aura of heroic fictions, portraying the reaction of normal men in the presence of danger. Several German critics had described from experience the reality of battle morale as shown in 1870 and had deduced how tactics should be based on the ever-present and balancing elements of fear and courage. At the close of the century a French military thinker, Colonel Fock, had demonstrated how great was the influence of the moral element in the higher sphere of command, although his teaching was concerned rather with fortifying the will of the commander than with unhinging the will of the opponent. But only the surface of the subject had been penetrated. Its civil aspects were untouched and in the opening weeks of the conflict the general misunderstanding of national psychology was to be shown in the muzzling of the press, in Britain due mainly to Kitchener, followed by the equally stupid practice of issuing communiques which so veiled the truth that public opinion became distrustful of all official news and rumour was loosed on its infinitely more damaging course. The true value of wisely calculated publicity and the application of the propaganda weapon were only to be learned after many blunders. Three, the rival war plans and historical survey the German plan must justly take priority, for not only was it the mainspring which set in motion the hands of the war clock in 1914, but it may even be said to have governed the course of the war thereafter. It is true that, from the autumn of 1914 onwards, this course outwardly seemed to be of the nature of a stupendous siege of the central powers, an idea incompatible with the terms we have used. But the conception of the Germanic alliance as a besieged party, although true of the economic sphere, suggests a loss of initiative which their strategy contradicts. Although the initial German plan miscarried, 
even in its failure it dictated the general trend of operations thereafter. Tactically, most of the fighting resembled siege operations, but the actual strategy on land long erred rather by its disregard of these tactical conditions than by its conformity with them. The Germans were faced with the problem that the combined forces of themselves and Austria were decidedly inferior to those of France and Russia. To offset this adverse balance, however, they had a central position and the anticipation that Russia's mobilization would be too slow to allow her to exert serious pressure in the opening weeks. While this assumption might suggest a decisive blow at Russia before she was ready, it was equally probable that she would concentrate her main forces too far back for such a German blow to reach, and the experience of Napoleon was not an example to encourage an advance deep into the interior of Russia, with its vast distances and poor communications. The plan long since adopted by Germany was, therefore, to deliver a rapid offensive against France while holding the Russian advanced forces at bay, and later, when France was crushed, to deal with the Russian army. But this plan, in turn, was complicated by the great natural and artificial barriers which the French frontier offered to an invader. It was narrow, only some 150 miles across, and so afforded little room to maneuver or even to deploy the masses that Germany planned to launch against her foe. At the southeastern end it abutted on Switzerland, and after a short stretch of flat country known as the Gap of Belfort the frontier ran for 70 miles along the Vosges mountains. Behind and prolonging this natural rampart ran an almost continuous fortress system, based on Epinal, Toul, Verdun, and 20 miles beyond the last named lay not only the frontiers of Luxembourg and Belgium but the difficult Ardennes country. Apart from the strongly defended avenues of advance by Belfort and Verdun, the only feasible gap in this barrier was the true Eder charms between Epinal and Toul, left open originally as a strategic trap in which the Germans could be first caught and then crushed by a French counterstroke. Faced with such a mental and physical blank wall, the logical military course was to go round it, by a wide maneuver through Belgium. Graf Schlieffen chief of the German general staff from 1890 to 1905, conceived and developed the plan, by which the French armies were to be enveloped and a rapid decision gained, and as finally formulated it came into force in 1905. To attain its object Schlieffen's plan concentrated the mass of the German forces on the right wing for a gigantic wheel and designedly took risks by reducing the left wing, facing the French frontier, to the slenderest possible size. The swinging mass, pivoting on the fortified area Metzenville, was to consist of 53 divisions, backed up as rapidly as possible by land and air Zatz formations, while the secondary army on the left wing comprised only eight divisions. Its very weakness promised to aid the main blow in a further way, for if a French offensive pressed the left wing back towards the Rhine, the attack through Belgium on the French flank would be all the more difficult to parry. It would be like a revolving door, if a man pressed heavily on one side the other side would swing round and strike him in the back. Here lay the real subtlety of the plan, not in the mere geographical detour. The German enveloping mass was to sweep round through Belgium and northern France and, continuing to traverse a vast arc, would wheel gradually east. With its extreme right passing south of Paris and crossing the Seine near Rouen it would then press the French back towards the Moselle, where they would be hammered in rear on the anvil formed by the Lorraine fortresses and the Swiss frontier. Schlieffen's plan allowed ten divisions to hold the Russians in check while the French were being crushed. It is proof of his clear sight, if not of his long sight, that he counted on the intervention of Britain and allowed for an expeditionary force of 100,000 operating in conjunction with the French. To him also was due the scheme for using the land and ersatz troops in active operations and fusing the resources of the nation into the army. His dying words are reported to have been, it must come to a fight. Only make the right wing strong. Unhappily for Germany, his successor, Moltke the Younger, lacked his moral courage while sharing his disregard of international morality. Moltke retained Schlieffen's plan, but he whittled away the essential idea. 
of the nine new divisions which became available between 1905 and 1914 Moult collotted eight to the left wing and only one to the right. True, he added another from the Russian front, but this trivial increase was purchased at a heavy price, for the Russian army of 1914 was a more formidable menace than when Schlieffen's plan came into force. In the outcome two army corps were taken from the French theatre at the crisis of the August campaign, in order to reinforce the Eastern Front. Schlieffen's deathbed entreaty was lost on his successor. Moltke also made a change of great political significance in the plan. Schlieffen had intended that the right wing should deploy along not only the Belgian but also the Dutch frontier, as a far north as Griefeld. By crossing the strip of Dutch territory known as the Maastricht Appendix, it would be able to turn the flank of the Liege forts which barred the way through the narrow Belgian gateway north of the Ardennes. He hoped that German diplomacy might secure permission for this passage through Holland, and he did not wish to violate the territory of either Belgium or Holland if he could avoid the moral reproach. For it was his calculation that the undisguised deployment there of part of his force would so alarm the French as to induce them to cross the southern frontier of Belgium and occupy the natural defensive position in the Meuse Valley south of Namur. Thereby they would provide a pretext for his own advance into neutral territory. Even should this subtle trap fail, Schlieffen calculated that he would be able to capture Liege in time to avoid any check on his main advance. And he was willing to cut his margin of time so close as to afford German statecraft the fullest chance to escape the charge of rape. Such imaginative craft was beyond Moltke's capacity and he decided that Liege must be taken by a coup de main immediately after the outbreak of war. Thus for a fancied addition to military security he deliberately invited the condemnation of neutrals, provoked Belgium to resistance, and drew the weight of Britain into the scales against his own forces. Moltke's method of drawing the enemy was certainly the antithesis of Schlieffen's. And it is a glaring example of the dangers, even the military dangers, which may ensue if strategy is allowed to dominate policy. If the fault of the final German plan was a lack of courage, that of the French plan was due to an excess. In their case, also, a miasma of confused thought seemed to creep over the leadership in the years just before the war. Since the disasters of 1870, the French command had planned an initial defensive, based on the frontier fortresses followed by a decisive counter-stroke. To this end the great fortress system had been created and gaps like the true Eder charms left to canalize the invasion ready for the counter. But in the decade before 1914 a new school of thought had risen, who argued that the offensive was more in tune with French character and tradition, that the possession of the 75-a field gun unique in mobility and rapidity of fire, made it tactically possible and that the alliance with Russia and Britain made it strategically possible. Forgetful of the lessons of 1870 they imagined that Elan was proof against bullets. Napoleon's much quoted saying that the moral is to the physical as three to one has much to answer for, it has led soldiers to think that a division exists between the two, whereas each is dependent on the other. Weapons without courage are ineffective but so also are the bravest troops without sufficient weapons to protect them and their morale. Courage soon oozes when soldiers lose confidence in their weapons. The outcome was disastrous. The new school, who found their profit in Colonel de Grandmisson, found in General Joffre, appointed chief of the general staff in 1912, a lever for their designs. Under the cloak of his authority, the advocates of the offensive outrance gained control of the French military machine, and, throwing aside the old doctrine, formulated the now famous, or notorious, Plan 17. It was based on a negation of historical experience, indeed, of common sense, and on a double miscalculation, of force and place, the latter more serious than the former. Accepting the possibility that the Germans might employ their reserve formations at the outset, the strength of the German army in the west was estimated at a possible maximum of 68 infantry divisions. The Germans actually deployed the equivalent of 83, counting Lander and Erzat's troops. But French opinion was, and continued to be, doubtful of this contingency, 
so much so that during the crucial days when the rival armies were concentrating and moving forward the French intelligence counted only the 45 active divisions in its estimates of the enemy strength, a miscalculation by half. If the plan had been framed on a miscalculation less extreme, this recognition does not condone but rather increases its fundamental falsity, for history affords no vestige of justification for a plan by which a frontal offensive was to be launched with bare equality of force against an enemy who would have the support of his fortified frontier zone, while the attackers forswore any advantage from their own. The second miscalculation, of place was that although the possibility of a German move through Belgium was recognized, the wideness of its sweep was utterly misjudged. The Germans were expected complacently to take the difficult route through the Ardennes in order that the French might conveniently smite their communications. Based on the idea of an immediate and general offensive, the plan ordained a thrust by the first and second armies towards the Saar into Lorraine. On their left were the 3rd Army opposite Metz and the 5th Army facing the Ardennes, which were either to take up the offensive between Metz and Thunville, or, if the Germans came through Luxembourg and Belgium, to strike northeast at their flank. The 4th Army was held in strategic reserve near the centre and two groups of reserve divisions were disposed in rear of either flank. Relegation to such a passive role expressing French opinion on the capacity of reserve formations. Britain's contingent share in this plan was settled less by calculation than by the Europeanization of her military organization during the previous decade. This continental influence drew her insensibly into a tacit acceptance of the role of acting as an appendix to the French left wing, and away from her historic exploitation of the mobility given by sea power. At a council of war on August 5, Sir John French, who was to command the expeditionary force, expressed a doubt of the pre-arranged plan, and, as an alternative, suggested its dispatch to Belgium, where it would have stiffened the Belgian resistance and threatened the flank of the wheeling German mass. Haig seems to have had a similar view. But the plan did not provide for variation, and in any case the general staff, through Henry Wilson, had virtually pledged themselves to act in direct cooperation with the French. When the general staffs of the two countries conducted their informal negotiations between 1905 and 1914, they were paving the way for a reversal of England's centuries-old policy for a war effort such as no Englishman had ever conceived. Lord Kitchener, who had just been made war minister in the emergency had a remarkably accurate intuition of the German plan and tried to avert the danger by advocating that the expeditionary force should concentrate near Amiens, where it would be less exposed. But French was now in accord with Wilson, and his vehement support of the French plan induced Kitchener to give way, later he lamented his consent as a mistaken weakness. Kitchener, however, gave French instructions which, designed to reduce the risks, were in the issue to complicate and even to increase them. For while French's assigned purpose was to support, and cooperate with, the French army, it was qualified by the somewhat contradictory statement that the gravest consideration will devolve upon you as to participation. Where your force may be unduly exposed. Further, you will in no case come in any sense under the orders of any allied general. The smoothness and secrecy with which the expeditionary force moved to France, the main part between August 12th and 17th, was a testimony to the transport arrangements and counter espionage measures, if still more to the short sightedness of the Germans. Not merely did their intelligence service fail to gain news of the British expeditionary force until it was actually encountered but the Supreme Command showed little concern with its whereabouts. When Moltke was asked if he desired the Navy to interfere with the passage of the British troops, he showed no enthusiasm for the idea, saying that it would be indeed splendid if the army in the West could settle with the 160,000 English at the same time as with the other enemies. In their pedantic adherence to the principle of concentration both the general staff and the naval staff ignored the importance of distraction. And each remained in its own narrow compartment, with little interest in what the other was doing and less desire to communicate its own intentions. The general staff's mind was fixed on the aim of a decisive battle, without a thought for the channel port, the detachments it made, 
so fateful in their effect, were for the negative purpose of protecting its own march, and not to embarrass the enemy. The naval staff's dominant idea was to keep the fleet concentrated in the North Sea, ready for eventualities but with little concern to influence events. Its positive action was limited to sending out a few submarines in a half-hearted manner. The idea of a landing on the English coast, or even a feint, does not seem to have been considered, although the mere possibility sufficed to detain a considerable part of Britain's military strength. Nor had the general staff made plans for embarrassing Britain at long range by encouraging native risings. A swift victory over the main armies in the main theatre of war was the German general staff's solution for all outside difficulties, and absolved them from thinking of war in its wider aspects. On the Russian front, the plans of campaign were more fluid, less elaborately worked out and formulated, although they were to be as kaleidoscopic in their changes of fortune as in the Western theatre. The calculable condition was geographical, the main incalculable. Russia's rate of concentration. Russian Poland was a vast tongue of country projecting from Russia proper, and flanked on three sides by German or Austrian territory. On its northern flank lay East Prussia with the Baltic Sea beyond. On its southern flank lay the Austrian province of Galicia with the Carpathian Mountains to the south, guarding the approach to the plain of Hungary. On the west lay Silesia. As the Germanic border provinces were provided with a network of strategic railways whilst Poland, as well as Russia itself, had only a sparse system of communications, the Germanic alliance enjoyed a great advantage, in power of concentration, for countering a Russian advance. But if its armies took the offensive, the farther they progressed into Poland or Russia proper the more would they lose this advantage. Hence their most profitable strategy was to lure Russians into a position favorable for a counter-stroke rather than to inaugurate an offensive themselves. The one drawback was that such a punic strategy gave the Russians time to concentrate and set in motion their cumbrous and rusty machine. From this arose an initial cleavage between German and Austrian opinion. Both agreed that the problem was to hold the Russians in check during the six weeks which must elapse before the Germans should have crushed France and so could switch their forces eastwards to join the Austrians in a decisive blow against the Russians. The difference of opinion turned on the method. The Germans, intent on a decision against France, wished to leave a minimum force in the east, and only a political dislike of exposing national territory to invasion prevented them from evacuating East Prussia and standing on the Vistula line. But the Austrians, under the influence of Konrad von Hotzendorf, chief of their general staff, were anxious to throw the Russian machine out of gear by an immediate offensive, and, as this promised to keep the Russians fully occupied while the campaign in France was being decided, Moltke fell in with this strategy. Conrad's plan was that of an offensive northwards into Poland by two armies, protected by two more on their right, farther east. The two attacking armies would then wheel eastwards and all four would join hands in driving the Russians back towards the Black Sea. Complementary to this plan, as originally designed, the Germans in East Prussia were to strike southeast, the two forces converging to cut off the Russian advanced forces in the Polish tongue. But Moltke failed to provide sufficient German troops for this offensive thrust. Conrad's own offensive was to be impaired by the combination of a variable state of mind with an inelastic basis of movement. The Austrian forces had been divided into three parts, echelon A, 28 divisions, for deployment on the Russian front, minimum Balkan, 8 divisions, for deployment on the Serbian front, echelon B, 12 divisions for use according to circumstances. The plan thus had more adaptability, on paper, than those of other armies, unfortunately, the instrument was not equal to the intention. Conrad's desire to settle with Serbia led him to begin moving Echelon B thither, despite the likelihood of Russia's intervention. Then, on July 31st, he changed his mind and decided to stop it but the chief of the field railways informed him that if utter confusion was to be avoided he must allow B to go to its original destination on the Danube frontier, and from there it could be transported to Galicia. As a result, 
its withdrawal from the Danube impaired the offensive against Serbia without helping that against Russia, for which it arrived too late. Thus a conflict of purpose in the Austrian command accentuated the ill effects of a conflict of interests between Austria and her ally. On the opposing side also, the desires of one ally vitally affected the strategy of the other. The Russian command, both for military and for racial motives, wished to concentrate first against Austria, while the latter was unsupported, and leave Germany alone until later, when the full strength of the Russian army would be mobilized. But the French, anxious to relieve the German pressure against themselves, urged the Russians to deliver a simultaneous attack against Germany, and persuaded the Russians to consent to an extra offensive for which they were ready neither in numbers nor in organization. On the southwestern front two pairs of two armies each were to converge on the Austrian forces in Galicia, on the northwestern front two armies were to converge on the German forces in East Prussia. Russia whose proverbial slowness and crude organization dictated a cautious strategy, was about to break with tradition and launch out on a gamble that only an army of high mobility and organization could have hoped to bring off. When put to the test, the plans of all the military commanders would quickly collapse. At a superficial examination, the fault would seem due to divided purposes in the minds of the leaders, to their failure to maintain the principle of concentration with which they had been indoctrinated. It is easy to point out how they failed in this way, many books by military experts have done so. But such a judgment is too academic. The fact that the fault was common to all sides suggests a deeper explanation. Not one of the leaders was anything but a devout upholder of the principle of concentration in theory, the trouble came when they tried to apply it to reality to the political and tactical conditions in which strategy operates. Their failure to adapt their plans to the actual situation may be traced to the habit of mind formed in peace training, especially in war games and exercises, where battle was the ruling idea, the conventions too exclusively military, and the values too purely numerical. By treating concentration as a matter of assembling superior numbers, its dependence on the enemy's distraction and on freedom from external interference was too commonly obscured. Peace training tended towards solutions that were idealistic rather than realistic. For war, like politics, is a series of compromises. Hence, the need of adaptation should be foreseen, the power of adjustment developed, in the pre-war preparation. This was rare among the staff-trained leaders of 1914. They had been brought up on a diet of theory, supplemented by scraps of history cooked to suit the prevailing taste, not on the experience contained in real history. For this to be attainable a critical mind is the first requirement, but such a faculty was frowned on by the military tradition of the 19th century, although marked in many great leaders of the 18th century. For 1914, the clinched German invasion of France was designed as a methodical sweep in which unexpected checks should not upset the timetable. The railway system in Germany had been developed under military guidance and supervision, so strict that not even a narrow gauge line or road rail could be laid without the approval of the chief of the general staff. As a result the number of double lines running to the western frontier had been increased from 9 to 13 between 1870 and 1914. On August 6 the great deployment began. 550 trains a day crossed the Rhine bridges, and by the 12th the seven German armies, 1,500,000 men, were ready to advance. Over the Hohenzollern bridge at Cologne a train passed about every 10 minutes during the first fortnight of war. This vast railway movement was a masterpiece of organization, but when the deployment, completed on August 17, merged into the forward march, the friction of war soon revealed weaknesses in the German military machine and its control. To meet the case of Belgian resistance, the German plan, as revised by Moltke, provided an instantly available detachment, under General von Emich, to clear a passage through the Meuse Gateway into the Belgian plain north of the Ardennes, ready for the ordered advance of the main armies concentrating behind the German frontier. The Ring Fortress of Liege commanded this channel of advance. But, after an initial check on August 5, a German brigade penetrated between the forts and occupied the town. 
The interest of this feat is that it was due to the initiative of an attached staff officer, Ludendorff, whose name Erlong was to be world famous. The forts themselves offered a stubborn resistance and forced the Germans to await the arrival of their heavy heitzers, whose destructive power was to be the first tactical surprise of the World War. The very success of the Belgians' early resistance cloaked the weight of the main German columns and misled the Allies' intelligence. The Belgian field army lay behind the Get covering Brussels and, even before the liege forts fell, the advanced guards of the German first and second armies were pressing against this line. The Belgians, deprived of support owing to the mistaken French plan and British conformity with it, decided to preserve their army by falling back on the entrenched camp of Antwerp, where its location would at least make it a latent menace to the German communications. The Germans, their immediate passage now clear, entered Brussels on August 20, and on the same day appeared before Namur, the last fortress barring the Meuse route into France. Despite the Belgian resistance the German advance was abreast of its timetable, but it might have been four or five days ahead. And if the Belgian withdrawal to a flank momentarily expedited, it ultimately hindered the German progress far more than any sacrifice in battle could have done. Meanwhile, away on the other flank, the French offensive had opened on August 7 with the advance of a detached army corps into Upper Alsace, a move intended partly as a military distraction and partly for its political effect. Its actual goal was the destruction of the German station at Baal and the Rhine bridges below. Soon brought to a halt, it was renewed on the 19th by a larger force under General Pau, which actually reached the Rhine. But the pressure of disasters elsewhere compelled the abandonment of the enterprise and the dissolution of the force, its units being dispatched westward as reinforcements. Meantime the main thrust into Lorraine by the French 1st, Dubail, and 2nd, de Castelno, armies, totaling 19 divisions had begun on August 14 and been shattered in the Battle of Morhange Sarabag, August 20, where the French discovered that the material could subdue the moral, and that in their enthusiasm for the offensive they had blinded themselves to the defensive power of modern weapons, a condition which was to throw out of balance the whole mechanism of orthodox warfare. Yet it is fair to add that this abortive French offensive had an indirect effect on the German plan, although this would hardly have occurred if Schlieffen or Ludendorff had been in charge at German headquarters instead of the vacillating opportunist Moltke. The fact that Moltke had almost doubled the strength of his left, compared with Schlieffen's plan, meant that it was unnecessarily strong for a yielding and enticing defensive such as Schlieffen had conceived, while lacking the superiority necessary for a crushing counter-offensive. But when the French attack in Lorraine developed and Moltke appreciated that the French were leaving their fortified barrier behind he was tempted momentarily to postpone the right-wing sweep, and instead seek a decision in Lorraine. This impulse led him to divert the other six newly formed ersatz divisions that should have been used to increase the weight of his right wing. He had hardly conceived this new plan before he abandoned it and, on August 16, reverted to Schlieffen's swing door design. But he also told his left wing commanders somewhat ambiguously that they must detain as many French troops as possible. And when the Crown Prince Ruprecht of Bavaria argued that he could only do this by attacking, Moltke left the decision to him. We may suspect that Ruprecht was loath to forfeit the opportunity of glory by retiring while the German Crown Prince was advancing. But nothing could have been more foolishly ambiguous than the Supreme Command's attitude. For when Ruprecht refused to refrain unless given a clear order, Moltke's deputy, Stein, said on the telephone to Kraft von Delmensingen, Ruprecht's chief of staff dash no, we won't oblige you by forbidding an attack. You must take the responsibility. Make your own decision as your conscience tells you. Conscience seems a curious basis for strategy. And when Kraft retorted, it is already made. We attack, Stein famously exclaimed, not really. Then strike and God be with you. Thus, instead of continuing to fall back and draw the French on, Ruprecht halted his Sixth Army on the 17th, ready to accept battle. Finding the French attack slow to develop, he planned to anticipate it by one of his own. 
he struck on August 20 in conjunction with the 7th Army, Heringen, on his left, but although the French were taken by surprise and rolled back from the line Mohan Sarabag, the German counterstroke had not the superiority of strength, the two armies now totaled 25 divisions, or of strategic position to make it decisive. Further, the attempt to envelop the French right flank by a movement through the Vosges was begun too late and failed. Thus the strategic result was merely to throw back the French onto a fortified barrier which both restored and augmented their power of resistance. And thereby they were enabled to dispatch troops to reinforce their western flank, a redistribution of strength which was to have far-reaching results in the decisive battle on the mound. With similar disregard of superior authority, the German Crown Prince, commanding the pivotal 5th Army between Metz and Thunville, attacked when he had been ordered to stand on the defensive. The lack of what Colonel Fock had termed intellectual discipline was to be a grave factor in Germany's failure, and for this the ambitions and jealousies of generals were to be largely responsible. While this seesaw campaign in Lorraine was in progress more decisive events were occurring to the northwest. The attack on Liege awakened Joffre to the reality of a German advance through Belgium, but not to the wideness of its sweep and the sturdy resistance of Liege confirmed him in the opinion that the German right would pass south of it, between the Meuse and the Ardennes. Plan 17 had visualized such a move, and prepared a counter. Grasping once more at phantoms, the French command embraced this idea so fervently that they transformed the counter into an imaginary coup de grace. Their third army, Ruffy, and the reserve fourth army, de Langle de Carry were to strike northeast through the Ardennes against the rear flank of the Germans advancing through Belgium, and thus dislocate their enveloping maneuver. The left wing, 5th, Army, under Lanrezac, was moved farther to the northwest into the angle formed by the Sambre and Meuse between Givet and Charleroi. With the British expeditionary force coming up on its left, it was to deal with the enemy's forces north of the Meuse and to converge on the supposed German main forces in conjunction with the attack through the Ardennes. Here was a pretty picture, of the Allied pincers closing on the unconscious Germans. Curiously, the Germans had the same idea of a pincer-like maneuver, with roles reversed, and with better reason. The fundamental flaw in the French plan was that the Germans had deployed twice as many troops as the French intelligence estimated, and for a vaster enveloping movement. For information, the French relied mainly on their cavalry, of which they had 100,000, but this enormous mass of cavalry discovered nothing of the enemy's advance. And the French armies were everywhere surprised. The French third and fourth armies, 20 divisions, pushing blindly into the Ardennes against a German center supposedly denuded of troops, blundered against the German 4th and 5th armies, 21 divisions, in a fog on August 22, and were heavily thrown back in encounter battles around Verton Neufjot. The troops attacked blindly with the bayonet and were mown down by machine guns. Fortunately the Germans were also too vague as to the situation to exploit their opportunity. But to the northwest the French 5th Army, 10 divisions, and the British, 4 divisions, had, under Joffre's orders, put their head almost into the German noose. The German masses of the 1st and 2nd Armies were closing on them from the north, and the 3rd Army from the east, a total of 34 divisions. Lanrezac alone had an inkling of the hidden menace. All along he had suspected the wideness of the German maneuver, and it was through his insistence that his army had been permitted to move so far northwest. It was due to his caution in hesitating to advance across the Samba, to the arrival of the British on his left unknown to the German intelligence, and to the premature attack of the German Second Army that the Allied forces fell back in time and escaped from the trap. The retreat to the Marne. The first four British divisions, after concentrating near Morberge, had moved up to Mons on August 22, ready to advance farther into Belgium as part of the offensive of the Allied left wing. On arrival, however, Sir John French heard that Lanrezac had been attacked on the 21st and deprived of the crossings of the Samba. Although thus placed in an exposed forward position, 
he agreed to stand at Mons to cover Lanrizak's left. But next day, the 23rd, Lanrizak had word of the imminent fall of Namur and of the appearance of the German Third Army, Horsen, on his exposed right flank near Dinant, on the Meuse. In consequence, he gave orders for a retreat that night. The British, after resisting the attacks of six German divisions during the day, fell back on the 24th in conformity with their allies. Not a moment too soon in view of the fact that the rest of the German First Army was marching still farther westward to envelop their open left flank. Too, but if the British had begun to retreat later than the Allies, they continued faster and further. This less happy effect was mainly due to Sir John French's sudden revulsion of mind and emotion. He had gone forward almost too eager to fulfill the task given in Kitchener's instructions. He came back with his mind concentrated on the qualifying clause. And the change was due more to the French than to the Germans. The trouble began when Lan Rizak, irritated by Joff's blindness to the close looming danger, vented on his newly arrived neighbor the indignation he could not show to his superior. This feeling was illustrated in the greeting which Lan Rizak's chief of staff gave to Huguet, who came with French to visit Lan Rizak. At last you're here. It's not a moment too soon. If we are beaten we shall owe it all to you. And when French, on being excitedly told that the Germans had reached the Meuse at Huey, inquired what they were likely to do, Lanrezak irascibly replied Dash why have they come there? Oh, to fish in the river. The sarcasm was modified in translation. But even French's ignorance of the French language could not prevent him understanding the impatience and rudeness which Lanrizac showed in their discussion. Quick to resent this, his resentment changed to alarm disgust when he found that the French had retired and left him isolated. Henceforward his mind was obsessed with the idea that they had left him in the lurch, and he thought of leaving them. The experience of the next few days hardened his thought of retiring independently to Avara, that to fortify himself in the peninsula with a modern version of the lines of Torres Vedras. From this disastrous intention he was dissuaded by Wilson's playful cajolery as well as by Kitchener's urgent and less tactful intervention, but still more by the turn of events. The hurried recoil of the French left wing had at last awakened Joffre to the true situation and to the utter collapse of Plan 17. From the wreckage he now tried to piece together a new plan. He decided to swing back his center and left, with Verdun as the pivot, while drawing troops from the right in Alsace and forming a fresh Sixth Army on his left to enable the retiring armies to return to the offensive. His optimism, soon to wane, might have been again misplaced but for German mistakes. The first was Moltke's folly in detaching seven divisions to invest more Burge and give it and watch Antwerp instead of using Lander and Erzat's troops as Schlieffen had intended. More ominous still was his decision on August 25 to send four divisions to check the Russian advance in East Prussia. These also were taken from the right wing, actually from the force besieging Namur. And the excuse afterwards given was that the German command thought that the decisive victory had already been won. Further, the German command lost touch with the advancing armies three and the movements of these became disjointed. The British two course stand at Lacat, made by Smith Doyen against his superior's wish, and Lanrizac's riposte at Guise, in which French forbade his I caught a help, were also factors in checking the German enveloping wing, and each had still greater indirect effects. For Lacat apparently convinced the German first army commander, Cluck that the British army could be wiped from the slate, and Guy's led Bullo, 2nd Army, to call on Cluck for support, whereupon Cluck wheeled inwards, thinking to roll up the French left. The idea of a sedan was an obsession with the Germans, and led them to pluck the fruit before it was ripe. This premature wheel before Paris had been reached was an abandonment of the Schlieffen plan and exposed the German right to a counter-envelopment. This rash movement was in progress when Moltke also sacrificed the conception of Schlieffen to the dream of Sedan, in a different sector. His centre and left were ordered to close like pincers round either side of Verdun, while the right wing was to turn outwards and face Paris as a shield to these pincers. 
This sudden reversal of direction and inversion of roll was akin to the folly of a driver who jams on his brakes and slews his front wheels hard round on a greasy road. One further factor must be mentioned, perhaps the most significant of all, the Germans had advanced so rapidly, outranking their timetable, that their supplies failed to keep pace, so that the fatigue of the troops was increased by hunger. For indeed, when the chance of battle came, their fighting power was practically numbed by physical exhaustion, a condition much aggravated by the thorough demolitions which the French had carried out as they fell back. Thus, in sum, so much grit had worked into the German machine that a slight jar would suffice to cause its breakdown. This was delivered in the Battle of the Marne. The tide turns. The opportunity was perceived, not by Joffre, who had ordered a continuance of the retreat, but by Gallini, the military governor of Paris, where the newly formed Sixth Army had assembled in shelter. On September 3, Gallini realized the meaning of clock's wheel inwards, directed the Sixth Army, Monnery, to be ready to strike at the exposed German right flank, and the next day with difficulty won Joffre's sanction. Once convinced, Joffre acted with decision. The whole left wing was ordered to turn about and return to a general offensive beginning on September 6. Monnery was already off the mark on the 5th and, as his pressure developed on the Germans' sensitive flank, Clark was constrained to draw off first one part and then the remaining part of his army to support his threatened flank guard. Thereby a 30-mile gap was created between Clark's and Bullough's armies, a gap covered only by a screen of cavalry. Clark was emboldened to take the risk because of the rapid retreat of the British opposite, and still with their backs to this scaping sector. Even on the 5th, when the French on either flank were turning about, the British continued a further day's march to the south. But in this disappearance lay the unintentional cause of victory. For when the British retraced their steps, it was the report of their columns advancing into the gap which, on September 9, led Bullough to order the retreat of his army. The superficial advantage which Cluck's first army, already isolated by its own act, had gained over Mornery was thereby nullified, and it fell back the same day. By the 11th the retreat had extended, independently or under orders from Moltke, to all the German armies. The attempt at a partial envelopment, pivoting on Verdun, had already failed, the jaw formed by the 6th and 7th armies merely breaking its teeth on the defences of the French eastern frontier. The attack by Ruprecht's Sixth Army on the Grand Coron, covering Nancy, was a particularly costly failure. It is difficult to see how the German command could have reasonably pinned their faith on achieving as an improvised expedient the very task which, in cool calculation before the war, had appeared so hopeless as to lead them to take the momentous decision to advance through Belgium as the only feasible alternative. Thus, in sum, the Battle of the Marne was decided by a jar and a crack. The jar administered by Mornery's attack on the German right flank causing a crack in a weak joint of the German line, and the penetration of this physical crack in turn producing a moral crack in the German commands. The result was a strategic but not tactical defeat and the German right wing was able to reunit and stand firmly on the line of the Aisne. That the Allies were not able to draw greater advantage from their victory was due in part to the comparative weakness of Mornery's flank attack, and in part to the failure of the British and the French Fifth Army, now under French Edespera E, to drive rapidly through the gap while it was open. Their direction of advance was across a region intersected by frequent rivers and this handicap was intensified by a want of impulsion on the part of their chiefs, each politely looking to his neighbour and timorously, to his own flanks. Their feelings can best be described by the apt verse Lord Chatham with his sword undrawn kept waiting for Sir Richard Strachan Sir Richard, longing to be at M. Kept waiting too, for whom? Lord Chatham. It seems, too, that greater results might have come if more effort had been made, as Gallini urged, to strike at the German rear flank instead of the front and to direct reinforcements to the northwest of Paris for this purpose. This view is strengthened by the sensitiveness shown by the German command to reports of landings on the Belgian coast, which might threaten their communications. 
the alarm caused by these reports had even led the German command to contemplate a withdrawal of their right wing before the Battle of the Marne was launched. When the moral effect of these phantom forces is weighed with the material effect, the detention of German forces in Belgium, caused by fears of a Belgian sortie from Antwerp, the balance of judgment would seem to turn heavily in favor of the alternative which French had tentatively suggested. By it the British expeditionary force might have had not merely an indirect but a direct influence on the struggle, and might have made the issue not merely negatively but positively decisive. But, considering the Battle of the Marne as it shaped, the fact that 27 Allied divisions were pitted against 13 German divisions on the decisive flank is evidence, first, of how completely Moltke had lapsed from Schlieffen's intention, second, of how well Joff had reshuffled his forces under severe pressure, third, of how such a large balance afforded scope for a wider envelopment than was actually attempted. The frontal pursuit was checked on the A line before Joff. On September 17, seeing that Mornery's attempts to overlap the German flank were ineffectual, decided to form a fresh army under de Castel now for a maneuver round and behind the German flank. By then the German armies had recovered cohesion, and the German command was expecting and ready to meet such a maneuver, now the obvious course. The Allied chiefs, however, if cautious in action were incautious in speculation. Critics may complain that they were not sufficiently ingenious, but they were certainly ingenuous. Wilson and Berthelot, the guiding brains of French and Joffre, were discussing on September 12 the probable date when they would cross the German frontier. Wilson modestly estimated it at four weeks hence, Berthelot thought that he was pessimistic and reckoned on reaching the frontier a week earlier. Flux and stagnation. Unhappily for their calculations, on the AI was re emphasized the preponderant power of defense over attack, primitive as were the trench lines compared with those of later years. Then followed, as the only alternative, the successive attempts of either side to overlap and envelop the other's western flank, a phase known popularly, but inaccurately, as the race to the sea. This common design brought out what was to be a new and dominating strategical feature the lateral switching of reserves by railway from one part of the front to another. Before it could reach its logical and lateral conclusion, a new factor intervened. Antwerp, with the Belgian field army, was still a thorn in the German side, and Falkenhayn, who had succeeded Moltke on September 14, determined to reduce it while a German cavalry force swept across to the Belgian coast as an extension of the enveloping wing in France. One of the most amazing features, and blunders, of the war on the German side is that while the Allied armies were in full retreat, Moltke had made no attempt to secure channel ports, which lay at his mercy. The British had evacuated Calais, Boulogne and the whole coast as far as Avra, even transferred their base to Estinazer on the Bay of Biscay, a step which not only revealed the measure of their pessimism but delayed the arrival of the reinforcing 6th Division until the German front had hardened on the a -Ine. And, during the Allied retreat, German Allans had roamed at will over the northwest of France, settled down in Amiens as if they were permanent lodgers, yet left the essential ports in tranquil isolation. The supreme command was so mesmerized by its clause which see in dogma dash we have only one means in war, the battle dash that it could see no purpose in securing the spoils before it had won the decisive battle. A month later the Germans were to sacrifice tens of thousands of their men in the abortive effort to gain what they could have secured initially without cost. We must pause here to pick up the thread of operations in Belgium from the moment when the Belgian field army fell back to Antwerp divergently from the main line of operations. On August 24 the Belgians began a sortie against the rear of the German right wing to ease the pressure on the British and French left wing, then engaged in the opening battle at Mons and along the Samba. The sortie was broken off on the 25th when news came of the Franco-British retreat into France, but the pressure of the Belgian army, six divisions, led the Germans to detach four reserve divisions besides Thriland brigades, to hold it in check. On September 7 the Belgian command learnt that the Germans were dispatching part of this force to the front in France, in consequence King Albert launched a fresh sortie on September 9, 
the crucial day of the battle on the Marne. The action was taken unsolicited by Joffre, who seems to have shown curiously little interest in possibilities outside his immediate battle zone. The sortie led the Germans to cancel the dispatch of one division and to delay that of two others to France, but the Belgians were soon thrown back. Nevertheless the news of it seems to have had a distinct moral effect on the German command, coinciding as it did with the initiation of the retreat of their first and second armies from the Marne. And the unpleasant reminder that Antwerp lay menacingly close to their communications induced the Germans to undertake, preliminary to any fresh attempt at a decisive battle, the reduction of the fortress and the seizure of potential English landing places along the Belgian coast. The menace to Britain, if the Channel ports fell into German hands, was obvious. It is a strange reflection that, inverting the German mistake, the British command should hitherto have neglected to guard against the danger, although the First Lord of the Admiralty, Winston Churchill, had urged the necessity even before the Battle of the Marne. When the German guns began the bombardment of Antwerp on September 28 England awakened, and gave belated recognition to Churchill's strategic insight. He was allowed to send a brigade of marines and two newly formed brigades of naval volunteers to reinforce the defenders, while the regular 7th Division and 3rd Cavalry Division, under Orlinson, were landed at Ostend and Zebra for an overland move to raise the siege. Eleven territorial divisions were available in England, but, in contrast to the German attitude, Kitchener considered them still unfitted for an active role. The meagre reinforcement delayed but could not prevent, the capitulation of Antwerp, October 10, and Rawlinson's relieving force was too late to do more than cover the escape of the Belgian field army down the Flanders coast. Yet, viewed in the perspective of history, this first and last effort in the West to make use of Britain's amphibious power applied a break to the German advance down the coast which just stopped their second attempt to gain a decision in the West. It gained time for the arrival of the main British force, transferred from the a to the new left of the Allied line, and if their heroic defence at Ypres, aided by the French and Belgians along the Isar to the sea, was the human barrier to the Germans, it succeeded by so narrow a margin that the Antwerp expedition must be adjudged the saving factor. How had the main battleground come to be shifted from France to Flanders? The month following the Battle of the Marne had been marked by an extremely obvious series of attempts by each side to turn the opponent's western flank. On the German side this pursuit of an opening was soon replaced by a subtler plan, but the French persevered with a straightforward obstinacy curiously akin to that of their original plan. By September 24, de Castelnau's outflanking attempt had come to a stop on the Somme. Next, a newly formed 10th Army under de Maud Huey, tried a little farther north, beginning on October 2, but instead of being able to pass round the German flank soon found itself struggling desperately to hold Arras. The British expeditionary force was then in course of transfer northwards from the Aisne, in order to shorten its communications with England, and Joffre determined to use it as part of a third effort to turn the German flank. To coordinate this new manoeuvre he appointed General Fock as his deputy in the north. Fock continued Joff's efforts to induce the Belgians to join this wheeling mass, but King Albert with more caution, or more realism, declined to abandon the coastal district for an advance inland that he considered rash. It was. For on October 14, four days after the fall of Antwerp, Falkenhayn planned a strategic trap for the next allied outflanking maneuver which he foresaw would follow. One army, composed of troops transferred from Lorraine, was to hold the expected allied offensive in check while another, composed of troops released by the fall of Antwerp and of four newly raised corps, was to sweep down the Belgian coast and crush in the flank of the attacking allies. He even held back the troops pursuing the Belgians in order not to alarm the Allied command prematurely. Meanwhile, the new Allied advance was developing piecemeal, as corps detrained from the south and swung eastwards to form a progressively extended scythe. The British Expeditionary Force, now three corps five strong, deployed in turn between La Bassie and Ypres, where it effected a junction with Rawlinson's force. 
Beyond it the embryo of a new French 8th Army was taking shape, and the Belgian continued the line along the Isar to the sea. Although the British right and centre corps had already been held up, Sir John French, discounting even the underestimate of the German strength furnished by his intelligence, ordered his left corps, Haag, to begin the offensive from Ypres towards Bruges. The effort was still born, for it coincided with the opening of the German offensive, on October 20, but for a day or two Sir John French persisted in the belief that he was attacking while his troops were barely holding their ground. Six. When enlightenment came he swung to the other extreme and anxiously urged the construction of a huge entrenched camp near Boulogne to take the whole expeditionary force. But his recurrent desire to retreat was overborne by the greater willpower, and perhaps the more consistent self-delusion of Fock, who by flattering deference, as well as forceful personality, had now gained a strong influence over French. And French's regard was increased when Fock let him know privately that Kitchener had proposed, in imagined privacy, to replace him by Sir Ian Hamilton. Too often in this war did the leaders fight each other while the troops fought the foe. The failure of the higher commanders to grasp the situation left the real handling of the battle to Haig and his divisional commanders and they for want of reserves could do little more than cement the crumbling parts of the front, by scraping reserves from other parts and encourage the exhausted but indomitable troops to hold on. Thus Ypres was essentially, like Inkerman, a soldier's battle. Already, since the 18th, the Belgians on the Zay had suffered growing pressure which threatened a disaster that was ultimately averted, by the end of the month, through the opening of the sluices and the flooding of the coastal area. At Ypres the crisis came later and was repeated, October 31st and November 11th marking the turning points of the struggle. That the Allied line, though battered and terribly strained, was in the end unbroken was due to the dogged resistance of the British and the timely arrival of French reinforcements. This defence of Ypres is in a dual sense the supreme memorial to the British regular army for here its officers and men showed the inestimable value of the disciplined morale and unique standard of musketry which were the fruit of long training, and here was their tombstone. From failing hands they threw the torch to the new armies rising in England to the call of country. With the continental powers the merging of normal international armies was the natural product of their system of universal service. But with Britain it was revolution, not evolution. With a supreme flash of vision Kitchener had grasped, in contrast to governments and general staffs alike, the probable duration of the struggle. More questionably, he decided that it meant the abandonment of Britain's traditional strategy of semi-detachment, and, donning the continental habit of thought, took the view that Britain could only exercise a decisive influence through the creation of mass armies. The people of Britain responded to his call to arms and poured into the recruiting stations. By the end of the year nearly one million men had enlisted, and the British Empire had altogether two million under arms. Having decided on this vast expansion, Kitchener chose to build a new framework rather than to use the existing territorial foundation. It is fair to point out that the territorial force was enlisted for home defence and that, initially, its members' acceptance of a wider role was voluntary. But the duplication of forces and of organization was undoubtedly a source of delay and waste of effort. Kitchener has also been reproached for his reluctance to replace the voluntary system by conscription, but this criticism overlooks how deeply rooted was the voluntary system in British institutions, and the slowness with which lasting changes can be effected in them. If Kitchener's method was characteristic of the man, it was characteristic of England. If it was unmethodical, it was calculated to impress most vividly on the British people the gulf between their gladiatorial wars of the past and the national war to which they were committed. It took even longer to impress the British military mind, as represented by general headquarters in France. Henry Wilson wrote that Kitchener's ridiculous and preposterous army of 25 corps is the laughing stock of every soldier in Europe. Under no circumstances could these mobs take the field for two years. Then what is the use of them? For by his calculation the British army was almost due to arrive in Berlin. While a psychological landmark, 
the Battle of Ypres is also a military landmark. 4. With the repulse of the German attempt to break through, the trench barrier was consolidated from the Swiss frontier to the sea. The power of modern defense had triumphed over attack, and stalemate ensued. The military history of the Franco-British alliance during the next four years is a story of the attempts to upset this deadlock, either by forcing the barrier or by haphazardly finding a way round dot on the Eastern Front. However, the greater distances and the greater differences between the equipment of the armies ensure the fluidity which was lacking in the West. Trench lines might form, but they were no more than a hard crust covering a liquid expanse. To break the crust was not difficult, and, once it was broken, mobile operations of the old style became possible. This freedom of action was denied to the Western powers, but Germany, because of her central position, had an alternative choice, and from November, 1914, onwards, Falkenhayn adopted, although for his own part unwillingly, a defensive in France while seeking to cripple the power of Russia. The Russian Front the opening encounters in the East had been marked by rapid changes of fortune rather than by any decisive advantage. The Austrian command had detached part of their strength in an abortive attempt to crush Serbia. And their plan for an initial offensive to cut off the Polish tongue was further crippled by the fact that the German part of the pincers did not operate. It was indeed being menaced by a Russian pair of pincers instead, for the Russian commander in chief, the Grand Duke Nicholas had urged his first and second armies to invade East Prussia without waiting to complete their concentration, in order to ease the pressure on his French allies. As the Russians had more than a two-to-one superiority, a combined attack had every chance of crushing the Germans between the two armies. On August 17, Rennenkampf's first army, six and a half divisions and five cavalry divisions, crossed the East Prussian frontier, and on August 19 to 20 met and threw back the bulk, seven divisions and one cavalry division, of Pritwitz's 8th Army at Gumbinnen. On August 21 Pritwitz heard that the Russian 2nd Army, 10 divisions and three cavalry divisions, under Samsonov had crossed the southern frontier of East Prussia, in his rear, which was guarded by only three divisions. In panic Pritwitz momentarily spoke on the telephone of falling back behind the Vistula, whereupon Moltke superseded him by a retired general, Hindenburg, to whom was appointed, as chief of staff, Ludendorff, the hero of the liege attack. Developing a plan which, with the necessary movements, had been already initiated by Colonel Hoffman of the 8th Army Staff. Ludendorff concentrated some six divisions against Samsonov's left wing. This force, inferior in strength to the Russians, could not have been decisive, but finding the trend and camp was still near Gumbinnen, Ludendorff took the calculated risk of withdrawing the rest of the German troops, except the cavalry screen, from that front, and bringing them back against Samsonov's right wing. This daring move was aided by the folly of the Russian commanders in sending out unciphered wireless orders, to which the Germans listened in. Under the converging pressure, Samsonov's flanks collapsed. His center was surrounded, and his army almost destroyed. If the opportunity was presented rather than created, this brief campaign and its sequel, afterwards christened the Battle of Tannenberg, is a significant example of the use of what are technically called interior lines dash more simply, a central position. Then, receiving his two fresh army corps from the French front, the German commander turned on the slow advancing Rennenkampf, and drove him out of East Prussia. As a result of these battles Russia had lost a quarter of a million men and, what she could afford still less, much war material. But the invasion of East Prussia had at least, by causing the dispatch of two corps from the west, helped to make possible the French recovery on the Man. And, with peculiar irony, these corps had arrived too late to be of service at Tannenberg. But the effect of Tannenberg was diminished because, away on the southern front, in Galicia, the scales had tilted against the Central Powers. The offensive of the Austrian 1st and 4th armies into Poland had at first made progress 
but this was nullified by the onslaught of the Russian 3rd and 8th armies upon the weaker 2nd and 3rd armies which were guarding the Austrian right flank. These armies were heavily defeated, August 26-30th, and driven back through Lemberg. The advance of the Russian left wing thus threatened the rear of the victorious Austrian left wing. Conrad tried to swing part of his left round, in turn, against the Russian flank, but this blow was parried. And then, caught, with his forces disorganized, by the renewed advance of the Russian right wing, he was forced on September 11 to extricate himself by a general retreat, falling back almost to Krakow by the end of September. Austria's plight compelled the Germans to send aid, and the bulk of the force in East Prussia was formed into a new Ninth Army and switched south to the southwest corner of Poland, whence it advanced on Warsaw in combination with a renewed Austrian offensive. But the Russians were now approaching the full tide of their mobilized strength, regrouping their forces and counter-attacking, they drove back the advance and followed it up by a powerful effort to invade Silesia. The Grand Duke Nicholas formed a huge phalanx of seven armies, three in the van and two protecting either flank. A further army, the 10th, had invaded the eastern corner of East Prussia and was engaging the weak German forces there. Allied helps rose high as the much heralded Russian steamroller, of sixty massed divisions, began its ponderous advance. To counter it the German Eastern Front was placed under Hindenburg, for whom Ludendorff and Hoffmann devised a master stroke, based on the system of lateral railways inside the German frontier, and also on the means of knowledge which to a large extent dispersed the fog of war on their side. For the continued interception of the wireless messages sent out by the Russian general staff gave the German leaders a clear picture of how the enemy viewed the situation and what he intended to do. Superior knowledge proved a compensation for inferior strength, as well as an invaluable insurance on behalf of audacity. The Ninth Army, retreating before the advancing Russians, slowed them down by a systematic destruction of the scanty communications in Poland. On reaching its own frontier unpressed, it was first switched northwards to the Posenthorn area, and then thrust southeast, on November 11, with its left flank on the Vistula, against the joint between the two armies guarding the Russian right flank. The wedge, driven in by Ludendorff's mallet, sundered the two armies, forced the first back on Warsaw, and almost effected another Tannenberg against the second which was nearly surrounded at Lodz, when the 5th Army from the van turned back to its rescue. As a result, part of the German enveloping force almost suffered the fate planned for the Russians, but managed to cut its way through to the main body. If the Germans were balked of decisive tactical success this maneuver had been a classic example of how a relatively small force, by using its mobility to strike at a vital point can paralyze the advance of an enemy several times its strength. The Russian steamroller was thrown out of gear, and never again did it threaten German soil. Within a week, four new German army corps arrived from the Western Front, where the April attack had now ended in failure, and although too late to clinch the missed chance of a decisive victory, Ludendorff was able to use them in pressing the Russians back by December 15 to the Bzuravka river line in front of Warsaw. This setback and the drying up of his munition supplies decided the Grand Duke Nicholas to break off the seesaw fighting still in progress near Krakow, and fall back on winter trench lines along the Nida and Dunajek rivers, leaving the end of the Polish tongue in the hands of the enemy. Thus, on the east as on the west, the trench stalemate had settled in, but the crust was less firm, and the Russians had drained their stock of munitions to an extent that their poorly industrialized country could not make good. The grip on the seas. We deal thirdly with the operations at sea, which actually occurred first in chronological order. The reason is that sea power only came to exert a dominant, eventually the dominant, influence on the war after the initial plans on land had miscarried. If the quick decision expected by the military leaders had been reached, it is questionable whether sea power could have affected the issue. How narrowly Germany missed decisive victory, 
and by what a combination of hardly conceivable blunders, is in the light of history now clear. While it is possible that Britain could, and would, have carried on the war unaided, we need to remember that in August, 1914, the condition was still that of a professional war with popular backing rather than a truly national war, that British intervention was still regarded as a chivalrous effort to succor violated Belgium and challenged France rather than as a life and death struggle for Britain's existence. And when a friend lies prone in a tiger's claws it is mistaken friendship to engage in a tug of war for the fragments if there is any chance of enticing the tiger from his prey. But fortunately, in 1914, the tiger was held at bay and, with this breathing space gained, Britain had the opportunity to exert her traditional weapon, sea power. Its effect on the war was akin not to a lightning flash, striking down an opponent suddenly but to a steady radiation of heat, invigorating to those it was used in aid of, and drying up the resources of the enemy. But if its effect was extended and cumulative, its application was instantaneous, comparable almost to turning on an electric switch. This simple act, yet perhaps the most decisive of the war, took place before the actual outbreak, on July 29th when at seven o'clock in the morning that Greater Armada, the British Grand Fleet, sailed from Portland for its war station at Scarpa Flow. Few eyes saw its passage, fewer minds knew its destination in those northerly Orkney Isles controlling the passage between North Britain and Norway, but from that moment Germany's arteries were subjected to an invisible pressure which never relaxed until on November 21, 1918, the German fleet arrived in those same northern waters to hand itself into the custody of a force of whom it had seen no more than a few fleeting glimpses during four and a half years of intangible struggle. The fundamental cause of this unprecedented type of conflict lay in the recent development of new weapons, the mine and the submarine, which reproduced in naval warfare that same predominance of defensive over offensive power which was the key factor on land. The immediate cause, however, was the strategy adopted by Germany's naval command, partly through a miscalculation of Britain's probable strategy. Appreciating their own inferiority to the British fleet as well as the impossibility of a surprise blow in face of its preparedness, and believing that their enemy was obsessed with the Nelsonian tradition of seeking battle, the German command adopted a Fabian strategy. They aimed to refuse conflict until their mine layers and submarines had weakened the strength of the British Navy, until the strain of a close blockade had begun to tell on the superior fleet, and perhaps provided the chance of a surprise stroke, and until the conquest of Britain's allies on land had made her position more difficult. The plan had at least a sound geographical basis, for the nature and configuration of the German coast lent itself to this strategy. The short North Sea coastline was heavily indented, the estuaries a maze of difficult channels, and screened by a fringe of islands, of which Heligoland formed a strongly fortified shield to the naval bases at Wilhelmshaven, Bremerhaven and Cuxhaven. Best of all, from the estuary of the Elbe there was a back door into the Baltic Sea, the Kiel Canal. By this the naval forces in the Baltic could be rapidly reinforced while an enemy advance into that landlocked sea was not only hampered by the neutral possession of its approaches but could be imperiled by submarine and destroyer attack while passing through the narrow channels between the Danish islands. The natural defensive power of Germany's sea frontiers made attack almost impossible, and conversely gave her an excellent base for aiding operations, save for the geographical handicap that the coastline of Great Britain like a vast breakwater, narrowed the exit for operations on the outer seas. The one obvious defect of this Fabian strategy was that it involved the immediate abandonment of Germany's foreign trade and reduced the possibility of her interference with the seaborne supplies of Britain and her allies. Moreover, the German plan of progressive attrition was vitiated by the strategy adopted by the British Admiralty which abandoned the direct doctrine of seeking out the enemy for the indirect doctrine of the fleet and being. Realizing how the mine and submarine, combined with Germany's natural advantages, had made a close blockade hazardous, the Admiralty adopted a strategy of distant surveillance, 
keeping the battle fleet in a position which commanded the North Sea and in instant readiness for action if the enemy appeared, and using the light craft for closer, but not close observation. This strategy was not as passive as it seemed to a critical public, eagerly expecting a new Trafalgar. It appreciated that Britain's general command of the sea was the pivot of the Allied cause, and that to hazard it by exposure to uncompensated losses was the negation of this supreme requirement. Therefore, while desiring battle and being ready for it, the Admiralty quietly set about its primary duties of maintaining the security of the ocean routes, dealing with the sporadic threats to those routes, and, thirdly, ensuring the safe passage to France of the British Expeditionary Force. The idea of economic pressure exercised by sea power was still in embryo. Not until a later phase did it crystallize into a formal doctrine, and the term blockade assume a new and wider definition. The attack on seaborne commerce was deep-rooted in the traditions of the British Navy, and thus the transition to an indirect attack on the life of the enemy nation, her supplies of food and raw material, was an almost imperceptible progress. When this pressure was exercised against herself in a novel form and by a new weapon, the submarine, it was human if illogical, that she should decry it as an atrocity. It was not easy for a conservative mind to realize that with the transition from a war of government policies into a war of peoples, intoxicated with Klaus Witsian catchphrases about a fight to the finish, the indefinite code of military chivalry must be submerged by the primitive instincts let loose. But in 1914 this absolute war was still only a theory and had little influence on the opening operations. The history of the naval struggle must be dated from July 26, 1914, when the Admiralty, in view of the clouded international situation, sent orders to the fleet assembled for review at Portland not to disperse. If the review was a happy chance the use made of it was one of the decisive acts and wisest judgments of the war, for while free from any of the provocation of an army mobilization, it placed Britain in automatic control of the situation at sea. It was followed, on July 29, by the unnoticed sailing of the fleet for its war stations in the North Sea, and warning telegrams to all squadrons abroad. To students of war and politics the lesson should not be lost for, whatever its other limitations, a professional force has this power of unprovocative readiness which a national force inevitably lacks. Mobilization is a threat creating an atmosphere in which peaceful argument with us and dies. Between negotiations and mobilization there is a gulf, between mobilization and war an imperceptible seam, and the act of any irresponsible man can draw a nation across it. Admiral Jellicoe, the new commander of the Grand Fleet, had one initial weakness to contend with, his base at Scarpa was without defenses against torpedo attack and the fortified base being prepared at Rosyth was still incomplete. The historic concentration of British sea power had been on the Channel coast, where lay the best prepared and defended harbours, and the government had been slow to provide funds for bases on the North Sea to accompany the change in the concentration areas. The danger compelled him to take his fleet west of the Orkneys although it came down as far as the 4th during the transport to France of the expeditionary force, which was directly protected by the older battleships of the Channel Fleet, and by a layered system of patrols in the southern waters of the North Sea. The safe passage of the expeditionary force was the first direct achievement of the Navy. The next followed on August 29th when Beatty's battle cruiser squadron and to its destroyer flotillas made a swoop into the Bight of Heligoland, sank several German light cruisers, and achieved the much greater indirect effect of confirming the Germans in their strictly defensive strategy, not an unmixed blessing, for it led them to concentrate on the development of submarine attack. Apart from this engagement the story of 1914 in the North Sea is a record of unceasing vigilance on the one side, of minor submarine and mine laying successes and losses, on the other dot the war in the Mediterranean opened with a mistake that was to have far reaching political consequences. Two of Germany's fastest ships were the, the battle cruiser Goban and the light cruiser Breslau, and received orders from Berlin to steer for Constantinople. They evaded the British efforts made to cut them off, 
partly owing to inelasticity in applying the admiralty instructions. On the high seas, the chase was more prolonged. Germany had not been allowed time to send out commerce destroyers from home waters, but for some months her few cruisers on foreign service were a thorn in the side of the British Navy. It was not easy to reconcile the needs of the North Sea concentration with the duty of patrolling and protecting the tremendous length of sea routes along which supplies as well as troops were flowing from India and the Dominions to the support of the mother country. By the destruction of the Emden on November 9, the Indian Ocean was finally cleared, but this success was offset by disaster in the Pacific, where Admiral Craddock's cruiser squadron was crushed by the heavier metal of Admiral von Spee's armoured cruisers, Schkarnhorst and Nisenau. This setback was, however, promptly redeemed by the Admiralty, who dispatched Admiral Sturdy with two battle cruisers, inflexible and invincible, on a lightning dash to the South Atlantic, while another battle cruiser, Australia, swept down from Fiji on Admiral von Spee's rear. Trapped on December 8 at the Falkland Isles, by this finely conceived surprise, Spee was sunk, and with him the last instrument of German naval power upon the oceans. From this time onwards, the ocean communications of Britain and her allies were secured for trade, for supplies and for the conveyance of troops. But as to all ocean routes there must be a land terminus. The development of the submarine made this security gradually less effective than it seemed on the morrow of Sturdy's victory. The nature of the war at sea began to undergo definite changes early in 1915. During the first phase, Britain had been too busy in clearing the seas and maintaining the security of the sea routes to devote much attention to the use of her sea command as an economic weapon against Germany. In any case her naval power was fettered by the artificial restrictions on blockade embodied in the Declaration of London of 1909, which the British government with singular blindness announced on the outbreak of war that it would accept as the basis of maritime practice. Their release from these self-imposed fetters was aided by Germany's action. On November 2, 1914, a German battlecruiser squadron made a raid on the Norfolk coast as a reconnaissance to test the scope of Britain's naval defence. Another followed on December 16 against the Yorkshire coast, Scarborough, Whitby and the Hartlepools being bombarded. Each time the Germans slipped away safely, but when they attempted a third, on January 24, the English battlecruiser squadron, under Beatty, trapped them off the Dogger Bank, sank the Blutcher and badly damaged the Durfliner and Saidlitz. Although the stroke missed full success, it convinced the Germans of the futility of their attrition strategy, and in general, the commander of their high seas fleet, was replaced by Paul, who proposed to Falkenhayn an offensive submarine campaign, which for success must be unlimited. As a result, on February 18, Germany proclaimed the waters round the British Isles a war zone where all ships, enemy or neutral, would be sunk at sight. This gave Britain a lever to loosen the Declaration of London, and she replied by claiming the right to intercept all ships suspected of carrying goods to Germany, and bring them into British ports for search. This tightening of the blockade caused serious difficulties with neutrals, America especially, but Germany eased the friction by torpedoing the Great Line of Lusitania, May 7, 1915. The drowning of 1,100 people, including some Americans, was a spectacular brutality which shocked the conscience of the world, and appealed more forcibly to American opinion than even the desolation of Belgium. This act, succeeded by others, paved the way for the entry of the United States into the war, though it was to be later than seemed likely on the morrow of the tragedy. One result of Britain's early established command of the sea was that it gave her the opportunity to sweep up Germany's overseas colonies with little hindrance or expenditure of force. Their seizure was valuable in that it gave the Allies important assets to bargain with in case of an unfavorable or negative issue to the war. At the end of August a New Zealand expedition captured Samoa and in September an Australian expedition took possession of New Guinea, the Australian Navy also cleared several important German wireless stations in the Pacific Isles. Japan, entering the war on Britain's side, sent a division with a naval squadron, 
to besiege the German fortress of Tsingtao on the coast of China. The first landing took place on September 2, and a tiny British contingent arrived on the 23rd, but the defences were modern, the land approach narrow, and the actual siege was not begun until October 31st. Seven days bombardment was followed by an assault, which led to the capitulation of the garrison. After a rather feeble resistance. In Africa, Togoland was occupied in August, the equatorial forest of the Cameroons was a sterner obstacle, and not until the beginning of 1916 were the German forces conquered by joint British and French forces after a prolonged but economically conducted campaign. General Bota, the South African Premier, once in arms against England, now for her, organized a force which conquered German South West Africa. Almost concurrently Bota rendered a still greater service to the British cause by putting down the rebellion of a section of disaffected Boers, which, save for the Irish Rising of Easter, 1916, was the only revolt within the borders of the Empire during these four trying years. Only German East Africa, the largest and richest of Germany's colonies, remained, and that, Owing to the difficulties of the country and the skill of General von Leto Vorbeck, the German commander, was not to be completely subdued until the end of 1917. An expeditionary force was sent thither in November to support the local British East African forces, and was repulsed at Tanga. To compensate his lack of troops, the German commander, Leto Vorbeck, found allies in the local bees and his skillful tactics produced panic among the Indian battalions. Not until late in 1915 could the British government, occupied with greater problems, spare either the time or the force to deal with this hornet's nest. The year 1915 witnessed the dawn of another new form of war which helped to drive home the new reality that the war of armies had become the war of peoples. From January onwards, Zeppelin raids began on the English coast and reached their peak in the late summer of 1916, to be succeeded by aeroplane raids. The difficulty of distinguishing from the air between military and civil objectives smoothed the path for a development which, beginning with excuses, ended in a frank avowal that in a war for existence the will of the enemy nation, not merely the bodies of their soldiers, is the inevitable target. Although the Zeppelin raids in 1915 and 1916, through misdirection, did little material damage and caused less than 2,000 casualties, it has been estimated that, by their disorganizing effect, about one sixth of the total normal output of munitions was entirely lost. The first psychological symptom of the World War, as it seemed to many, was an immeasurable sigh of relief. Had the peoples of Europe sat on the safety valve too long? The war-weary mind of today cannot reconstruct the tension and anxiety, the strain and stress of hope and fear of the long years of the peace that was no peace and yet was not war. It may be read as a revolt of the spirit against the monotony and triviality of the everyday round, the completion of a psychological cycle when the memories of past wars have faded and paved the way for the emergence and revival of the primordial hunting instinct in man. This first phase of enthusiasm was succeeded by one of passion, the natural ferocity of war accentuated by a form of mob spirit which is developed by a nation in arms. The British army was relatively immune because of its professional character, whereas in the German army, the most essentially citizen, it gained scope because of the cold-blooded logic of the general staff theory of war. With the coming of the autumn a third phase became manifest, more particularly among the combatants. This was a momentary growth of a spirit of tolerance, symbolized by the fraternization which took place on Christmas Day, but this in turn was to wane as the strain of the war became felt and the reality of the struggle for existence came home to the warring sides. Foreseen won the battle that was not, yet turned the tide, the Manano battle has caused more controversy produced so large a literature in so short a time, or given rise to more popular interest and legend than that of the man. But then this crisis of September, 1914, wrought the downfall of the German war plan and thereby changed the course of history. For if it be true, as it certainly is in part, 
that Germany lost the war when she lost this battle, it is natural that claimants to the distinction of having won it should be many. The first legend to arise was that Fock had won it by driving the German centre into the marshes of St. Gond, and even today, in total disregard of the facts and times of the battle, this is still given currency by reputable historians outside France. But while, like a pebble dropped in water, the ripples of this story were still spreading, knowledgeable opinion in France was violently arguing whether the credit was due to Joffre, the commander-in-chief, or Gallieni, his quondam superior and then subordinate, who had delivered from Paris the blow at the German flank, exposed by Clark's wheel inwards before Paris. One school contended that Joffre had conceived the idea of the counter-offensive, and at most admitted under pressure of facts that Gallini's initiative in seeing the opportunity had given an impulse to Joffre's decision to seize it. The other school argued that Joffre, after the failure of his first attempt to stage a counter-offensive on the line of the Somme, had given up all idea of a fresh attempt at an early date, and that but for Gallini's fiery determination and persuasion the retreat would have continued. A dispassionate judgment is now possible, and if we recognize that on Joffre fell the grave responsibility of taking the decision, the weight of evidence shows that Gallini's inspiration dictated both the sight and promptness of the thrust. Furthermore, it rebuts the alternative case of Joffre's advocates that Gallini marred the prospect by precipitating the blow, for we know that 24 hours delay would have enabled the Germans to complete the protective redistribution which Gallini interrupted. On the German side, a similar controversy has raged as to whether the order to retreat was a mistake, and whether Clark of the First Army, Bullo of the Second, or the envoy of the Supreme Command, Colonel Hench, was responsible for the fatal decision. The multiple controversy has at least served to show that the man was a psychological rather than a physical victory. So, also, have been most of the immortal victories of history, with the actual fighting a secondary influence. For the profoundest truth of war is that the issue of battles is usually decided in the minds of the opposing commanders, not in the bodies of their men. The best history would be a register of their thoughts and emotions, with a mere background of events to throw them into relief. But the delusion to the contrary has been fostered by the typical military history, filled with details of the fighting and assessing the cause of a victory by statistical computations of the number engaged. The man was so clearly a psychological issue that the minds of the commanders have received due analysis. But even so, the combat complex has tended to narrow the analysis of minds to the area where the clash of bodies took place. Thereby certain suggestive evidence has escaped comment. This evidence may be expressed in a startling question. Was the victory primarily due to the heated imagination of an English railway porter and to a party of temporary visitors to Ostend? Or, at the least, did these humble worthies constitute with Gallini the mainspring of victory? The suggestion is not so fantastic as it seems when we study the mental atmosphere of the German commanders. Before and during the crisis they were constantly looking backward apprehensively over their right shoulders, fearful of an allied stroke against their ever-lengthening communications in Belgium and northern France. Unfortunately for the Allies, there was small warrant for this nervousness. The belated plea for landing the Beff on the Belgian coast had been overruled by the Wilsonian pledge and policy of tying it as an appendix to the French left wing. Yet the Belgian field army, if under German guard at Antwerp, had at least caused a serious detachment of German strength to this guard, and more, was a chronic irritation to German nerves. The fertile brain of Mr. Churchill was also at work. Resources were scanty but he dispatched a brigade of marines under Brig General Aston to Ostend, with orders to give their presence the fullest publicity. They landed on August 27, and stayed ashore until the 31 St. Now to turn to the other side of the hill. On September 5, the day when the French troops were moving forward to strike at Cluck, Colonel Hench, the representative of the Supreme Command, came to the threatened army with this ominous and despairing warning dash the news is bad. The 6th and 7th armies are blocked. The 4th and 5th are meeting with strong resistance. 
the English are disembarking fresh troops continuously on the Belgian coast. There are reports of a Russian expeditionary force in the same parts. A withdrawal is becoming inevitable. We know from other sources that the 3,000 Marines had grown in the German command's imagination to 40,000, and that the Russians were said to be 80, 000. Thus, the German flank army was left to face its ordeal with the belief that its rear was seriously menaced, and that in any case the Supreme Command was contemplating a withdrawal. At the least such knowledge must have been insidiously enervating during a period of strain. If the Supreme Command came to have doubts of the Belgian news, it also became imbued with the idea of a retirement, and when Hench came again on September 9 with full powers to coordinate it, should rearward movements have begun, not only had these begun, but they also coincided with fresh disturbing news from Belgium. For if the Belgian sortie from Antwerp that day was short-lived, it had all the incalculable psychological effect of menacing news at a moment of crisis. The German retreat gathered momentum and spread. With it turned the tide of the war. History should do justice to Mr. Churchill's happy inspiration and General Aston's handful of marine promenaders. But equally helpful was that amazing Russian myth which originated and spread so mysteriously. Mr. Churchill we know, had actually proposed to bring a Russian expeditionary force in such a way. Did the proposal perhaps leak out and become exaggerated into realization in the process? General opinion, however, has long ascribed the legend to the heated imagination of a railway porter working on the simple fact of the night passage of troop trains with Gaelic-speaking occupants. If so, a statue in Whitehall to the unknown porter is overdue. Keeping this external factor on the circumference of our thought, let us turn to trace the sequence of events in the actual battle zone. The immediate chain of causation begins with the escape by retreat of the French and British armies from the frontier trap into which Joffre's plan had led them. The first, highly coloured, Reports from the army commands in the battles of the frontiers had given the German Supreme Command the impression of a decisive victory. It was under this hallucination that Moltke, on August 25, cheerfully and needlessly dispatched four divisions to the Russian front, to the detriment of his right wing punch, already weakened by seven divisions left for the investment of derelict fortresses, truly a bad investment. Then the comparatively small totals of prisoners raised doubts in Moltke's mind and led him to a more sober estimate of the situation. The Kaiser's easy optimism now irritated him. Dash he has already a shout hurrah mood that I hate like death. The new pessimism of Moltke combined with the renewed optimism of his army commanders to produce a fresh change of plan, which contained the seeds of disaster. While Clark's army, on the German extreme right or outer flank, was pressing on the heels of the British, so close that the outside British corps, Smith Doyen, was forced to halt and give battle, Cluck's neighbour on the inside, Bullo, was following a plan Rizak's French 5th Army. When on August 26 the British left wing fell back southwards badly mauled from Legato, Cluck had turned southwestwards again. If this direction was partly due to misconception of the line of retreat taken by the British, the idea that they were retreating to the channel port, it was also in accordance with his original role of a wide circling sweep. And by carrying him into the Amiensperon area, where the first parts of the newly formed French 6th Army were just detraining after their switch from Alsace, it had the effect of dislocating Joffre's design for an early return to the offensive, by compelling the 6th Army to fall back hurriedly towards the shelter of the Paris defences. But Cluck had hardly swung out to the southwest before he was induced to swing in again. For in order to ease the pressure on the British, Joffre had ordered Lanrizac to halt and strike back against the pursuing Germans, and Bullough, shaken by the threat, called on Cluck for aid. Lanrizac's attack. on August 29, was stopped before Bullough needed this help, but he asked Cluck to wheel in nevertheless, in order to cut off Lanrizac's retreat. Before acceding, Cluck referred to Moltke. 
The request came at a moment when Moltke was becoming perturbed in general over the way the French were slipping away from his embrace and, in particular, over a gap which had opened between his second, Bullo, and third, Horsen, armies through the latter having already turned south, from southwest, to help the fourth army, its neighbor on the other flank. Hence Moltke approved Clock's change of direction which meant the inevitable abandonment of the original wide sweep around the far side of Paris. Now the flank of the wheeling German line would pass the near side of Paris and across the face of the Paris defences. By this contraction of his frontage for the sake of security Moltke sacrificed the wider prospects inherent in the wide circling sweep of the original plan. And, as it proved, Instead of contracting the risk he exposed himself to a fatal counterstroke. On the night of September 2, Moltke sent a message to the right-wing commanders which confirmed the change of plan and foreshadowed a new one. The French are to be forced away from Paris in a southeasterly direction. The first army will follow in echelon behind the second army, and will be responsible henceforward for the flank protection of the force. But the first army was a full day's march ahead of the second, if Clock tried to carry out the second part of the message he would be neglecting the first part. Hence he decided to march on, while detailing an incomplete reserve corps and a depleted cavalry division to serve as a flank guard. How lightly he regarded any danger from Paris is also shown in the facts that no aircraft were allotted to the flank guard and no air reconnaissance ordered to the westward. Meantime Moltke was growing depressed and his decision to abandon the original plan was definitely taken on September 4. In place of it, Moltke substituted a narrow air envelopment, of the French centre and right. His own centre, fourth and fifth armies, was to press southeast while his left, sixth and seventh armies, striking southwestwards sought to break through the fortified barrier between Toul and Epinal, the jaws thus closing inwards on either side of Verdun. Meantime his right, first and second armies, was to turn outwards and, facing west, hold off any counter-move which the French might attempt from the neighborhood of Paris. Moltke's order continued to ignore that Clark was ahead of Bullo in the race southward and had already crossed the Marne. For it not only told Clock to remain facing the east side of Paris, that is facing west, but to remain north of the Marne while Bala wheeled into line, facing west, between the Marne and the Seine. Thus to fulfill the order Clock had not merely to halt, while Bala caught up and passed him, but to perform a sort of backward somersault. Such gymnastics are somewhat upsetting to the equilibrium of a large army and in this case the French counter-move which Moltke wished to guard against had already begun before his new plan could take effect. Moreover Clock, reluctant to be thus deprived of the chance of being the agent of decisive victory, continued his advance south towards the Seine on the 5th, saying that the movement to face west might be made at leisure. For the moment he still left the weak detachment of three brigades and a few cavalry to guard his flank. Next morning it was struck by the French 6th Army moving out from Paris. During these days the Franco-British retreat had continued. On August 30, Joffre, yielding to the pressure of a government alarmed at seeing him abandon the capital by his direction of retreat, detached Monry's 6th Army to reinforce the Paris garrison. Parting with it signified his abandonment of the flank counterstroke, for this was the force he had assembled for its execution. Moreover, a memorandum drawn up that same day shows that he had transferred his faith to a counter-offensive against the German centre in the hope of accomplishing the rupture which we formerly attempted facing northeast and debouching from the Meuse. On September 1st, Joffre issued orders for the retreat of the Allied armies to be continued to a line south of the Seine, Orb and Ornain rivers. Not only was the effect to take the armies away from and far to the southeast of Paris, but a commander who is contemplating an early counter-offensive does not place the obstacle of a river barrier between himself and the enemy. And a further note to the several army commanders next day added that it was Joff's intention to organize and fortify this line, whence he planned to deliver not an immediate but an eventual counter-offensive.
That same day he replied to a suggestion of a stand on the Marne, made by Sir John French and communicated through the Minister of War I do not believe it possible to envisage a general action on the Marne with the whole of our forces. But I consider that the cooperation of the English army in the defence of Paris is the only course that can give an advantageous result. To the Minister of War and to Gallini he repeated the same verdict. When zealous apologists say that the idea of a counter-offensive was at the back of Joff's mind, the historian can agree. This array of evidence is more than sufficient to dispel the legend that Joff had any intention of giving battle on the Marne or that he planned the counterstroke which tilted the balance so dramatically. The definite nature of his reply was the more significant because, on September 1st, a staff officer with Lanrizac's army had found the German order for a change of direction in the wallet of a dead officer, and this was sent to Joff's headquarters early next day. And on the morning of the 3rd, the changed direction, to the southeast, of Cluck's marching columns had been noticed and reported by British aviators. In the afternoon they added that these columns were crossing the Marne and in the evening Mornery reported that there were no German troops left in the area west of the line Paris Senlis. All this was reported to Joff without making any impression on his plans, save that on the night of the second he altered the limit of his retirement to a line still farther south. But from Gallini, the new military governor of Paris, even a fragment of information gained on the third had drawn an instant response. He ordered Mornery to carry out further air and cavalry reconnaissances as soon as it was light on the 4th. Quickly convinced by these early reports that the Germans were moving obliquely past the front of the Paris defences, exposing their own flank, Gallini was equally quick to act. At 9 am he ordered Mornery's army to get ready for a move eastward to strike the Germans in flank. He then informed Joff by telephone of his preparatory moves and urged him to sanction a counter-offensive. This consent was necessary not only to ensure a combined effort but because Joff had persuaded the new Minister of War to subordinate Gallini to himself. Gallini's fiery and inspired arguments made an impression, but no more, on the slow-thinking commander-in-chief of the field armies. To save time while Joffre was still cogitating Gallini rushed off by motor to Milan to explain the new situation to the British, and if possible gain their cooperation. Unfortunately, Sir John French was absent from his headquarters, and at first Gallini could not even find Archibald Murray, his chief of the general staff. It was a curious scene. Gallini, for his part, found the British staff unsettled and depressed not hesitating to say that if England had known the condition of the French army she would not have entered the war. They were hardly in the mood to discern the underlying qualities of this most unmilitary looking military genius, bespectacled and untidy, with shaggy moustache, black button boots and yellow leggings. Little wonder perhaps that one eminent soldier with a pungent gift of humour remarked that no British officer would be seen speaking to such a Comedian. Gallini pointed out to Murray that it was vital to seize the opportunity which the Germans had given by offering their right flank, told him that the army of Paris was already in motion against the German flank, and begged that the British should cease to retreat and join with his forces in an offensive next day. Murray, however, showed ungrand repugnance. A entre dans nos views, and declared that he could do nothing in the absence of his commander. After waiting three hours in vain for Sir John French's return, Gallini had to leave at 5 p.m. with the mere promise of a telephone message later. This brought no satisfaction, for its purport was that the British would continue their retreat next day. Their decision had been confirmed by receiving a letter, written that morning, from Joff, who said, My intention, in the present situation, is to pursue the execution of the plan that I have had the honour to communicate to you that of retiring behind the Seine, and only to engage on the selected line with all forces united. The meagre influence which the news of Clark's change of direction had achieved was shown by a subsequent paragraph which said, in the case of the German armies continuing their movement towards the SSE, perhaps you will agree that your action can be most effectively applied on the right bank of the river, between the Marne and Seine. 
This casual qualification to the definite opening statement gave the British little encouragement to fall in with Gallini's audacious suggestion. There is a dramatic contrast between the sluggish working of Joff's mind, gradually but all too slowly veering round, and Gallini's swift coup deal and instantaneous reaction. After Gallini's morning message, Joff had been moved so far as to send a telegram, timed 12.45 pm, to Francia Despera e, who had superseded Lanrezac in command of the Fifth Army, saying, dash, Please inform me if you consider that your army is in a state to make it an attack, with any chance of success dash an inquiry which hardly suggests a sense of vital opportunity or an urge to action. This reached Francia Despera e while Henry Wilson, of French's staff, was with him, and, after discussion, a reply was drafted, saying the battle cannot take place before the day after tomorrow, and that the 5th Army would continue its retreat on the morrow, attacking on the 6th. To this message he added, in his own hand, a qualifying note even less encouraging, in order that the operation may be successful the necessary conditions are, 1. The close and absolute cooperation of the 6th Army debouching on the left bank of the Auk on the morning of the 6th. It must reach the Auk tomorrow. Or the British won't budge. 2. My army can fight on the 6th, but its situation is not brilliant. No reliance can be placed on the reserve divisions. What was likely to be the effect on Joffre of such a discouraging reply to his tentative inquiry? To harden his hesitation. That hesitation was the more natural because Berthelot, his chief advisor, was vehemently in favor of continuing the retreat and maintaining the original plan. Then early in the afternoon came an ominous report of German progress across the Marne. As Joff's own memoirs relate, this was all that was needed to cause Berthelot to return to the charge. The memoirs, it is true, argue that Joff merely continued to put off a decision, but they admit that he issued new instructions that were designed to accord with Berthelot's plan. Still more significantly, the decision was taken to move the headquarters over 30 miles farther south. Then, while Joff was having an early dinner, Francia Despera E's message arrived. The next link in the chain of causation fits in with a click. The click of a telephone switch putting a call through. For if Gallini's coup deal gained the opportunity, it was, as he himself said, coups de telephone which gained the Battle of the Marne. On returning to his headquarters in Paris, he had found a belated message from Joff which was favorable to his proposal for a counter stroke but preferred it to be delivered south of the Marne, where it would have lost the greater effect given by a blow against the enemy's flanks and rear. Gallini seized the telephone, got through to Joff, and by the fervor and force of his arguments at last won his sanction for the army of Paris to strike north of the Marne as part of a general counter-offensive by the left-wing armies. Joff promised to obtain the cooperation of the British. Gallini promptly issued orders, 8.30 pm to Mornery's army, which he reinforced. After several hours delay Joff's orders were sent out for the offensive on September 6, it was too late now for the 5th, and too late to be generally effective even for the 6th. The delay had far-reaching consequences, not all ill. On the 5th while Mornery's troops were moving east towards the enemy. Both the British and French Desperates were marching south in accord with their original orders, away from the enemy, and even away from each other. But for Gallini, the gap they thus opened might have proved perilous. When they turned about next day, they had much ground to recover, and were not as quick in retracing their steps as the situation demanded. This disappearance of the British not only enabled but encouraged Cluck, who had been taken completely unawares, to pull back half his main body, two and four corps, from the sector where the British had been, to reinforce the hard pressed flank guard which was trying to hold off Mornery's menacing advance against the German rear. The arrival of these fresh forces began to check Mornery's advance on the 7th, and Gallini pushed forward every possible reserve he could scrape up in order to strengthen Mornery. Here occurred the famous if legend crusted episode of the Paris taxicabs. A fresh division had just detrained near Paris, but it was forty miles from the battlefront. If it marched thither it would be too late, 
and there was only sufficient trail transport to take half the division. That afternoon, the police held up taxi cabs in the streets, bundling the passengers out in some cases, and, after collecting 600 cabs, sent them to the suburb of Gagny where they filled up with soldiers. Gallini came to see the performance and, with mingled gratification and amusement, exclaimed, Well, at least it's not commonplace. During the night this forerunner of the future motorized column swept, as only Paris taxicabs can sweep, through the outlying villages and past their amazed inhabitants, making two journeys, with 3,000 soldiers at a time. Unfortunately these taxicabs maintained their traditional preference for speed over reliability and, passing and repassing, became so mixed that on the morning of the 8th several hours were spent in sorting out their passengers before the division could attack. The pressure on the Germans gained extra force from the fact that it was directed against their rear flank. If Gallini had received the two further army corps for which he had asked days before and which were only just arriving piecemeal, the German forces south of the Marne might have been cut off and the battle been as decisive tactically as it was strategically. Even in the actual situation, the menace was such that at 10 pm on the 6th clock called back his two remaining army corps, so creating a 30 mile wide gap between himself and the neighboring army of Bolo. Only two weak cavalry corps, with a few Jager battalions, were left to fill it and Clock failed to arrange that this thin screen should be put under a single command. The consequences were fatal. Although he was able to hold and even press back Mornery's troops, the gap he had left in the southern front uncovered Billow's flank. Although still untouched by Franche Desperae's slow advance on the 7th, Bullow, sensitive to his raw side, drew back his right to the north bank of the Petit Morin. And when news came that the British were advancing into the centre of the gap, it proved the signal for the German retreat, which began on September 9. If the continuance of the British withdrawal on September 5 had marred the chance of a crushing victory, it was a pleasant irony of fate that their very withdrawal made possible the victory is actually achieved. It is necessary, however, to take account of the situation on other parts of the battlefront for, unless the German intentions elsewhere had been frustrated, Joff's victory would have been impossible and defeat probable. To the frustration of their left wing attack in the east, or Lorraine sector, the Germans themselves were the chief contributors, for by pressing the French back on their own fortress line they had already made their task of breaking through it almost impossible. And yet another of the many accidents of the Marne made their repulse certain, for when Dubail's and de Castelnau's armies, after their defeat in the Battle of Morhange Sarabug, ended their hasty retreat, their line sagged inwards, and into this re-entrant, formed quite unintentionally, the main German attack was launched, pushing towards that very gap of charms which the French in earlier years had prepared for their reception. Thus the French were given an opportunity to strike back effectively at the German flanks, and thereby they temporarily paralyzed the original German advance, which came to a halt on August 27. This not only gave the French breathing space to strengthen their position, but enabled Joffre, with safety, to transfer part of the force from the right wing to the more critical left wing. News of this transfer inspired Moltke to frame his new plan of September 5th, and lured him into another vain attack on the French fortified barrier, despite protest from Crown Prince Ruprecht of Bavaria, commanding the 6th Army. The new attack was launched frontally against the Grand Corps and Nancy, the ridge which formed a flank buttress for the Gap of Charms and the Kaiser arrived with his white cuirassiers, like an actor waiting his call, to make a triumphal entry into Nancy. But successive assaults, inadequately prepared, collapsed under the well-knit and superior fire of the French artillery, and on September 8 Moult ordered Ruprecht to stop the offensive and the vain loss of life. Ruprecht had been urged into it against his own judgment by the excessive confidence of the artillery expert, Major Bauer, that his super heavy howitzers would have the same effect as on the obsolete Belgian fortresses. Yet, curiously, he now only gave up the attack under protest, so Macorberish was the judgment of the military leaders of 1914-18. The German centre, 5th and 4th armies, west of Verdun, 
was no better able to fulfill its role as the right arm of the pincer-like squeeze ordained in Moltke's modified plan. In the Verdun area Sarail had replaced Ruffy as commander of the French Third Army, and the first instructions he received indicated not only a continued retreat but the abandonment of Verdun. Sarail thought differently, however, and determined to cling on to the Verdun pivot as long as possible, without losing touch with the Fourth Army to the west. It was a happy piece of initiative, and the break thus placed on the southeastward advance of the enemy's Fifth Army, under the German Crown Prince, was an essential factor in upsetting Moltke's plan. The stout resistance of Sarail's troops, and still more the deadly fire of their artillery, not only held up but paralyzed the Crown Prince's advance. And a belated attempt on the 9th to break the deadlock by a night attack, ended in a suicidal fiasco, with the Germans firing on each other. Sarail, however, asked in vain for reinforcements which might have enabled him to convert his resistance into a dangerous counterstroke from Verdun westwards against the German flank, for by holding on to Verdun he had formed one side of a sack into which the German armies between him and Mornery, on the other side, had pushed dot the German Third Army, Horsen, formed a link between the German centre and right wing, and was assigned the indefinite role of being ready to support either. This role was perhaps in part the reflection of the fact that, being composed of Saxons, the Prussians tended to discount its value. In the event it was virtually divided, its left was used to help the Fourth Army in the abortive attack on the French Fourth Army, de Langle de Carry, an attack which, after perhaps the severest fighting of the whole battle, was driven to ground by the French artillery. Its right joined with Bullo's left in an attack on Foch, who had taken over command of a new Ninth Army, in the French centre, formed by simple subtraction from the Langle de Carry's army. Among all the legends of the man that which has grown up round Foch's part is the most comprehensive and has the least substance. The first claim, still widely believed, is that Foch decided the issue of the whole battle by a counterstroke which threw the Prussian guard into the marshes of St. Gond. In fact, however, the Germans took their leave without interference, after the issue had been decided farther west. The second, and more modest claim, is that Foch made the victory possible by preventing a German breakthrough in the French centre. Even this is inaccurate, because the Germans were not trying to break through here. Bullo was merely carrying out his new protective task of wheeling his line to face west. And, in the course of this wheel, his left wing naturally bumped against Fox front. A further paradox is that although Fock issued repeated orders for attacks, his troops in reality were on the defensive, a defense needlessly desperate owing to his own disobedience of orders. At 1.30 am on September 6, Fock had received Joff's famous order for the general about turn. Unlike the other armies, he received it in time to act on his share of it, which was to cover the flank of Franche Desperae's attack by holding the southern exits of the marshes of St. Gond. Instead, he concentrated the bulk of his forces for an offensive north of the marshes, leaving the weak Eleven Corps to hold the wide and vulnerable sector east of the marshes. His troops were tired and much reduced by the hard retreat, and their offensive quickly died away, in their reflux they failed to hold firmly the southern exits of the marshes. Thus Foch continued to keep his main strength on that flank. But the Germans could only cross by the narrow causeways, and in consequence made a sidestep, as they might have done earlier. On the 7th, their attack east of the marshes broke down under the fire of the French artillery. As the only way of evading it, a bayonet attack in the half-light before dawn was arranged. This caught Fox right by surprise and it gave way rapidly. Fortunately the Germans did not follow up as rapidly and so captured few of the tormenting guns. Even so, the situation was serious and Fock called for help, Francia Despera e Lentecourt to support his left and Joffre sent another to fill the gap now yawning on his right. On the 9th the continued German attack against Fox Wright made fresh progress and met little resistance, until, shortly before 2 p.m., it was stopped by receiving Bullo's now notorious order for a general retirement the Germans drew off undisturbed and even unobserved. 
to meet the earlier emergency Fock had taken the 42nd Division from his intact left wing and switched it across to his right, but it only arrived in time to fire its guns in the twilight after the vanished foe. Contrary to the popular legend of its decisive counter-stroke against the flank of the German breakthrough. And one has to add that although Bullo had exposed his flank in making the wheel, Fock thought only of making a frontal counter-attack. On the battle as a whole his main, and most serious, effect was that he detracted from the main offensive instead of helping to cover it. In our survey of the battlefront we have now travelled back to the decisive western flank. Let us focus our eyes on the various headquarters behind the German front and examine the wavering gusts of opinion which culminated in the German retirement. The Supreme Command was back at Luxembourg, whither it had moved from Koblenz, on August 30th, and depended for communication with the armies on wireless, supplemented by occasional visits by staff officers in motor cars. No regular motor or motorcycle dispatch service had been organized and wireless communication suffered not only from the time lost in enciphering and deciphering but from interference from the Eiffel Tower in Paris. As the army commanders, faithful to the tradition of 1870, were jealous of control, information was as sparse as it was slow except when they had successes to report, and exaggerate. Throughout the crisis of the battle, from September 7 to 9, no single report of any value came back from the front and, as late as the 12th, Moltke had no knowledge of what had happened to Clark's army, or where it was. Perhaps this ignorance made little difference, for on the 5th, Falkenhayn, then at Luxembourg in his capacity of Minister of War, noted in his diary, only one thing is certain, our general staff has completely lost its head. Schlieffen's notes do not help any further, and so Moltke's wits come to an end. Moreover, Moltke had already reconciled himself to defeat. For the gloom at Luxembourg is well shown by the fact that when, on September 8, Lieutenant Colonel Hench left, as his emissary, to visit in turn the five armies west of Verdun, he was given full powers to coordinate the retreat, should rearward movements have been initiated. He found none had occurred, if he found little confidence, at the headquarters of the 5th, 4th, and 3rd armies. Passing on he spent the night of the 8th with Bullo, and the found such an intensification of gloom that when he left in the morning he could at least feel confidence on one point, that orders for a retreat would soon be given. And about 9 a.m. on the 9th their reports told Bullo that six enemy columns, five British and one of French cavalry, were approaching the Marne, and so entering the mouth of the Gap. By 11 a.m. he had issued orders for the retreat of his army to begin at 1 p.m., sending word to clock of his action. Hench, delayed by blocks and panics on the road, did not reach Cluck's headquarters till almost noon. There, according to his evidence, he found that orders for a retirement had already gone out, and in confirming them merely added the direction of the retreat, northeastward. But Cluck's chief of staff, Cull, asserts that these orders were only the mistake of a subordinate and that he had merely ordered a swing back of his left in view of the fact that the British were almost behind it. He further says that Hench, in view of Bullough's situation, gave him orders to retreat. And Hench is not alive to contradict him. But the facts that the withdrawal began at 2 p.m., that the roads behind had been cleared, and that neither Cull nor Cluck troubled to ask for a written order, go far to support Hench, by showing their eagerness to be off. Cull, indeed, has admitted that the imminent breakthrough of the British and French Edespera e made the retreat inevitable. And, owing to the British penetration, Cluck's army had to retreat northward, thus leaving the gap still open. The most curious of all the many accidents of the man is its accidental reproduction of the perfect pattern Napoleonic battle the pattern which Napoleon several times fulfilled and which General Cameron and other students believe was normally in his mind. Its characteristics were that while the enemy was gripped in front, a maneuver was directed against one of his flanks, a maneuver which was intended not to be decisive in itself but to create the opportunity for a decisive stroke. For the threat of envelopment caused a stretching of the enemy's line toward it off and so created a weak joint on which the decisive stroke then fell. 
On the Marne Galleon he caused this stretching and the British pierced the joint. The pattern was executed perfectly, yet quite unconsciously. Hence we see clearly that the continued retreat of the British on the 5th and their slow advance on the 6th and 7th were strategically invaluable, holding back unintentionally as Napoleon would have done purposely. If their decisive thrust had been disclosed earlier, the joint would hardly have been weakened by the removal of Kluck's last two corps, the departure of which, even as it was, Bullo delayed until early on the 8th and the fact that Monry's stroke was definitely checked while these two corps were still on the march towards him is sufficient evidence that his stroke in itself could not have caused a decision. But the continued slowness of the advance on the 8th, 9th and 10th was the negation of the Napoleonic pattern. And it proved fatal to the chance of converting the German retreat into a disaster. Thereby it paved the way for the four long years of trench warfare. In part it was due to the obstacle provided by successive rivers. But in still greater part it was due to want of impulsion, and misguided direction. Sir John French seems to have had little faith in the prospect, and still less in his allies' efforts. In consequence he trod on the brake rather than the accelerator, besides keeping most of his cavalry on his right flank, and even in rear of it as a link with his French neighbour instead of a spearhead of the pursuit. Seven, indeed, not until the 11th was the cavalry really launched in pursuit. Francia Desperae's advance was even more cautious. His right was tied back to Foch, his centre slowly followed up, but did not catch up, Bullo's retiring wing. His left neglected to push along the completely open path. A further cause of delay, however, was the tactical method employed in the advance. The old idea of keeping an even alignment still ruled, as it did until 1918, so that if one corps or division was checked its neighbours tended to halt. Thus frequent opportunities were missed for pushing on past the flanks of a temporary resistance and maintaining the momentum of the advance. And because the British and French missed this opportunity it was to be left for 1918 to see and the Germans to apply the method of nature, for thus does any current or stream take the line of least resistance, finding a way past an obstacle and then flowing on, while the back eddies wash away the now isolated obstacle. Perchance also the victory might have been more decisive, to the shortening of the war, if its creator had not been removed from control at the beginning of it. Having already limited the power of Gallinese blow, Joffre seized the first chance to deprive him of his powers of directing it. Would that he had been as quick in exploiting the weakness of the rival army. For on September 11, Joffre informed Gallini that he would resume direct control of Mornery's army, leaving Gallini to fret his soul within the confines of Paris while watching the fruits of victory slipping from the grasp of his slow-thinking superior. Throughout the battle Gallini's governing idea had been to direct all reserves to the north, towards the enemy's rear, although several times frustrated by Joffre. With Gallini's disappearance the advance became purely frontal, giving the Germans the breathing space to reorganize and stand firm on the line of the Ain. Not until then, September 17, did Joff's mind awake to the idea of concentrating by rail a fresh mass of maneuver behind the German flank. As a result, in the so-called race to the sea, the French were always an army corps too few and 24 hours too late, until the trench front stretched to the sea. But his was not the sole failure to take advantage of the temporary state of disorder and indecision behind the German line. It is the sober verdict of General Edmonds, the British official historian, that Dash had some of the 14 British Territorial Force Divisions and 14 Mounted Brigades, with the 6th Division still in England, being landed at the Channel Coast ports to fall on the German communications and rear, a decisive tactical result might have been obtained and the war finished. Even as it was, on reaching the AI an opportunity had remained, only to be missed. Indeed. The official history states that the prospects of a breakthrough never were brighter than on the morning of the 13th. Thanks to German carelessness and the initiative of various junior commanders, the passage of the river had been achieved on both flanks. 
and from all the information furnished to General Haig the gap had not been closed which had existed between the German first and second armies ever since the Battle of the Marne. But the race was lost owing to a failure of the high command to appreciate the situation. On the 13th the divisions made a rather cautious and leisurely advance, and in the GHQ orders there was no hint whatever of the importance of time. By the evening of the 13th September the situation had completely changed. German reinforcements were known to have arrived, and serious resistance was to be expected on the 14th, yet the GHQ orders merely repeated the formula that the army will continue the pursuit. There was no plan, no objective, no arrangements for cooperation, and the divisions blundered into battle. With their failure, the flux crystallized and deadlock ensued. A still greater opportunity was thrown away by the French to the eastward, for, on reaching the Ain, Kaz Cavalry Corps and a group of reserve divisions were opposite a 10 mile gap in the German front. After crossing the river, the cavalry rode on 13 miles northwards to Sisson, but then, seeing the danger of being cut off, the order was given to retire to the bridges. This inglorious sense of precaution forfeited an opening such as cavalry would never again enjoy on the Western Front. For, at Sisson, Kaz Cavalry Corps was 15 miles north of the thrown back flank of the German Second Army, and 40 miles behind the line of the Third Army. It had only to move eastwards across the enemy lines of communication to cause at least alarm and confusion. The question has often been posed whether the trench stalemate would have come to pass if France had possessed a Napoleon. Although the unappreciated defensive power of modern weapons and the unwieldy masses of 1914 weighted the scales against the mobility and decisiveness of warfare, the Galini interlude raises a doubt. For not only did Galini afford the one instance of Napoleonic coup deal witnessed on the Western Front in 1914-18, but his intuition, his boldness of maneuver and his swift decision were so vivid a contrast to that of the other leaders, French, British and German, as to suggest that it was possible to snatch a decision by maneuver from the jaws of trench warfare before the artisan swallowed the artist. The hypothesis is strengthened by the fact that Gallini's influence was exercised under the most shackling conditions. The command of a fortress was governed by rules and limitations which ordained a strictly defensive role, even gave the governor power to refuse assistance to the field armies, and discouraged him from any wider horizon than that of his immediate responsibility for the defense of the fortress. It was the irony of fortune that the commander-in-chief in the field should have led the way to universal siege warfare, that the commander of a fortress should have conceived and launched the most decisive maneuver of the war. Yet war is a game where the joker counts, and when Joff withheld the trump Galini played the joker. As he remarked later, half humorously, half bitterly, there has not been a battle of the man. Joff's instructions ordained a retreat on the Seine and the evacuation of Verdun and of Nancy. Sarail did not obey, he saved Verdun, Castel now held on to the Grand Coron, he saved Nancy. I have taken the offensive. As for asserting now that it is the Commander-in-Chief, who had gone back far to the rear while I advanced, who conducted, foresaw, and arranged it all. It is hard to believe. The truest phrase of all was his first dash though has not been a battle of the Marne. Nor had there been a battle of Sedan in 1870. The folly of McMahon in face of the first Moltk was paralleled, and even excelled, by the folly of the second Moltk in face of shadows. Foreseen to the field of legend, Tannenberg like that of the Marne, the popular story of the great German victory of Tannenberg is a monument of monumental error. For it consists, actually, of a figure of wood, on a pedestal of clay, varnished with legend. The first and most popular of these legends provided a romantic picture of an old general who, as the hobby of his years of retirement, spent his time in devising a gigantic trap for a future Russian invasion, exploring paths through and sounding the bottom of the marshes in which the Russian hordes were to be engulfed, and then, when war came, carrying his dream to fulfillment. The next legend, which rose as the shadow of Ludendorff rose behind the figure of Hindenburg, 
was of a masterly plan for a second canny conceived and dictated in the train that was carrying Ludendorff to pick up his nominal master en route to East Prussia. History, alas, must dissipate both dot for the Germans, essentially a people of combination, found their Gallini in a conjunction between the brain of a young staff officer and the drive of an old corps commander. And they, in turn, were much helped because Russian leadership was able to combine the faults of a Moltke and a Joffre. Indeed, the military history of modern Russia is epitomized in the brief record of the invasion of East Prussia. The man who was, in large measure, responsible for the blundering execution was also responsible for that disastrous invasion being made, and being made before the Russian forces were ready. This was General Jylinsky who had been chief of the general staff until 1913. For he had made the military convention with France whereby Russia was pledged to put 800,000 men in the field on the 15th day of mobilization. This arrangement put a strain on the cumbrous Russian war machine which caused numerous cracks and local failures when it began moving. And it also put a strain on the Russian headquarters staff which led them to make decisions in a state of nervous flurry. But the arrangement did not end with this promise, for the new plan envisaged an offensive against the Germans simultaneously with the main thrust against the Austrians. To increase the drawbacks, the plan was to be carried out by a man who had not worked it out, who had even been deprived deliberately of any influence upon it by General Sukhomolinov, the Minister of War. Sukhomolinov, indeed, was scheming to get command himself. But he was not the only one who had a belief in his own divine fitness for command. And his rival claimed divine right. For when the war came the Tsar proposed to take command himself, to the alarm of his ministers. Under pressure from them the Tsar regretfully appointed the Grand Duke Nicholas, who was at least a trained soldier. But handicapped him by nominating his two principal assistants. One of these, Yanushkevich, was a courtier general, unpopular with the working army. The second, Danilov, was an able but orthodox soldier, and really directed the Russian strategy. From the earliest days of August the Grand Duke was incessantly pressed by the French, through the Russian Foreign Office, to do something to relieve the German pressure on the French, and to do it quickly. Thereby, Although the Russian invasion of East Prussia did not begin before the promised time it began before it was ready. East Prussia formed a long tongue of land pointing across the Neman River, to the heart of Russia, and flanked on the north by the Baltic and on the south by Russian Poland. Along the land frontier two armies had been assembled, the first or Vilno army under Renenkamp and the second or Warsaw army under Samsonov. The two formed a group under the higher control of Jylansky. His plan was that Renenkampf should advance against the eastern tip of East Prussia, drawing upon himself the German defending forces, then, two days later, Samsonov was to cross the southern frontier and bestride the Germans' rear, cutting them off from the Vistula. The fault of this plan lay not in the conception but in the execution. Its potential value was well proved by the alarm, indeed, the dislocation of mind, caused in the German headquarters when the menace was disclosed. But it suffered two natural handicaps, apart from faulty leadership and military unreadiness. The first was that the two armies were separated by the fifty-mile chain of the Majurian lakes, these also, in conjunction with the fortified Königsberg area on the west narrowed Renenkampf's line of advance to a gap only about 40 miles wide. Secondly, the Russians' own invasion from the south was now to be handicapped by the fact that they had left the border country a desert, with poor railways and worse roads, as a barrier against a German invasion. On August 17, Renenkampf crossed the eastern frontier with six and a half divisions and five cavalry divisions. The problem of meeting such a double thrust had long been studied, and Schlieffen's solution had been that of utilizing the obstacles of the country, especially the Majurian lakes, to strike hard and with full strength at whichever Russian army first came within reach, and then to turn against the other. But Pratwitz, the commander in East Prussia, was akin to his superior, Moltke, in his fear of taking calculated risks. 
unwilling to rely on land and garrison troops to supplement natural obstacles in delaying Samsonov. He also left the two divisions of the 20 Corps, Skelts, on the southern front. The remainder of his 8th Army, 7 divisions and 1 cavalry division, concentrated to oppose Renenkampf. And, to handicap himself further in gaining quick and decisive results, he launched a frontal attack on the invaders, owing to a mistaken idea of their position. This attack was delivered near Gumbinen on August 20. The German center corps, the 17, Mackensen, had to deliver the most straightforward attack and suffered a heavy repulse, which offset, at least psychologically, the success of the corps on either wing. Even so, Renenkampf was on the point of ordering a retreat to save his own center from encirclement when, next morning, he found that the Germans were retreating instead. For on the day of Gumbin and Samsonov had reached the frontier, so hurried on by Jylinski, that his troops were tired and hungry, their transport incomplete and the supple services in chaos. He had with him eight divisions and three cavalry divisions while two more divisions were following on. His appearance was reported by the 20 quarter Pratwitz, and his force was rather under than overestimated. Pratwitz was unnerved by the news, although the 20 Corps was not. That evening two of his staff, General Grunert and Lieutenant Colonel Max Hoffman were talking outside their office in the headquarters at Ney Eidenberg, uncomfortably close to the southern frontier, when Pratwitz appeared and called them into his office. There also was the chief of staff, Count Walder C., another wavering bearer of a famous name. With anxiety writ on his face, Pritwitz said Dash I suppose, gentlemen, you also have received this fresher news from the southern front? The army is breaking off the battle and retiring behind the Vistula. Both the junior staff officers protested, urging that the Gumbin and Thrust should first be driven home, that there was adequate time, and that, in any case, a precipitate retreat without fighting would give Samsonov, who was much nearer the Vistula, the chance to cut off the main German forces. Pratwitz, however, curtly told them that the decision rested with him and not with them. He then left the office, leaving them to continue the argument with Waldersee, and, eventually, to persuade him to take bolder measures. It was decided that, to gain time, and room, an attack should be launched against Samsonov's left or western flank. And for this purpose three divisions should be railed back from the Gumbinen area to reinforce the 20 Corps, while the remainder of the force there, I Reserve and 17 Corps, were to retreat westwards by road. Here was the foundation of the Dannenberg maneuver. On returning to the office, Pritwitz agreed to their moves, and spoke no more of retiring behind the Vistula. Next day he grew quite cheerful when word came that his forces had been disengaged safely from Renenkampf's front, and that Samsonov had almost come to a standstill. But on the 22nd, when the headquarters had been moved north to Mulhorsen, a bombshell was exploded by a telegram which announced that a special train was on its way with a new commander-in-chief and a new chief of staff on board, the first being General von Hindenburg and the second. General Ludendorff. Half an hour after came the delayed telegram which told Pratwitz and Waldersee that they had been superseded. Not until later did the astonished staff discover the clue to this dramatic upset. It lay in the fact that, while Pratwitz was out of the office, during the discussion on the 20th, he had not only telephoned to Mackenzie and to the lines of communication authorities, to tell them that he was going to retire behind the Vistula, but had telephoned also to the Supreme Command, then at Cobbins on the Rhine. He had even told Moltke that he could only hold the Vistula line if he received reinforcements. To crown his nerve-broken folly, he forgot to tell his staff of this telephone talk when he came back, and so prevented them informing Moltke of his change of plan. And Moltke, whose own loss of nerve and lapse into pessimism were still to come, though imminent was remarkably quick to penalize it in a subordinate dot he looked round at once for a man of decision and found him in Ludendorff, who had just trenched victory from defeat at Liege. Then as an afterthought, he chose a nominal superior for Ludendorff, who was summoned to Cobbins. Arriving there on the 22nd, 
he had the situation in East Prussia explained to him, dispatched his initial orders direct to the unfortunate Pritwitz's corps commanders, caught the train for his new command, and picked up his commander, Hindenburg, at Hanover. Let us pause to contemplate this delightful and amusing picture of the German system of command. The staff officer chosen first and alone consulted, while the figurehead waits unclaimed in the lost property office at Hanover, the staff officer telegraphing his orders, and then collecting his baggage on the way, but the supreme jest was that the plan had already been framed and the necessary movements made by a still more junior staff officer, Hoffman, who was to remain under Ludendorff in his post as head of the operations branch. The calculated daring of the plan, moreover, owed much to an earlier experience of Hoffman's. For Schlieffen, with discerning insight, had picked this simplishly brilliant young captain, whom many deemed merely a witty flamer, to go as observer with the Japanese forces in the war against Russia. There he learned much about the Russian army, and not least a story that two generals, Renenkampf and Samsonov, had boxed each other's ears on the railway platform at Mukden. Thus, in his judgment, Renenkampf would be in no hurry to aid Samsonov by pressing on from Gumbinen. He had also learnt in Manchuria the incredible carelessness of Russian methods and this knowledge led him in August, 1914, to accept the intercepted Russian wireless orders, sent out in clear, as authentic, whereas his seniors were distrustfully inclined to regard them as an artful deception. Paradoxically, the fulfilment of Hoffman's plan and its development by Ludendorff, the plan on which Ludendorff was to rise to world fame, were hindered by Ludendorff's initial orders. For, in order to amputate Pritwitz's control, Ludendorff had telephoned from Cobbins to the several army corps, telling them to act independently until he arrived. The I Reserve and 17 Corps on Rennenkampf's front utilized this order to take a day's rest in their retreat westwards. Another check on rapidity was that the whole of the 8th Army headquarters had to move back to Marienburg to meet the new commanders. On arrival there on the 23rd, Ludendorff was pleasantly surprised to find that the movements already in progress fitted in with his own half formed plan, and he confirmed Hoffman's arrangements. Next day it became clear that Renenkamp was not moving forward in pursuit, and Ludendorff enlarged the plan by accelerating the retirement of the I Reserve Corps, below, so that it could strike Samsonov's right flank. Then, on the 25th, intercepted wireless messages showed him the slowness of Renenkamp's movements, and he began to think that he could use the 17 Corps, Mackenzie, also, leaving only the cavalry to watch and hoodwink Renenkampf. Thereby he might strike hard at not one but both of Samsonov's flanks, and bring off a decisive double envelopment. Unfortunately for his now matured plan, even forced marches could not overtake the lost day of rest. Samsonov meantime had been staggering forward, driven on by telegraphic clashes from Jylinski, who had jumped to the conclusion that the Germans were doing what Pritwitz had contemplated, retreating to the Vistula. And in driving Samsonov on to cut them off, Jalinsky not only neglected to hasten Renenkampf, but even diverted his energy by orders to invest Konigsburg. Meantime Samsonov's army was spread out over a front of nearly 60 miles, and his right, center and left were widely separated. If they had been linked by mobility, this width might have been an advantage. But with sluggish troops and bad roads it became a danger and an attempt to sidestep farther west as he advanced led through self-dislocation to self-destruction. Skeltz's 20 corps had been slowly giving way, and wheeling back westwards, before the advance of the Russian center, 13 and 15 corps, towards the line allenstein Osterroad. Fearing both the strain and the effect of a further retirement, Ludendorff ordered François I Corps to attack on the 26th and break through the Russian left wing, I Corps and two cavalry divisions, near Ustau. François protested that part of his troops, three quarters of his field guns, all his heavy guns, and his ammunition columns had not yet arrived, he also urged that instead of making a frontal attack he should get round the Russian flank. Ludendorff summarily overrode these objections. 
His sense of time was perhaps greater than his sense of tactical reality. But Francois, who had no wish to repeat Mackensen's experience at Gumbinnen, avoided the Russians' active resistance by passive resistance to Ludendorff's orders, and contented himself with the capture of an outlying ridge. And any danger to Skeltz's twenty corps was avoided by the inactivity of Samsonov's exhausted troops. One corps, for example, had marched more than 150 miles in 12 days over roads that were merely deep sand dot but the 26th did not pass without hard fighting. For away on the other flank the Russian right wing, Vicor and cavalry division, separated by two days march distance from the rest of the army, had encountered near Lawton the two German corps that were marching back from the east front. The Russian right wing was thrown back in confusion, but the attacks of Below and Mackensen were badly coordinated, their troops were tired by the forced marches, and they did not press the pursuit. Thus the Russian right wing, although disorganized, was able to retire safely. Part of one division, however, had been hemmed in with their backs to the Bossa Lake, and in the panic a number were drowned. From this small incident arose the legend that Hindenburg had driven Samsonov's army into the lakes and marshes, drowning thousands. The real crisis of the battle, as a whole, came on the 27th. For that morning Francois, now amply supplied with shells, opened a fierce bombardment on the position of the Russian left wing near Ustau. The Russian troops could not stand high explosive on top of an empty stomach, and they broke in flight without waiting for the German infantry. Francois ordered the pursuit to be made towards Ney Eidenberg, to get across the rear of the Russian center, but a Russian counter-attack against his outer flank caused him to wheel south towards Soldau. At daybreak on the 28th, however, he discovered that the beaten Russian left wing had retired precipitately from Soldau across the frontier, and he once more turned his forces eastwards to Neidenberg. The time that he had lost on the 27th was compensated for by the fact that the Russians had engulfed themselves still further, to their doom. For although Samsonov knew the night before that his right had been beaten and his left was menaced, he had ordered his center to strike northward again. As he can be acquitted of undue optimism, there are two possible explanations, that he was too rigidly loyal to his orders in trying to carry out his mission, or that he was unwilling to retreat when Rennenkampf, his old enemy, was advancing. His attack probably saved the Germans a repulse, for Skeltz had been ordered by Ludendorff to chime in after Francois' attack. As it was, the Russian center made several cracks in Skeltz's front, although at the price of further exhaustion to itself. These cracks seemed to have momentarily cracked Ludendorff's nerve, for he ordered Francois both to send back assistance and, with the rest of his corps, to march northeast towards Lana, against the immediate rear of the Russian center. This direction, which traversed thick forest country, would have given Francois less time and chance to bar the Russian line of retreat. Fortunately, he again disregarded his orders, and continued towards Neidenberg. Soon after midday Ludendorff discovered that the Russians were not attempting to deepen the cracks, but, rather, were showing signs of retreat. So he sent Francois fresh orders not only to move on Neidenberg but, through it, eastward on Willenberg. And by the night of the 29th, Francois' troops held the road from Neidenburg to Willenburg, with a chain of entrenched posts between, forming a barricade across the line of retreat of the Russians who were now flowing back, and becoming inextricably mixed in the forest maze which Francois had avoided. With its rear closed and its roads congested, the Russian center, 13, 15 and half the 23 Corps dissolved into a mob of hungry and exhausted men, who beat feebly against the ring of fire and then let themselves be rounded up in thousands. The crowning scene of the tragedy was enacted by Samsonov himself, who had moved up from Neidenberg on the 27th to control the battle, only to find himself caught up in the swirling eddies of the retreat. Unable to do anything he turned and rode south again on the 28th, only to get lost in the depths of the forest. In the darkness he turned aside, and his absence was unnoticed by his staff until a solitary shot rang out, 
he had taken his own life rather than survive the disaster. But when he died the disaster was not so complete as his despair, nor so certain. If the Russian center had only been able to reorganize itself for an aimed attempt to break out, it might well have succeeded. For Francois' barricade was thin and was itself menaced from the outside. The source of the menace was Artamonovsky Corps which, after its defeat at Uzda and retreat over the frontier, had been reinforced, and now returned to the rescue. Air reports warned Francois of the danger on the 29th but he stoutly refused to give up his blockade, although he dispatched such force as he could possibly spare to check the advancing Russians at Ney Eidenberg. Even so, the town was lost on the 30th, but Ludendorff was already sending reinforcements, and Artamanov, having made little attempt to press his advantage, retreated south once more on the 31 st. The cause of Francois' weakness, however, and the escape of part of Samsonov's army, was due to the failure of Mackenzie and below from the east to join up with Francois. Thus the barricade was neither as firm nor as complete as it might have been. Owing to faulty cooperation between Mackenzie and below, and lack of clear guidance from above, their corps abandoned the pursuit of the Russian right wing and turned northwards towards Allenstein marching, in good German style, to the sound of the guns instead of weaving a net round the enemy's rear in Hannibalic style. Ludendorff, divided between fear of Renenkampf's advance and his desire to annihilate Samsonov, issued a contradictory series of orders which did not help to sort out the tangle into which Mackenzie and below had got their forces. In the outcome, he thereby risked more and gained less for he took longer to close up his battle accounts and left a gap in the southeast through which part of the Russian 13 Corps actually escaped, and most of it might have escaped, if Mackenzie, on his own initiative, had not turned southwards again in an effort to close the gap, and the Russians had not been blinded by panic. Nevertheless, 92,000 prisoners were taken, two and a half army corps annihilated, and the other half of Samsonov's army severely shaken, especially in morale. The Germans were certainly favored by the enemy's folly, above all, in dispersing the fog of war at intervals by unciphered wireless messages. Yet if we make due allowance for these flashes of light, we should take due account of the blindness and the difficulties of this wild region. The victory of Tannenburg remains a great achievement, as it was a unique one in the history of the war. But Ludendorff was not the designer of victory and still less Hindenburg. To Hoffman is due the chief credit of the design, if Bratwitz and Ludendorff have some share for accepting it in turn, and Ludendorff also for certain additions of detail. Nor was Ludendorff even the agent of victory, for Francois' share was the most essential. And against Ludendorff's share must be offset the fact that his original telegram from Koblenz was the original and echoing cause of the failure to complete Samsonov's encirclement. For the Battle of Tannenberg was not a second canny, deliberately planned, as it has so often been acclaimed. The aim was to break the force of the Russian invasion, and not to surround the Russian army, and the idea of the double envelopment only an afterthought which became possible of fulfillment when Renenkampf continued to remain passive. As much an afterthought as the very name given to the victory. For Ludendorff's order for the pursuit on the 28th had been headed for a Juno, when Hoffman suggested that he might aptly wipe out a stain on German annals by using instead the name of the town in front of them, Tannenberg, where in 1410 the Teutonic Knights had suffered an historic rout. For scene 3, the man WHO juggled with armies, and broke them, at Lemberg, a man in Europe had worked harder for war than Konrad von Hotzendorf, the careering head of the Austro Hungarian armies. None surpassed him in eagerness. Fate determined that he, of all the military chiefs, should come to grief most utterly in the first clash of the armies. Yet he was, perhaps, the ablest strategist among them. Moltke, Joffre, and the Grand Duke Nicholas were conscientious pedestrian soldiers, with marked differences of temperament but not of tempo. They were slow moving and slow thinking, 
whereas Conrad had a sense of mobility and an aptitude for bold maneuver. His strategy blended the spirit of an artist with the suppleness of an acrobat. If his ideas were bounded by the walls of the 19th century school of war, they represented its best fruits. Also its worst defect, a failure to appreciate the growing part that material factors play in modern war. Lacking a sense of tactical reality, he would attempt feats of strategic virtuosity for which his instrument was inherently unfitted. When it bent, under the strain, he merely pressed on it the harder, until it broke in his hands. The Austrian army was the most obsolete in equipment among those of the great powers, its field guns were fewer in proportion and shorter in range, some two thirds of the rifles were of old pattern, a quarter of a century old, and its reserve was so inadequate that, even in September, the troops holding the Carpathian passes had to be issued with single loaders, its transport was so scanty that it had to be supplemented by a cumbersome collection of assorted farm carts, which congested the roads. Yet with all these hindrances to vigorous action the training of the Austro-Hungarian army had been devoted purely to the offensive. This infatuation with a tactical impossibility seems to have been due to the influence of Konrad von Hotzendorf who had himself compiled the manuals on which the army had been trained. If the tactical instrument of his plan was brittle, its strategic foundation was hollow. The Polish salient, deep thrust between the jaws of Austrian and German territory, was on the map a morsel so inviting that any amateur strategist would have jumped at the idea of biting it off. It excited Conrad beyond discretion. He pictured to himself a strategic super sedan with his own armies thrusting up from Galicia and the Germans driving down from East Prussia, to cut off the Russian masses in the wide plains of Poland. But this project was not easy to adjust to the practical problem of a double-fronted war conducted by a double-headed alliance. Germany had long decided to concentrate her initial efforts against France. At a meeting in 1909, Moltke had told Conrad that he hoped to settle with France within six weeks and then to switch his forces to the Russian front in support of Austria. In view of the German decision, Conrad might wisely have decided to stand on the defensive until the reinforcement came. If he had done so, geography and Russian lethargy would have worked in his favor, to gain time. The rivers and streams that run north from the Carpathians would have provided a series of delaying obstacles, and the Russian army's slow rate of concentration would have withheld early danger. But, even to gain time, Conrad could only conceive one form of action, the offensive. And, with this obsession, Russia's lengthy process of mobilization served him as a justification. The sooner he struck the less force he would have to meet. It was calculated that the Russians would have 31 divisions on the Austrian front by the 20th day of mobilization, August 18, rising to 52 by the 30th day. Conrad counted on having available a force equal to the Russians by the first date, whereas he would be in an inferiority of 3 to 4 by the second. To him this was an incentive to prompt action although to anybody save a military optimist of the 1914 kind bare equality of strength, and strength of such a dubious quality, might have seemed inadequate odds in launching a would-be decisive offensive. But Conrad also counted on the strength of a vague promise from Moltke, in 1909, that the German forces in East Prussia would take the offensive. Although no direction was mentioned, and even the intention lapsed, Conrad continued to assume that such an offensive would take place. If the German general staff bears the responsibility of having failed to undeceive him, instead, Moltke indulged in schoolboyish exhortations to thrust the carriers into the marshes of the Pripyat and drown them. The dash Conrad was certainly eager to deceive himself, rather than forego the opportunity of displaying his art. His two strongest armies, the first and the fourth, were assembled on the left of his line in Galicia for a northward thrust, while the third covered their eastern flank, it was to be joined by the second when this eventually arrived from its circular tour on the Serbian front. Conrad had admitted the possibility that the Russians, instead of assembling to be cut off in the Polish salient, might concentrate for an offensive against his eastern flank, in that case he proposed to swing his armies round to face them, 
on a line through Lemberg, but, as such a possibility did not accord with his desires, he was more than ready to discount it. This did not prove difficult, thanks to the defective means of information on which he relied. He had over a hundred thousand cavalry, but a mere forty-two aircraft, and of these only a few were serviceable. The Austrian advance was preceded by a great mass of cavalry sent forward on August 15 on a hundred-mile excursion to search a front 250 miles wide. Within a few days so many of the horses had sore backs that several entire divisions were put out of action. Only a small proportion came within reach of the enemy, who did not use a cavalry screen, thus these Austrian cavalry bumped into the Russian infantry, who took heavy toll of them. The Austrian official history candidly remarks that the results of the distant cavalry reconnaissance were not worth the cost of casualties. But the slight indications that he gleaned sufficed to satisfy Conrad that the Russians were assembling according to plan, his plan. So, on the 20th, he gave the fateful order for the northward offensive into the depths of Poland. Groping in the dark, the Austrian infantry pushed on towards Lublin, while Conrad, in false confidence, expressed his belief that there is no sign of any Russian movement from the east against the right flank. His delusion was soon to be rudely dispersed, for two whole Russian armies were marching against this flank. In contrast to the Germans, Conrad seems to have discovered too late the possibility of intercepting the enemy's wireless orders, although he learnt the trick in time to escape the closing of the net into which he had blindly walked. By comparison, the Russian plan was of shrewd and simple design. It offered two essentially different alternatives, but the initial dispositions were made to suit either. In any event, all the Polish salient west of Warsaw and the Vistula was to be evacuated. The Russian forces were divided into two groups, one assembling on the northwestern front facing East Prussia, and the other on the southwestern front facing East Galicia, each group comprised three armies, with a fourth guarding its outer flank. If the Germans concentrated for an offensive against Russia, the alternative that would be adopted was Plan G, Germania by which the Russian forces would fall back to a north and south line through Brest-Litovsk, retiring farther if and when necessary, until the arrival of the troops from Siberia and Turkestan enabled them to take the counter-offensive in strength. If the Germans made their main effort against France, and remained inactive in the east, Plan A, Austria, came into operation. In this, the southwestern group of armies, reinforced by one from the northwestern, would take the offensive against the Austrians, the remainder of the northwestern group would invade East Prussia. In the light of orthodox theory, this plan of delivering a double attack on two widely separated points and in divergent directions, may seem unwise, and be too hastily condemned. Its justification lay in the weakness of the German forces in East Prussia and in the importance of a distraction to their effort against France, as the event proved. Also it would shield the flank of the main offensive, and shorten the front if it succeeded, while paving the way for the ultimate advance of the main armies into Silesia. Here were strong arguments. Moreover, it would have been difficult, because of poor communications, for more troops to be used effectively on the Galician side. The defects of the plan were less in the general design than in the conduct of the northern offensive and the crudeness of the instrument. Unfortunately, these defects were aggravated by the pressure which the French applied to the Russian command to accelerate its action. The Grand Duke Nicholas resisted their suggestion that he should advance direct against Silesia, ignoring the enemy on his flanks, but in loyalty to his allies he began to assemble two fresh armies on the center with a view to such a move, as soon as possible. Also, he tried to hasten the execution of his present moves, and thereby put a greater strain on the Russian organization than it could safely bear. If the consequences were most harmful on the East Prussian side, where they led to Dannenberg, their effects were felt earlier on the Galician side. Here the Russians, like the Austrians, had a picture of their enemy's plan that was exactly the reverse of the reality and no more than the Austrians did they have the means of information to correct it. Ivanov, commanding the southwestern group of armies, imagined the enemy moving east, 
they would be met by his strong third and eighth armies, advancing west, and then his fourth and fifth armies would descend from the north across their rear. A delightful picture, and, although it was incorrectly conceived, it came near to being fulfilled, the other way round. The opening, however, was unpropitious. Under pressure from the Grand Duke Nicholas, and contrary to Ivanov's wish, the Fourth Army on the extreme west began moving down before its mobilization was complete. In this unready state, it collided on the 23rd with the Austrian First Army pushing northward. Both were surprised. But in this Battle of Krasnik, superiority of force was on the Austrian side, and it enabled General Dankel to turn the flank of the Russians and drive them back. The news of this reverse was an unpleasant shock to the Grand Duke and Ivanov, but, with eyes still glued on their original picture, they too easily slipped into the deduction that the Austrian stroke came merely from an offensive flank guard. And to punish the audacious intruder Plev's fifth army was ordered to wheel westward against his flank and rear, so as to cut him off. Another picture. Unfortunately for the Russians, this wheel presented their own flank to the northward advancing Austrian fourth army, Orfenberg. The clash took place on the 26th. In this Battle of Komarov, the Russians suffered the worst because their own commander was continuing to urge the westward wheel while the enemy was forcing them to face round the south. Under this double pressure the Russian 5th Army became badly bent, especially on the flanks, and by the evening of the 28th it was in grave danger of being encircled by Orfenbergs. It might have crumpled sooner if the Austrian cavalry had not fallen a prey to a panic, due to their own carelessness, which temporarily unhinged Offenberg's advance. That hitch in drawing closed the net at fateful consequences. For the grey waves of the main Russian advance were now rolling on towards Lemberg, perilously close to Offenberg's line of supply and retreat. The caution and cumbrousness of the Russian armies, by acting as a break on their advance, had helped to keep Conrad in ignorance of the impending menace. And his own temperament had contributed to make this worse. Enthused by the opening success of his northward advance, he had drawn three divisions from the weak Third Army near Lemberg to increase Offenberg's strength. And at the same time he approved a suggestion that what remained should advance east from Lemberg to strike at the supposedly small Russian forces now reported in that direction. His second army from the Danube was only just beginning to arrive on the scene, at Stanislaw in the south. The third army's rash advance to the Zlota Lipa on the 26th was followed by still rasher attacks, unprepared and disjointed, on the heads of the Russian columns, which had a 5 to 2 advantage in numbers. The Austrians recoiled in disorder to the Nalipa. Lemburg itself, 25 miles behind the battlefield was filled with panic-stricken fugitives that night. Next morning Conrad ordered the battered Third Army to fall back on Lemberg, and sent word to Orfenberg to return the three divisions loaned to him. Conrad, indeed, was about to halt his two northbound armies when news came that the Russians were not pursuing their progress. Thereupon he changed his mind, and also his previous orders. Ivanov still believing that he was faced by the mass of the Austrian forces, had decided to pause for 48 hours, so that his columns might close up and deploy for battle on the Nalipa. Had he pushed on at once it is likely that he would have crashed through the shaken Austrians as through a paper screen. The Grand Duke, when he heard of the halt, sent orders that the advance on Lemberg was to be resumed immediately. A remote commander-in-chief may propose but his executive subordinates dispose, the troops under their control. The Russian attack did not develop until the 30th, and even then its decisive impulse came, not from Ruzsky's army facing Lemberg, but from Bruzlov, who had made a sidestep northward with the bulk of his army, the 8th, by night, and then delivered a smashing blow with his right corps against one sector of the Austrian front. Its collapse produced a general reflux. The roads to the rear were congested with fugitives, intermingled with guns and transport. The Austrian official history candidly relates that a mere cry of the Cossacks are coming often sufficed to cause another panic surge. They were not coming, however, 
anything like as fast as in the Austrian spheres. Once more the Russians gave their enemy time to recover. They took nearly three days to advance the 18 miles which their fugitive opponents had covered in less than one. Then, their belated approach produced fresh panics, which opened such gaps on the enemy front that Conrad was constrained to abandon Lemberg, late on September 2. But his enemy had given him time that he could not have gained. He used it, not to hedge, but to plunge more heavily, staking everything on the completion of his success in the north. Here, by the 30th, Offenberg's wings were well round Plev's flanks, while Dankel's right was driving a wedge between the two Russian armies. Confident of an early decision, Offenberg begged for two days' grace to achieve it. It was far easier for the local commander to ask than for Conrad to concede such an interval, he bore the responsibility for the whole, and had to face the alarming fact that only thirty miles and a panicky mob separated Ruski and Bruselov from the communications of his own northern armies. Notwithstanding this grim situation, Conrad accepted Offenberg's plea and allowed him to retain the extra divisions. Like a left handed swordsman beset by two adversaries, Conrad would guard his right side with a frail wicker shield while thrusting full out at the man in front of him. His willpower commands admiration, it would command unreserved admiration if one was sure that it was not fostered by self delusion. Moreover, in the modern war of masses, the will of the commander in chief, however strong, cannot dominate those of the men upon whom he depends, his will will not work unless his mind is attuned to theirs. In the events that now followed, the gulf between Conrad's ideas and the capacity of his instrument became manifest. On the night of the 30th, the commander of the menaced Russian 5th Army sought to extricate himself by an order for withdrawal. That order might not have availed to save him if fortune had not on this occasion favored the discreet. Next morning the jaws of the trap, instead of closing, were drawn back. Two archdukes controlled the jaws, Joseph on the right and Peter on the left. A solitary Austrian aeroplane, reconnoitering, magnified a handful of Russian cavalry into a division marching against Joseph's rear. He pulled back a large part of his force to guard it. On the other wing, the Austrian cavalry reported a similar threat, equally mythical whereupon Peter drew back his whole force, to cover his rear. Thus the Russians safely withdrew, leaving an empty battlefield. Too late, Offenberg the next morning ordered a rapid pursuit. Counter orders came from Conrad. These new orders were born of help rather than of anxiety. It was unfortunate that Plev's army had not been surrounded, but to Conrad's eyes it was rooted. It is fair to point out that he could only see the enemy's condition through the magnifying glass provided by subordinates eager to flatter his hopes and enlarge their own achievements. Encouraged by this view of a plev definitely removed from the board, Conrad conceived the picture of a new and greater encirclement. Offenberg should turn about and descend from the north upon the slowly advancing armies of Ruski and Bruselov while the newly arrived Austrian Second Army should strike from the south against their other flank, and lap round their rear. It was a masterly conception, which in breathtaking boldness, was worthy of Napoleon. Unfortunately, Conrad's picture did not coincide with the reality of his opponent's situation, and was affected by a change in their plans. Ivanov had ordered Ruski to incline northward, with Bruselov conforming so that he might take in flank and rear the forces that were pursuing Plev. The effect on Conrad's plan was that this movement brought Trotsky round to face the southbound Austrians instead of presenting them his flank, also, it contracted the space in which Offenberg could maneuver between his late and his new opponent. Even this might not have mattered if Conrad's instrument, the Austrian army, had been fitted for bold and swift maneuver. Its palpable unfitness formed Conrad's worst breach with reality. Moreover, a new danger was arising. There were now two armies instead of one facing his own extreme left. For the newly formed Russian Ninth Army had been brought down the Vistula to support the Fourth. While the latter pinned Dankel's army, the former was to push past his flank and round the Austrian rear. Then the whole of the Austrian armies might be cut off from their natural line of retreat. 
Thus while Conrad was trying to catch part of Ivanov's forces in a deadly embrace, Ivanov was sidestepping to get round his left and take him in the rear. The clash of these two plans produced a series of acrobatics such as huge armies have not attempted before or since, and to which these particular armies were most unsuited. Offenberg duly turned about and marched south, leaving the Archduke Joseph's divisions as a rear guard. The supposedly beaten Plev also turned about and followed. On September 6, Orfeinberg, expecting to strike Ruzsky's flank, found Ruzsky knocking against his own Atrava Rushka. Fortunately for him, Ruzsky was equally surprised, and this gave Orfenberg a chance to face round. Away to the far south, Conrad's other pincer had been no more effective. The Austrian Second Army came fresh, too fresh, to the fighting but was travel worn. Its advance soon petered out in a series of disjointed attacks, unsupported by artillery, which culminated in a rippling wave of panic during the night. When the tangle was straightened out, the Austrian 2nd, 3rd and 4th armies stood in a line facing east. The one clear fact that emerged was that the Russian armies were inclining northward. This inspired Conrad to the conception of yet another offensive design regardless of the state of his troops. On the evening of September 8, Orfenberg was given the task of holding the Russians who faced him, while the other two armies left their prepared defensive positions and wheeled northwards to roll up the Russian line. But the day of the 9th brought disillusionment. Bruzlov was also intent on taking the offensive, and the two sides met head-on. The condition of the Austrian forces discounted their superiority of numbers and the battle ended in stalemate, leaving each side with an exaggerated impression of the other's power. With faith unquenched, Conrad that night sent a fresh order to his armies for a concentric attack against the enemy on the Lemberg front. Next morning he went forward himself with the idea that his presence might be an encouragement. Not unnaturally, his presence at, or rather behind, one point of a fifty-mile line made no appreciable difference. He sent an urgent message to the commander of the Second Army to attack without halting, vigorously and regardless of loss. The commander of the Second Army did not think the order worth passing on to the troops. Such orders were to be repeated so many thousand times on all sides during the World War that it would seem as if to those who uttered them they had the virtue of a magic incantation. An economy of the phrase might have endowed it with more potency. It is rare to trace any effect on those to whom it was addressed, still less on the enemy. By his persistent pursuit of the tactically impossible, Conrad had engulfed his armies in a pit whence escape was helpless unless fortune threw them a line. Fortune relented and did so, by a telegram that did not travel along a line. While Conrad's disordered forces were throwing themselves against the Russians near Lemberg, in fulfillment of his plan, and becoming more entangled in the process, dark masses of the enemy were looming across their rear. Away to the northwest, Dankel's isolated army was struggling to hold up the Russian 4th and 9th armies, double its strength, who were pushing down from the north. On the 9th Dankel warned Conrad that he could hold them no longer, but must fall back behind the San. Worse still there was a 30-mile gap between Dankel's inner flank and Ruskies. Into this gap Plev's army and a whole cavalry corps were marching, unseen and unforeseen by Conrad. But the ingenuous Russian command came to his rescue in the nick of time. Early on the 11th the Austrians intercepted a wireless order which the Russians, according to their habit, had sent out unciphered. The order showed that Plev's left wing was expected to reach points well behind Rava Rushka by that evening. Still clutching at straws Conrad delayed a few hours in the hope of a miracle on his other flank, and meantime sent an order for the remnant of the Archduke Joseph's divisions to drive back the intruding mass. Orfenberg did not think such an order fit to pass on. So, in the afternoon, as no news of a miracle came, Conrad at last gave the order to disengage the armies and fall back behind the San as fast as possible. By one of history's strangest coincidences, 
It was at almost the same hour that Moltke accepted the inevitable and gave the order that converted the enforced withdrawal of his right wing into a general retreat of the German armies in France. The Austrian retreat, however, if less final, was far longer and harder. To quote the moving words of the Austrian official history dash day and night behind a huge train of transport vehicles marched the infantry, with bowed heads, yet undiscouraged, sick, the artillery, sinking in up to their axles in the morass that the roads became. The cavalry regiments, like horsemen of the apocalypse, in molten confusion, made their way on, their presence palpable from afar by the penetrating smell of the festering galls of hundreds of lead horses. The deep churned mud of the roads luckily served as a break on the inherently sluggish Russians. And frequent flickers of light from their wireless orders helped to guide the Austrians in evading interception. But Offenberg's troops could only do so by turning so far south that they became intermingled with the retreating tide of the Third Army. Less than two thirds of the Austrian troops whom Conrad had confidently pushed forward in August reached the shelter of the San. Even though they did not tarry, they were so obviously unfit to fight that on September 15, when the first Russians approached, Conrad ordered a fresh retreat to the Dunajek, a farther 80 miles west, leaving behind the great fortress of Przemysl and its garrison as an obstacle to the pursuers. Conrad would, almost surely, have saved himself and his country this additional draught of Gaul if he had abstained from his last futile assaults near Lemberg. But his rosy imagination had prevented him. This had certainly revived when, after the war, he wrote in his memoirs, the Austro Hungarian armies were not beaten. They had to be withdrawn to escape a situation that might well have led to a defeat if the battle had continued. From this they were saved. He saved them from annihilation but not from ruin. He had lost some 350,000 men out of 900,000, and the survivors had retreated over 150 miles, abandoning the province of Galicia. But the ultimate effects were worse than the immediate results. Conrad had juggled with armies, and broken them. If he was able to collect the pieces and stick them together with German glue, they never again had a sound ring. Foreseen for first Epridash the real and the shadow battle within nine months of its beginning. The war produced two battles of Ypres. And of these first Ypres was itself a twin battle. In its inception and its course it was closely related to the struggle simultaneously in progress along these are between Ypres and the sea. But it had also a dual nature. There was the battle fought by the Allied troops who held the shallow trenches in front of Ypres. There was a different battle being fought, in imagination, by the two chief commanders on the Allied side, at their headquarters behind Ypres. The latter were attacking shadows while the former were defending themselves against the sternest realities. Rarely, if ever, have the view at the front and the view behind the front been so widely apart. The clash at Ypres followed, yet was not truly a continuation of, the outflanking attempts that followed the deadlock on the Aisne. For while Joffre and Fock continued to concentrate their gaze on the immediate western flank of the German line in France, and their thoughts on the next overlapping move, Falkenhayn had shifted his attention to Flanders and was planning a wider maneuver, as wide, in fact, as the coastline would allow. A new Sixth Army, composed of troops switched from the eastern flank in Lorraine, was to counter Joffre's next narrow swing. Meantime another fresh army would sweep down the Belgian coast behind the Allies' flank. That army, the 4th, was made up of the troops set free by the fall of Antwerp together with four newly raised army corps, in these an enthusiastic crowd of young volunteers was blended with a 25% nucleus of trained reservists. The abandonment of Antwerp, and its possible consequences, did not obtrude into Fox Horizon. On October 10, he sketched out his picture of the future dash I propose to advance our left, 10th army, by Lille to the Celta Tournai or Orkies, the British army, forming line from Tournai through Courtrai. In this way all the French, British and Belgian detachments would be united on the left banks of either the Celta or the Lys. 
after that we can see. Had this intention been fulfilled the Allied forces would have been moving eastward while the new German forces were marching southward behind their backs. On the 13th, Fock wrote to Joff concerning Sir John French's intentions, the Marshal wishes at all costs to go to Brussels. I shall not hold him back. Fortunately for the Allied troops, King Albert held them both back by his sagacious reluctance to let go of the coast and embark on an inland excursion. And the Germans soon supplemented his restraining check. Besides confirming his wisdom. When the British II Corps began moving forward to fulfill its part of the wheeling sweep, it found that the French left was falling back. By the 18th, it had been brought to a halt itself before Lelieven was reached. The three corps, and Allenby's cavalry corps, coming up on its left, were likewise held up, and on the 20th found themselves resisting an enemy offensive. The day previously the German onslaught on the line, near the sea, had begun. Until now the six-week Belgian divisions, stiffened by Admiral Ronuk's brigade of French marines, had been occupying the line from the sea almost to Ypres. But, just in time, two French territorial divisions, covered by Maitre's cavalry corps, took over the right half of the line, as far as Dixmude, reinforcing Roanoke's brigade and linking up with Rawlinson's force at Ypres. The attack on the Belgian sector was made by Bessler's three divisions from Antwerp. Screened by these until the last moment, a greater force was converging against the Dixmude Ypres sector. At this moment of approaching crisis, Fock was still intent on carrying out his eastward offensive, and his chief concern seems to have been with the uncertain spirit of the British commander in chief. Sir John French had moved his forces to Flanders only after prolonged hesitation, anxious lest by taking position on the left flank of the French he might again be exposed as at Mons in August. Once committed to the move, he had quickly become optimistic, with the help of Fox's tactful handling and assiduous flattery. Then, however, he was disquieted by the resistance his two corps met in the initial advance towards Lille. He spoke of constructing a huge entrenched camp at Boulogne to shelter the whole expeditionary force. Sensitive as a weathercock, his mind had swung round again by the 19th, under Fox gusts of optimistic encouragement. Although Rawlinson's attempt that date to advance eastward on Menin had been abortive, French ordered Haig's corps to advance northeastward with the object of capturing Bruges, saying that the enemy's strength on the front Menin Ostend is estimated at about a corps and no more. Yet his own intelligence officers estimated, and underestimated, the enemy's strength as being three and a half corps. As one of the officers later explained, the old man only believed what he wished to believe. Fox's power of suggestion for the moment dominated French's mind. For two more days French persisted in the belief that he was attacking, while, in reality, his troops were barely holding their ground. The imagined offensive remained imaginary, because it clashed with the opening of the German offensive against Ypres and a simultaneous renewal of the German offensive against the southern part of the British line. Everywhere the British were thrown on the defensive, and in several places lost ground. But French that evening renewed his attack orders to Haag, apparently with the idea that his left wing would still find the enemy's open flank. So on the 21st Haig's corps duly tried to advance past Rawlinson's flank, only to be first held up and then menaced on its left. The troops dug in where they stood, and, as their left had been swung back, the Ypres salient of now immortal memory was formed. That same day, Joffre, visiting Flanders, had come to see French and, as an encouragement to fresh offensive efforts, had told him that the French detachment was being increased by the dispatch of the Nine Corps. The weathercock, however, was now veering, back to a former direction. Until the French reinforcements arrived. The British commander was unwilling to give any more far-reaching order than that action against enemy will be continued tomorrow on general line now held. It was a euphemistic way of recognizing the defensive. Fox still persisted in the offensive idea. Although the enemy's strength was now unmistakable, he ordered his own troops, now forming the embryo of Derbel's Eighth Army to make a general offensive on the 23rd in the three widely spread directions of rulers, 
Thirt, and Gestels. At the same time he asked the Belgians and British to take part, the latter again to swing east. If they had done so they would have laid open their flank. Happily the enemy gave them no chance of trying. Fox request did not reach British general headquarters until a few hours before the French attack was supposed to start. It was also complicated by the receipt of a request from Derbel that the British would attack in a different direction, and by Derbel's instructions to his own right wing to advance on a line which would take it through the British front. The official history remarks, with moderation, that such proposals could not be taken seriously. On hearing of them Haig telegraphed to GHQ that there must be some misapprehension of the situation, that there was no time for concerted action, and every chance of confusion. But his anxiety was needless. The leading French troops did not appear until the afternoon, and the enemy's fire at once stopped their attempt to advance. But they were a welcome reinforcement to the line of defence. Their arrival made the two sides approximately equal in strength, numerically, from Ypres to the sea. Next day, the 24th, the French IX Corps was ordered to continue to advance. Foch telegraphed direct to the Corps commander, Du Bois, all the units of the IX Corps are detrained, dash which was anticipation, not fact. Make your dispositions that all these units are employed today and that the action receives a new impulse. There must be decision and activity. The result at least gave an air of vindication to Fox theory, for Du Bois' men advanced over half a mile before they were finally held up, while the British, fighting defensively, lost some ground. But the German records suggest that in the proportion of loss inflicted the defensive was the more profitable and that by the night of the 24th the new German corps had blunted their fighting edge. Realizing that their effort was spent, the German 4th Army commander pinned his hopes to a continued effort against the Zer sector, where a decision seemed imminent. This, if achieved, would open the path to Dunkirk and Calais. Under cover of darkness the Germans had gained a footing across the Zer near Tervit on the night of the 22nd. Counterattacks failed to dislodge them, all the Belgian reserves were used up, and the French 42nd Division, which would have been invaluable for the purpose, had unfortunately been committed to a vain offensive in the coastal corridor near Newport. By the 24th the Germans had brought the infantry of two and a half divisions across the Zer to expand this foothold, and the Belgian centre gave way under the strain. Fortunately it managed to rally on the embankment of the Dixmude Newport Railway whether the 42nd Division was switched in time to stiffen the resistance. And Ronak's Marines splendidly withstood a succession of assaults on the key point of Dixmude. But the situation was still critical, and next day King Albert sanctioned the attempt to create a water barrier by opening the locks at Newport so as to flood all the country between the Zer and the railway embankment. These arrangements took time. But, happily, the line of the railway embankment was held, without suffering much pressure, until at high tide on the evening of the 28th the Belgian engineers succeeded in opening one of the locks at Newport and letting in the sea. If it crept in slowly, each day brought a fresh reinforcement to the flood, until it seemed to the Germans as if their whole country had sunk with them and behind them. With the impetus of desperation they renewed their attack and breached the embankment line of defence at Ramscapel. But the rising flood came to the rescue, and during the night the Germans began to retire across the Zer to escape being cut off. The crisis on the Zer was the prelude to a greater crisis at Ypres. This, again, followed on a fresh attempt by the Allies to take the offensive which weakened them for the subsequent defensive struggle. No sooner had the first crisis at Ypres passed than Foch resumed the offensive, in his own mind he had never discontinued it. That he had again infused French with his own assurance is clear from the telegram which French had sent to Kitchener, the enemy are vigorously playing their last card. In the night of the 24th French wired again, suggesting that the battle was practically won. But on the 25th the Allied offensive made practically no progress against newly wired German defences. On the 26th, Du Bois and Haig continued the attack, but only advanced a few hundred yards. In contrast, the sharp southern corner of the salient, 
where Orlinson's men, the 7th Division, stood, was smashed in by a German attack, and for a time converted into an equally sharp re-enterant. Luckily the assailants did not follow up their success. They were preparing and screening a greater stroke. A new German army under Fabic was being brought up, to be inserted like a wedge on the south side of the Ypres salient, between the 4th and 6th armies. This wedge was made up of six divisions, heavily buttressed with artillery. Its entry into the battle on the 29th would give the Germans a 2 to 1 superiority of numbers. With unforeseen irony, French had just wired to Kitchener that they were quite incapable of making any strong and sustained attack. For two days more, the Allied offensive was continued without effect, although Dubois had been reinforced by a third division. Faced with a strong line, and themselves provided with little ammunition, the fighting commanders were wise enough to water down the orders received from behind. And although on the night of the 28th these orders again prescribed the offensive, the troops in front suspected the coming storm. It broke, over the British front, at half past five next morning. It was now the Germans' turn to leave the shelter of their trenches and offer themselves as targets. An infantry trained to fire 15 rounds rapid in the minute with the rifle was thus enabled to prove its hitting power, and to produce a leaden counterstorm that obscured its lack of machine guns so well that its German assailants thought it had quantities, they declared that over every bush, hedge and fragment of wall floated a thin film of smoke, betraying a machine gun rattling out bullets. Thus at the end of the day the British front was intact, save at one point, Geluvelt crossroads. But Haag, under whom all three divisions had now been placed, had no reserve left intact. During the day, French had been to Castle for another injection of Fockian serum. Fock told French that he was satisfied with the advance of his own troops between Ypres and the sea, but admitted that he was far from well informed as to their doings. French, on his return, ordered the British advance to be continued. He also wired to Kitchener that if the success can be followed up, it will lead to a decisive result. Haag, with the greater realism that came from a closer view, told his troops to entrench, and added that he would postpone orders as to the resumption of the offensive until he saw what the situation was in the morning. The enemy command at the same time was issuing an order of the day which said, The breakthrough will be of decisive importance. We must and therefore will conquer settle forever the centuries-long struggle, end the war, and strike the decisive blow against our most detested enemy. We will finish with the British, Indians, Canadians, Moroccans, and other trash, feeble adversaries who surrender in mass if they are attacked with vigor. The attack was aimed at the Zandvoord and Messins ridges, to break through the southern hinge of the salient with the object of reaching the Kemmel Heights. Thus the main weight fell on the 7th Division and on the thin chain of three dismounted cavalry divisions which linked Haig's force with the three corps. A bad break was made in the cavalry line. But the war experienced assailants did not show the reckless courage of the volunteers who had been repulsed earlier, and their caution in following up their success enabled Haig and Allenby to putty up the gaps. Haig also made an appeal to Du Bois who generously sent his own small reserve to strengthen the line south of Ypres, where it certainly did more good than in supporting an imaginary offensive on the north side. Fock, back on the hill of Castle, had little idea of what had happened. Towards the end of the afternoon a first report of these events was brought to him, but, as he says, it was impossible for me to estimate their full significance. About 10 p.m. one of his staff came back with word that there was certainly a gap in the British cavalry front, which they could not fill for want of men. If this breach was not quickly closed, the road to Ypres would be open. Fock at once telephoned to the British GHQ at St. Thoma to ask for fuller news, but was told that nothing more definite was known. So, just before midnight, Fock himself set off for St. Oma. To counteract French's depression, and to fill the physical gap, he promised that if French would hold on he would send him eight battalions of the 32nd Division, which was just arriving in the French sector. Fock did not get back to Castle until about 2 a.m. Summarizing his action up to this moment, he said, pointing to the map, 
I've stuck away for there and there, then, at Holbeek, the English broken through, the botches passing through, away for here. A few hours later, after daybreak, the worst crisis of the whole struggle arose. The main German attack was once more aimed, with odds of five to one, at the sagging line of Allenby's cavalry. But this line, now reinforced by a few battalions of British infantry and Dubois' timely contribution, stood firm until the attacks died away at nightfall. Half, a bare half, of Fox's promised contribution arrived in time to relieve part of the line in the evening. The crisis of the battle occurred farther north, at Geluvelt on the Ypremenin Road. Lying on a forward spur of the low ridge that covers Ypres, Geluvelt was the last point retained in British hands from which the eyes of ground observers could overlook the enemy's line. Under increasing pressure the front of the 1st Division caved in, and shortly before noon Geluvelt was lost. The divisional commander, Lomax, on hearing the news, rode back to the headquarters he shared with Munro of the 2nd Division, and laconically remarked, My line is broken. Half an hour later a shell burst into the room where they were holding a conference with their staffs. Lomax and several others were fatally injured. Only one of those present was unhurt. Control was temporarily disorganized. Haig meantime had left his headquarters at the White Chateau and ridden forward up the Menin Road at a slow trot with part of his staff behind him as at an inspection. If the sight of him brought reassurance to the stragglers and wounded who were trickling down the road, the sight of them and the nearer fall of the enemy shells told its significant tale to him. On his return he heard definite news of the break in the line. It moved him to issue orders for his troops to fall back to a rearward line just covering Ypres, and to hold it to the last, if they could not hold on where they were. But, unknown to him, the immediate danger had already been averted. Soon after the Germans captured Galuvelt, a counter-attack by a remnant of the first South Wales borderers had retrieved the position on the flank. But, Clearly, it could only be maintained if an adequate reinforcement arrived. So Brigadier General Fitzclarence, commanding the 1st, Guards, Brigade, sent up the few oddments he still had at hand, and then raced back to find the divisional commander. Lomax's resources were exhausted, but he had arranged with Munro that in case of any break the 2nd Division reserves should aid him by coming down on the enemy's flank from the north. And earlier in the morning, one battalion, the second Worcestershires, had been placed at his disposal. Thus Lomax, barely half an hour before being himself mortally wounded, was able to give Fitzclarence the means of saving the situation. Swiftly, Fitzclarence studied the map and the ground and gave his orders to Major Hankey, commanding the second Worcestershires, his staff officer, Captain Thorne, went with them as guide. The counterstroke caught the Germans relaxing after their own success, and, coming unexpectedly, tumbled them out of Geluvelt before they could rally. If the German artillery was quick to exact a toll, the German infantry had shown a remarkable incapacity to exploit their opportunities. The disciplined cohesion of their superior numbers enabled them to break into the thin allied defenses, once inside, and themselves disordered. They failed to produce the initiative that might have guided them through, and became the victims of their own too machine like discipline. It was a serious reflection on the system and spirit of their pre war training. But the enemy's initial success, naturally, made a strong impression behind the defender's front, where impressions perforce operate sooner than facts, and often more decisively. Sir John French himself came up to the White Chateau about 2 p.m. No better news had yet come to relieve the gloom, and French had scarcely need to be told of the critical situation, for he could feel it in the atmosphere. Haig himself was in a mood that recalled the night of Landrecies during the retreat from Mons. Every reserve had been used, and French had none to offer. White with anxiety, he hurried off on foot to regain his car and go in search of aid from Fock. But he had barely departed when, just as Haig was preparing to ride forward himself, Brigadier General Rice came galloping back, as red as a turkey cock and sweating like a pig, with the news that Geluvelt had been retaken and the line re-established. 
Charteris adds, it was just as if we had all been under sentence of death and most suddenly received a free pardon. Hag alone showed no sign of the reaction, pulling at his moustache, he remarked, I hope that it's not another false report. Despite Rice's assurances, he seemed still doubtful, although he sent an aide de camp to tell French. The aide de camp caught up French just as he had reached his car. How far the news was convincingly communicated, and how far French understood its significance, is uncertain. He drove off at breakneck pace on the way to Castle. But as his car slowed down in passing through Vlaemeting, a French staff officer recognized him and told him that Fock was there conferring with Durbel and Dubois in the town hall. French went thither to catch Fock. In making his appeal for aid he painted a black picture of the situation and the state of Haig's corps. The reality was certainly dark, but perhaps the picture seemed blacker because Fock and French had so long persisted in seeing it brightly colored. French naturally told Fock of Haig's orders for a withdrawal and it was equally natural for Fock to regard any limited withdrawal as tantamount to disaster. He protested vehemently against any withdrawal, crying, if you retreat voluntarily you will be swept up like straws in the gale dash he could not picture the palsy that afflicted the Germans in following up their attacks. According to Fock, French replied that if his exhausted troops were asked to continue the battle, there is nothing left for me to do save to go up and be killed with the I Corps. It is possible that the dramatic note was heightened in interpretation. Whether or not Fock replied, you must not talk of dying, but of winning, he certainly proposed to apply his usual remedy. I'll attack to right and left. He promised that at daybreak six battalions of the 32nd Division, actually two less than he had promised at midnight, should counterattack on the right flank of the I Corps while part of Dubois' corps counter-attacked on its left. Dot, he then sat down and drafted a note, it is absolutely essential that no retirement is made, and to that end to dig in wherever you happen to be. This does not prevent you from organizing a rear position which should join up, at Zonnebeek, with our DC corps. But any movement made to the rear by a considerable body of troops will lead to an enemy push and to certain disorder among the retiring troops. This must absolutely be prevented. He handed this epistle to French with the words, There, if I were in your shoes, those are the orders I'd send to Haig. Of Fox influence on French, there is little question. It is reflected in the note which French now dispatched to Haig along with Fox memorandum. It is of the utmost importance to hold the ground you are on now. It is useless for me to say this, because I know you will do it if it is humanly possible. I will see if it is possible to send you any more support myself when I reach headquarters. I will then finally arrange with Fock what our future role is to be. But of Fock's practical influence on the battle situation at the time, there is no evidence. The Worcestershire's counter attack had saved it before Fock and French had their talk. And before their notes reached Haig, he had settled his new line of resistance. For tactical security he had decided to straighten the front of the 1st Division by withdrawing to a line just behind Galuvelt, while the 2nd Division was to stand on its existing line. And as the enemy pressure had ceased, what Fox said merely confirmed what had already happened. We may admire the spirit that inspired it, but we cannot regard this celebrated note as materially and historically decisive. For the next ten days Haig's line remained without change and unshaken, save for a minor withdrawal of his right on the 5th to conform to a recoil of the French troops on his right. On November 1st the main German effort was again made on the flank of the salient, against its southern hinge. This time they tried an assault under cover of darkness, as early as 1 a.m., and the experiment was repaid by the capture of the Messins Ridge. The inward bulge of Allenby's line was deepened by over a mile. But the arrival of the French 32nd Division soon after daybreak relieved the strain, although its counter-attack could not redeem the lost ground. If the other French attack on Haig's left also made no measurable progress, its appearance likewise tended to discourage the enemy from pressing his own attack. Fock wrote, the battle continues. It seems to me calmer. More troops are constantly arriving. 
In a few days we shall be able to renew the attack in full force. On the second the French attack to reduce the Messines bulge was forestalled by a German attack, causing a French recoil, during which Wickeet was lost and the bulge somewhat deepened. But most of the French 39th Division and half of Ka's cavalry corps arrived from the south to relieve the strain, and the 43rd Division was just detraining. The French now took over the larger part of Allenby's line. Thus they held henceforth two thirds of the battle line formed by the Ypres salient and the Messon's re entrant, leaving the weary and intermixed units under Haig's command to maintain the central sector. Worst hit of all was the 7th Division whose infantry were reduced from 12,300 men to 2,400, a bare fifth of their original strength. During the next few days Fock pursued his attacks, without progress. While those of November 1st and 2nd by their boldness damped the enemy's will to advance, these later attacks had no such moral effect to compensate their lack of visible progress. For the German command was marking time until, by combining their line elsewhere, they could bring up six more divisions for a renewed effort. In this, the points of their attack were to be successively closed inwards like a pair of calipers. Initially, abandoning the attempt to deepen the Messines bulge, they would place the points against the two hinges of the salient. Meantime, Fock and Derbel were playing into the enemy's hands by a reckless persistence in abortive local attacks. The sequel to this self-exhausting impulse is to be traced in the dangerous recoil which came on November 6 at the southern hinge in face of the Germans' new pressure, itself a preliminary to their final stroke. At Estieloy the Great Eyed came within two miles of Ypres, lapping round the rear of the British, who were holding the nose of the salient. Haag warned his chief that, to avoid being cut off, he would have to fall back to a line through Ypres itself. Fock, however, sent to assure Haig that he would regain the lost ground by an attack next day. At 9.30 am on the 7th he sent a message that the French line had been re-established. But in fact nothing had been done. His men were too deadbeat to respond to orders. And when eventually they were spurred to an offensive effort, it naturally failed thus failing to remove the menacing wedge that lay embedded in the flank of the salient. On the 8th Haig went with French to see Fock at Castle. And found him as exuberantly confident as ever. But it was his indefiniteness rather than his assurance that kept them from fulfilling their intention to fall back to a straighter and safer line. So, unable to obtain any satisfaction and unwilling to leave his allies in the lurch, Haig was fain to hold on as best he could, scraping the human putty off one crack to cement another. Happily, if deceptively, the next two days were comparatively quiet along the British sector. Not so for the French. For on November 10 the enemy struck heavily against the northern hinge of the salient, and as far as Dix mewed. The blow was parried, the French profiting by the natural line of the Zer Canal across which their left retired. Its more significant result was to convince the French command that their own line north of Ypres was the spot selected for the enemy's final effort. And thither were diverted such few reserves as they could spare, at the expense of the already weakened southern hinge. But this blow against the northern hinge had been intended by the Germans as simultaneous with one against Gelouvelt and the southern hinge, as far south as the Cummins Canal a blow for which a new corps under Plettenberg had been brought up, it comprised a division of the Prussian Guard and another picked division. As Plettenberg was not ready, the left hand blow had been postponed. On the 11th the attack was launched, in a grey November mist, and prepared by the heaviest bombardment yet experienced. But at all save two points it was repulsed. One was at the actual hinge, where the wedge was driven in as far as the later famous Hill 60. The French detachment there appealed for help to the French and British corps on either side, but neither could spare any reserves. The ever willing Du Bois, however, once more sent his only reserve, and with its help the line was restored. The other and deeper penetration was made in the British line just north of the Menin Road. Here the German 1st Guard Brigade broke through the weak front of the British 1st, Guards, Brigade, 
a strange coincidence of history, even though only the remnants of one guards battalion were left in the latter brigade. But the Prussian guardsmen, bewildered by the woods, failed to exploit their success and were driven back by a flank counterattack. In this the 52nd Light Infantry played a leading part, as they had done in repelling the final assault of the Imperial Guard at Waterloo. Although the blow had been heavier than on October 31st, the situation had never been so critical, perhaps largely because it had made less impression on the minds of the commanders in rear. And with the failure of this blow on November 11th, date of prophetic symbolism, the crisis at Ypres finally passed. It is true that the German higher command would, in its own mind, still deliver several powerful attacks before it admitted defeat. But the men who were called on to execute its orders were no longer capable of vigorous effort, or inclined to pursue such an unhopeful prospect. Thus the spasmodic attacks that continued during the following week, chiefly against Dubois' front, were but the fading flickers of a storm that is traveling away. The relief of the I Corps, so long demanded by Haig and refused by Foch with the word impossible, was now carried out, and the French took over for a time the whole salient. Dot first Ypres had been essentially a soldier's battle a greater Inkerman. In a memorable sentence General Edmonds has epitomized the situation, the line that stood between the British Empire and ruin was composed of tired, haggard, and unshaven men, unwashed, plastered with mud many in little more than rags. Its only divergency from accuracy lies in its one deviation from stark simplicity. The British Empire has shown a capacity for survival, even when its military expeditions have actually been driven back to their ships, and when its enemy has been in possession of the channel ports. And it is by no means sure that, if the expeditionary force had been defeated at Ypres, the Germans were capable of following so closely on its heels as to bring disaster. In the light of the succeeding years there is, indeed, reason for regret that Haig did not fulfill his idea of withdrawing to the straighter and stronger line along the canal through Ypres. It would have saved cost and simplified defence. And its hindrance to the later attempts at the offensive in Flanders, an impossible country for the offensive, might have been an additional advantage. The danger at first Ypres was certainly aggravated by the failure of Foch, French, and Derbel to realize this impossibility. Herein lay their most material influence on the battle. For the real handling of the battle was left in the hands of Haag and Dubois. Even they, for want of reserves, could do little more than cement the crumbling parts of the defense by judicious thinning of other parts of an ominously thin front perhaps to do boys, for the way he took, not once alone, the calculated risk of parting with his own reserves, is due the highest credit of command earned in the defensive battle. Foch undoubtedly had a moral influence on the battle, no less by his obstinate refusal to listen to reason than by the unconquerable strength of his will. This never will, did. Detach it from the actual ebb and flow of the battle line, and we can admire it unreservedly. It made an impression on all who came in contact with it. But one is not able to detect any point at which it touched the men in the battle line. And where it touched the fighting commanders the effect seems to have become a source more of exasperation than exaltation. The one sure point where Fox will fortified another will was at the back of the front, at the Allied General Headquarters. While some of the claims made for its influence on the Belgian command may be discounted especially in regard to King Albert, they cannot be disregarded. On Sir John French the influence is more measurable, but here the measure of its effect is inevitably as infinitesimal as Sir John French's influence on the battle. The German design was foiled, and Ypres saved, in spite of the delusions of the higher command, by the troops in the front line. The men who defended Ypres against the German onslaughts were front line troops in the strictest sense, their defence had length without depth. Its shallowness was the measure of their numerical weakness, but also the supreme tribute to their moral strength. The thin red line of the past was never so thin as the line at Ypres, and never so hardly tried. The thin khaki line withstood a strain that lasted for weeks compared with the hours of the past. Dot by a patriotic falsification of history, into which military chroniclers easily lapse, 
Too many accounts of First Ypres have represented it as a nearly all British battle. Ungenerously, and untruly, they have obscured the great part played by our allies, just as a century earlier they distorted the outline of Waterloo, and the vital share of the Prussians. To correct the proportions does not diminish the credit of the British troops. It is in quality, not in quantity, that military virtue lies. And no battle in Britain's annals has given clearer proof of fighting quality, and of its value, than First Ypres. It was a battle in the natural line of British tradition, a defensive attitude combined with timely riposts. Thus it suited the nature of the troops who conducted it. If it did not directly fit their pre-war tactical training, predominantly offensive in imitation of the continental fashion, it appealed to their native instincts, which count for more than a fashionable dogma under the test of battle. And because of the extent of their training, compared with the conscript armies of the continent, they had acquired elements of skill that were of value in any form of action. Above all was this true of their shooting skill, with the rifle. In defence it had greater scope and effect than in attack. Such was the ability of the British infantry to produce 15 rounds rapid a minute that the Germans credited them with quantities of machine guns whereas, in fact, each battalion had come to France equipped only with two, and in many cases had lost these by the time Ypres was reached. The delusion in the minds of the enemy, which such weapon skill created, redressed the delusions of the Allied higher command and was a decisive factor in the issue. Indeed, it was the decisive factor when coupled with the morale of the men who handled the weapons. No praise can be too high for the indomitable spirit which inspired their collective endurance. This was, in a sense, a special product. The enemy had no lack of courage. Their discipline was equally strong, and perhaps too strong for their own tactical effectiveness but the little British army had a corporate sense that was unique. To this its very smallness, as well as its conditions of service and traditions, contributed. First Ypres, on the British side, was not merely a soldier's battle but a family battle dash against outsiders. The family spirit was its keynote, and the key to the apparent miracle by which, when formations were broken up and regiments reduced to remnants, those remnants still held together. They attained their end, in both senses. Ypres saw the supreme vindication and the final sacrifice of the old regular army. After the battle was over, little survived, save the memory of its spirit. 5 1915, the deadlock before the end of 1914, the state of deadlock on the Western Front was realized, if in varying degree, by the governments and general staffs of the warring countries and each was seeking a solution. The reaction varied in form and in nature, according to the mental power and predisposition of the different authorities. With the Germanic powers the opinion of Falkenhayn was the decisive factor, and the impression derived not merely from his critics, but from his own account, is that neither the opinion nor the direction was really clear as to its subject. On his appointment after the Marne reverse, he still adhered to the Schlieffen plan of seeking a decision in the West, but he did not follow the Schlieffen method of weakening his left wing in order to mass on the vital right wing. The autumn attack at Ypres was made largely with raw formations, while war experienced troops lay almost idle between the Aisne and the Vosges. Colonel Gruner, chief of the field railways, even went so far as to submit a detailed plan to Falkenhayn for transferring six army corps to the right wing, but it was rejected. When we remember how close to breaking point the British front came at Ypres, it can only be said that for a second time the German Supreme Command saved the Allies. At this juncture, too, Ludendorff was pleading for reinforcements to make his wedge blow at the Russian flank near Lodz decisive. But Falkenhayn missed the chance by delaying until the April failure had passed from assurance to fact. Reluctantly dissuaded from a fresh attempt to break the trench barrier in the West, Falkenhayn seems to have been vague as to any alternative object. His feeling that the war must ultimately be decided in France led him to distrust the value, as he doubted the possibility, of a decision against Russia. 
Hence while he realized that the Eastern Front was the only practicable theater for operations in the near future, he withheld the necessary reinforcements until his hands were forced by the threatening situation of the Austro-Hungarian Front. And even then he doled out reserves reluctantly and meagerly, enough to secure success, but never in sufficient quantity or in time for decisive victory. It is to his credit, however, that he realized a long war was now inevitable, and consequently set to work to develop Germany's resources for such a warfare of attrition. The technique of field entrenchment was carried to a higher pitch than with any other army. The military railways were expanded for the lateral movement of reserves, the supply of munitions and of the raw material for their manufacture was tackled so energetically and comprehensively that an ample flow was ensured from the spring of 1915 onwards, a time when the British were only awakening to the problem. Here was laid the foundation of that economic organization and utilization of resources which were to be the secret of Germany's resisting power to the pressure of the British blockade. For the scientific grasp of the economic sphere in war Germany owed much to Dr. Walter Rathenau, a great captain of industry. She was also a pioneer in the psychological sphere for, as early as the autumn of 1914, German agents launched a scheme of propaganda in Asia to undermine British prestige and the loyalty of Britain's Mohammedan subjects. The defect of German propaganda, its crudeness, was less apparent when concerned with primitive peoples than when applied to the civilized peoples of Europe and America. The same period witnessed also the one great success for German diplomacy, the entry of Turkey into the war although this was fundamentally due to a combination of pre-war causes with military events. Since 1909 the country had been under the control of the Young Turk Party, to whom traditions, including that of friendship with Britain, were abhorrent. Germany, filled with her own dream of a Germanic Middle East, of which the Baghdad Railway was the symbol, had skillfully exploited the opportunity to gain a dominating influence over the new rulers of Turkey. Their leader, Inver Pasha, had been military attaché in Berlin, German instructors permeated the Turkish army, and a definite understanding existed between Germany and the young Turk leaders as to common military action, urged by the common bond of necessary safeguard against danger from Russia. The arrival of the Goban and Breslau reinforced the moral pressure of Wan Genheim, the German ambassador, and eventually on October 29 the Turks committed definite acts of war at Odessa against Russia, and in Sinai against Britain. Falkenhayn has shown the decisive importance of Turkey joining in the struggle dash first as a barrier across the channel of munition supply to Russia, and secondly as a distraction to the military strength of Britain and Russia. Under German dictation, Turkey struck as early as mid-December against the Russians in the Caucasus, but Inver's overambitious plan ended in disaster at the Battle Sarikamish. Turkey was no more fortunate in her next venture, to cut Britain's Suez Canal artery with the east. The Sinai Desert was a check on an invasion in strength, and the two small detachments which got across were easily repulsed, at Ismailia and Tassim, although allowed to make good their retreat. But if both these offensives were tactical failures, they were of great strategic value to Germany by pinning down large Russian and British forces. As an offset to Turkey joining the Central Powers, Italy definitely threw over the artificial ties of the old Triple Alliance and joined the Entente. On May 24, she declared war on Austria, her hereditary enemy, although avoiding an open breach with Germany. If her main object was to seize the chance of redeeming her kinsmen in Trieste and the Trentino from Austrian rule, there was also a spiritual desire to reassert her historic traditions. Militarily, however, her aid could not have an early or far-reaching effect on the situation, for her army was unready to deliver a prompt blow, and the Austrian frontier was a mountainous obstacle of great natural strength. On the Entente side the reality of the trench deadlock produced different and diverse reactions. If the desire to hold on to territorial gains swayed German strategy, the desire to recover their lost territory dominated the strategy of the French. It is true that their mental and material concentration on the Western Front, where lay the main armed force of the enemy, was justified by military tenets, but without any key to unlock the barrier they were merely knocking themselves to pieces. 
winter attacks in Artois, on the Aisne, in Champagne and the Wovro afforded costly proof that against the Germans' skill in trench fighting, Joff's nibbling was usually attrition on the wrong side of the balance sheet. As for any new key, the French were singularly lacking in fertility of idea. Britain's trouble was rather an excess of fertility, or rather an absence of decision in choosing and bringing to fruition these mental seeds. Yet in great measure this failing was due to the obscurantism of professional opinion, whose attitude was that of blank opposition rather than expert guidance. British inspired solutions to the deadlock crystallized into two main groups, one tactical, the other strategical. The first was to unlock the trench barrier by producing a machine invulnerable to machine guns and capable of crossing trenches, which would restore the tactical balance upset by the new preponderance of defensive over offensive power. The idea of a machine for this definite purpose was conceived by Colonel Swinton in October, 1914, was nourished and tended in infancy by Mr. Winston Churchill, then First Lord of the Admiralty and ultimately, after months of experiment hampered by official opposition, came to maturity in the tank of 1916. The strategical solution was to go round the trench barrier. Its advocates, who became known as the Eastern in contrast to the Western school, argued that the enemy alliance should be viewed as a whole, and that modern developments had so changed conceptions of distance and powers of mobility that a blow in some other theatre of war would correspond to the historic attack on an enemy's strategic flank. Further, such an operation would be in accordance with the traditional amphibious strategy of Britain, and would enable it to exploit the advantage of sea power which had hitherto been neglected. In October, 1914, Lord Fisher, recalled to the office of First Sea Lord, had urged a plan for landing on the German coast. In January 1915, Lord Kitchener suggested another, for severing Turkey's main line of eastward communication by a landing in the Gulf of Alexandretta. The post-war comments of Hindenburg and Enver show how this would have paralyzed Turkey. It could hardly, however, have exercised a wider influence, and it was anticipated by another project partly the result of Churchill's strategic insight and partly due to the pressure of circumstances. This was the Dardanelles expedition, about which controversy has raged so hotly that the term just applied to Churchill may be disputed by some critics. This is answered by the verdict of Falkenhayn himself dash if the straits between the Mediterranean and the Black Sea were not permanently closed to Entente traffic all hopes of a successful course of the war would be very considerably diminished. Russia would have been freed from her significant isolation, which offered a safer guarantee than military successes. That sooner or later a crippling of the forces of this titan must take place. Automatically. The fault was not in the conception, but in the execution. If the British had used at the outset even a fair proportion of the forces they ultimately expended in driblets, it is clear from Turkish accounts that victory would have crowned their undertaking. The cause of this piecemeal application of force, and dissipation of opportunity, lay in the opposition of Joffre and the French general staff, supported by Sir John French. Despite the evidence of the sequel to the Marne, of the German failure at Ypres, and of his own ambitious yet utterly ineffectual offensive in December, Joffre remained confident of his power to achieve an early and decisive victory in France. His plan was that of converging blows from Artois and Champagne upon the great salient formed by the entrenched German front, to be followed by an offensive in Lorraine against the rear of the enemy armies. The idea was similar to that of Foch in 1918 but the vital difference lay in the conditions existing and the methods employed. A study of the documents conveys the impression that there has rarely been such a trinity of optimists in whom faith was divorced from reason as Joffre, Fock, his deputy, in Flanders, and French, albeit the latter's outlook oscillated violently. In contrast, the British government considered that the trench front in France was impregnable to frontal attacks had strong objection to wasting the manpower of the new armies in a vain effort, and at the same time felt increasing concern over the danger of a Russian collapse. These views were common alike to Churchill, Lloyd George and Kitchener, who on January 2, 
1915, wrote to Sir John French dash the German lines in France may be looked upon as a fortress that cannot be carried by assault and also that cannot be completely invested, with the result that the lines may be held by an investing force while operations proceed elsewhere. Lloyd George advocated the transfer of the bulk of the British forces to the Balkans, both to succour Serbia and to develop an attack on the rear of the hostile alliance. In a memorandum on January 1 he suggested Salonika or the Dalmatian coast as bases of operation. That same day, curiously, Gallini proposed to the French government a landing at Salonika, as a starting point for a march on Constantinople with an army strong enough to encourage Greece and Bulgaria to combine with the Entente. The capture of Constantinople was to be followed by an advance up the Danube into Austria-Hungary in conjunction with the Romanians. Francia Despera e expressed similar views. But the commanders on the Western Front, buoyantly confident of an early breakthrough, argued vehemently against any alternative strategy, stressing the difficulties of transport and supply and insisting on the ease with which Germany could switch troops to meet the threat. Eight if there was force in their contention, it tended to ignore the experience of military history, that the longest way round is often the shortest way there and that the acceptance of topographical difficulties has constantly proved preferable to that of a direct attack on an opponent firmly posted and prepared to meet it. The weight of Western opinion prevailed and the Balkan projects were stifled. But misgivings were not silenced, and at this juncture a situation arose which revived the Near Eastern scheme in a new if attenuated form. The Dardanelles. On January 2, 1915. Kitchener received an appeal from the Grand Duke Nicholas for a diversion which would relieve the Turkish pressure on Russia's army in the Caucasus. Kitchener felt unable to provide troops and suggested a naval demonstration against the Dardanelles, which Churchill, appreciating the wider strategic and economic issues, proposed to convert into an attempt to force the passage. His naval advisers, if not enthusiastic, did not oppose the proposal and, in response to a telegram, the admiral on the spot, Garden, submitted a plan for a methodical reduction of the forts and clearance of the minefields. A naval force, mainly of obsolete vessels, was got together with French aid and, after a preliminary bombardment, entered the Straits on March 18. Drift mines, however, caused the sinking of several ships and the attempt was abandoned. It is a moot point whether a prompt renewal of the advance would not have succeeded, for ammunition in the Turkish forts was exhausted, and in such conditions the mine obstacle might have been overcome. But the new naval commander, Admiral de Robeck, decided against it, unless military aid was forthcoming. Already, a month before, the War Council had determined on a joint attack, and began the dispatch of a military force under Sir Ian Hamilton. But as the authorities had drifted into the new scheme, so were they tardy in releasing the necessary troops, and even when sent, in inadequate numbers, several more weeks delay had to be incurred, at Alexandria, in order to redistribute the force in its transports suitably for tactical action. Worst of all, this fumbling policy had thrown away the chance of surprise, which was vital for a landing on an almost impregnable shore. When the preliminary bombardment took place in February, only two Turkish divisions were at the Straits, this was increased by four by the date of the naval attack, to six when Ian Hamilton was at last able to attempt his landing. For this he had only four British divisions and one French division, actually inferior in strength to the enemy in a situation where the inherent preponderance of defensive over offensive power was multiplied by the natural difficulties of the terrain. His weakness of numbers and his mission of aiding the passage of the fleet compelled him to choose a landing on the Gallipoli Peninsula in preference to one on the mainland or on the Asiatic shore, and the rocky coastline limited his possible landing places. On April 25 he made his spring, at the southern tip of the peninsula near Cape Hells, and, with Australian and New Zealand troops, near Garba Teep, some 15 miles up the Aegean coast, the French as a diversion, made a temporary landing at Kumkail on the Asiatic shore. Owing to the Turks' uncertainty the British were able to gain a lodgment on several beaches, strewn with barbed wire and swept by machine guns. 
but the momentary asset of tactical surprise was forfeited, and the difficulties of supply were immense, while the Turks held the commanding heights and were able to bring up their reserves. The invaders managed to hold on to their two precarious footholds, but they could not expand them appreciably, and the stagnation of trench warfare set in. They could not go on, and national prestige forbade them to go back. Ultimately, in July, the British government decided to send a further five divisions to reinforce the seven now on the peninsula. By the time they arrived, the Turkish strength in the region had also risen to 15 divisions. Ian Hamilton decided on a double stroke, a reinforced blow from Garba Teep and a new landing at Sivla Bay, a few miles north, to sever the middle of the peninsula and secure heights commanding the Narrows. He deceived the Turkish command and achieved surprise on August 6, but the first blow failed and the second lost a splendid chance by the inexperience of the troops, and still more by the inertia and fumbling of the local commanders. For over 36 hours, before reserves arrived, only one and a half Turkish battalions barred the path. Energetic new commanders, for whom Ian Hamilton had previously asked, were sent out when the opportunity had passed. The British were once more condemned to hang on to tenuous footholds, and, with the autumn rains setting in, their trials were increased. The government had lost faith and were anxious to withdraw, but fear of the moral effect delayed their decision. Ian Hamilton was asked for his opinion, however, and when he pronounced in favour of continuing, in which course he still had confidence, he was replaced by Sir Charles Munro, who immediately declared for evacuation. It was a remarkable example of prompt decision. While Munro visited Anzac, Savla, and Hells during a single morning, without going farther than the beach, his chief of staff sat on board ship drafting the recommendation for evacuation. Well may Churchill say dash he came, he saw, he capitulated. Kitchener at first refused to sanction the withdrawal and himself hurried out to investigate. The government was most relieved to see him go because they hoped to utilize his absence to relieve him of his post. Most of the coalition cabinet were united in dissatisfaction with his secretiveness and his administration, although disunited over the question of evacuating Gallipoli. Mr. Bernalaw, the leader of the Conservative Party, took a strong line on both questions. The Prime Minister, however, feared a public outcry over Kitchener's removal only less than he feared Mr. Bernalaw's resignation, and so temporized by giving way to Bernalaw's demand for evacuation, and by excluding Churchill from the War Committee of the Cabinet. Evacuation, therefore, was virtually decided upon before Kitchener reached Gallipoli. The fresh wave of opinion at home undoubtedly had an effect on his mind, and after his revived proposal for a fresh landing near Alexandretta had been vetoed by the war committee, he reluctantly veered round and consented to evacuation. Curiously, in the last phase it was the Navy that tried to avert this. For de Robeck, who had passively resisted since March all promptings to a further naval attack, was now relieved by Admiral Wemyss who not only opposed evacuation but, basing himself on a plan devised by Commodore Keyes, offered to force the Straits and control them for an indefinite period. The proposal came too late. The forces of opposition at home were now too strong, and in obedience to orders a withdrawal of the troops was carried out from Savla and Anzac on the night of December 18, and from Hells on that of January 8. If the bloodless evacuation was an example of masterly organization and cooperation, it was also a proof of the greater ease of such operations in modern warfare. And as a final touch of irony Monroe and his chief of staff, who had nothing to do with its skillful execution, received high decorations in reward. Thus the curtain rang down on a sound and far-sighted conception, marred by a chain of errors in execution almost unrivaled even in British history. The German campaign. While the British were striving to unlock the back door to Russia, the Germanic powers were hammering the Russians, whose resistance was collapsing in large measure from a lack of munitions which could only be made good by foreign supplies through that locked entrance, the Dardanelles. This fact and its effect was acutely appreciated by Russia's most formidable opponent. 
In the autumn of 1915, Hoffman emphatically declared that the success of Germany's efforts against Russia depended on keeping the Dardanelles firmly closed. For if the Russians saw that there was no means of exporting their wheat, or importing war material, there would be a gradual collapse in that country. On the Eastern Front, the campaign of 1914 had shown that a German force could count on defeating any larger Russian force, but that when Russians and Austrians met on an equality victory rested with the Russians. Falkenhayn was forced, reluctantly, to dispatch German reinforcements as a stiffening to the Austrians, and thus was dragged into an offensive in the East, rather than adopting it as a clearly defined plan. Ludendorff, in contrast, had his eyes firmly fixed on a particular object, and from now on advocated unceasingly a wholehearted effort to break Russia. Ludendorff's was a rigid strategy of decision, Falkenhayn's an opportunistic strategy of attrition. The one took too little account of political factors, the other too much dot in the conflict of wills between these two men, lies the clue to the resultant strategy of Germany, highly effective, yet not decisive. This tug of wills was marked by the offensive use of the telegraph and by the unceasing pull of wires, with the Kaiser as the chief puppet. While Falkenhayn was constantly trying to nullify a potential supplanter by denuding Hindenburg of the power to strike the enemy effectively, Ludendorff countered by screwing Hindenburg up to threats of resignation. Well might Hoffman watching the intrigues, note in his diary, when one gets a close view of influential people, their bad relations with each other, their conflicting ambitions. One must always bear in mind that it is certainly much worse on the other side among the French, English and Russians, or one might well be nervous. His intuition was correct. The race for power and personal position seems to destroy all men's characters. I believe that the only creature who can keep his honor is a man living on his own estate, he has no need to intrigue and struggle, for it is no use intriguing for fine weather. The Russian plan for 1915 embodied some of the lessons of experience and was soundly conceived, but the means were lacking and the instrument defective. The Grand Duke Nicholas aimed to secure both his flanks solidly before attempting a fresh blow towards Silesia. From January until April, under bitter winter conditions, the Russian forces on the southern flank of the Polish salient strove to gain possession of the Carpathians and the gateways into the Hungarian plain. The Austrians, with a German infusion, parried their efforts, and the loss was disproportionate to the small gains. But the long besieged fortress of Przemysl, with 120,000 men, at last fell into Russian hands on March 22. In northern Poland the Russians were preparing to strike upwards at East Prussia, when they were forestalled by a fresh Ludendorff stroke eastwards towards the frontier of Russia proper. The blow was launched on February 7, over snow-buried roads and frozen swamps, and was distinguished by the envelopment and capture of four Russian divisions in the Augustovo forests, near the Mazurian lakes. Moreover, it extracted the sting from the Russian attack farther west. These moves were, however, merely a curtain raiser to the real drama of 1915. But before turning to this, it is necessary to glance at events on the Western Front, the importance of which is partly as a signpost to the future and partly because of their reaction on the Eastern Front. While a way round the trench barrier was being sought in Gallipoli and experiments with a novel key were being carried out in England, the Allied commands in France were trying more orthodox solutions. In February and March the French lost 50,000 men in nibbling their way 500 yards into the German defences in Champagne, in his report Joff claimed that the offensive was nonetheless fecund in results. In April the French sacrificed 64,000 men in an attack against the St. Mihiel salient which proved a complete fiasco. Smaller, yet more significant was the British attack at Neuve Chapelle on March 10. Save as a pure experiment the attempt stood self-condemned. For it was an isolated attempt on a small front with inadequate resources. The arrival in France of several new regular divisions, made up from foreign garrisons, of the Indian Corps, and of the 1st Canadian Division, had brought the British strength up to 13 divisions and 5 cavalry divisions. 
besides a number of selected territorial battalions. This increase enabled French to divide his forces into two armies, and gradually to extend his share of the front. But Joffre was insistent that French should relieve the French of the Ypres salient, which they had taken over in November, and he made the intended French attack contingent on this relief. Sir John French considered that he had not sufficient troops for both purposes, and so decided to carry out the attack single-handed. An additional motive was his resentment of the constant French criticisms that the British were not pulling their weight. In design, however, the attack, entrusted to Haig's First Army, was both original and well thought out. After an intense bombardment of 35 minutes duration on a 2,000 yards frontage, the artillery lengthened their range and dropped a curtain of fire to prevent reinforcements reaching the enemy's battered trenches which were rapidly overrun by the British infantry. Complete surprise was attained, and most of the first positions captured, but when, in the second phase, the frontage was extended, the artillery support proved inadequate. Further, owing to scanty information and to the two corps commanders waiting upon each other, a long pause occurred which gave the Germans five clear hours to organize fresh resistance. Then, too late and mistakenly, Haig ordered the attack to be pressed regardless of loss. And loss proved the only result. An underlying factor was that the narrowness of the attack sector made the breach more easy for the defenders to close, although this defect was unavoidable owing to the general shortage of munitions, especially heavy guns and high explosive shell for them. The British had been slower than the Germans to awaken to the scale of munition supply required for this new warfare. Even so, Deliveries fell far behind contract, owing largely to the handicap imposed by trade union rules on the dilution of skilled labor. These could only be modified after long negotiation, and the shortage of shells became so obvious in the spring of 1915 as to lead to a public outcry initiated by Colonel Rippington, the military correspondent of the Times, after consultation with Sir John French. Lord Northcliffe with fearless disregard of the odium, threw the full weight of his newspaper into the campaign which culminated in the establishment of a Ministry of Munitions, under Lloyd George, to coordinate and develop both the supply and the manufacture of raw materials. Although this press campaign failed to recognize some of the major causes of the shortage, as well as the fact that the need was for more heavy guns and not merely for more shells, its general effect was of incalculable value. Nothing else could have so roused the people or cleared away obstructions. Apart from shells, the crudeness and inferiority of all the British trench warfare weapons, compared with the German, made such a radical reorganization overdue, and its urgency was emphasized by the near approach of the time when Britain's new national armies would take the field. If the task was undertaken late, it was carried out with energy and thoroughness, although improvisation was long in overtaking the evil consequences of early neglect. Apart from labor difficulties the immediate fault lay largely with military short-sightedness, which manifested itself in a constant tendency to underestimate needs and underrate novelties. It is significant that as far back as 1908 the financial secretary of the war office, impressed by an official observer's report of the growing use of machine guns in the German army, wrote to the Master General of the Ordnance that if the military members of the Council would like to have more machine guns for the Army that at any rate the Finance Department of the War Office would make no objection. He received the reply that two machine guns per battalion were enough. And to that scale the War Office authorities stubbornly adhered, although in 1909 the School of Musketry urged an increase to six. Even when the machine gun had obviously gained a dominance of the battlefield. General headquarters in France resisted its growth from the puny pre war scale of two in each battalion. One army commander, Haag, declared that it was a much overrated weapon and that this scale was more than sufficient. Even Kitchener laid down that four were a maximum and any in excess a luxury, until the Ministry of Munitions came to the rescue of the machine gun advocates and boldly multiplied the scale of provision by 16. It was due also to Mr. Lloyd George that the Stokes gun, a quick-firing light mortar, 
had the chance to surmount the official barrier and develop into the outstanding and ubiquitous trench weapon of the war. And later, the Ministry of Munitions suckered the tank when it was repeatedly threatened by the suffocating embrace of the war office. Nevertheless the ultimate responsibility for the munition failure lay with the British people, and their representatives in Parliament. Although, before the war came, the new Committee of Imperial Defence had done much preparatory spade work, a strict limit was set to its efforts by the passivity as well as parsimony of Parliament and people in face of the growing danger of war. Preparedness crawled forward to meet the onrushing menace. Most fundamental of all faults was the neglect to organize the industrial resources of the country for conversion and expansion in case of war. While an increase in the fighting forces may, by its air of threat, accelerate the danger of war, readiness for industrial mobilization is unprovocative and, if war comes, a more essential foundation for the power to wage it. The pre war neglect is a far graver charge against the government which declared war on August 4, 1914, than any failure to increase the army estimates or to introduce conscription. Yet in making that declaration, the government, however conscious of the political and moral issues, appears to have been unconscious that it was dooming the manhood of the nation to a terrible drain of life through want of weapons. It is a moral question how far, in such circumstances, any government is justified in taking the decision for war and in retaining office. The only excuse lies in the sanction of public indifference to such needs. And unhappily, experience has shown the practical difficulties suffered by a democratic government which tries to outstrip public opinion. Thus the ultimate responsibility falls on the British people. Even the military conservatism which obstructed improvements and reorganization during the war may be charged to lack of public concern with the training and selection of officers in peace. In the light of 1914-18 the whole people bear the stigma of infanticide. No belated wartime spurt could overtake the consequences of pre-war neglect until many thousands of lives had been wasted vainly. Even the Somme offensive was to be hampered by a limited supply of ammunition while of this much was wasted because of the failure of hastily produced fuses. Not until the end of 1916 did the flow of munitions reach a volume, still expanding, which finally removed any material handicap on the strategy of the British leaders. The tactical sequel of Neuve Chapelle was less fortunate. It was clear that the small-scale experiment had only missed success by a narrow margin, and that there was scope for its development. But the Entente commands missed the true lesson, which was the surprise attainable by a short bombardment that compensated its brevity by its intensity. And only partially did they appreciate the fact that the sector attacked must be sufficiently wide to prevent the defender's artillery commanding, or his reserves closing, the breach. Instead, they drew the superficial deduction that mere volume of shell fire was the key to success. Not until 1917 did they revert to the Neuve Chapelle method. It was left to the Germans to profit by the experience against the Russians in May. But before that occurred, the Western Front was destined to increase the tally of military blunders. In the first, it was the Germans' turn to find and misuse a new key to the trench deadlock. This was the introduction of gas, and, unlike the British introduction of tanks later, the chance, once forfeited, did not return, owing to the relative ease of providing an antidote. On October 27, 1914, in the Neuve Chapelle sector, the Germans fired 3,000 shrapnel shells containing a nose and eye irritant as well as bullets. This was the first battlefield experiment, but the effect was so weak that the fact was not even known until revealed by the Germans after the war. Then, in a local attack in Poland on January 31, 1915, the Germans tried the use of improved lacrimatory gas shell, but the experiment was a failure owing to the nullifying effect of the intense cold. At the next attempt the gas was lethal and was discharged from cylinders owing to the failure of the authorities to provide the inventor, Haber, with adequate facilities for the manufacture of shells. Further, the initial disappointment led the German command to place little trust in its value. In consequence, 
When gas was discharged against the French trenches at Ypres on April 22, there were no reserves at hand to pour through the wide breach it created. A strange green vapor, a surging mass of agonized fugitives, a four-mile gap without a living defender, such was the sequence of events. But the resistance of the Canadians on the flank of the bridge and the prompt arrival of English and Indian reinforcements saved the situation in the absence of German reserves. The chlorine gas originally used was undeniably cruel, but no worse than the frequent effect of shell or bayonet, and when it was succeeded by improved forms of gas, both experience and statistics proved it the least inhumane of modern weapons. But it was novel and therefore labelled an atrocity by a world which condones abuses but detests innovations. Thus Germany incurred the moral odium which inevitably accompanies the use of a novel weapon without any compensating advantage. On the Entente side, wisdom would have counselled a period of waiting until their munition supply had grown and the new British armies were ready but the desire to regain lost territory and the duty of relieving the pressure on Russia combined with ill-founded optimism to spur Joffre to premature offensives. The German losses were exaggerated, their skill and power in defense underrated, and a series of diffused and unconnected attacks were made. The chief was by the French between Lens and Arras, under Fox direction when the earlier experience of failure to make an effective breach in the trench barrier was repeated. The attack was launched on May 9 by Derbel's army, of 18 divisions, on a four-mile frontage. It was quickly checked with murderous losses except on the front of Badain's corps which, thanks to meticulous preparation, broke through to a depth of two miles. But the penetration was too narrow, reserves were late and inadequate and the gap closed. Fock, however, persevered with vain attacks which gained a few acres of ground at excessive loss. Meantime Haig's first army had attacked towards Orbers Ridge simultaneously with the larger French attempt. The plan was to penetrate at two points north and south of Neuve Chapelle, four miles apart, the total frontage of the two being two and a quarter miles, and then to converge in exploiting the double penetration. But the Germans profiting also from the experimental value of Neuve Chapelle, had developed their defences. Thus the attack died away quickly from a surfeit of German machine guns and an insufficiency of British shells. Under pressure from Joffre the attack was renewed on May 15 on the Festubert sector south of Neuve Chapelle, and continued by small bites until May 27. The larger French offensive between Lens and Arras was not abandoned until June 18 when the French had lost 102,500 men, nearly double the defenders lost. The effect of these attacks was, moreover, to convince even the dubious Falkenhayn of the strength of his western line, and of the remoteness of any real menace from the Franco-British forces. His offensive on the Eastern Front had already opened. Tactically unlimited, its strategic object was at first only the limited one of relieving the pressure on the Austrian Front, and, concurrently, of reducing Russia's offensive power. Conrad proposed and Falkenhayn accepted a plan to break through the Russian center as the best means to this end. In this plan the Gaulistan no sector between the Upper Vistula and the Carpathians was selected as offering the fewest obstacles to an advance and best protection to the flanks of a penetration. The breakthrough was entrusted to Mackenzie, whose chief of staff and guiding brain was seeked the man who was to rebuild the German army after the war. Mackenzie's force comprised the newly formed German 11th Army, made up with eight divisions from the west, and the 4th Austro-Hungarian Army. The Ypres gas attack and a large cavalry raid from East Prussia were initiated to cloak the concentration on the Dunajek of 14 divisions and 1,000 guns against a front held by only six Russian divisions. This front was composed of several lines of trenches but not highly fortified. Between the opposing sides there was a wide no man's land, as much as two miles across, in which the inhabitants were still living in their farms, the cattle pasturing undisturbed dash until the Germans removed these people as a precaution against any leakage of news. Mackenzie's army arrived on the scene and took over its allotted sector during the last week in April being inserted between two Austrian armies. 
For his 18-mile front of attack Mackenzie had one field gun to every 45 yards, and one heavy gun to every 132 yards. If this was not large by later standards it was ample to solve the problem of breaking into a position such as the Russians had organized. The greater problem was that of maintaining the momentum of the advance so as to break through the rearward positions before the Russian reserves could arrive and man them. To meet this need Sikh issued instructions that all staffs must strive to keep the advance continuously moving. No definite daily objectives were to be assigned to corps and divisions lest by fixing them the possibility of further progress might be stopped. The quick advance of one part of the front will ease the situation at other parts where there is more resistance. Disposition in depth should enable the success at one place to be extended to a neighboring front. This conception of a varying progress coupled with a flexible use of reserves foreshadowed the famous infiltration method of 1918 with its keen out of backing up success instead of trying to redeem local failure. To the further benefit of the Germans Ivanov, the Russian army group commander, would not believe reports of the impending attack and was thus caught with his reserves badly placed. During the night of May 1 the storm troops moved forward across no man's land and dug in close to the enemy front line. At 10 am on the 2nd, after a four hours intense bombardment had flattened the Russian trenches, the attack was launched and the infantry swept forward through the dust and smoke. Here and the lone grey figures jumped up and ran back, weaponless, in grey fur caps and fluttering, unbuttoned great coats. Soon there was not one of them remaining. Like a flock of sheep they fled in wild confusion. The surprise was complete, the exploitation rapid, and despite a gallant stand on the Wisloka River, the whole Russian line along the Carpathians was rolled up until on May 14 the Austro-German advance reached the San, 80 miles from its starting point. Russian defeat almost turned into disaster when the San was forced at Jaroslav, but the impetus of the advance had momentarily spent itself in reserves were lacking. A new factor was introduced by Italy's declaration of war against Austria, but Falkenhayn persuaded the Austrian command, with some difficulty, not to move troops from the Russian front and to maintain a strict defensive on their Italian frontier, which was secured by the mountain barrier. He realized that he had committed himself too far in Galicia to draw back, and that only by bringing more troops from France could he hope to fulfill his object of transferring troops back there. For this could only be possible when Russia's offensive power was crippled and her menace to Austria removed. Strengthened by these reinforcements, Mackenzie attacked again in cooperation with the Austrians, retook Zemeisl on June 3 and captured Lemberg on June 22, cutting the Russian front into two separated portions. But neither Falkenhayn nor Conrad had foreseen such results, and in consequence no arrangements had been made to maintain supplies during so long an advance. Hurried improvisation could not atone for lack of preparation and the consequent delays allowed the enemy to retire without dissolving, though he left copious drippings. The Russians, from their vast manpower resources, had almost made good the loss of 400,000 prisoners, so that Falkenheim's anxiety about the stability of his Austrian allies led him to yield to Sikh's insistence and to continue the offensive, although still with limited objects and with one eye on the situation in France. Mackenzie's direction was changed, however, from eastwards to northwards, up the wide corridor between the Bug and Vistula, where lay the main Russian forces. In conjunction, Hindenburg was ordered to strike southeast from East Prussia, across the Nehru and towards the Bug. Ludendorff disliked the plan as being too much of a frontal attack, the Russians might be squeezed by the closing in of the two wings, but their retreat would not be cut off. He urged once more his spring scheme for a wide enveloping maneuver through Kovno on Vilna and Minsk. Conrad took the same view. Falkenhayn opposed this plan, fearing that it would mean more troops and a deeper commitment. And on July 2 the Kaiser decided in favor of his plan. But the result justified Ludendorff's expectation. The Grand Duke extricated his troops from the Warsaw salient before the German shears could close on him. Falkenhayn, on the other hand, 
considered that Ludendorff had not put his full weight into the attack. The controversy became bitter. Hindenburg wrote not only to Falkenhayn but to the chief of the Kaiser's military cabinet, declaring that his title of commander-in-chief on the Eastern Front had become a cutting irony. Falkenhayn unkindly took him at his word, by taking away one of his armies, and forming a fresh group of armies, thus reducing his status. By the middle of August, 750,000 prisoners had been taken, Poland had been occupied, and Falkenhayn decided to break off large scale operations on the Eastern Front. Bulgaria's entry into the war was now arranged, and he wished to support the combined attack of Austria and Bulgaria against Serbia as well as to transfer troops back to meet the French offensive expected in September. Yet, in hope of redeeming the lost opportunity and placating his personal opponents, he was led to sanction one more effort to break the Russians. Ludendorff was given belated permission to carry out his Vilna scheme, with such resources as he had, while Conrad planned to strike eastward from Luck in an attempt to repeat Gorlice and cut off the Russian forces south of the Pripyat marshes. Ludendorff's move began on September 9, Below's army of the Neiman and Ditchhorn's 10th Army forming two great horns which gored their way into the Russian front, the one east towards Dvinsk and the other southeast towards Vilna. The Russians were driven back in divergent directions and the German cavalry, advancing between the horns, far overlapped Vilna and drew near the Minsk railway. But the German strength was slender, and the Russians free to concentrate against this isolated menace. In face of stiffening resistance and shrinking supplies Ludendorff was driven to suspend operations. The crux of the situation was that the Russian armies had been allowed to draw back almost out of the net before the long-delayed Vilna maneuver was attempted. The Austrian offensive did not develop until September 26, and then failed dismally. Conrad unwisely persisted in renewing it, and, by the middle of October, the Austrians had sacrificed 230,000 men without affecting the general issue. Russia had been badly lamed, but not destroyed, and, although never again a direct menace to Germany, she was able to delay the full concentration of German strength in the West for two years, until 1918. Falkenhayn's cautious strategy was to prove the most hazardous in the long run, and indeed to pave the way for Germany's bankruptcy. By October, the Russian retreat, after a nerve wracking series of escapes from the salients which the Germans systematically created and then sought to cut off, came to a definite halt on a straightened line, stretching from Riga on the Baltic to Chisinauits on the Romanian frontier. The Russian armies, however, had gained this respite at a ruinous price, and their Western allies had effected little in repayment of Russia's sacrifice on their behalf in 1914. For the Franco British relief offensive of September 25 had been no more fruitful than its predecessors. The main blow was launched by the French in Champagne, in conjunction with the Franco British attack in Artois, on either side of Lens. One fault was that the sectors were too far apart to have a reaction on each other, but a worse was that the command tried to reconcile two irreconcilable factors, they aimed at a breakthrough, but preceded it with a prolonged bombardment which gave away any chance of surprise. Joff's plan was that the breakthrough in these two sectors was to be followed by a general offensive on the whole Franco-British front which would compel the Germans to retreat beyond the Meuse and possibly end the war. The unquenchable optimist. Both in Champagne and Artois the attacks penetrated the German forward positions without difficulty, but subsequent delay in bringing reserves forward allowed the German reserves to close the gaps, a task simplified by the narrowness of the frontage of attack. The slight gains of ground in no way compensated for the heavy price paid for them. The Allied loss was approximately 242,000 against 141,000 Germans. And if the Allied commands had gained more experience, so had the Germans, in the art of defence. The British share in this offensive is, however, notable as marking the appearance in strength of the new armies, at Luz they were blooded, and if inexperience detracted from their effectiveness, 
their courage and driving force were an omen of Britain's power to improvise a national effort comparable with the long created military machines of the continent. The direction of this effort inspired less confidence, and Sir John French gave place to Sir Douglas Haig as commander in chief. Just as already in September the Russian command had been transferred from the Grand Duke Nicholas, nominally to the Tsar, as a moral symbol, but actually to General Alexov, the new Chief of Staff. Nine simultaneously, French's Chief of Staff, William Robertson, who had been long slighted by him owing to Henry Wilson's stronger influence, went home to become Chief of the Imperial General Staff in order to give a stronger direction to the general strategy of Britain, if also to give it a Western Front bias. Somewhat curiously, Haig chose as his own chief of staff an old friend, Kigel, who had not hitherto seen any service in France. Italy's first campaign. Italy's military contribution to the Allied balance sheet of 1915 was handicapped not only by her unreadiness, but by the awkward strategic position of her frontier difficult for initiating an offensive and hardly more favorable for a secured offensive. The Italian frontier province of Venezia formed a salient pointing to Austria and flanked on the north by the Austrian Trentino, on the south by the Adriatic. Bordering on the Adriatic was a stretch of relatively low ground on the Isonzo sector, but the frontier then followed the Julian and Carnic Alps in a wide sweep round to the northwest. Any advance eastwards inevitably suffered the potential menace of an Austrian descent from the Trentino upon its rear. Nevertheless, the easterly sector, though difficult enough, seemed to offer more prospect of success. Besides threatening a vital part of Austria, than an advance northward into the Alps. When Italy was preparing to enter the war, General Cadena, who assumed command, drew up his plan on this basis of an offensive eastwards and a defensive attitude in the north. The overhanging menace of the Trentino was mitigated by the expectation of simultaneous pressure upon Austria from Russia and Serbia. But on the eve of Italy's declaration of war this hope faded, the Russian armies falling back under Mackensen's blows, while the Serbs, despite requests from the Allies, failed to make even a demonstration. This lack of pressure enabled the Austrians to dispatch five divisions to the Isonzo from the Serbian front these being relieved by three newly formed German divisions. Three more divisions were sent from Galicia. Even so there were only some thirteen divisions in all available to oppose the Italians, who had a numerical superiority of more than two to one. In order to secure good covering positions on the north a limited advance was made into the Trentino, with success, but another into the northeast corner of the frontier salient, towards Tarvis in the Carnic Alps was forestalled. This local failure was to have unfortunate results later, in 1917, for it left the Austrians with a good strategic sally port into the Taglimento Valley. Meantime the main Italian advance, by the Second and Third Armies, had begun at the end of May, but out of their total of 24 divisions only seven were ready. Bad weather increased the handicap, the Isonzo coming down in flood and the initial advance soon came to a standstill. The Isonzo front crystallized, like the others, into trench warfare. The Italian mobilization, however, was now complete and Cadena mounted a deliberate attack, which opened on June 23. This first battle of the Isonzo continued until July 7 with little gain to show. A fresh series of efforts after a ten days pause were hardly more effective, and the front then relapsed into the spasmodic bickering characteristic of trench warfare, while Cadena made preparations for a new and larger effort in the autumn. When it was launched in October he had a two-to-one superiority in numbers, but was weak in artillery. This defect, coupled with the superior experience of the defender, rendered the new offensive as barren as its predecessors. It was sustained too obstinately and, when finally broken off in December, the Italian loss in the six months campaign totaled some 280,000, nearly twice that of the defenders, who had shown on this front a fierce resolution which was often lacking when they faced the Russians. The conquest of Serbia. While stalemate, although with marked changes beneath the surface, had once more settled in on both the Russian and French fronts. 
the later months of 1915 witnessed stud operations elsewhere which were to have an unforeseen influence on the war. One of the most remarkable blind spots in the strategy of the Allies was the failure to perceive the importance of Serbia as an irritation, and consequent distraction, to the Austro-German alliance in a most sensitive region. Such a menace to uneasy Austria's rear flank was an invaluable distraction to the forces and plans of the enemy alliance as a whole. It was, indeed, a necessary distraction if Serbia's allies were to concentrate with effective results in the main theatres. Geography made Serbia a potential Austrian ulcer, at a politically and militarily tender spot. To maintain the irritation, quality rather than quantity of aid was needed. Not the dispatch of large allied forces, which could scarcely be supplied until communications were improved, but the provision of technical troops and material. The Serbs themselves were magnificent fighting troops, and naturally suited to the terrain, what they required were the means of fighting effectively. To provide these was a far more urgent, and more economic, step than to equip the newly raised armies of Britain. By neglecting it the Allies allowed their Austro-German opponents to operate on and excise the ulcer, this blindness was the source of wider, and widening, trouble to themselves. Austria had proved capable of holding the Italians on the Isenzo, and once the Russian danger began to fade under the pressure of the summer offensive, her command was anxious to deal conclusively with Serbia. Austria's attempted invasions in August and September, and again in November, 1914, had been brusquely repulsed by Serbian counter-strokes, and it was not pleasant for a great power, especially one with so many Slav subjects, to swallow such military rebuffs. Her impatience coincided with Falkenhayn's desire to gain direct railway communication with Turkey, hard-pressed at the Dardanelles. Throughout the summer the rival coalitions had been bidding for Bulgaria's support, and in this bargaining the Entente suffered the moral handicap of military failure, and the material handicap caused by Serbia's unwillingness to give up any part of Macedonia, of which she had despoiled Bulgaria in 1913. As Austria had no objection to offering territory that belonged to her enemy, Bulgaria accepted her bid. This accession of strength enhanced the chance of a decision against Serbia, and in August Falkenhayn decided to reinforce the Austrian Third Army with Galwitz's army from the Russian front. In addition two Bulgarian armies were available. Mackenzie and Sikht were sent to direct the operations. To meet this new threat Serbia, apart from her own relatively small forces, had only a treaty guarantee of Greek aid and promises from the Entente powers. The first disappeared with the fall of Venizelos, the pro ally Greek premier, and the second, as usual, were too late. On October 6, 1915, the Austro German armies attacked southwards across the Danube, with a flanking movement across the Drina on the right. The sturdy resistance of the Serbs in delaying actions and the natural difficulty of the mountainous country checked the advance but before Franco-British reinforcements could arrive the Bulgarian armies struck westwards into southern Serbia, across the rear of the main Serbian armies. This drove a deep wedge between the Serbs and their allies, moving up from Salonika, and automatically loosened the resistance in the north. With their line bent at both ends until it resembled a vast bow threatened with a double envelopment, and with their retreat to the south cut off, the Serbian armies decided to retire west through the Albanian mountains. Those who survived the hardships of this midwinter retreat were conveyed to the island of Corfu, and after being re-equipped and reorganized, joined the Entente force at Salonika in the spring of 1916. The conquest of Serbia, though not, as it proved, of Serbian military power, relieved Austria of danger on her southern frontier, and gave Germany free communication and control over a huge central belt from the North Sea to the Tigris. For the Entente this campaign dug a military sump pit which for three years was to drain their military resources, there to lie idle and ineffective. Yet ultimately that sump pit was to overflow and wash away one of the props of the Central Alliance. The Salonika expedition. When at the beginning of October the Entente governments had awakened to Serbia's danger, British and French divisions had been dispatched hurriedly from Gallipoli to Salonika, 
which was the only channel of aid to Serbia, by the railway to use Cub. The advanced guard of this relieving force, which was under the command of General Sarail, pressed up the Vardar and over the Serbian frontier, only to find that the Bulgarian wedge had cut it off from the Serbians, and it was forced to fall back on Salonika, pursued by the Bulgarians. On military grounds an evacuation of Salonika was vigorously urged by the British general staff, but political reasons induced the Allies to remain. The Dardanelles' failure had already diminished their prestige, and by convincing the Balkan states of German invincibility had induced Bulgaria to enter the war and Greece to break her treaty with Serbia. To evacuate Salonika would be a further loss of prestige, whereas by holding on the Allies could check German influence over Greece, and maintain a base of operations from which to aid Romania, if, as expected, she entered the war on their side. To this end the Salonika force was augmented with fresh British and French divisions, as well as contingents from Italy and Russia, and there also the rebuilt Serbian army was brought. But apart from the capture of Monasta in November, 1916, and an abortive attack in April, 1917, the Entente forces made no serious offensive until the autumn of 1918. Its feeble effect was partly due to the natural difficulties of the country in the form of mountain ridges guarding the approach to the Balkans, partly to the feeling of the Allied governments that it was a bad debt, and partly to the personality of Sarail, whose conduct and reputation for political intrigues failed to command the confidence and cooperation essential if such a mixed force was to pull its weight. On their side the Germans were content to leave it in passivity, under guard of the Bulgarians, while they steadily withdrew their own forces for use elsewhere. With gentle sarcasm they termed Salonika their largest internment camp, and with half a million allied troops locked up their jibe had some justification, until 1918. Mesopotamia. Nor was Salonika the only drain opened in 1915. Mesopotamia was the site of a fresh diversion of force from the center of military gravity, and one which could only be excused on purely political grounds. It was not, like the Dardanelles and Salonika, undertaken to relieve a hard-pressed ally, nor had it the justification of the Dardanelles' expedition of being directed at the vital point of one of the enemy states. The occupation of Mesopotamia might raise British prestige, and it might annoy Turkey, but it could not endanger her power of resistance. Although its origin was sound its development was another example of drift due to the inherent faultiness of Britain's machinery for the conduct of war. The oil fields near the Persian Gulf were of essential importance to Britain's oil supply, and thus, when war with Turkey was imminent, a small Indian force of one division was dispatched to safeguard them. To fulfill this mission effectively it was necessary to occupy the Basra Vilayet at the head of the Persian Gulf in order to command the possible lines of approach. On November 21, 1914, Basra was captured, but the rising stream of Turkish reinforcements compelled the Indian government to add a second division. The Turkish attacks in the spring of 1915 were repulsed, and the British commander, General Nixon, judged it wise to expand his footing, for greater security. Townshend's division was pushed up the Tigris to Amara, gaining a brilliant little victory, and the other division up the Euphrates to Naziraya. Southern Mesopotamia was a vast alluvial plain, roadless and railless, in which these two great rivers formed the only channels of communication. Thus a hold on Amara and Naziraya covered the oil fields, but Nixon and the Indian government, inspired by these successes, decided to push forward to Katel Amara. This move led the British 180 miles farther into the interior, but had a partial military justification in the fact that it cut the Chatel High, issuing from the Tigris, formed a link with the Euphrates by which Turkish reserves might be transferred from one river line to the other. Townshend was sent forward in August, he defeated the Turks near Kut, and his cavalry carried the pursuit to Azizia, halfway to Baghdad. Enthusiasm spread to the home government, anxious for a moral counterpoise to their other failures, and Nixon received permission for Townshend to press on to Baghdad. But after an indecisive battle at Dsifton, 
the growing superiority of the Turkish strength compelled Townshend to retreat to Kut. Here, isolated far from help, he was urged to remain, as several fresh divisions were being sent to Mesopotamia. Kut was invested by the Turks on December 8, 1915, and the relieving forces battered in vain against the Turkish lines covering the approach on either bank of the Tigris. The conditions were bad, the communications worse, the general ship faulty, and at last on April 29, 1916, Kut was forced to surrender. However unsound the strategy which dispatched Townshend on this adventure, it is just to emphasize the actual achievements of his small force in face of superior numbers. With inadequate equipment and primitive communications, and utterly isolated in the heart of an enemy country, it wrote a glorious page of military history. When these handicaps are compared with the 4 to 1 superiority in number, and highly organized supply system of the force which ultimately took Baghdad, the comparison explains the awe in which Townshend and his men were held by the Turks. The Home Front, 1915. Perhaps one of the most significant landmarks in the transition of the struggle from a military to a national war was the formation of a national ministry in Britain, which occurred in May, 1915. For the prototype of parliaments to abandon the deep-rooted party system and pool the direction of the war was proof of the psychological upheaval of traditions. The Liberal Prime Minister, Asquith, remained, but the Conservative element acquired a preponderant voice in the cabinet, although the dynamic personality of Lloyd George began to gain such a hold on public opinion that the real leadership slipped into his hands. Churchill whose vision had saved the menace to the channel ports and made possible the future key to the deadlock, was shelved, as already had been hauled Dane, the creator of the expeditionary force. Political changes were general in all countries, and were symptomatic of a readjustment of popular outlook. The early fervor had disappeared, and been repulsed by a dog determination which, if natural to the British, was in strange contradiction to popular, if superficial, conceptions of the French temperament. Economically, the strain had yet to be felt severely by any country. Finance had shown an unexpected power of accommodation, and neither the blockade nor the submarine campaign had seriously affected food supply. If Germany was beginning to suffer some shortage, her people had more tangible omens of success to fortify their resolution than had their enemies. In 1916, however, the strain on them was to be intensified by the failure of the 1915 harvest, the worst for 40 years. Fortunately for Germany's powers of endurance, the danger was to be relieved, and the British blockade partly nullified, by the inexpensive capture of a wheat growing country on the Eastern Front. Ironically, the enemy were to throw Germany this life boy, by encouraging Romania to enter the war after Falkenhayn had almost drowned the war will of the German people in a bath of blood and tears by his renewed offensive on the Western Front. Five scene one the birth of a plan dash the Dardanelle as a giant, three ships, and the fear of a rape were the main factors in bringing Turkey into the war against her traditional ally, Britain. The giant was Baron Marshal von Bieberstein, who for fifteen years, until 1912, was German ambassador at Constantinople to a race whose sole criterion of conduct and admiration was might, whose chivalry was only extended to the mighty, Marshal von Bieberstein's huge frame, scarred face and trampling manner formed a living picture of the growing power of Germany. Perhaps one man alone could have counteracted the impression with that of Britain's more mature and quieter strength. This man was Kitchener, who, curiously, seems to have felt an ungratified desire for the post. Instead, the British ambassador during the critical years was one from whose personality the requisite prestige and strength were absent, and who, during the critical weeks, was even absent on leave. The ships were the new German battle cruiser Goban, and the British built battleships Sultan Osman and Rishadia. A shrewd step to enhance German prestige and weaken the one remaining foothold of British influence, that of the naval mission. The Goban was sent out early in 1914 to Constantinople and for long lay anchored near the entrance to the Golden Horn. Then, in the war-charged atmosphere of late July, 
The ever-present Turkish fear of Russian lust for the Dardanelles developed almost to panic point. It was nonetheless powerful because mingled with Turkish lust for wider dominion. Certain of war between Germany and Russia, uncertain of Britain's entry, and egged on by the German Afilinver Pasha, the Turkish Grand Vizier responded to previous German overtures by asking the German ambassador, on July 27, for a secret alliance against Russia. Next day the proposal was accepted, and on August 2 the treaty was signed, unknown to most of the Turkish cabinet. On the morrow the first mines were laid in the Dardanelles, and Enver had already mobilized the Turkish forces on his own initiative. But the news of Britain's entry into the war was a shock which nearly burst the new treaty like a paper balloon. Indeed, so much hot air was generated during the next few days that it even sufficed to blow out another Ballon d'Essai, the astonishing offer to Russia of a Turkish alliance. But this offer did not suit Russia's ambition, even though it promised her the one chance of having a channel through which she could receive munitions from her Western allies. She preferred isolation to the sacrifice of her dream of annexation, and did not even report the offer to her allies. But Turkey's sudden reversal of attitude, and the predominance of her fear of British power over the fear of Russian ambition, were short lived. And the revival of confidence was greatly helped by annoyance. Turkey, smarting under her wounds of the Balkan War, had been awaiting the delivery of her first two modern battleships with an eagerness and pride all the more general because the money had been raised by collections among the people. On August 3, however, the British government informed Turkey that it was taking over the ships, and the announcement caused an explosion of indignation. Every man who had contributed his might felt an injury akin to a personal betrayal. This popular outcry was at its height when, on August 10, the Goban, accompanied by the cruiser Breslau, appeared at the entrance to the Dardanelles, having slipped past the British fleet near Sicily. An officer of the German military mission, Lieutenant Colonel von Kress, brought the news to the war minister, Inver Pasha, and told him that the forts were asking instructions as to whether they should allow the warships to enter. Then a vital interchange took place. Inver Dash, I can't decide that now. I must first consult the Grand Vizier. Crestash but we must wire immediately. A moment of inward turmoil. Then Dash they are to allow them to enter. A further and guileful question from Crestash if the English warships follow the Germans, are they to be fired on if they also attempt an entrance? The matter must be left to the decision of the cabinet. Excellency. We cannot leave our subordinates in such a position without issuing immediately clear and definite instructions. Are the English to be fired on or not? Another pause. Yes. As General Kanengesa, a German witness of this eventful discussion, says Dash we heard the clanking of the portcullis descending before the Dardanelles. International law was evaded, British objections frustrated, Turkish pride satisfied and Inver's dubious colleagues calmed by arranging the factitious sale to Turkey of these warships. Turkey was not yet ready for nor agreed upon war, and Britain had every motive to avoid it. Thus, during the weeks that followed, the Turks were successively enabled and emboldened to advance along the path to war by the passivity of Britain in face of growing provocation. The German crews were kept, the German admiral appointed to command the Turkish navy, the British naval mission removed from control, and then forced to withdraw, British ships were detained, their wireless dismantled, German soldiers and sailors filtered into Constantinople, and the straits were closed. Meantime Turkish ministers, ever ready with glib assurances, congratulated themselves on the gullibility of the British, whose restraint was rather due to an acute sense of vulnerability, as a power with millions of Muslim subjects. Conciliation was pressed to the point of folly, however, when the British Admiralty's intention to appoint Admiral Olympus, ex-chief of the naval mission to Turkey, to command the British Dardanelles squadron was abandoned for fear of giving offence to the Turks. And when the need for conciliation had passed, 
a misplaced chivalry seems to have taken its place in preventing the use of the one man who knew the Turks and the Dardanelles intimately. Even the Germans began to be worried when a series of raids on the Egyptian frontier could not goad Britain to war. So the German admiral, with Enver's connivance, led the Turkish fleet on a raid into the Black Sea against Britain's more sensitive ally, shelling Odessa and other Russian ports. The story of this provocation, as related to and recorded by Lord Dabernon after the war, is illuminating. The official sanction came to the German embassy in a sealed envelope addressed to the Admiral. An official took the initiative and precaution to open it and send on merely a copy. The first report that reached Constantinople was that the Goban had been sunk, and so, thinking that the order had sunk with her, the Grand Vizier conciliatingly replied to Russian protests by denying that any such order had been given. Thereupon the German embassy sent to him, saying dash the order of which you deny the existence, because you think it was sunk with the Goban, is in a safe place. At the German embassy. Pray cease to deny that the Turkish government has given the order to attack Russia. Thus the war-fearing Grand Vizier was compelled to stand aside helplessly while German cunning removed any excuse to the Triple Entente for avoiding war, at the end of October. The best chance for both Britain and Russia was now in making war, instantly. The defences of the Dardanelles were obsolete and still incomplete. The only two munition factories in Turkey lay on the shore close to Constantinople and open to easy destruction by any warships which penetrated thither. The misuse of the opportunity is a tale of almost incredible haphazardness on the part of Britain, of equal short-sightedness on the part of Russia. On November 3 the Allied fleet carried out a short bombardment of the outer forts at the Dardanelles, the only use of which was to help the German authorities in trying to overcome Turkish inertia over the defences. They had sunk back into lethargy again when, six weeks later, a British submarine gave a fresh alarm and gained its commander of EC by diving under the mines and sinking a ship near the Narrows. But the effect of these warnings has been overrated. Turkish lethargy was almost as boundless as British folly. Not until the end of February did the Turks post more than one division on the Gallipoli Peninsula, and not until March did the improvements in the defences of the Straits approach completion. In part, this state of weakness seems to have been due to a feeling that it was waste of energy to try to prevent a passage, which could not be prevented against any serious attempt. If the few well-informed experts, German or Turk, were dubious of their power to stop a purely naval attack, they were still less confident of resisting a combined attack. And the Turkish staff history frankly says, up to 25th February, it would have been possible to effect a landing successfully at any point on the peninsula, and the capture of the straits by land troops would have been comparatively easy. At one time, the Entente might have found such troops, in quantity, without touching their own resources. For in mid August, the Greek Prime Minister, Venizelos, had formally and unreservedly placed all his country's forces at the disposal of the Entente. The offer was not accepted owing mainly to Sir Edward Grey's desire to avoid antagonizing Turkey, whose hatred for Greece was stronger than for any other of her adversaries of 1912. But the hope, if not the desire, soon began to fade and before the end of the month Russia asked Greece whether she would send an expedition to help enforcing the Dardanelles. King Constantine agreed but made the proviso that Bulgaria's neutrality must be assured, to avoid the danger of a stab in the back. The Greek plan, a thorough one, was that 60,000 men should land near the outer tip of the peninsula to take in rear the forts guarding the straits, while another 30,000 landed near Boulair to seize and hold the isthmus, but, by the time Turkey entered the war, Constantine had withdrawn his reluctant consent, believing that Bulgaria was already pledged to Germany. In England the only leader who showed a consistent appreciation of the importance of opening the Dardanelles was Churchill. From August onwards he frequently tried to arouse the interest of the War Office, which, for several years, had not even made a perfunctory review of the question. Three weeks after Turkey had entered the war he raised it again at the first meeting of the new War Council, but all eyes were still focused on the French front, and he got no support from Kitchener. 
the Turks were granted a fresh lease of repose. But during December the blankness of the prospect on the Western Front was realized by many in England, and a few in France. Simultaneously the growth of the new armies evoked a natural question as to their use. The two factors combined to freshen, if not to clear, the atmosphere. Suggestions for a new strategic line of approach came from several quarters. The most definite and practical was contained in a paper of December 29th, written by the Secretary of the War Council, Lieutenant Colonel Maurice Hankey, who emphasized the deadlock in France, and, while urging the development of new mechanical and armored devices to force a passage through the wire entanglements and trenches, suggested that Germany could be struck most easily through her allies, especially Turkey. He advocated the use of the first three new army corps for an attack on Constantinople, if possible in cooperation with Greece and Bulgaria, as a means not only to overthrow Turkey and bring the weight of the Balkans into the Entente scale, but to open communication with Russia. Further advantages would be to bring down the price of wheat and release 350,000 tons of shipping. The argument revealed a grasp of grand strategy, whereas the horizon of most soldiers, especially the highest, was narrowly bounded by tactics. Sir John French, of course, objected to any effort outside his own command in France. But at this juncture an appeal came from the Grand Duke Nicholas for a British demonstration to relieve the pressure on his forces in the Caucasus. Ironically, this danger had almost passed before his appeal was received. Still more ironically, the emergency had been due to his own objection to spare troops from the main front. Kitchener's response was to suggest the Dardanelles as the best place for such a demonstration and also that reports could be spread at the same time that Constantinople was threatened. Fischer now chimed in, to suggest not a demonstration but a combined attack on a large scale, in conjunction with which old warships should be used to force the Dardanelles. He concluded characteristically and prophetically dash but as the great Napoleon said, celerity, without it failure. Churchill knew how little hope there was of obtaining troops for a large-scale attack but eagerly caught hold of the naval possibility. Later in the day, January 3rd, he telegraphed, with Fisher's agreement, to the Admiral on the spot, Carden Dash do you consider the forcing of the Straits by ships alone a practicable operation? Back came Carden's answer Dash I do not consider Dardanelles can be rushed. They might be forced by extended operations with large numbers of ships. Carden's detailed plan was submitted to the War Council on January 13. The fatal decision was to be taken in a fateful atmosphere. Strategy instead of being the servant of policy had become the master, a blind and brutal master. From many sides there was an urgent call upon policy. Russia was faltering before she had even got into her stride. Serbia had barely escaped a fall, Greece and Romania were leaning back the more that Bulgaria seemed to be leaning forward to grasp Germany's outstretched hand, Italy was sitting on the fence. The one front where troops were available was in France, and their ammunition was not, for the scale of ammunition that would suffice in other theatres would not even make a dent in the trench barrier in France. But strategy, as embodied in Sir John French, balked the desires of policy, and as he was loyally rather than logically supported by Kitchener, the rest of the cabinet was persuaded by a sense of numb, though not dumb, despair, aggravated by their amateur status. Hence they clutched too desperately at a straw of professional opinion which offered the chance of making bricks without men. And the words in which the decision was formulated was an epitome of their confused thought dash to prepare for a naval expedition in February, to bombard and take the Gallipoli Peninsula, with Constantinople as its objective. The suggestion that ships were to take a part of the land is delightfully naive. A few days later, Churchill made an attempt to strengthen his plan by suggesting to the Grand Duke Nicholas that the Russians should cooperate by a simultaneous land and sea attack on the Bosphorus. Strategically, his suggestion was the best possible. Paradoxically, it proved void because the political aspect here dominated the mind of the Russian strategists. 
strong as was their desire to possess Constantinople, they had no wish to cooperate with their allies in gaining it. The cornerstone of Russian policy was the annexation of both Constantinople and the Dardanelles. Sazanov, the foreign minister, had tried to make this claim more palatable to his allies by suggesting the internationalization of Constantinople in return for Russian control of the Straits, but the weight of military opinion had overborne this partial concession. Thus it is not surprising that military Russia viewed with jealousy and suspicion any move of her allies towards her own goal, and withheld her assistance. Even Susanoff records Dash I intensely disliked the thought that the Straits and Constantinople might be taken by our allies and not by the Russian forces. When the Gallipoli expedition was finally decided upon by our allies, I had difficulty in concealing from them how painfully the news had affected me. Russia would not help even in helping to clear her own windpipe. She preferred to choke rather than disgorge a morsel of her ambition. And in the end she was choked, the verdict should be fellowed a say. In England, too, fresh complications arose. Churchill's quarrel with the plan was that the scale was too petty, Fisher's, that it might become too large, and so obstruct his Baltic project. And from this divergence a quarrel developed between the two, the political and the professional heads of the Admiralty. At the next War Council meeting Fisher rose to tender his resignation, but Kitchener intervened and, drawing him aside, persuaded him to fall in with the general opinion of the meeting. Thus the compromise plan was a compromise even in its acceptance. Most apt is the verdict of General Aspinall Oglander in his official history, that operations on the Western Front were a gamble with pounds for a possible gain of pence, whereas in the East pence were to be wagered in the none too sanguine hope of winning pounds. The naval attack began with the bombardment of the outer forts on February 19, curiously, the anniversary of Admiral Duckworth's successful attempt to pass through the Straits, in 1807. Five days of bad weather then intervened and, when the bombardment was renewed on the 25th, the forts were outranged and the Turks retired from them. Next day the fleet began the second phase, the crushing of the intermediate defences, more difficult because these, being inside the mouth of the straits, were more difficult targets to observe. Although results were disappointing, the chance was taken to land demolition parties, on the tip of the peninsula, which destroyed the guns in the abandoned outer forts. Thereby history, at least, gained a dramatic comparison. For on the same spot where this handful of marines moved about freely on February 26, thousands of men fell two months later. Further landings were made next day, and again on March 3, but on the 4th they met slight opposition, and were re-embarked. Meantime, the bombardment continued in rather desultory fashion, due in part, but not only, to the bad weather, and strawlers made a few rather feeble attempts to sweep the first minefield. Lack of aircraft to observe and correct the shooting was, however, a great handicap, and on the 9th Carden reported that he could do no more until his air service was reinforced, and would meanwhile concentrate on clearing the minefield. But the weeks were slipping away and the Admiralty could not help feeling that Carden's caution was disproportionate to the importance of his task, and of speed in his task. Hence, on March 11 a telegram was sent to urge him to decisive action, and to free him from any fear of being held responsible if serious loss ensued. Carden responded at once and arranged a general fleet attack, under cover of which the mines were to be cleared. And the principle governing the attack was to be that the battleships should only move in, and fire from, waters clear or already cleared of mines. At this point Carden fell sick and was succeeded by his second-in-command, de Robeck. The attack was begun on March 18 and was foiled not by resistance but by inadvertence, for, evading the British destroyer patrols, a little Turkish steamer had laid a new line of mines well outside the main minefield, dropping them parallel to the shore in near NQE Bay, where the Allied fleet had taken up its position in earlier bombardments. This new line of mines lay undiscovered and unsuspected while the fleet advanced past it to engage the forts. By 1.45 pm the forts had been practically silenced, 
with little damage to the battleships, and the minesweepers were now sent forward to clear the main minefield, while the French battle squadron, in the van, was temporarily withdrawn. As this squadron was retiring through Irenkui Bay, a tremendous explosion was heard, and a dense cloud of smoke seen, in the Bouvet, and in less than two minutes she had heeled over and sunk with nearly all her crew. But the relieving line of battleships continued the attack from closer ranges and the fire from the forts, momentarily renewed, became more and more flickering as guns were buried in rubble and telephone wires cut. Suddenly, however, about 4 p.m., the inflexible and irresistible were seen almost simultaneously to have a heavy list. Mystery accentuated the moral effect. No one suspected the presence of the new line of mines, and guesses as to the cause ranged from that of a shoal of floating mines, turned loose to drift down with the current, to that of torpedoes fired from some hidden point on shore. Fear of the unknown prompted Admiral de Robeck's decision to order a general retirement forthwith, and even as this was in progress the ocean, sent to the irresistible's aid, struck the same line of mines, and both foundered during the night. Although the whole British fleet lost only 61 men in casualties, the loss in material was large, for out of the 18 allied battleships three had sunk and three more were badly damaged. But a far worse loss was that of nerve and of imagination, to see the enemy's side, among the naval authorities. Actually, the enemy was suffering greater depression, and with more reason. More than half their ammunition had been expended and they had no reserve of mines. Many of the gun crews were demoralized, and the widespread opinion among both Turkish and German officers was that they had little hope of opposing a renewal of the attack. But that attack, contrary to their expectation, was never renewed. When he came out of action, Drobek had the full intention of renewing it, and so had the Admiralty, which informed him that five more battleships were being sent out to replace his losses and added that it was important not to let the forts be repaired, or to encourage the enemy by an apparent suspension of the operations. But on the 23rd he sent a telegram which not only revealed his reversal of view but reversed the opinion of the Admiralty, except Churchill, who had to bow to the weight of professional opinion. For de Robeck's new opinion was that the fleet could not get through without the help of the army, and that any further effort must be postponed until this was ready. And, in practice, this opinion meant that the navy was to hand over the whole offensive burden to the army, and to stand by, watching, while the army spent itself in vain assaults unaided by any fresh naval attack. Perhaps the underlying factor was that service tendency of mind which sentimentally values things more than lives, a tendency which may have its foundation in totemism but is also accentuated by the peacetime shortage of material and the penalties attached to any loss of it. The artilleryman's love of his guns, and readiness to sacrifice his life to avert the disgrace of losing them, is paralleled by the sailor's adoration of his ship, even an old and obsolete ship such as these at the Dardanelles. It hinders him from adopting the common sense view that a ship, like a shell, is merely a weapon to be expended profitably. Perhaps. Also, a powerful auxiliary factor in the sailors' decision was now the presence of soldiers and their willingness to assume the burden. For, coincidentally with the preparations for a naval attack, the British government had drifted independently towards a land attack. It had its origin, not in a wider consideration of the Dardanelles problem, but in a separate consideration of where the new armies could be used as an alternative to France. The committee reported in favor of Salonika as an immediate aid to Serbia and an ultimate stab in the back to the Central Powers, up the Danube. The opinion won favour at the meeting of the War Council on February 9, being reinforced by the news that Bulgaria had contracted a loan with Germany and by the desire of encouraging Greece to support Serbia. And Kitchener, who had declared that he could find no troops for the Dardanelles plan, now announced that he would send the regular 29th Division to Salonika in conjunction with the French division. The promise of two divisions, however, was naturally not enough to allay Greek misgivings, Greece was unwilling to accept the offer unless Romania was persuaded to join, 
and Romania was held back by the sight of Russia's misadventures. But the fact remained, and could no longer be hidden from the cabinet by Kitchener's veil of mystery and authority, that the 29th Division was available. Nor did he for the moment seek to withhold it. In consequence, the War Council, on February 16, decided that it should be dispatched to the centrally placed harbor of Mudros in the Aegean at the earliest possible moment, together with troops from Egypt, with the idea that all the forces, were, to be available in case of necessity to support the naval attack on the Dardanelles. No one, however, suggested that the naval attack should be postponed to obtain surprise and the greater effect of a combined operation. The troops were merely to mount guard over what the navy gained. But the 29th Division immediately became the rope in a tug of war between the eastern and western schools of thought, and on to the western end were pulling not only the British headquarters in France, but Joffre. Joffre's foresight was always, and only, quick when his own preserves were threatened, and he saw in the dispatch east instead of west of the newly assembled 29th Division a disquieting omen of the destination of the new army divisions. Kitchener could easily have hardened his heart against French, but he could not against the French. Just as his loyalty to France was an earlier instinct than his love of the East, so it now proved stronger than his belief in the Eastern theater. At the next meeting of the War Council, only three days later, he turned about face and asserted that the 29th Division could not be spared. In its place he suggested the dispatch of raw Australian and New Zealand troops, two divisions from Egypt. And he even notified the Admiralty behind Churchill's back that the 29th was not to go, thereby interrupting the collection of the transports required to carry it. That same day the naval attack had opened, and the bombardment echoed throughout the Near East. When the news came, that the outer forts had fallen, the Turkish government made ready to flee into the interior of Asia Minor. The Germans expected not only the appearance of the Allied fleet off Constantinople but that its appearance would be the signal for a revolt against Inver, and the consequent signature of peace by Turkey. For the Turks, in any case, could not have carried on the war once Constantinople, their only munition source, was abandoned. Italy and Greece began to incline more strongly towards war, and Bulgaria away from it. On March 1 Venizelos proposed to land three Greek divisions on the Gallipoli Peninsula, but here Russia fatally intervened by notifying Athens that in no circumstances can we allow Greek forces to participate in the Allied attack on Constantinople. Only the neutral part of these favorable echoes reached the War Council in London but it was sufficient to encourage the believers and win over the doubters. The original idea that the naval attack was only tentative, to be abandoned if found difficult, now faded and all save one were agreed that the attack must be carried through, if necessary with land forces. The one dissenting voice was that of Lloyd George, who objected to the army having to pull the navy's chestnuts out of the fire. Curiously, he alone sounded the warning truth of history that the renewal along the same line of an attack that has failed is rarely justified, and that it is better to switch the effort in a fresh direction. If his just objection was not immediately justified it was because of the Turks' lethargy in profiting by their warning. In contrast, Kitchener laid down emphatically that having entered on the project of forcing the straits there can be no idea of abandoning the scheme. But not until March 10 did he make up his mind to release the 29th Division and, perhaps worse, not until the 12th did he nominate a commander for the expedition. Yet the French, despite Joffre's refusal to contribute from the field armies, had scraped together a division from the interior and had begun to embark it as early as the 3rd. At the war office in London not a single preparatory step had been taken. One result was that when Ian Hamilton departed on the 13th none of his administrative staff were available, and he had to leave without them. Further, the sum of his information comprised a 1912 handbook of the Turkish army, a pre-war report on the Dardanelles forts, and an inaccurate map. To compensate for this deficiency some of his staff had scoured the booksellers for guidebooks to Constantinople. The one swift action in this halting period was Ian Hamilton's passage out to the Dardanelles. 
a chain of special trains and fast cruisers whisked him thither faster than he could have travelled in peacetime by the Orient Express, and he reached the fleet on March 17, the eve of its attack. His first discovery was the unsuitability of Lemnos as a base, owing to lack of water, as well as lack of piers and shelter in Mudra's harbour. His second, was that the troops already present were so ill distributed in their transports that they would have to be disembarked and redistributed before they could land on an open and hostile shore. Hence his first step, on the 18th, had to be the unfortunate one of changing his base to Alexandria and directing all transports there. So ill-conceived and chaotic had been the original loading that battalions were separated from their first-line transport, wagons from their horses, guns from their ammunition, and even shells from their fuses. One infantry battalion of the 29th Division had actually been split up among four ships. Even with the Impel Wharfs and Camps of Alexandria, unloading and reloading was a slow business, not accelerated by the delayed arrival of the administrative staff. On March 22, after the naval attack and before sailing for Alexandria, Ian Hamilton with his chief assistants met de Robeck in conference. The moment we sat down de Robeck told us he was now clear he could not get through without the help of all my troops. Soldiers could not argue with a naval verdict, even had they any wish, and so without discussion the army was committed to the task. And the task was committed to the army. For although Ian Hamilton politely suggested to the Admiral that he should push on systematically with the attack on the forts, and Churchill made similar representations, the Admirals both at the Admiralty and at the Dardanelles were as rigid as rock in passive resistance, and henceforth the fleet was dedicated to what Churchill has aptly termed the no principle, an unsurmountable mental barrier. Sired by strategic confusion and damned by naval negation. The landing on Gallipoli was born, and marred in delivery by muddled military midwifery. From this welter only one clear note emerged, in a memorandum drawn up for the Prime Minister by Morris Hankey on March 16. In it he emphasized that combined operations require more careful preparation than any other class of military enterprise. All through our history such attacks have failed when the preparations have been inadequate and the successes are in nearly every case due to the most careful preparation beforehand. It would appear to be the business of the War Council to assure themselves, in the present instance, that these preparations have been thoroughly thought out. He pointed out that surprise had already been forfeited and in consequence the task had become far more formidable. Hence he enumerated a comprehensive list of practical points upon which the War Council should cross-examine the naval and military authorities, saying, in conclusion dash and less details such as these, are fully thought out before the landing takes place. A serious disaster may occur. It may occur to the historian that Hankey was the only expert advisor of the British government who had thought out the foundations of strategy. For when the Prime Minister, loath to question Kitchener's omniscience, tentatively asked if any scheme had been worked out, Kitchener replied, that that must be left to the commanders on the spot, and thereby shut down all discussion. No heed was given to the wider aspects of the plan, its immediate and potential needs in men, guns, ammunition, and supplies. In consequence, the expedition was to live from hand to mouth, nourishment being always too small and too late, yet in some far exceeding what would originally have sufficed for success. Five seen to the slip twixt lip and cup, the landing on Gallipoli, April 25th, 1915 Despite the chain of folly which preceded it, was there still a chance of success when the belated land attack on the Dardanelles was launched? The verdict of history is affirmative. Part if not all, of the opportunity forfeited by the British was redeemed for them by the Turks. The panic caused by the opening of the naval attack, and the feeling that the passage of the Dardanelles could not be prevented, led the Turks to order new military dispositions which, in the words of Limon von Sanders, head of the German military mission, did away with any defence of the exterior coast of the Gallipoli Peninsula with its dominating heights. It did away with the defence of the Asiatic coast at the mouth of the Dardanelles. It was the feeblest imaginable defensive measure. 
that it was not put into operation may have been due to Lyman von Sanders' protests, with which, however, Inver replied that he did not concur, but was more probably due to pure inertia. The absence of renewed naval attacks after the failure of March 18 was, rightly, taken as a sign that a land attack was being prepared, and this assurance was confirmed by abundant reports from various Mediterranean ports, especially Alexandria and Port Said. This was the less surprising in that public reviews of the troops were held at Alexandria and Cairo, while at least one member of Ian Hamilton's staff received official letters from home through the ordinary post, addressed Constantinople Field Force. Any chance of secrecy had indeed disappeared, with the necessity of disembarking the force in Egypt. Thus, on March 25, Inver was led to form a separate army for the defense of the Dardanelles and to place it under the command of Lyman von Sanders. After a hurried survey Lyman exclaimed to his subordinate, Hans can engess a if the English will only leave me alone for eight days. They left him for four weeks. This month of grace, he records, was just sufficient to complete the most indispensable arrangements and to bring the 3rd Division under Colonel Nalai from Constantinople. Its arrival brought his strength up to six divisions, six times the strength present on Gallipoli before the naval attack began. But he found them dispersed as coast guards, and his first step was to concentrate them. To do this effectively, he had to decide where to expect a landing. The Asiatic coast, where movement and an approach to his rear was easy, he deemed the point of greatest danger. And so he placed two divisions near Bissaka Bay to cover the line of forts on this side. On the European side he most feared a landing at the neck of the peninsula, near Boulair, where the waters of the Gulf of Suros were separated by a mere three and a half mile strip from the waters of the Sea of Marmara. A landing here would cut off the defenders of the peninsula from Thrace and Constantinople, although if they did not lose their nerve they might be able to maintain themselves by drawing supplies from the Asiatic side, across the Narrows. This, however, was only a possibility. Near Boulair, therefore, Lyman von Sanders posted two more divisions. The two other, and lesser danger points were near Garbatip at the six-mile waist, a low waist, of the peninsula, where a wide valley ran across to Maidos at the Narrows and near Cape Hells, at the southern end, where the gradual ascent up the slopes of Wakibaba might be swept by the fire of the British fleet. Lyman von Sanders distributed one division to guard the whole of the southern part of the peninsula while his remaining division, under Lieutenant Colonel Mustafa Kemal, was posted near the waste as a general reserve. The scheme of defence was essentially based on mobility, and to obtain the utmost value from his dispositions as well as to offset the British ease of sea movement, he concentrated his energy on increasing and improving the roads. Lyman von Sanders' dispositions are the best justification for Ian Hamilton's plan. In this the governing factors were the small size of the British force and its mission. The force comprised only five divisions, 75,000 men to the Turks 84,000. The object was to open a path for the fleet through the Narrows not to engage independently in a campaign for big strategic prizes. Kitchener's bare instructions strongly deprecated, although without explanation, an advance on the Asiatic side, and there the guns of the fleet could give no support beyond the initial landing. The Gulf of Suros was obviously the most vulnerable strategic point but, as Lyman von Sanders himself has pointed out, it afforded no direct artillery effects against the defences of the Straits. Moreover, the beaches near Boulair were seen to be strongly prepared for defence, while a landing on the west side of the Gulf would be uncomfortably close to the Bulgarian frontier, and with difficult country to traverse. In either case, a small force would be in danger of being itself attacked in flank and rear from the mainland of Thrace, and so being caught between two devils and the deep sea. Weighing up these conditions, and his handicaps, Ian Hamilton decided on a dual blow in the southern half of the peninsula. The 29th Division was to land on four beaches at the Toe and Sezuki Barber, while the French waited in support, meanwhile sending a regiment to land at Kumkale on the Asiatic side as a feint and distraction. 
the two divisions of the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps, whose initials were to enrich both dictionary and history with the word Anzac Dash were to land north of Garba Deep, while the Royal Naval Division made a feint near Boulair. If the idea of security seems to have dictated the landing at the tow, surprise was to be its effect. And surprise was assiduously sought in manifold ways. Commander Runwin was inspired by the proximity of Troy to make the apt suggestion of reproducing the immortal wooden horse, in this case to be a sea horse. A collier, the River Clyde, was to be run ashore at V Beach and to disgorge troops through large openings cut in its sides. Ian Hamilton himself added another stratagem, which had some parallel to Wolfs of Quebec whereby a detachment of two battalions was to be landed farther up the coast at a spot apparently inaccessible, and so unlikely to be defended, whence it could menace the rear of the Turks defending the southern beaches. This spot was christened Y Beach. Further, the French transports were to make a pretense of landing troops at Bissaka Bay. Ian Hamilton also wished to increase the chance of local surprise, and decrease the risk of loss, by landing at night even though it meant foregoing the support of the guns of the fleet. But Hunter Weston, commanding the 29th Division, preferred a daylight landing, to avoid the risk of confusion. He gained his way through the support of naval opinion, which was based on the difficulties of the current. For the Anzac landing, the Corps commander, Birdwood, wisely preferred any risk to that of the obvious, and if his landing was to suffer an effect through confusion, which was more due to lack of training than to initial loss of direction in the dark, it escaped the heavy losses of the 29th Division. By April 20 the preparations for the venture were complete and the troops assembled at Mudros on their transports. The weather, almost continuously unfavorable for several weeks, was both the determining and the most uncertain factor. Not until the 23rd did it allow the scheme to be set in motion. For the mechanism, like an alarm clock, required, and was timed to strike, 36 hours from the start of the movement. On the evening of the 24th, 11 transports of the Royal Naval Division sailed for the Gulf of Soros, escorted by warships which opened a slow bombardment at daybreak on the Boulay lines. Towards evening, boats were ostentatiously swung out, filled with troops, and began pulling for the shore, to return to the ships as soon as darkness cloaked them. During the night an officer, Lieutenant Commander B.C. Freyberg, swam ashore from a boat two miles out and lit flares along the beach. His feat, and its effect, was an outstanding proof that in war it is the man, and not men, who count, that one man can be more useful than a thousand. For the Garbutti landing, 1,500 men of the covering force were carried in three battleships to the rendezvous five miles offshore. They clambered down into the boats at 1.30 am just as the moon was sinking. Then, towed by the battleships and followed by seven destroyers with the rest of the covering force, they moved silently inshore until the distance was halved. Here the twelve tows, each with a steam picket boat at the head, cast loose and continued the approach. But darkness and the strong current caused the tows to arrive off the beach a mile north of the intended point and so on a more rugged part of the coast, skirted by precipitous cliffs, seamed with steep gullies and covered with scrub. Day was just breaking when at 4.25 am, under a scattered and erratic fire from a few small and stupefied posts, the 48 boats were rowed across the last 50 yards until they touched bottom. Then, in a headlong Russian scramble, the Australians swept inland. Hardly a man had fallen, but units were badly mixed, and soon became worse. The next contingent landed from the destroyers, suffered rather more, at least on the left, but carried the advance over a mile inland. One small party even penetrated far enough to see the glistening straits beyond and beneath. The Hell's Landing was less fortunate, although the opponents were little more numerous. Only two Turkish battalions were present in the whole area south of Akibaba and only two of the five selected landing places were covered by wire entanglements and machine guns. These were the central beaches W and V on either side of Cape Hells itself. 
The British covering force comprised the four battalions of Hare's 86th Brigade, which with an extra half battalion were to land at V, W, and X beaches, one battalion at South Beach, and two battalions at Y Beach for the threat to the enemy's rear. Thus seven and a half battalions were to be thrown ashore initially, followed by five more of the main body, and ultimately by the French division. At 5 a.m., under cover of a heavy fleet bombardment, the toes crept towards the shore. The first mischance was the slow progress, against the current, of the toes making for S Beach, on the east flank, which caused those destined for the three main beaches to be held back until nearly 6 a.m. Nevertheless, the toes for X Beach, round the western tip of the peninsula, landed without a casualty beneath a low cliff where their arrival was unexpected by the Turks and opposed only by a picket of twelve men. But at W, the next beach eastwards, the landing parties ran into a well-prepared death trap. Not a shot was fired as the boats rowed in but, as they grounded, they were swept by bullets and the men, jumping overboard, were entangled in submerged wire. Despite heavy loss they struggled forward, drove off the defenders, and gained a lodgment on the cliffs. But Hare, too gallantly exposing himself, was wounded, and the efforts subsided. The landing at V Beach, beside the old fort of Sed Elba, fared still worse. Here the invaders ran, like gladiators, into a gently sloping arena designed by nature and arranged by the Turks, themselves ensconced in surrounding seats, for a butchery. The toes, checked by the current, were caught up by the river Clyde, and as it grounded hell yawned. In the incoming boat oars dropped like the wings of scorched moths, while the boats drifted helplessly with their load of dead and wounded. Many men jumped overboard only to be drowned in water stained with their own blood. A few gained the beach and found shelter beneath a low bank, which was to mark the limit of the day's advance. Those who tried to emerge from the river Clyde and reach the shore across a bridge of lighters, were no more fortunate, and fell in heaps. The few survivors on the beach and the thousand left in the river Clyde could only wait for nightfall to release them. Two companies of Turks, distributed between V and W beaches, had checked the main British landing. But S Beach, at the other side of Morto Bay, was, like X, an unlikely spot and so guarded by only a platoon of Turks. The landing battalion got safely ashore and then, having had preliminary instructions to await the advance from the other beaches, fulfilled them to the letter. Its inertness, however, was approved by Hunter Weston, owing apparently to an exaggerated estimate of the Turkish strength. Actually the two intact battalions ashore at the two flank beaches, S and X, totaled four times the strength of the Turkish defenders of V and W beaches and by an advance inwards could have taken them in rear. Soon, also, that superiority was increased, but not the pressure. Two battalions of the 87th Brigade, the other two had been used for the original landings at S and Y, were put ashore safely on X Beach by 9 a.m., but they had been earmarked as divisional reserve, and the brigadier did not feel justified in using them, except to dig in unless and until he received instructions from Hunter Weston. These never came, so the force of X Beach remained passive. Meantime, after another vain attempt to land at V Beach, in which the commander of the 88th Brigade was killed, the remaining two and a half battalions of the main body were disembarked at W Beach. But, as the official history gently says, in contrast to the gallant exploits of the morning a certain inertia seems to have overtaken the troops on this part of the front, who now amounted to at least 2,000 men. Faced with a definite task, the capture of the beaches, the 29th Division had put an indelible mark on history. But once that task was done, platoon, company and even battalion commanders, each in their own sphere, were awaiting fresh and definite orders and on their own initiative did little to exploit the morning's success, or to keep in touch with the enemy. Instead, they allowed themselves to be paralyzed by an enemy whom they had already driven from his trenches and whom, though unaware of the fact, 
they outnumbered by at least 6 to 1. But a still greater opportunity was missed at Y Beach, three miles up the coast, where 2,000 men were safely disembarked without a hitch and without any opposition. For 11 hours they were left undisturbed by the enemy, and throughout that period they alone were equal in numbers to all the Turkish forces south of Akibaba. Yet throughout the 25th the initial success remained unexploited. During the ensuing night the troops gallantly repulsed a succession of fierce attacks on their line. But the whole enterprise was suddenly abandoned next morning, and the men re-embarked, at the very moment when the enemy himself was in full retreat. The one man who realized the opportunity was Ian Hamilton himself, out at sea, but he had delegated the execution of the landing to the commander of the 29th Division, and had kept no reserve. Somewhat naturally, he was loath to interfere except by suggestion, though he was far quicker than the man on the spot to appreciate the check in the south, and as early as 9.21 am he signaled to Hunter Weston Dash would you like to get some more men ashore at Y Beach? If so, trawlers are available. But Hunter Weston's attention was glued to the bloody beaches where the enemy was better prepared, and there he preferred to concentrate his efforts. At Y Beach itself, the landing had been made without a shot being fired or a Turk being discovered. But the commander, Colonel Matthews, was content to await further orders. Crowds of troops were sitting about the edge of the cliff, and not until late in the afternoon did they even attempt to entrench. Towards dark one Turkish battalion was brought up and launched a series of counter-attacks against the two British battalions. Repeatedly beaten off, the Turks finally fled in disorder soon after 7 am, but their night assaults caused such loss and confusion among the defenders that panic spread. A string of alarmist messages were signaled to the ships and many stragglers poured down to the beach, swarming into the boats sent for the wounded. This state continued even after the disappearance of the Turks, and Matthews, who saw no response to his urgent appeal for reinforcements, reluctantly decided to follow the example set by his stragglers. By 11.30 am the whole force had re-embarked. Some hours later a naval party under Lieutenant Commander Keyes went ashore and made a prolonged search for wounded without being fired on. But if anything can justify Matthew's action, and previous inaction, it is his utter neglect by his superior, Hunter Weston. Throughout the 29 hours on land no word of any kind reached him from divisional headquarters. No officer was sent to visit him, no reply was sent to his urgent appeals. And when, early in the morning of the 26th Ian Hamilton once more intervened with the offer of a French brigade, six battalions, Hunter Weston had no thought but to land them on W Beach, in the enemy's face. The measured verdict of the official history upon Y Beach is that Dash in deciding to throw a force ashore at that point Sir Ian Hamilton would seem to have hit upon the key of the whole situation. It is as certain as anything can be in war that a bold advance from Y, on the morning of April 25, must have freed the southern beaches that morning, and ensure the decisive victory for the 29th Division. Danzac, too, a great opportunity went begging, although here the initiative of one opponent, the then unknown Mustafa Kemal, contributed to its unfulfillment. The surprise landing had placed 4,000 men before 5 a.m and another 4,000 before 8 a.m., on a shore guarded by only one Turkish company. The next company was more than a mile to the south, two battalions and a battery in local reserve were four miles inland, and still farther away lay the general reserve of eight battalions and three batteries, commanded by Mustafa Kemal. He was out watching a regiment at training, when suddenly a number of gendarmes, bareheaded and weaponless, came running frantically towards him, crying dash they come, they come. Who comes? Ingles, Ingles. He turned to ask, have we all cartridges? Yes. All right. Forward. Leading a company himself, and leaving the rest of the regiment to follow, he raced to the great dividing ridge of Chunuk Bear in time, about 10 a.m to cross the crest and check the leading Australians as they were climbing up the steeper slopes on the west. 
until now barely 500 Turks had been available to hold up 8,000 Australians, but henceforth the defenders were to be augmented steadily until by nightfall six battalions, perhaps 5,000 men, had been brought up, and from 4 p.m. onwards launched in a series of counter-attacks which forced back but failed to break the ragged Australian line. Both sides had suffered about 2,000 casualties, the Turks far more heavily in proportion, but the raw Australians were in unknown country, under fire for the first time, and the moral effect of the shrapnel from the enemy's handful of guns was made worse by the absence of their own. Although 15,000 men were ashore by 6 p.m., the front was but a thin and much intermixed line, and the beach was crowded with leaderless men who had drifted back, many because they had lost themselves rather than lost their nerve. But the sight naturally confirmed the fears of the commanders, themselves in rear, and so gloomy was their report to Birdwood, when he landed at 10 p.m., that he sent a message to Ian Hamilton saying dash both my divisional commanders and brigadiers have represented to me that they fear their men are thoroughly demoralized by shrapnel fire. If troops are to be subjected to shell fire again tomorrow morning there is likely to be a fiasco. If we are to re-embark it must be at once. All available boats were ordered to be sent to the beach. Only by a fluke did the message ever reach the commander in chief, for in the hurry it was not addressed to anyone, but, being thrust into the hands of the beach master, who was going out to the flagship, he handed it when the to Admiral Thursby. After reading it, Thursby decided to go ashore to discuss the re-embarkation with Birdwood, but at that moment the Queen Elizabeth, with Ian Hamilton on board, unexpectedly arrived from Hells, so that Thursby went instead to report to him. Thus by a chain of happy mishaps Birdwood's grave message reached Ian Hamilton in time. Insight must have guided him in an extraordinarily difficult decision, for no other guidance, or comfort, was available, and no time to obtain it. The reply which he wrote was epitomized in its postscript dash you have got through the difficult business. Now you have only to dig, 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 until you are safe. Like a fresh breeze, this definite and confident order dispersed the rumor laden and gloomy atmosphere on the beach. The rear ceased to talk about evacuation, and the front did not know that the rear had been talking about it. When morning broke, there was also a respite from the real enemy, for Mustafa Kemal had no further reserves with which to renew his counter attack and the shrapnel from his few guns was no longer a terror to troops now safely dug in. Indeed, it was the Turk who suffered demoralization, from the guns of the fleet, and especially the huge 15-inch shells of the Queen Elizabeth. Could the lost opportunity still have been regained? History answers, yes. And the reason lies in the profound impression made, by Ian Hamilton's original plan, on the mind of the enemy commander-in-chief. Limon von Sanders records of the first day, April 25, that dash from the many pale faces among the officers reporting in the early morning, it was apparent that, although a hostile landing had been expected with certainty, a landing at so many points surprised and disquieted them. We could not discern at the time where the enemy was actually seeking a decision. The last sentence is a euphemism. For Limon von Sanders actually thought that the place where the British were merely making a bluff was the place where they were seeking a decision. If he kept his head he lost his sense of direction. His first act was to order his 7th Division to march from the town of Gallipoli to Boulair. His next, to gallop thither himself. And there he stayed while the critical struggle was in progress at the other end of the peninsula. Not until evening would he even spare five battalions out of his two divisions around Boulair, to go to the real battle zone, and not until over 48 hours after the British landing did he release the remainder. But the extension of the opportunity was of no avail to the British. Partly for want of fresh troops, when so many, in comparison, were locked up in the Western Front safe deposit. But partly, also, for want of effort from those who had landed. Ian Hamilton's optimism, although justified, was not shared by his subordinate commanders on the morning of the 26th. It was not merely the Anzac force which remained passive. At Hells, Hunter Weston, appreciating the tiredness of his troops but not the weakness of the enemy, 
gave up any idea of advancing until French reinforcements arrived. Expecting a Turkish onslaught, and fearing the result, he issued the order, every man will die at his post rather than retire. So far from attacking, the Turks went back to a new line in front of Krithia. Well they might, for their total strength here up to the 27th was only 5 battalions, and casualties had reduced them to a real strength scarcely more than the original two. Not until the 28th was a new attack attempted, and by then the Franco-British force had almost lost its advantage of numbers and suffered the disadvantages of ignorance of the ground, thirst, increased tiredness, besides complicating its task by combining the attack with a right wheel. The small gains were lost to Turkish counter-attacks and near the coast the line wavered and broke. The danger here was averted by a single shell from the Queen Elizabeth. It burst its 24,000 shrapnel bullets right in the midst of the onrushing mass of Turks, and when the dust cleared not a Turk was to be seen. But by nightfall the whole 29th division was back at its starting point. Meantime the troops at Anzac were reorganizing and making their front secure. But so also were the Turks and thus the Anzac force was locked in a tiny cell only one and a half miles long and half a mile deep, while the Turk looked down from the roof upon the arrested trespassers. The almost blank credit side of the Allied balance sheet was now relieved by a Turkish contribution. Urged on by Inver's peremptory order to drive the invaders into the sea, Limon von Sanders launched massed bayonet attacks on the nights of May 1st and 3rd. Several thousand dead were heaped as a sacrifice before the Allied front, which was only, and momentarily, endangered in the French sector. The Turks' forfeit was soon redeemed, by the British. Two brigades were brought from Anzac and a new brigade, of territorials, came from Egypt. Even so, the Allied force at Hells could only bring a fighting strength of 25,000 against a Turkish strength now raised to nearly 20,000 and, in the issue, it did not even test their strength. The Allied attack arranged for May 6 suffered every possible disadvantage. It was purely frontal, on a narrow three-mile front, against unlocated positions, with an extreme shortage of shells, and a shortage of aircraft to observe the fire, at the shortest notice. Hunter Weston's orders were not issued to brigades until 4 a.m. for an attack to begin at 11 a.m. Once more the control of the battle and the last remaining reserves were handed over to Hunter Weston by Ian Hamilton Dash all that was left to him, as the official history says, of the high office of commander in chief was its load of responsibility. Fatigue rather than resistance foiled the attack. The troops, worn out by strain and lack of sleep, had not even the energy to press on to the slaughter, and they did not even push back the Turks' advanced posts. As the best remedy for lack of rest Hunter Weston ordered a fresh effort next morning. This was no more effective, except in draining the ammunition almost to zero. So a third attack was ordered for the third morning. In this the loss at least was confined to a smaller circle, by launching four weak battalions of New Zealanders, in daylight, against a position held by nine Turkish battalions. Then Ian Hamilton, finding that three brigades were still in reserve, himself intervened. The whole allied line was to fix bayonets, slow palms, and move on Krithia precisely at 5.30 pm. This produced heavy casualties, if nothing else. The attacking force had lost a third of its strength in the three days. Thereafter the front of the two small footholds gained by the allies inevitably relapsed into stagnation which soon froze solidly as the Turks converted their hasty defences into an organised trench system. Now, at last, Ian Hamilton was driven to ask for reinforcements, and to awake the government to his serious need and situation. Hitherto, although conscious of the inadequacy of his force, he had been too loyal to Kitchener, and perhaps too aware of his old chief's arbitrary methods, to worry him by importunate demands. Before leaving England he had been told that 75,000 men would and must suffice, that even the 29th Division was but a temporary loan, and the fact that Kitchener had warned Maxwell, the commander in Egypt, to help him with additional troops, 
was not communicated to him by Maxwell despite Kitchener's explicit instructions. Lack of ammunition was another handicap, and when he called attention to it the war office reply merely told him that it was important to push on. Yet, almost simultaneously with his vain three days attack, May 6th to 8th, in which he could only use 18,500 shells, Haig was expending 80,000 on Orber's Ridge in one day, for less result, a far less object, and twice the loss of life. Up to a point, the astonishing feature of Gallipoli was how near Ian Hamilton came to success with his inferior forces and resources. His oft criticized choice of landing place could hardly have been improved on if, by supernatural power, he had been able to know the enemy's mind and dispositions. By avoiding the natural line of expectation, the pitfall of commonplace generalship, and by distracting the enemy's attention to that line, he ensured his own troops an immense superiority of force at the actual landing places, although his total force was less than that of the Turks. The enemy commander let his attention be so fixed on Boulay that for 48 hours after the British were sure their immediate opponents were denied adequate reinforcements. This fact is the best answer to the common criticism that Ian Hamilton should have struck at Boulay, a point so obvious to everyone at home that, curiously, it was also obvious to the enemy. Another popular criticism is that Ian Hamilton dispersed his force at too many points and should have concentrated his effort on one small sector. This is answered not only by the pale faces of which Lyman von Sanders tells, but by the next three years' experience of this abortive method on the Western Front, experience which was purchased at an infinitely greater cost. Perhaps, as an alternative landing place, also in the least defended area, Savla Bay might have offered the advantages of Ian Hamilton's choice with less disadvantages. But in April accurate information was lacking and exaggerated faith placed in the effect of the naval guns at Hells. Another reasonable criticism is that the British power of rapid sea movement might have been utilized more fully, to withdraw troops were checked before they were deeply committed and switch them to reinforce the unopposed landings or to fresh points. Thereby the lack of reserves might have been partly compensated through the power to create fresh ones by switching. This, indeed, had been suggested to Braithwaite, the chief of staff, on the day before the landing by Captain S. Pinehall, an officer of the general staff. He urged that the plan should be adapted to meet the contingency that either or both the landings at Anzac and Hells might fail. An equal or greater fault in the plan was that it failed to provide for partial success, the most probable case in war, and left no floating reserve in the hands of the commander-in-chief ready for prompt application at the most promising point ashore. Unhappily, both the plan and the execution suffered from lack of the elasticity which is an essential axiom in war and the partial success of both landings in the first phase tended to harden the design, until it became hard and stuck fast. For years controversy has centered round the incubation period of the Dardanelles project, and the plan which was evolved. More depressing is the later revelation of the opportunities thrown away after the force had landed, lost opportunities hitherto obscured by a halo of romance. Five scene three the gas cloud at Ypera. April 22, 1915 The sun was sinking behind Ypera. Its spring radiance had breathed life that day into the dead town and the mouldering trench lines which guarded it. A month hence the town would be a shell with all the eerie moonlit grandeur of a greater Colosseum. Three years hence it would be merely a vast antique of tumbled ruins. But on that 22nd day of April, 1915, it had merely the dreariness of incomplete abandonment, momentarily relieved by the fragrance of a spring day's sunshine. As that fragrance faded with the waning sun, even the guns became silent, and an evening hush spread over the scene as if in order waiting of a benediction. The hush was false, purely a prelude to the devil's malediction, with organ pealing, senses swinging. At five o'clock a fearful din of guns broke out and heavy shells struck with reverberating crash on Ypres and many villages rarely or never touched before, and to the nostrils of men nearer the front came the smell of a devilish incense. 
those nearer still to the trenches north of Ypres saw two curious wraiths of greenish yellow fog creep forward, spread until they became one and then, moving forward, changed to a blue-white mist. It hung, as it had come, over the front of the two French divisions, one Algerian, one territorial, which joined up with the British, and held the left of the salient. Soon, officers behind the British front and near the canal bridges, were startled to see a torrent of terrified humanity pouring backward. The Africans, nearest the British, were coughing and pointing to their throats as they fled, mingled with them soon came horse teams and wagons. The French guns were still firing, but at 7 pm these suddenly and ominously became silent. The fugitives left behind them a gap in the front over four miles wide filled only by the dead and by those who lay suffocating in agony from chlorine gas poisoning. Otherwise the two French divisions had almost completely disappeared. With the aid of gas the Germans had removed the defenders on the north flank of the salient as deftly as if extracting the back teeth from one side of a jaw. The remaining teeth in front and on the south flank of the salient were formed by the Canadian division, Alderson, nearest the gap, the 28th division, Balfin, and the 27th Division, Snow, which together comprised Pluma's 5th Corps. The Germans had only to push south for four miles to reach Ypres, and loosen all these teeth by pressure from the rear. That evening they walked forward two miles and then, curiously, stopped. The space of four and a half miles between the raw edge of the Canadian front and the canal which formed the cord of the salient, was only filled by a few small posts taken up hastily by packets of French and Canadians hitherto in reserve, and between these posts there were three untenanted gaps of 2,000 yards, 1,000 yards, and 3,000 yards, respectively. Yet on May 1st the Germans had only advanced a few hundred yards farther. And when the fighting at last died down, at the end of May, the only outward change was that the nose of the salient had been flattened, mainly by a voluntary British withdrawal. But, in curious contrast to normal experience, it was the defenders who had lost most heavily. The British loss was 59,000, nearly double that suffered by the Germans who attacked them. Why did the gas come as so complete a surprise? Why did the Germans fail to exploit such a surprise? Why did the British escape disaster when taken unawares by the French collapse and yet suffer so disproportionately when the Germans had forfeited their advantage? These are the three crucial questions of second deeper. Towards the end of March, prisoners taken on the south of the salient, then held by the French, gave full details of the way that gas cylinders had been stored in the trenches, and of its method of discharge. Perhaps because they were about to be relieved. The French commanders took no action in regard to this warning, although, curiously, the details appear in the bulletin of the French 10th Army, away down in Picardy, for March 30 th. An even more complete and localized warning came on April 13, when a German deserter gave himself up near Langemark to the French 11th Division, then holding the sector, and related that cylinders with asphyxiating gas, had been placed in batteries of 20 cylinders for every 40 meters along the front. At a given signal, three red rockets fired by the artillery, the cylinders will be opened and the escaping gas will be carried by a favorable wind towards the French trenches. In order to guard against being poisoned by the gas, each German soldier is in possession of a packet of tow soaked in oxygen dash the deserter handed over one of these embryo gas masks in proof of his statement. The French divisional commander, General Ferry, gravely impressed, warned the French division on his left, the British 28th division on his right, and the Canadian division, which took over part of his front two days later while the Algerian division took over the rest. More significant still, Ferry warned his corps commander, Paul Fourier, and the liaison officer from Joffre's headquarters, who came to visit him. How did these two key men react? Paul Fourier deemed Ferry a credulous fool and ignored his suggestions that the German trenches should be shelled in order to destroy the cylinders, and that the number of men in the front line, exposed to the gas danger, should be reduced. 
the liaison officer not only dismissed the story as a myth, but reproved Ferry, first, for warning the British direct, and, second, for taking steps to reduce the garrison of the front line contrary to Joff's doctrine. And, following the usual happy custom of the French army, Ferry was thereafter punished by removal for being right. General Potts, who, with his two divisions, took over the left of the salient from Balforia, was no more inclined to believe the story than Balforia, although a fresh warning came from Belgian sources on April 16. Potts mentioned the story scoffingly to the British liaison officer from Smith Doyen's Second Army, but apparently did not think it worth repeating to his own troops. So they waited in ignorance until suffocation overtook them. The only measures taken were by the British. Aircraft reconnaissances were made, but failed to observe anything unusual, and Plumer passed the warning to his divisional commanders for what it was worth. No precautions against gas were suggested or ordered, and in the next few days, even the fact of the warning was forgotten, perhaps all the easier because it sounded such an ungentlemanly novelty. Yet acquaintance with the German practice of getting in the first verbal blow might well have made the British command suspect the sinister significance of the German wireless communique of April 17 yesterday, east of Ypres. The British employed shells and bombs with asphyxiating gas. But one factor which undoubtedly lulled suspicion of an attack was the lack of any sign that the Germans were concentrating reserves for it. This lack of signs was due, not to special precautions, but to the lack of such reserves. And thereby the Germans lost the opportunity created by the most complete surprise of the war. As scientifically hidebound as its opponents, the German Supreme Command had little faith in the new weapon. So little, that for want of facilities the inventor, Haber, had to use cylinders mainly for projection instead of shells. A discharge of gas from cylinders must be dependent on a favorable wind and, as a westerly or southwesterly wind was the most frequent in Flanders, the Germans thus offered a hostage to fortune. Disclosing their new weapon prematurely and for a paltry prize, they gave their opponents the advantage in retaliation until sufficient gas shell was produced to replace gas cylinders. However weak their faith, it is incredible, but for the result, that the Germans should have neglected to be ready for a possible success. Yet, actually, Falkenhayn allotted no fresh reserves for the attack, and even refused the request for extra ammunition. Falkenhayn's idea was merely to try the gas as an experimental aid to an attack which itself was merely a cloak to his projected blow against the Russians. If the Ypres salient could be raised, so much the better, but he did not take any longer view. Originally the attack was to be launched by the 15 Corps against the southern side of the salient, and the gas cylinders were in position by March 10. But the attack had to be postponed repeatedly for want of a favorable wind, and towards the end of March an alternative attack was prepared on the north side of the salient. Intended for April 15, this in turn was delayed a week. It was then launched by the two divisions of the 26 Reserve Corps, with one division of the 23 Reserve Corps attacking on their right. As an aid to the main thrust the other division of the 23 Reserve Corps was to strike at Steenstraat, which was both the hinge of the salient and the junction between the French and the Belgians. Unaided by gas this subsidiary attack made little progress. Only one division was available in Army Reserve, and this was not released until next day, and was then given to the 23 Reserve Corps, not to the 26 which had an open gap before it. Dot, but if lack of reserves was the fundamental cause of the Germans' failure, the immediate cause was the troops' fear of their own gas. They had only been issued with the crudest form of respirator, which many of them did not even wear, no special tactics had been thought out, and, after passing through the gasping and agonized men who littered the French trenches, they were only too willing to comply with the letter of their limited orders and dig in as soon as they reached the short distance objective that had been assigned. The failing light, too, prevented them discovering the extent of their success and the weakness of the few stout-hearted knots of Canadians who were strung across their path. And during the succeeding days they were equally content to act as camp followers to their artillery, 
merely taking a short step forward to occupy and consolidate such fresh patches of ground as the guns and gas had swept practically clear of defenders. However short-sighted during the first days, when opportunity lay open to their embrace, this pure siege warfare method was good sense later. It foreshadowed the Verdun method of a year later, and, thanks to Fock, the Allies helped to make it most profitable to the Germans. Fock was then, as Joff's deputy, in higher control of the French troops in Flanders, and charged with the duty of coordinating the efforts of the French, British and Belgians. On hearing the news of the German breakthrough, he ordered Putz to make sure of holding his ground, now the line of the canal, and to organize a counter-attack to regain the ground he had lost. But the French had lost their artillery and all they could do was to fulfill the first point. Fortunately, the Belgians baffled the German efforts to break the hinge. Putz, however, told the British that he would be counter-attacking and to aid him two Canadian battalions made a midnight counter-attack. They penetrated the new German line, and captured Kitchener's wood, but as no French attack developed they had to withdraw from it later. Next day, the British, scraping together a few handfuls of reserves, attempted further petty counter-attacks which naturally failed at heavy cost, as they were delivered in daylight and with negligible support from the French and from artillery. By evening on the 23rd, however, the broad way to Ypres and the British rear was almost filled, although by only 21 and a half sorely weakened British battalions, 12 of them Canadian, who faced 42 German battalions, and a 5 to 1 superiority in guns. Sir John French ordered a continuation of these vain efforts on the 24th, but the Germans anticipated him. At 3 a.m. they attacked the Belgian hinge and were badly discomfited, henceforth they were unable either to widen or deepen their small foothold across the canal. At 4 a.m. they launched a heavy blow, with gas, against the jagged corner of the Canadians' front. No respirators were yet available and the only protection were handkerchiefs, towels and cotton bandoliers, wetted with the liquid most readily available in the trenches and placed over the mouth. Many men were overcome and, although there was only a small break in the line at the first onset, this gradually spread. For a time good artillery shooting prevented the Germans probing the breach, but in the afternoon they surged forward to and beyond S.D. Julian. The situation looked critical, but a counter-attack by two Yorkshire Territorial Battalions, helped by Canadian batteries firing over open sights rolled the leading Germans back to S.D. Julian. This slight taste of repulse sufficed to quench the Germans' thirst for further advance that day. But their irresolution was hidden from the eyes of the British commanders by the general confusion. In the patchwork line across the Germans' path, Canadians, British regulars, territorials, evens waves, of various divisions and brigades, were intermingled, clinging on wherever they had been pushed like dabs of cement into a crumbling wall. The salient had now been compressed by German pressure into a narrow tongue of land, barely three miles across, although nearly six miles deep. Thus, in attempting to hold it, the defenders were now so crowded that they provided an easy harvest for the German guns. Yet Sir John French, beguiled by the optimism of Fock and Potts, and the assurance that two fresh French divisions were coming up to retake the lost ground, was unwilling to sanction any withdrawal. Early on the 25th, the day of the Gallipoli landing, a fresh regular brigade was brought up and thrown blindly into an attack near St. Julian, there to be mown down like corn, by machine guns in enfilade. With appalling swiftness 2,400 men were scythed, more loss than Ian Hamilton's army paid for the capture of the Gallipoli beaches. And that evening the bulk of the Canadian division was withdrawn into reserve, having lost some 5,000 men in its gallant efforts to battle against gas and heavy guns with their rifles, supplemented meagerly by guns that the official history terms the ancient and obsolete weapons of the South African War. Nor did the burden of this helpless struggle cease with the relief of the Canadians, it was merely shifted more fully to other shoulders. For another month operations were to continue, methodical German attacks answered by unmethodical British attacks. 
lest I be thought to emphasize the futility unduly, let me quote the sober and somber words of the official history the governing idea was that the French should restore the line lost by them, and that the British should assist. General Fock ordered immediate counter-attacks which General Putz was not in a position to execute, whilst the British wholehearted attempts to carry out their share by means of offensive action, which was as a rule neither a true counter-attack nor a deliberately prepared attack, led to heavy losses without restoring the situation. It seemed to the British officers at the front that they were being sacrificed to gain time until the French were ready for a big spectacular effort, but this, even if ever intended, did not materialize. To study the cause of the tragedy, we must shift our gaze from the front to the rear. After expending the Indian Lahore Division and the Northumberland Territorial Brigade in another vain attack on the 26th, with a loss of another 4,000 men, Smith Doyen realized the futility of such efforts and the improbability of French cooperation. Hence, on the 27th, he wrote to Robertson, the chief of the general staff asking him to put the real situation before French, and saying dash I am doubtful if it is worth losing any more men to regain this French ground, unless the French do something really big. He further suggested that it would be wise to prepare for a withdrawal to a less acutely bent line nearer to Ypres. All that he got in reply was a telephone message from Robertson dash chief does not regard situation nearly so unfavorable as your letter represents. In fact, However, Smith Doyen's letter was far more optimistic than the grim conditions justified. Yet this comforting message from the comfortable and peacefully remote general headquarters was followed by a still worse rebuff, a telegram, sent through unciphered, telling Smith Doyen to hand over command of all the troops engaged at Ypres to General Plumer, and also to send the latter his chief of staff, General Milne. Relations between French and Smith Doyen had become very strained ever since Smith Doyen had saved French's situation against his own orders at Le Cat in August, 1914. Now, French, true to a habit of his namesakes, seized the chance to punish Smith Doyen for making a true diagnosis, and administered a public rebuff which left Smith Doyen no option but to send a hint that he would resign if desired. French instantly embraced it and ordered him to hand over his shrunken command and go home. Nevertheless, Plumer's first instructions from French were to prepare the very withdrawal that Smith Doyen had tentatively proposed. Then French went off to see Fock at Castle and came back with a different outlook. Fock argued vehemently against a withdrawal, said that the lost ground could be retaken by the troops already available, urged that a retirement should be forbidden and begged French to support the French offensive to retake the landmark region at all costs, beginning at noon on the 29th. The days that followed were a comedy behind the front, a tragedy for the troops in front. Day after day, French heard from his fighting subordinates of the sufferings of the men and of the continued absence of the ever-promised French offensive. Thereupon he would incline towards a withdrawal only to be swung the other way by fox buoyant assurances and flattering entreaties. Once more let us quote the official history for ill now, although for wheel in the last year of the war, General Fock was the very spirit of the offensive. Sir John French, though at first he had wholeheartedly complied with General Fock's wishes, appreciated the small result of the French efforts, or, rather, the smallness of the first efforts and the heavy losses of his own troops crowded together in the small place arm of the narrowed salient. Sir John French then became convinced that he must withdraw his troops, and passed from optimism to pessimism. It was naturally most difficult for his subordinates to follow his moods, particularly when his mind was on the borderline between one phase of thought and the next, and when, at the entreaty of General Fock, he more than once agreed to wait a little longer before withdrawing his men, and to order one more counter-attack. However, he clutched at a straw in the wind when, late on May 1, Fock confessed that Joffre, so far from sending reinforcements, was calling for troops to be sent from Ypres to strengthen his forthcoming offensive near Arras. French forthwith sanctioned the long-planned withdrawal, by nightly stages, although only to a line some three miles short of Ypres, so that the front still formed a salient, if a flatter one. 
This was more inconvenient for defense and control than the original salient. The head being exposed to pounding from all sides while Ypres itself formed a dangerously narrow throat of supply and communication. The political and sentimental objection to yielding ground, especially Belgian ground, and the military desire to facilitate the task of any belated French effort, led Sir John French to overrule the fighting commander's wish to withdraw to the natural straight line of defence formed by the ramparts of Ypres and the canal. So they stayed in the reduced salient, one huge artillery target, that to be pounded and gassed incessantly, with their scanty ammunition running out, until relief at last came, in the fourth week of May, through the Germans exhausting their own comparative superfluity of shells. For the Germans had at least the good sense to cease attacks when they came to the choice between economizing infantry lives and economizing artillery ammunition. All that the French had done in the interval was to clear the west bank of the canal, on May 15, while the continued British bayonet attack east of Ypres did not even succeed in preventing the Germans switching troops from the British sector to check the eventual small French attack, truly a mountain that was long in labour and brought forth a mouse. And having forfeited 60,000 men for the privilege of acting as midwife, the British were then left to hold the most uncomfortably cramped new salient, or target, at continued expense for over two years. To throw good money after bad is foolish. But to throw away men's lives where there is no reasonable chance of advantage, is criminal. In the heat of battle, mistakes in the command are inevitable and amply excusable. But the real indictment of leadership arises when attacks that are inherently vain are ordered merely because if they could succeed they would be useful. For such manslaughter, whether it springs from ignorance, a false conception of war or a want of moral courage, commanders should be held accountable to the nation. Five scene for the unwanted battle, lose, September 15th. 1915 In early September the back of the front in France was seething with rumours of a great Franco-British offensive which was to shatter the German front, and, if the atmosphere among the fighting troops was tense, it had also an exhilarating breath of confidence in the result. For the first time the new armies and territorials were to take a prominent part, and few seemed to expect that the joint hammer blows of British and French together could fail, at least to dissolve the static trench warfare that had persisted for nearly a year. But there was one extreme contrast to this air of confidence, and that was in the headquarters of the British higher commanders. For the ill-fated Luz offensive was undertaken directly against the opinion of Haag, the man who, as commander of the First Army, had to carry it out. Haag argued that the supply of heavy artillery and of shells was still inadequate, that its adequacy was the governing factor of the situation and that until this weakness was remedied, it was little used to make plans for offensives. For in June the British Army still had only 71 heavy guns to 1,406 field guns, and the factories in England were turning out no more than 22,000 shells a day, compared to 100,000 by the French, and 250,000 by the Germans and Austrians. According to report. Haig's view was by no means an isolated one. Robertson, chief of the general staff of the British Expeditionary Force, fully endorsed it, but his influence with his own chief had been undermined by Sir Henry Wilson, who was a devout believer in the infallibility of French military judgment, and Robertson had even been excluded from Sir John French's personal mess. Meantime, Wilson, the friend and confidant of French, was proposing to Kitchener that the British army should be divided into two groups, one to be located away in Lorraine, so as to ensure that French should be unable to take an independent attitude towards the French. Equally emphatic, and pessimistic, was Sir Henry Rawlinson, who, under Haag, would have the main task with his army corps. He noted in his diary dash my new front is as flat as the palm of my hand. Hardly any cover anywhere. D.H. tells me that we are to attack au fond, that the French are doing likewise and making a supreme effort. It will cost us dearly, and we shall not get very far. He, however, was left no choice but to do that his men might die. For, in face of all these warnings, 
only too truly founded, the better judgment of the British commanders was overborne by Joff's pressure. The next revelation is that the instrument of this pressure was Lord Kitchener. It is a curious sidelight on one who had been among the first of British leaders to appreciate the state of deadlock in the West and to exclaim against the stubborn folly of seeking to pass the impassable. Kitchener had seen his January doubts fulfilled, and in June had bitterly remarked, as Poincare has recorded Dash Joffre and Sir John, French, told me in November they were going to push the Germans back over the frontier. They gave me the same assurances in December, March, and May. What have they done? The attacks are very costly and end in nothing. Yet he was now the determining factor in adding naught to naught. How was this strange chain of causation forged? Joff, spiritual twin of his subordinate Fock, in the sense of being an unquenchable optimist, was undeterred by his hard experiences of the spring from the repetition of them in the autumn. In his plan, two great convergent blows were to be delivered from the widely separated sectors of our toys, Arras Lens, and Champagne, Reims the Argonne, the former being originally intended as the main blow. Note this point for it had a vital influence and suffered a vital alteration. A successful breakthrough both in Champagne and Artois was to be the signal for a general offensive of all the French and British armies on the Western Front. This, Joff confidently declared, would compel the Germans to retreat beyond the Meuse and possibly end the war. Yet, in the event, one and a third German divisions sufficed to break the back of the attack of the six British divisions north of Lens, and south of Lens the French attack by fourteen divisions was hardly even developed in face of five German divisions. What a majestic conception was this plan of Joffs, and how utterly unrelated to the material conditions of modern warfare. And what painful evidence that professional strategy may be the sheerest amateur strategy. When Joff's draft plan was sent on June 4 to Sir John French, the British commander in chief expressed his general agreement. Then a strong gust of common sense came from his subordinate, Haag, and the military where their vein swung the other way. Haig had made a personal reconnaissance of the area south of the Labassi Canal, Labassi Lentz and as a result declared definitely that it was not a favorable one for an attack. His verdict was to prove most accurate. In his view the German defenses were so strong that, until a great increase of heavy artillery was provided, they could only be taken by siege methods. The ground, for the most part bare and open, would be so swept by machine gun and rifle fire both from the German front trenches and from the numerous fortified villages immediately behind them that a rapid advance would be impossible. He suggested that, if an offensive on the left of the French was imperative, subsidiary attacks only should be made south of the canal, and the main one delivered astride and north of it. But he concluded with the cold douche already mentioned. Joff, however, would not accept arguments for a postponement of the offensive or a change of sight. He even remarked with that magisterial infallibility which is so delightful in retrospect, but in retrospect only, that your attack will find particularly favorable ground between Luz and Labassi. It was certainly both a simple and a magisterial way of brushing aside the adverse evidence of Haag, who had seen the ground. Meanwhile the Germans, if not yet expecting an attack, were working with feverish energy to strengthen their defenses and to create a second system in rear of the front this was nearing completion by the end of July and knowledge of it accentuated Sir John French's doubts, under Haig's reiteration of his opinion. Hence a conference was arranged at Frevent on July 27 with Fock who, however, maintained that it was essential that, regardless of the ground and the strength of the enemy's defenses, Haig's army should make its main attack just north of Lens in close connection with the French 10th Army south of Lens, pinching out this maze-like mining town. The tug of war between Haig and French, and Joffre and Fock continued, with Sir John French seeking a way out through a project of cooperating with artillery fire alone. This was quashed and the tug of war decided by the intervention of Kitchener. Visiting Sir John French in August, he told him that we must act with all energy and do our utmost to help France in this offensive, 
even though by so doing we may suffer very heavy losses. In this reversal of his own previous attitude, he was apparently influenced by the disasters then occurring on the Russian front, and his feeling of the urgent need to succor our Russian allies, as well, perhaps, by his reaction from the disappointment at the Dardanelles. But two blacks do not make a white and, as he had long since declared his view that the Western Front was impassable, it is difficult to see how he could feel that a hopeless offensive that could bring fresh hope to the Russians. He may have felt, however, that it would show the need and pave the way for the appointment of a supreme commander of the Entente forces. The official history has discreetly lifted a corner of the veil of history with the statement dash it is believed that Lord Kitchener himself had anticipated a call to this post. In that case a timely concession to the French over Luz was likely to make them more receptive towards the other suggestion later. But the immediate result, to quote the official history, was that under pressure from Lord Kitchener at home, due to the general position of the Allies, and from Generals Joffre and Foch in France, due to the local situation in France, the British commander-in-chief was therefore compelled to undertake operations before he was ready over ground that was most unfavorable, against the better judgment of himself and of General Haag, and, with no more than a quarter of the troops, nine divisions, instead of thirty-six, that he considered necessary for a successful attack. French was himself, as we shall see, to extinguish its last hope of success. The last but one had been extinguished by a final alteration of the French plan. This was Joffre's decision to make the Champagne attack, and not the Artois. His main attack, for the reason that the ground in Champagne had fewer obstacles or villages in the way of the attackers. The sudden preference for tactical over strategical considerations is in curious contrast to his view where the British attack was concerned. This change, again, had a damaging influence on the British attack for both the British and French official accounts make it clear that the French Artois attack south of Lens by 17 divisions on a 12-mile frontage, supported by 420 heavy guns, was not seriously pressed once the strength of the defence was realised. Yet the French had nearly twice as many heavy guns to the mile as the British, 117 in all. In Champagne 27 French divisions, with 850 heavy guns, were assembled for the attack, on an 18-mile frontage. Thus the proportionate artillery support here was still higher. When the decision to attack at Luz was definitely taken, Haig's first intention to curtail his commitment and probable loss, was to attack at first with only two divisions. But a too successful demonstration of the possibilities of chlorine gas projected in a wave from cylinders led him to modify his views, and to believe that if the wind was favorable the gas discharge might even procure decisive results and justify him in attacking on the wider frontage of six divisions, Rawlinson's four corps, 47th, 15th and 1st divisions, on the right, or south, and Goffsai corps, 7th, 9th and second divisions, on the left dot with sound judgment of the chances, Haig urged that under no circumstances should our forthcoming attack be launched without the aid of gas, but he was overruled by French and Foch. He then obtained permission to reserve his decision until the last possible moment and to let the choice, between the large or limited attack, depend on the weather conditions. By the irony of fortune, the wind was most favourable for the use of gas on September 15, the day originally fixed by Foch for the attack, and this fact encouraged Haig's hopes. But the retention of a dual plan led to a distribution of the artillery on the whole army front instead of a concentration on one third. Dot over 5,000 cylinders of gas, containing nearly 150 tonnes, were carried up to the front trenches and safely installed in special recesses without one being hit by enemy fire. Even so, there was barely half the volume of gas necessary to maintain a continuous flow for the 40 minutes that, in turn, were considered necessary to outlast the protective power of the oxygen apparatus used by the enemy machine gunners. Hence the cylinders had to be turned on and off intermittently. Smoke candles were used in the intervals to simulate gas, and, at the end, 
to form the first smoke screen of the war. The artillery bombardment began on September 21, the ammunition being eked out by limiting each heavy gun to 90 rounds, and each field gun to 150 in the 24 hours. The results were not encouraging, so far as effect could be discovered and led the commanders to study the wind all the more attentively. The last night was a time of tense anxiety. Repeatedly Haig studied fresh charts sent in by a chain of meteorological observers. At 6 p.m. the forecast was that the wind would be on the borderline between favorable and unfavorable, with a slight bias towards favorable. At 9 p.m. the forecast was better, indicating a probable change to a southwesterly or even westerly wind which would carry the gas over the German trenches. Thereupon Hagan hesitatingly ordered the full-scale offensive with gas, although as a precaution staff officers of each corps had been ordered to stand by their telephones. At 3 a.m., after a further report not quite so encouraging, he fixed sunrise, 5.50 a.m., as the hour for releasing the gas. During the hours of darkness the wind changed as predicted, but only as far as southwest, and, worse still, was so slight as to be almost a calm dot about 5 a.m., as soon as it was light, Haig went out. He could feel only the faintest breath of air, and he asked his senior ADC to light a cigarette. The smoke drifted in puffs to the northeast. Did it justify the venture? Would the gas merely hang in the British trenches? A slight increase of wind was felt and at 5.15 a.m. Haig gave the decisive order to carry on and climbed his wooden lookout tower. But the improvement was delusive, and a few minutes later one of his staff telephoned to the I Corps, to ask whether it was possible to stop the discharge and the attack. For this emergency the gas officers had made ample arrangements. But Goff replied that it was too late. If it would certainly have been a close shave, one may suspect especially in view of Goff's record, that with this ardent fight of the wish was at least the midwife, if not the father, of the thought. When the gas was actually turned on at 5.50 am it carried fairly well over the German trenches on the right, if too slow and slight for full effect, but on the left was a failure, in some places drifting back and upsetting the attack. In Holmes' second division, the officer in charge of the gas on the 6th Brigade front declined to assume the responsibility of turning on the cylinders. But when this was reported to divisional headquarters, Holm replied with an order that the program must be carried out whatever the conditions. As a result of this obstinacy many of the infantry were poisoned by their own gas. Those who were able to advance were soon stopped, and slaughtered by the youngest German machine gunners. Nevertheless, Home ordered a fresh assault, which was only abandoned after his brigade commanders had protested against the useless sacrifice of life. The general infantry assault had been launched at 6.30 a.m., and into it was thrown the entire strength of the First Army, except for local reserves. Neither Haig nor the commanders of his two attacking corps kept any reserve as they understood that the commander-in-chief expected a breakthrough and would use his general reserve to back them up promptly. On the extreme right the 47th Division nearly carried out its task of throwing forward a defensive flank, but the not quite had an important bearing on the surprisingly successful initial rush of its neighbor, the 15th Division, contributing towards the loss of direction which nullified its near approach to a breakthrough, beyond Hill 70. So swift and deep was the advance of these Scotsmen of K's army that the German command made hurried preparations to evacuate the whole area, and as far back as Dwy there were endless convoys of wagons formed up in double lines ready to march away. Another ill effect was due to the long delay in the 1st Division's advance, only partially retrieved. Its left brigade had suffered similarly to Horn's division and, instead of the divisional reserve being sent through the gap made on the flanks, the morning was wasted in futile attempts to renew the frontal assault. This stoppage in the British centre tended to check the whole momentum of the British advance. Further to the left the 7th and 9th divisions obtained promising results, although the 9th had suffered, both in opportunity and life from the misguided insistence of the corps commander, Goff, on renewing the vain frontal assault of the left brigade. In wise contrast Kappa, 
commanding the 7th Division, when confronted with a check on his left, had quickly passed his reserve through the gap made by the successful advance of his right. The fulfillment of any promise, however, depended on the prompt infusion of reserves. This was the crux of the situation and the sealing cause of failure. Even Joff had said that if French kept his reserve divisions too far back they would run the risk of arriving too late to exploit the success of the leading ones. It is indispensable that these divisions are put, before the attack, at the absolute disposal of General Haig. Haig repeatedly urged that they should at least be brought up close behind him. French's assurances were so vague as to be simultaneously unsatisfying and misleading. As usual his outlook seems to have been governed by contradictory impulses of undue optimism and pessimism. French's general reserves comprised the cavalry corps, which, under modern conditions, did not count except in the minds of cavalry trained commanders, and the eleven corps. The last included the guards division, newly formed, and the 21st and 24th divisions, newly arrived in France. With curious judgment French left seasoned divisions lying idle on the quiet Somme front, and chose to use these two raw divisions for the critical phase of the battle. Moreover, he had given Haig to understand that they would be immediately at hand for Haig's use, whereas he placed them sixteen miles in rear. And in his subsequent dispatch he untruthfully stated that they were put at Haig's disposal at 9.30 am on the 25th. Actually, Haig did not hear until 1.20 p.m., and then indirectly. Haig bitterly remarked, soon after dash if there had been even one division in reserve close up we could have walked right through. General Headquarters refuses to recognize the teaching of the war as regards the control of reserves. His confidence was probably exaggerated, at least as to the effect of such a narrow breach and he was himself to err somewhat similarly in the following July. But his natural disgust, accentuated by French's untruthful dispatch, led first to an acrimonious interchange of letters and then to an irreconcilable quarrel. He seems, also, to have been galled, and not for the first time, at the way his own sound advice had been overruled by Fox influence with French. French in retort charged Haig with the folly of trying to push reserves through a far too narrow gap. The sequel was that Haig wrote personally to Kitchener and spoke to Haldane about French's failure and incompetence, and thereby helped to precipitate French's downfall and his own succession. As for the long and slow march up of those divisions, bad traffic arrangements were more responsible than their own inexperience for accentuating the evil caused by the commander-in-chief's dispositions. As General Edmonds caustically says dash it was like trying to push the Lord Mayor's procession through the streets of London, without clearing the route and holding up the traffic. Folly was capped by farce when, on the outskirts of Bethune. A military policeman stopped the 72nd Brigade because the brigade commander had no pass to enter the area. Never, surely, were novice divisions thrown into a vital stroke in a more difficult or absurd manner, and in an atmosphere of greater misconception of the situation in all quarters. This amply explains their subsequent failure when their belated attack was at last launched at 11 a.m. on the 26th and redresses the hasty judgments which were spread at the time, a stigma that was slow to fade. That in courage they were not lacking is clear, and equally that its fruits were reduced by their rawness, by that of their staff still more. The handicap of inexperience in these and the other new army divisions engaged can be overemphasized. It does not appear that, as a whole, apart from certain battalions in them, the regular divisions were more effective or even as effective in the battle. Battlecraft is a rare quality, the product of gifted and original leadership, and in its absence mere dash is often more effective than so-called experience. The ineffectiveness of the larger French attack south of the Lens also affected the British opportunity. For the French did not advance until six and a quarter hours after their allies and even then made little progress where they did not make merely a demonstration. The bitter experiences of the spring and summer seem to have led the fighting commanders to discount Fox faith in a breakthrough, and to annul his vehement order by gentle evasion in places. 
Joffre also put a brake on him from above, for on the second morning he telephoned him to go cautiously, and followed this by the warning dash stop the attacks of the 10th army, taking care to avoid giving the British the impression that we are leaving them to attack alone. His reason was apparently that he now pinned his hopes to the attack in Champagne, which on the first day gave a delusive promise of a real breakthrough. It is worthwhile to note that the partial opening success of the attack in Champagne, and also in Artois, was largely due to the obstinate self delusion of Falkenhayn, who had disregarded ample warnings from many sources, and requests for reserves. Only two hours before the attack began he assured the Kaiser that the local army commanders see things too black, and that the French were not in a condition to attack. Early reports on the 25th had also led Haig to overestimate his initial success, and as early as 10.30 am he ordered the 3rd Cavalry Division forward. The commander soon discovered Haig's mistake, but Haag, believing that the cavalry had gone on, hurried the 21st and 24th divisions forward as soon as he could get hold of them. But before they came up the known situation had changed, and the two leading brigades were taken to strengthen the line gained by the original attack. Haig still hoped to break the intact German second line of defences, and to this end the rest, four brigades, of these divisions continued their march across country, and unknown country, in the dark and rain. Tired, hungry, and as confused as their commanders, they were launched to the attack next morning without effective artillery support, and against defences now stronger and more strongly manned than the original first line. For the Germans had not only been reinforced, but had covered themselves with a thick wire entanglement during the night. The attack broke down at all before this uncut obstacle, and the survivors turned and flowed backwards. Their disappearance left a hole in the ragged British front between Luz and Holuch, which the Guards Division came up to fill. Meantime German counterattacks were multiplying dangerously, especially on the flanks. At last, on the 28th, Fock came to the relief not only by taking over the British flank sector near Luz, but with a local success on Vimy Ridge, which drew off most of the newly arrived German Guard Corps to check it and in concert with Sir John French he arranged to make a renewed general offensive on October 2. The same course was adopted in Champagne, where the French for three days had vainly hurled themselves at the German second position, suffering fearful loss, which would have been worse if a Pétain, second army, had not stopped his attack in disregard of higher orders. But as the pause was to be followed by a renewal at the same point, it merely gave the Germans time to strengthen it and accumulate resources in the rear. Local upsets due to German counter-attacks, and the exhaustion of the troops, caused further delay, and the renewed offensive was repeatedly postponed. Eventually all three attacks were delivered on different dates. The British last on October 13. And, in the words of the official history, it had not improved the general situation in any way and had brought nothing but useless slaughter of infantry. Curiously, Haig's sense of realism waned in this last phase, or, perhaps more truly, it was subdued by his bulldog tenacity, for although Joffre had abandoned the effort, Haig was working up a new general attack for November 7, an operation whose inevitable cost does not seem to have had any adequate excuse. Happily, Generals Winter and Weather intervened. But the British casualties already amounted to 50,380, or 60,392 if the subsidiary attacks by Haig's army be included, whereas the German loss was barely 20,000, despite their costly counter attacks. The French in Champagne and Artois had lost 191,797 officers and men and inflicted 120,000 casualties, a proportion which suggests that the actual handling of these attacks was better than that of the British, if helped by more powerful artillery. Both allies had gained in experience, if not in wisdom, but they had afforded the Germans still better experience in the way to frustrate such attacks. And in 1916 it was the Germans who profited heavily both by the offensive and the defensive lesson. 6 1916, the dogfall in 1914, the center of gravity of the World War had been on the Western Front, 
In 1915 it shifted to the Eastern Front, in 1916 it once more moved back to France. Although the Entente had dissipated some of their strength in Salonika and Mesopotamia, the rising tide of England's new armies and of ammunition supplies promised the power for an effort far larger in scale than before to break the trench deadlock. Measures had also been taken to keep these new divisions up to strength. By the end of 1915 the British force in France had risen to 38 divisions through the entry into the field of Kitchener's army, as well as of the territorial divisions. Although, the principle of voluntary enlistment had not yet been abandoned, the method was systematized and based on a national register. This scheme, launched in October, 1915, under the aegis of Lord Derby, aimed to reconcile the demands of the army with the needs of industry, calling up men by groups as they were wanted, and taking single men first. But the response among the latter was not adequate to preserve this graduated principle, and in January, 1916, by the Military Service Act, the voluntary system, system is hardly the correct term, was replaced by conscription. At the close of 1915, the first serious effort to obtain unity of action between the Allies was made, and a conference of the leaders of the French, British, Belgian, and Italian armies, with representatives present from the Russian and Japanese, was held at Joffre's headquarters on December 5. As a result they adopted the principle of a simultaneous general offensive in 1916 by France, Britain, Russia and Italy. In view of the rawness of the British troops, it was recognized that time must be allowed for training, and Russia also needed time for re-equipment, so that the offensive could not begin before the summer of 1916, although it was hoped to carry out preliminary attacks to wear down the enemy's strength. But in January both Joffre and Fock gave Haig a clear intimation that it was for him to carry out this preparatory task, and that they did not intend to take the offensive until he had done so. German action was to dislocate this scheme, and only the British share came fully into operation, and not even that into full effect. By a grim jest, however, it forced the French to carry out the wearing down process, in an indirect form. For Falkenhayn was about to fulfill his long cherished plan for a Western offensive, but with characteristic limitations. Always a believer in the strategy of attrition, he now carried this ruling idea into tactics, and produced the new form of attack by methodical stages, each with a limited objective. In an appreciation made at Christmas, 1915, he argued that England was the staple of the enemy alliance. The history of the English wars against the Netherlands, Spain, France and Napoleon is being repeated. Germany can expect no mercy from this enemy, so long as he still retains the slightest hope of achieving his object. Save by submarine warfare, however, England and her army were out of reach, for their sector of the front did not lend itself to offensive operations. In view of our feelings for our arch enemy in the war that is certainly distressing, but it can be endured if we realize that for England the campaign on the continent is at bottom a sideshow. Her real weapons here are the French, Russian and Italian armies. He regarded Russia as already paralyzed, and Italy's military achievements as unlikely to affect the situation. Only France remains. France has almost arrived at the end of her military effort. If her people can be made to understand clearly that in a military sense they have nothing more to hope for, breaking point would be reached, and England's best sword knocked out of her hand. He added that a breakthrough in mass was unnecessary, and that instead the Germans should aim to bleed France to death by choosing a point of attack for the retention of which the French command would be compelled to throw in every man they have. Such an objective was either Belfort or Verdun, and Verdun was chosen because it was a menace to the main German communications, because it offered a salient and so cramped the defender, and because of the moral effect if so renowned a place were lost to France. It has also been suggested that the choice was influenced by a peculiarly German moral, or unmoral, consideration. For Verdun was the ancient gate of the west through which the German hordes had passed to attack the Gauls. Similarly the Germans were fond of christening their trench positions after the heroes of the Nibelungen, Siegfried, 
Brunhilde and so on. The vein of superstition is still more clearly suggested in the Kaiser's choice of a second Moltke to guide his armies, and in the original location of their headquarters in the same hotel and same town, Koblenz, as they had occupied in 1870. The keynote of the tactical plan at Verden was a continuous series of limited advances, which by their menace should draw the French reserves into the mincing machine of the German artillery and each of these advances was itself to be secured from a loss by a short but intense artillery bombardment. By this means the objective would be taken and consolidated before the enemy could move up his reserves for counterattack. Although the intelligence branch at French General Headquarters gave early warning of the German preparations, the operations branch was so full of their own offensive schemes that the warning fell on deaf ears. Further, the easy fall of the Belgian and Russian fortresses had led to a commonly held view that fortresses were obsolete, and Joffre, persuading the French government to declass Verdun as a fortress, had denuded it of guns and troops. The forts were only used as shelters and the trench lines which took their place were inadequate and in poor repair. At 7.15 am on February 21, the German bombardment began, on a front of 15 miles, and at 4.45 pm the infantry advanced, although the first day only on a four and a half mile front. From then until February 24 the defenders line east of the Meuse was crumbled away as by the erosion of the tide. Joffre was now roused so far as to entrust the defence to Pétain, for whose use reserves were assembled. On March 6 the Germans extended the attack to the west bank of the Meuse but the defence was now stiffening, the numbers balanced, and the immediate threat to Verdun was checked. A slight lull followed, and during it the Allies of France made efforts to relieve the pressure on her. The British took over the Arras front from the French 10th Army, their front becoming now continuous from the Isar to the Somme, the Italians made their fifth attack, though in vain, on the Isenzo front, and the Russians hurled untrained masses on the German front at Lake Narochs, near Vilna, where the slight gains were soon lost through a counter-stroke. These efforts did not prevent Falkenhayn pursuing his attrition offensive at Verdun. The advances were slight but they were cumulative in effect, and the balance of loss turned definitely against the defenders. On June 7 Fort Vaux fell, and the German tide crept ever closer to Verdun. And in the Azago region, Conrad had launched his offensive against Italy's Trentino flank. Again, Russia came to the rescue. In the spring of 1916, she had 130 divisions, but still woefully short of equipment, facing 46 German and 40 Austrian divisions. The preparation and reorganization for her intended share in the year's Allied offensive were cut short by the emergency at Verdun and in relief of her French allies she had launched the costly and obstinately prolonged attack at Lake Narochs in March. When at last it was broken off, the preparations for the main offensive were resumed. This was to begin in July, coincidentally with the Somme offensive, meantime Brusloff, commanding the southwestern front, prepared such attacks as he could stage from his own resources as a distraction of the enemy's attention from the main offensive. But the distraction was released prematurely, on June 4, in response to Italy's appeal to Russia to prevent the Austrians reinforcing their Trentino attack. Without warning, because without any special concentration of troops, Brusloff's troops advanced against the Austrian 4th Army near Luck, and the Austrian 7th Army in the Bukovina, whose resistance collapsed at the first shock. This last vital effort of the Russian army in the war had important consequences. It stopped the Austrian attack on Italy, already impaired by an Italian riposte. It compelled Falkenhayn to withdraw troops from the Western Front, and so abandon his plan for a counterstroke against the British offensive preparing on the Somme, as well as the hope of nourishing his Verdun attrition process. It led Romania to take her fateful decision to enter the war on the Entente side, and caused the supersession of Falkenhayn in the Supreme Command and his replacement by Hindenburg with Ludendorff, officially styled first quartermaster general, as the directing brain. Although Romania's entry was the immediate reason, 
The underlying one was the fact that Fall Haynes' indefinite strategy in 1915 had made possible the Russian recovery which stultified his strategy of 1916. Fall Haynes was history's latest example of the folly of half measures. The ablest and most scientific general Dash Pennywise, pound foolish Dash whoever ruined his country by a refusal to take calculated risks. In 1916 he had turned back westwards to pursue his long-cherished goal, and his strategy had faithfully fulfilled the canons of military orthodoxy by taking for its objective the enemy's strongest army and the strongest point of that army's position. It certainly achieved the object of compelling the French to pour their reserves into the Verdun bloodbath but did not achieve any decisive strategic result. Falkenhayn had rejected Conrad's proposal for a concentration against Italy such as had previously overthrown Serbia. Conrad's reasons had been that such a blow against the hereditary enemy would act as a tonic to the Austro-Hungarian forces, and that the theatre of war lent itself to decisive results by a thrust southwards from the Trentino against the rear of the Italian armies engaged on the Isonzo. The success attained by the relatively light blow of 1917, Caporetto, lends historical support to his contention. But Falkenhayn was dubious both of the feasibility and value of the plan, and was unwilling even to lend the nine German divisions which Conrad asked for to relieve Austrian divisions in Galicia. In default of this aid Conrad persisted in attempting his design single-handed, taking some of his best divisions from Galicia and thereby exposing their front to Brusloff's advance without obtaining adequate force to achieve his Italian plan. Falkenhayn's smouldering resentment at this disregard of his views was fanned into flame by the Galician disaster, and he intervened in Vienna to procure a deposition of Conrad. With retributive irony his own fall followed close on that of Conrad. Brusloff's offensive continued for three months with fair success but reserves were not at hand for immediate exploitation, and before they could be moved down from the north the Germans were patching up the holes. His later efforts were never so dangerous, but they absorbed all the available Russian reserves, and the huge losses then incurred went far to complete the ruin of Russia's military power. Great as was the influence of Brusloff's offensive on German strategy, its effect on the Verdun situation was less immediate. But the long planned offensive on the Somme came to the rescue, and for want of nourishment, the Verdun offensive faded away. Nevertheless, although the Germans at Verdun had fallen short of their object, moral and material, they had so drained the French army that it could play but a slender part in the Allied plan for 1916. The British had now to take up the main burden of the struggle, and the consequence was to limit both the scope and effect of the Entente strategy. On July 1, after a week's prolonged bombardment, the British Fourth Army, recently created and placed under Orlinson, attacked with 13 divisions on a front of 15 miles, north of the Somme, and the French with five divisions on a front of eight miles, mainly south of the river where the German defence system was less highly developed. The unconcealed preparations and the long bombardment had given away any chance of surprise, and in face of the German resistance, weak in numbers but strong in organisation, the attack failed along most of the British front. Owing to the dense and rigid wave formations that were adopted the losses were appallingly heavy. Only on the south of the British front, near Fricourt and Montauban, did the attack gain the real footing in the German defences? The French, with slighter opposition, and being less expected, made larger gains. This setback negatived the original idea of a breakthrough to Bayporm and Cambrai, and Haig for a time fell back on the attrition method, of limited advances aimed to wear down the German strength. Rejecting Joff's desire that he should again throw his troops frontally on the Thpval defences, Haig at first resumed the attack with his right wing alone, and on July 14 the penetration of the Germans' second position offered a chance of exploitation, which was not taken. From now onward a methodical but costly advance continued, and although little ground was gained the German resistance was seriously strained when the early onset of winter rains suspended operations in November. The effect, however, can be exaggerated, 
for it did not prevent the Germans withdrawing troops from the west for the attack on Romania. But in one respect the Somme shed a significant light on the future, for on September 15 the first tanks appeared. Their early employment before large numbers were ready was a mistake, losing the chance of a great strategic surprise, and owing also to tactical mishandling, and minor technical defects. They had only a limited success. Although the higher military authorities lost faith in them, and some urged their abandonment, more discerning eyes realized that here was a key which, when properly used, might unlock the trench barrier. The Somme offensive had a further indirect effect, for its relief to the Verdun pressure enabled the French to prepare counter strokes, carried out by Mangin's Corps on October 24 and December 15, which regained most of the lost ground with small casualties. These economical successes were due to a partial revival of surprise, to a more elastic use of the limited objective method, and to a high concentration of artillery, with a minimum of infantry to occupy the defences crushed by the guns. But the French success was greatly helped by Hindenburg's misguided insistence, for the sake of prestige, on maintaining the earlier gains instead of withdrawing the tired troops to a more secure line somewhat in rear. He at least profited by the lesson, to the Allies' detriment, in the spring of 1917. Romania, sympathetic to the Entente cause, had been waiting a favorable opportunity to enter the war on their side, and Brusloff's success encouraged her to take the plunge. Her command hoped that this, combined with the Allied pressure on the Somme and at Salonika, would fix the German reserves. But Romania's situation had many inherent defects. The strategical position of her territory was bad, the main section, Wallachia, being sandwiched between Austria Hungary and Bulgaria. Her army, though externally of a modern pattern, had grave weaknesses beneath the surface. Of her allies, only Russia could give her direct aid, and they failed her. And, with all these handicaps, she launched an offensive into Transylvania, which bared her flank to Bulgaria. While the Entente fumbled, the Germans acted. The plan was initiated by Falkenhayn and developed by Hindenburg Ludendorff when they took over the Supreme Command on August 28. While one force concentrated in Transylvania for a counter stroke, a Bulgarian army with German stiffening, under Mackenzie, was to strike through Romania's back door and invade the Dobruja. This automatically halted the Romanian offensive in Transylvania, and drew away its reserves. At the end of September, the Romanians were thrown back by the Austro German counteroffensive, of which Falkenhayn was given executive command. They succeeded in holding the passes of Romania's mountain border in the west until mid November, but Falkenhayn just broke through before the snows blocked the passes. Mackenzie switched his main forces westwards and crossed the Danube close to Bucharest, on which both armies now converged. It fell on December 6, and, despite belated Russian aid, the Romanian forces were driven north into Moldavia. The brilliantly coordinated German strategy had crippled their new foe, gained possession of the bulk of Romania, with its oil and wheat, and gave the Russians another 300 miles of front to hold. Sarail, at Salonika had not succeeded in fixing the Bulgarian reserves. The Austrian offensive in the Trentino had interrupted Cadena's plans for a renewed effort on the Isenzo, but when the former was halted Cadena switched his reserves back to the Isenzo. In preparation for this offensive the whole sector from Monte Sabotino to the sea was entrusted to the Duke of Worcester's Third Army, under which 16 divisions were concentrated against six Austrian divisions. Following a preliminary feint near the sea on August 4, the attack opened well two days later. North of Gorizia Capello's corps swept over the long impregnable Monte Sabotino, which guarded the approach to the river, and, crossing the river on the night of August 8, occupied the town. This compelled an Austrian retreat in the Carso sector to the south, but attempts to exploit the success eastward failed against fresh positions of resistance. Three more efforts were made in the autumn, and if they imposed a wearing strain on the Austrians, they caused greater loss to the attackers. During the year Italians had suffered some 483,000 casualties, 
and inflicted 260,000. The only territorial success that the Entente could show for their year's campaign, and, even so, it did not reveal itself fully until the new year, was away in Mesopotamia, the capture of Baghdad. This moral token was seized on with an enthusiasm which, militarily, it hardly warranted. The bitter experience of the past had damped the ardor of the British government, and Sir William Robertson, the new chief of the Imperial General Staff, was opposed to any further commitments which drained the strength available for the Western Front. But Maud, the new commander on the spot, by subtle if unconscious steps succeeded in changing this defensive policy into one of a fresh offensive. After thorough reorganization of the Mesopotamian force and its communications, he began on December 12, 1916, a progressive right wheel and extension of his front on the west bank of the Tigris above and below Kut. These methodical trench warfare operations had placed him ready for a spring across the Tigris at the Turks' line of retreat, which was thus parallel to his front. But despite his 4 to 1 superiority of force, the failure of his right to pin down the enemy, and of his cavalry to cut off their retreat, prevented a decisive success. But it led to permission for an advance on Baghdad, and he entered the Mesopotamian capital on March 11, 1917. A series of skillfully conducted operations then drove the Turks into divergent lines of retreat and secured the British hold on the province. Ever since the abortive Turkish attempt to invade Egypt early in 1915, the British had kept a fairly large force there even when the Dardanelles expedition was crying out for troops. When Gallipoli was evacuated, the release of the Turkish forces threatened a fresh move on Egypt. To forestall this danger the authorities in Cairo had gained Kitchener's approval for a landing in Ayas Bay near Alexandretta, but the proposal had been opposed by the general staff at home and then nullified by the political objections of the French to any British intervention in Syria which they already counted as part of their share of the spoils of war. Thus throughout 1916 the large British garrison of Egypt, at one time over a quarter of a million strong, remained passive while the Turks, by using a few thousand men in Sinai and by stirring up the Senussi in the western desert, created trouble on both flanks which reacted on the unrest within the frontiers of Egypt. But the British, also, contrived to secure an Arab ally on the eastern side of the Red Sea. This was the Sheriff of Mecca, who had already rendered them valuable service by refusing to proclaim the jihad from the holy cities at the Turks behest, and had thus extinguished the prospect of rallying the Muslim peoples for a holy war against the British. Then, in June 1916, the Sheriff raised a revolt in the Hejaz against Turkish rule and thereby created a distraction to the Turks which the British had hitherto failed to provide with their own forces. Its first effect was on the British, who now decided to undertake an advance to El Arish, which would give them command of the Sinai Desert and restore their possession of the frontier. But although another Turkish incursion was punished at Romani in July, Sir Archibald Murray's advance was slow to develop, being governed by the time taken in laying a railway and pipeline, for water, across the desert. It was not until Christmas died that the British occupied El Arish, and pounced on the outlying Turkish posts at Magdabu and Rafa. This new exodus inspired the British government to carry out an invasion of Palestine, at as cheap a cost in troops as possible. The towns of Gaza, on the coast, and Beersheba, 25 miles inland, guarded the approach to Palestine. Murray attacked Gaza on March 26. 1917, but the attempt fell short when on the brink of success. By nightfall Gaza was practically surrounded, but the victorious position was given up bit by bit, not under enemy pressure, but on the orders of the executive British commanders, through faulty information, misunderstandings, and over-anxiety. Nor did the harm end there, for Murray reported the action to the government in terms of a victory and without hint of the subsequent withdrawal, so that he was encouraged to attempt, without adequate reconnaissance or fire support, a further attack on April 17th to 19th, which proved a costlier failure against defences now strengthened. Britain's new Arab allies, however, 
provided a valuable distraction which counteracted these Turkish successes, with no drain on the British forces beyond a handful of technical advisers. After its opening success the revolt had been in danger of collapse, but the situation was saved and the scales changed by Faisal's sudden flank move up the Red Sea coast to Wedge, whence the Arabs harassed the Hejaz railway. This move was prompted by a young archaeologist turned temporary soldier, Captain T. E. Lawrence. Steeped in the history and theory of warfare, he had the elasticity of mind to adapt his knowledge to irregular conditions and the magnetic personality to combine the Arabs' loose shower of sparks into a firm flame which consumed the Turkish resources. In May 1917, he set off with a party of Arabs on a lone hand expedition which, after sowing fresh seeds of revolt in Syria, culminated in a descent upon Aqaba. The capture of this sea base on the northern arm of the Red Sea removed all danger to the British communications in Sinai and opened the way for the Arabs to become a lever on the flank of the Turkish forces opposing the British. Already more Turks were occupied in guarding the long line of the Hejaz railway and the territory south of it than were facing the British in Palestine. The war at sea, 1915-16. Germany's first submarine campaign. Associated by allied opinion with the name of Admiral von Tirpitz, the exponent of ruthlessness, had been a signal failure, both in its meager results and the disproportionate ethical damage it did to Germany's cause. A series of notes, exchanged between the American and German governments, culminated in April, 1916, in a virtual ultimatum from President Wilson, and Germany abandoned her unrestricted campaign. The deprivation of this weapon spurred the German Navy to its first, and last, attempt to carry out the initial plan on which it had begun the war. Late on May 30, 1916, the British Grand Fleet left its bases on one of its periodical sweeps through the North Sea, but with reason to expect a possible encounter. On May 31, early in the morning, the German High Seas Fleet also put to sea in the hope of destroying some isolated portion of the British fleet. For such an encounter the British Admiral, Jellicoe, had formulated an outline plan in the early months of the war. Its basis was the cardinal necessity of maintaining the unimpaired supremacy of the Grand Fleet, which he viewed as an instrument, not merely of battle, but of grand strategy, the pivot of the Allies' action in all spheres, economic, moral and military. Hence, while desirous of bringing the German fleet to battle under his own conditions, he was determined not to be lured into mine and submarine infested waters. Early in the afternoon of May 31, Beatty, with his battle cruisers and a squadron of battleships, after a sweep to the south was turning north to rejoin Jellicoe, when he sighted the German battle cruisers, five in number. In the initial engagement, two of Beatty's six battle cruisers were hit in vital parts and sunk. When thus weakened he came upon the main German fleet under admirals here. He turned north to lead them into reach of Jellicoe, fifty miles distant, who raced to support him. Mist and failing light put an end to an indecisive action, which, however, left the British fleet between the German and its bases. During the nights here broke through the destroyer guard, and although sighted was not reported, Thus he slipped safely through a net which Jellicoe dared not draw too close in view of his guiding principle, and of the danger of torpedo attack. If the Battle of Jutland could be counted a tactical advantage to the Germans, it had no effect on their strategic position. The grip of Britain's blockade was unrelaxed. Once more Germany fell back on submarine warfare, and the first development was an extension of range. In July one of her large submarine cruisers appeared off the American coast and sank several neutral ships. In the narrow seas the Mediterranean was the scene of active operations, but the immediate pressure on Britain was relaxed during the summer. Foss here, in a fit of pique at the German government's surrender to President Wilson's threat, refused to let his submarines operate under the code of visit and search. Hence the burden of the restricted campaign fell on the Flanders flotillas, and, fortunately for Britain, the German naval chiefs had been obtusely slow to realize and exploit the advantages of the Belgian coast as a base. 
the six months lost originally through neglect to organize a base were never fully redeemed, and the scale of the forces here was never in proportion to the possibilities of menacing Britain from this close range post. On October 6, Sahir was overruled by an order to reinforce the effort with his flotillas. This veiled renewal of the general submarine campaign was inspired mainly by Admiral von Holtzendorf, the chief of the naval staff, and Captain von Bartenbuck, the chief of the Flanders flotillas. The indirect result was to deprive Sahir automatically of the submarines which he required to safeguard his own sorties and lay traps for the British fleet. Thus the paralysis of the German fleet henceforth was the result of the Germans' own alternative plan, and not of Jutland. And it did not even leave the British Grand Fleet in possession of the North Sea. For the moral effect of a submarine ambush which marked the German sortie of August 19 was so great, even though it miscarried that henceforth the Grand Fleet was almost as confined as an old-time debtor in the fleet prison, and was definitely debarred from the southern half of the North Sea. Jellicoe and the Admiralty were agreed upon the necessity for this self-imprisonment. The command of the sea became almost a burlesque when the danger of a German invasion of Denmark loomed up that autumn and, after examination by the Admiralty and War Office, the verdict was that dash for naval reasons it would be almost impossible to support the Danes at all. The shadow of the submarine was longer than the shadow of Nelson's column. With illuminating candor the British official naval history says dash the Grand Fleet could only put to sea with an escort of nearly 100 destroyers, no capital ship could leave its base without an escort of small craft and the German U-boats had hampered our squadrons to an extent which the most expert and far-sighted naval officer had never foreseen. Yet, with curious inconsistency, the voices of naval officers have been heard ever since the war proclaiming the sovereignty of the battleship, the ineffectiveness of the submarine. The Grand Fleet in the autumn of 1916 was all the more heavily fettered because its warders were reduced owing to the call for light craft to combat the new veiled submarine campaign against commerce. Despite all countermeasures this was so successful that the monthly loss of shipping rose steadily from 109,000 tons during June, to 368,000 tons in January, 1917, approximately half being British. During the veiled campaign the Mediterranean was both an ill-favored and, by the Germans, too well favored area, for besides simplifying the submarine's task of finding targets, it simplified the problem of evading the undertakings given to America. In the Mediterranean, there was little risk of injuring American ships or interests by mischance. One new boat alone in five weeks' cruise sank 65,000 tons of shipping. Countermeasures proved utterly unable to stem the rising tide of sinking ships even when more destroyers and other small craft became available. During one week of September, 1916, 30 ships were sunk by two, or at the most, three submarines in an area patrolled by 97 destroyers and 68 auxiliary craft. Among the remedies tried were those of secret routes, of hoisting false colors, and of decoy ships. This last ruse was carried out by what were known as Q-ships equipped with torpedo tubes, depth charges, and guns concealed behind collapsible bulwarks, while disguised as merchant ships. The disguise was enhanced by the acting of the crews who coolly simulated panic under conditions where most men would not have needed to do so, and thereby lured the molesting submarine to the surface within close range. Although these Q-ships provided the most romantic phase of the naval war, and sank eleven U-boats, their effect was almost exhausted by the end of 1916, save that it made the enemy more wary, and naturally less inclined to merciful discrimination between armed and apparently unarmed ships. This Q-ship risk to the U-boat was accentuated by the British arming of ordinary merchant ships, which placed the slow, fragile and half-blind U-boat in a perilous dilemma. The more merciful the U-boat the greater danger it ran, the less heed it paid to the nature of its target and the rescue of those on board the more its safety and success were assured. Hence the outcry in Germany for a policy of sinking at sight was naturally strengthened. Moreover, if Britain was feeling the strain of economic pressure, 
so also was Germany, and her leaders feared that the race between decisive success on land and economic collapse would end against her. The naval authorities declared that a renewal of the unlimited submarine campaign, which with her increased numbers could now be far more intense, would bring the Entente to their knees. Accepting this opinion, Ludendorff agreed to a step which he had hitherto opposed, the combined weight of naval and military opinion overbore the protests of the Imperial Chancellor. A proposal of peace discussions, and its foreseen rejection by the Entente powers, was made the moral justification for openly abandoning the restrictions of visit and search, and for withdrawing the promise given to President Wilson, on February 1, 1917, the unrestricted policy, of sinking all ships, passenger or cargo, without warning, was proclaimed, with the full realization that it involved their weight of America being thrown into the scales against Germany. Doubts of its wisdom in Germany were stifled by the plea of necessity, the promise of certain victory, and the argument of inevitability, that America was bound to come to the help of the Allies in order to ensure their ability to pay their debts to her. But the Germans reckoned on victory before America's weight could count in the scales. Six scene one the mincing machine, Verdun it is a truism that the war of 1914 to 18 revolutionized all ideas of time in a military sense, and especially in the duration of its battles. For several thousand years of warfare a battle, however great the scale, had been a matter of hours. This remained the general case down to the beginning of this century, though a few battles from the Napoleonic Wars onwards increased the span to days, for example, Leipzig, Gettysburg. The real change was inaugurated with the Russo-Japanese campaign, when battles at last had to be reckoned in weeks. With the World War the standard became months, because the battles had usually become sieges, without being recognized or scientifically treated as such. The change, it is to be hoped, is at transitory one, for quantity does not imply quality, and duration does imply immobility and indecisiveness, which are perforce the negation of generalship so that whether from the standpoint of military science or from that of the drain of human life, long battles are bad battles. The prolongation, too, has complicated the task of the military historian, for unless he desires to fill massive tomes with profuse detail, it is difficult to pick out salient features where there are either none, or else so many that they tend to merge into a formless mass. And of all the so-called battles of the war, Verdun holds the duration record, extending from February 21 to December 15, 1916. Even if the suspension of the German offensive be taken as the last date, and the French counteroffensive considered as distinct, the duration is seven months. This difficulty of singling out any one date is unfortunate, for no battle of the whole war was more heroic or more dramatic in its course or made so vivid an appeal to the sympathies of the watching nations. It was France's supreme sacrifice and her supreme triumph, and to the splendor of her achievement all the world paid homage. From February 25th onwards, there was a series of crises until June 23rd, and many French authorities select the former date as the chief. Yet who should know better than the Germans the moment when the tide really turned against them? So distinguished a critic as General von Zwell considered that the real turning point was on March 9, when the Germans failed to capture the Côte de Poivre. It was on March 4 that the Crown Prince called on his army group for a supreme effort to take Verdun, the heart of France. On March 6, after a two days bombardment, the new blow fell, and by the 9th was definitely frustrated. The determination of such a datum point is affected also by the question as to the object of the German supreme command in launching the attack on Verdun. General von Falkenhayn, the chief of the great general staff and the responsible officer, has stated categorically that it was to bleed France white by choosing a point of attack for which, sooner than let go, the French command would have to fight to the last man. He has also quoted from a paper prepared at Christmas, 1915, to show that he argued that a breakthrough in mass was not necessary for this purpose. Yet, despite his post war statements, there is still a just doubt as to the initial object. A prominent German critic, 
Colonel Fuster, pointed out how difficult it was to reconcile Falkenhayn's statement with the manner in which the attack was carried out, and declared that the initial operation was obviously an accelerated attack for the purpose of breaking through. He based himself on extracts from Falkenhayn's own order of January 27, 1916, and the latter's vehement marginal criticisms on the explanation of failure rendered by the Crown Prince's headquarters on March 31. These show Falkenhayn calling for an unchecked and continuous advance. Others, including Pétain, believe the real idea underlying the plan was that of a revival of the Sudan double envelopment which had been attempted in September 1914. In 1916 such a plan had more favorable chances, for the salient was more acute than at the time of the Marne battle, owing to the St. Mihail wedge that had been driven into its eastern flank. And the fact that the salient lay astride a river, the Meuse, would hamper the defenders in holding back their German pincers. Moreover, this hypothesis provides a logical explanation for what outwardly seems the unaccountable German mistake in launching their first attack only on the east bank of the river. But if a Sedan was the Germans' object, they might expect that their attack on the east bank would draw the French reserves thither so that the later attack on the west bank, when released, would be able to sweep across the rear of the French, using the river as their prison wall. Thereby, not only would part of the French army be cut off, but the rest be cut in two, while the vast breach would ensure the collapse of the whole trench front in France. Fresh light on this enigmatic battle has, however, come from the German archives and from important witnesses, the evidence collated in a book by Hermann Wendt is particularly illuminating. From this new material it would appear that the explanation of Falkenhayn's purpose lies in his opportunism, and the explanation of the curious course of the German operations, in one more of the internal conflicts that wrecked so many plans. Falkenhayn, whose course was apparently none too clear in his own mind, seems to have rested on the hope that something might happen, that something might be a moral collapse behind the French front, produced by the combination of natural depression and subsidized propaganda. But if he was wiser than other strategists in realizing the importance of political effects, he does not seem to have had clear ideas as to how to produce them. And, unfortunately for him, his executive subordinates had a purely military outlook. The scheme drawn up by the Crown Prince's Chief of Staff, Schmidt von Nobelsdorf, diverged widely from Falkenhayn's line of thought. It proposed an attempt to pinch off Verdun, by a vigorous attack on both flanks, so as to avoid a long drawn out battle of material, with its incalculable expenditure of force. This big gamble did not suit Falkenhayn's book, so he reduced the plan to an attack on the East Bank only, apparently hoping to control the executive commander's impetuosity by keeping a tight hand on the reserves. In this purpose, as in his greater one, he was to fail. It is not easy to determine whether that failure was due more to his own misjudgment in adjusting the means to the end, or to his inability to adjust his subordinates' views to his own. Princely subordinates were difficult to control, and Falkenhayn's position was too unstable for him safely to exert strong pressure. Also, whatever his failings, he at least has the credit of affirming a new principle in tactics. The German offensive was to be based on firepower rather than on manpower, and its main agent was to be an intense artillery bombardment, making up for its relatively short duration by the number of batteries and their rapidity of fire, and so seeking to regain the supreme advantage of surprise which was inevitably lost by an artillery preparation of several days, or even a week as the Allied method had been at Luz, in Champagne, and was still to be on the Somme. To increase their chance of surprise the Germans constructed none of the customary jumping off trenches close to the enemy lines, confident that their tremendous artillery bombardment would enable their infantry to cross the wide no man's land, in places half a mile across, without meeting effective resistance. With their rear preparations they were less successful. But although the intelligence branch at French General Headquarters was thus able to deduce the German intentions, the operations branch disregarded the warning. On February 1 a driblet of two territorial divisions was sent, 
but only at the last moment were adequate reinforcements, to Army Corps, ordered there. Even when the first of these arrived there were only three divisions on the right bank of the Meuse. Two on the left, and three south of the fortress facing east, with no reserves at hand. It is not difficult to guess what would have happened if the German attack had come on the 13th, as intended, before this first corps arrived. Bad weather saved the defenders in a double sense, for it also hampered the moving forward of the Germans' heavy guns. There is, however, another important aspect of this preliminary phase which is comparatively little known. A hasty generalization from the easy fall of the Belgian and Russian fortresses may have caused much of the subsequent critical position at Verdun. Originally the French fortresses were not under the control of the field army, but Joff used the examples of Legion Namur as an excuse to persuade the French government to declass Verdun as a fortress, and, having got control in August, 1915, from then on he drained it of its men and armament. This removal of guns continued even until January 30, 1916, and the casemates were simply used as shelters for troops. Instead of an all-round defense a single trench position was taken up beyond the forts, and in rear only one subsidiary trench line was usable. For this continuous front, the commander, General Hare, had not enough men, or material, to garrison it or keep it in an efficient state of defense. Its wire was incomplete, and it had scarcely any shellproof cover. Little wonder that when the blow fell the trench position was blotted out. In contrast was the extraordinary imperviousness of the forts. Forts Dwimont and Vaux fell into German hands, and when they were recaptured in October the French found that months of tremendous bombardment had made scarcely an impression. The underground cover remained intact, not one field gun turret was destroyed and hardly any of the casemates rendered unoccupable. It was a grim jest of fate that the French should have thrown away their shield for a target, through a hasty assumption that fortresses were valueless. The original governor, General Kms, had not shared this view, but when, before a parliamentary delegation, he dared to express his opinion, in contradiction to the army group commander, General Dubail, he was not only rebuked but dismissed. For some time, rumors had percolated through to Paris about the inadequate state of the Verdun defenses, and in December Gallini, as Minister of War, had written to Joffre asking for information and an assurance that they should be developed. Joffre's reply might well be framed and hung up in all the bureaus of officialdom the world over, to serve as the mummy at the feast. Rebutting the suggestions, he added dash but since these apprehensions are founded on report, which allege defects in the state of the defenses, I request you to specify their authors. I cannot be a party to soldiers under my command bringing before the government, by channels other than the hierarchic channel, complaints or protests concerning the execution of my orders. It is calculated to disturb profoundly the spirit of discipline in the army. The enemy was soon to dispel his doctrine of infallibility, as the mutinies of 1917 were to show that the incapacity of generals and their waste of human life are the most potent factors in disturbing the spirit of discipline. But retribution is slow. Colonel Driant, deputy financier and a well-known military writer, who had given the warning, was one of the first victims of its neglect while Joffre for a time gained fresh popular laurels from the heroic sacrifice of Driant and his fellows. At a quarter past seven on the morning of February 21, a cold, dry day, the German bombardment began on both banks of the Meuse and on a front of 15 miles. Steadily the trenches and wire were flattened out or upheaved in a chaos of tumbled earth. The craters made by the huge shells gave to all the countryside an appearance like the surface of the moon. Familiar as it was to be later, in February, 1916, so violent a bombardment was new, and therefore the more appalling. So it went on, until at 4 pm the fury of the shell storm reached its height. Another three quarters of an hour and a thin skirmish line of German infantry began to advance almost unnoticed followed by bombing parties and flamethrowers, 
to feel the French position before the rest of the infantry was launched. This method economized life, and it also disclosed the unequal effect of the German bombardment, which in part suffered from the deadly counter battery fire of the French artillery. Moreover, the initial German attack was made by only six divisions and only along a four and a half mile front between Bois de Hormont and Herber Bois on the east bank. On so narrow a front the few scattered packets of surviving Frenchmen caused more delay than should have been the case on a reasonable frontage, and the early onset of darkness halted the attack after the foremost trenches had been occupied. But next day the attack developed more widely, and from then until the 24th the defenders line was progressively crumbled away. The French commanders on the spot asked permission to evacuate the Wauvre plain and draw back the line onto the Meuse heights on the right bank. Even this they felt must be only a preliminary to the evacuation of the whole right, or eastern, bank of the Meuse. But behind the front the full gravity of the situation was hardly realized. Operations still asserted that the Verdun offensive was a feint to cover the real blow, in Champagne. Even when the news of the crumbling front came through, Joff was not moved, much less disturbed. At last, on the evening of the 24th, General de Castelnau, who, since his appointment as chief of the French general staff, had been adroitly sidetracked by Joff's ever zealous, and jealous, entourage, took the initiative and, Going direct to Joffre, gained his permission to send Badane's army to take over the defense of Verdun. Still more alarming reports came in later, and at 11 p.m. de Castelnau, with unique daring, insisted that the orderly officer should rap on Joff's locked door and wake him up. Before the great man returned to resume his unvarying ration of sleep, he had given de Castelnau authority to go to Verdun with full powers. Leaving Chantilly during the night, De Castelnau moted post haste to the headquarters of the army group commander, de Langle de Gary. Joff meanwhile had telegraphed that the front north of Verdun must be held at all costs, every commander who gives an order for retreat will be tried by court-martial. He left it to de Langle de Gary to decide whether to swing back his right onto the Meuse Heights, and the latter acted on this permission. De Castelnau's first day at Verdun was not auspicious, for on the 25th occurred the strange incident of Fort Douaumont, and with it the first crisis of the long battle. Like most of the other forts it had no garrison, except for a crew of 23 gunners who manned one turret. When, however, the German tide approached the fort, General Grisham, commanding the right sector, dictated an order that the line of the forts was to be made the principal line of resistance. This was shortly before midnight on the 24th. Unfortunately his staff waited for the preparation of some sketches to attach to the order, and so delayed its issue until 9.45 am on the 25th. Meantime a patrol of Brandenburgers, finding the drawbridge down and no sign of any defenders, the gunners had fallen asleep dead beat, walked in and took possession without firing a shot. A triumphal German communique announced the capture of Dwimont by assault in the presence of the Kaiser. This piece of official bombast, however, was to be outclassed and outfast when, owing to a misunderstood telephone message, the communique of March 9 announced the capture of Fort Vaux, three months too early. But the cream of the jest was that both the divisional commander who made the report and the officer who had not taken the fort, received from the Kaiser the highest Prussian order, Paul Emerite. A bad telephone is not without compensations. On February 25, Badain took over command at Verdun, and the nucleus of a reserve army was assembling in rear. His first problem was not so much defense as supply. The German heavy guns had closed all avenues except one light railway and the Bala Duke to Verdun Road, which later became immortal as the Sacred Way. To push up troops was no use unless they could be fed and supplied with ammunition. The road was already cracking under the strain of the incessant transport, and so gangs of territorial troops were brought up to keep it in repair and to double it by parallel tracks. Henceforward the flow of traffic rose to as many as 6,000 lorries in the 24 hours. Up in front Badain was organizing the front into sectors, each with its own heavy artillery, and throwing in repeated counter-attacks. 
if these gained little ground, they disconcerted and checked the attacking Germans. Another assisting factor was that the farther they advanced on the east bank the more did they expose themselves to flanking fire from the French artillery across the river. The advance lost its momentum, slowed down, and already on the German side a grievous pessimism had set in, so as well tells us. Falkenhayn was now led to widen the front of attack, although he doled out only four divisions. On March 6, after two days' bombardment, the Crown Prince attacked on the west bank of the Meuse, and on the 8th the troops on the east bank joined in this supreme effort. The gains did not repay the losses, and against Mortham on the west and the Poivre height on the east the attack beat in vain. Any hope of a breakthrough faded, for the defence was now consolidated and the numbers had been balanced. Whatever we think of his foresight, there can be no question that Joff's imperturbable temperament was a great asset in calming the anxiety of those days, and in Pertain he made the right choice for the emergency. It is proverbial that fortune favours the brave, and two great pieces of luck befell the French, the fortunate destruction of all the German 17-inch howitzers by the French long-range guns, and the blowing up of the great German artillery park near Spincourt which held 450,000 heavy shell, unwisely kept fused. One authority, indeed, General Pallet, gives it as his opinion that these two factors saved Ver and Dot from March 9 onwards, there can be no question that the German policy was primarily attrition, and that so far as Ver and was aimed at it was as a moral objective. Publicity had given it a symbolical value definitely superior to its military value. It must be confessed that the strategy nearly succeeded, but only after a long interval, through the introduction of a new agent. In the meantime the Germans paid an exorbitant price for little gain. Nevertheless, they put a heavy tax on the French. Badain did his best to mitigate the strain by a rapid rotation of reliefs, which kept each division under fire for the shortest possible time. But, as a result, a great part of the French army was drawn through the mincing machine, and the drain on the French reserves almost bankrupted their share in the forthcoming Somme offensive. On the German side, the disappointing results produced an earlier reaction. At the end of March, Falkenhayn inquired whether there was any chance of progress within a reasonable time, and he contemplated an alternative attack at Ypres. But the Crown Prince confidently declared that the greater part of the French reserves had been used up, and that he was unreservedly of the opinion that the fate of the French army would be decided at Verdun. Moreover, the fatally old fashioned idea of the executive command was betrayed in the remark that the destruction of the French reserves should be completed by the employment of men, as well as of apparatus and munitions. Falkenhayn gave way to this plea. Dot so the Crown Prince, egged on by Schmidt von Nobelsdorf, continued to pour out his men's blood, while Falkenhayn spent the time in study of possible alternatives. But at the end of April the barren result of constant nibbling attacks led to a decision to revert to wider ones. These proved equally futile, so that even Schmidt von Nobelsdorf was led to admit the hopelessness of further attack. Yet when he visited Falkenhayn in this mood of repentance, he found the latter had also changed his mind, to the opposite view. So Schmidt von Nobelsdorf was reconverted, and the offensive continued. But the wastage of life was now balanced by Joff's misguided instructions that Fort Dwimond must be recovered, he also removed Badain's restraining hand by promoting him to command of the army group and placing Nivelle in direct charge at Verdun. By launching repeated attacks, Nivelle now played into Falkenhayn's hands, and lost on the rebound. On June 7, after a heroic resistance, Fort Vaux really fell, by another German telephone mistake the wrong officer again received the credit, and with it a large stretch of ground was submerged by the German tide, that now seemed to the anxious watchers to resemble the forces of nature rather than of men. On June 11, Badain was forced to ask Joffre to hasten the relief offensive on the Somme. Then on June 20, the Germans introduced a new kind of defosgene gas shell with startling effect. It paralyzed the French artillery support, and on the 23rd came a deep advance that brought the Germans almost to the Belleville height. 
The last outwork of Verdun. Mengen's incessant counter-attacks could do no more than put a break on the advance, and Pétain made all ready for the evacuation of the East Bank, though to his troops he showed no signs of anxiety and ever repeated the now immortal phrase, on Leora. Four divisions were hurriedly dispatched to him by Joffre, thus further weakening the Somme reserve. But the Germans had used their new lever too late. Strategically, the defenders were now made secure, indirectly, as Falkenhayn stopped the flow of ammunition to Verdun on the 24th, when the British bombardment began on the Somme, preparatory to the long arranged attack which was delivered on July 1st. From that day on, the Germans at Verdun received no fresh divisions and their advance died out from pure inanition. The way was thus paved for the brilliant French counter-offensives of the autumn, which retook by bites what had been lost by nibbles. It is no disparagement of the sterling defence to recognise, as we must, that the Somme saved Verdun, and, second, that the Germans after throwing away their best chance by too narrow an attack frontage, came desperately close to their goal four months later. 16 to the Bruisel off offensive in June 5, 1916, began an offensive on the Eastern Front which was to prove the last really effective military effort of Russia. Popularly known as Bruiselov's offensive, it had such an astonishing initial success as to revive enthusiastic dreams of the irresistible Russian steamroller, that was perhaps the greatest and most dangerous smith of the war. Instead, its ultimate achievement was to sound Russia's death knell. Paradoxical in its consequences, it was still more so in its course, an epitome of the delusive objectives, of the blunders leading to success, and the successes leading to downfall, which marked perhaps the most erratic war in history. In 1915 the Entente had pinned their hopes on Russia, only for the year's campaign to close with the Russian armies. Battered and exhausted, barely escaping complete disaster by a seemingly endless retreat. When Falkenhayn turned in 1916 to inaugurate the Verdun attack he left Russia lamed but not crippled, and her surprisingly rapid, if perhaps superficial recovery, enabled her to dislocate the German plans for 1916. As early as March she attacked at Lake Narochs, on the Baltic flank, in a gallant sacrificial attempt to relieve the pressure on France. Her command then prepared, for July, a main offensive, also in the north. But before this was ready the needs of her allies once more led her into a premature move. While the strain at Verdun was growing ever more serious, the Austrians took the opportunity to launch an attack in the Trentino, against the Italians, who appealed to their Russian ally to prevent the Austrians releasing further forces from the Eastern Front to reinforce the Trentino menace. Meantime the Tsar had held a council of war of his army group commanders on April 14. It was here arranged that the main Russian offensive should be made by Everts' center group of armies, while Kuropatkin's northern group wheeled inwards to assist it, and it was proposed that Bruzlov's southern group should stay strictly on the defensive as his front was unsuited to the offensive. But Bruzlov regarded this as a reason for taking the offensive, because helpful to surprise, and argued that past lack of success was due to the way the Russian armies had allowed the enemy to utilize his central position by not attacking simultaneously. As a result of the discussion Bruzlov was given permission to act as he wished, and, with such resources as he had, to stage an offensive that would draw the enemy's attention away from the main blow planned in the north, near Molochno. Realizing that his best chance of success lay in surprise, he began preparations at over twenty places, so that even deserters could not give away the real point of attack and, instead of concentrating his reserves, he divided them. The appeal of Russia's ally hastened his action. On May 24, Alexov telegraphed to ask how soon he could attack. Bruzlov replied that he would be ready to do so on June 1, provided that Evert also attacked. Evert, however, was not ready, it was finally agreed that Bruzlov should strike on the 4th, and Evert 10 days later. On the night of the third Alexa rang up Bruzlov and expressed doubts of the wisdom of a plan so unconventional, suggesting that he should concentrate his troops for an attack on a narrow front, instead of distributing them on a wide front. 
Bruce Lofty Murd and Alex F eventually gave way, saying, God be with you. Do as you like. The troops were moved up during the night for an apparent gamble, in which every factor save the possibility of surprise weighed against success. Bruce Loft's strength was no more than equal to that of the opposing force, 38 against 37 divisions, and it was widely distributed. But the absence of any concentration gave the Austrians no warning of the impending move, and when, on June 4, the Russian 8th Army, under K. Ledin, advanced near Luck for what was little more than a reconnaissance in force, they took the Austrians by surprise. The front broke like a crust of pastry at the first touch, and almost unresisted the Russians pushed between the Austrian 4th and 2nd armies. By the following day 40,000 prisoners had been taken, and the number swelled rapidly as Bruzlov widened his offensive. Although the Russian 11th Army, Sakharov, failed near Danipol, the other two armies farther south gained as rapid success as that at Luck. The 7th Army, Shkabigev, drove the Austrians back across the Streeper, and the 9th Army, Lechitsky, breaking through in the Bkovina, captured Chsinowitz, the southernmost position of the Austrian front. By the 20th, Bruzlov had captured 200,000 men. Never has a mere demonstration had so amazing a success since the walls of Jericho fell at Joshua's trumpet blasts. With both flanks collapsed, the Austro German armies in the south were in danger of a greater Dannenberg, if only the Russians could exploit their chance. But all the reserves were massed in the north for the intended main offensive, and this was not developed. First, Evert said that on account of bad weather he could not begin until the 18th, and, even so, did not expect to be successful. The Tsar and Alexa flacked the resolution either to coerce or to replace Evert, and instead authorized him to prepare an attack at a different place, which meant further delay. But neither Evert nor Kuropatkin showed any inclination to take the offensive, and, as Alexa could not move them, he tried instead to move their reserves. Poor lateral communications, however, prevented these reaching Bruce Loft before the Germans could hurry reinforcements to stem the tide. The German command showed its usual cleverness, using the first reinforcements for a counterstroke by Linz engine against the northern edge of the Luck breakthrough, and this at least checked the Russian progress at the most critical point. To the south, in the Bkovina, the Russian advance continued until it came to a natural halt against the barrier of the Carpathian Mountains. Late in July, the Russian attack was renewed, first in the center towards Brody and Lemberg by Sakharov, then farther north towards the Stukhad River and Kovel, by the Russian Guard Army, long prepared for a supreme effort. But the opportunity had passed, and although the attacks still dragged on throughout August, the gains in no way compensated for their heavy cost and an effort which opened in a blaze of sunshine faded out in autumn gloom. Its indirect were, however, greater than its direct effects, although not unmixed in benefit. It had compelled Falkenhayn to withdraw seven divisions from the west, and so abandon his plan for a riposte against the British Somme offensive, as well as the hope of nourishing his attrition process at Verdun. It led Romania to take her fateful decision to enter the war on the Entente side to her undoing. And it wrought the downfall of Falkenhayn, who had spoiled the ship for a hapeth of tar. But these indirect effects were purchased at a heavy price. Bruzlov had captured Abkovina and much of eastern Galicia, he had captured 350,000 prisoners, but, through prolonging the offensive when opportunity had passed, over one million men had been lost. This loss undermined morally, even more than materially, the fighting power of Russia. The imminent sequel was to be revolution and collapse. For the last time Russia had sacrificed herself for her allies, and it is not just that subsequent events should obscure debt. Six scene three the Somme offensive battle dashur, to be strategically accurate, the series of partial actions, in Picardy which opened on July 1st, constituted the offensive campaign of the Franco-British armies in 1916. Into it was thrown the entire British effort of the year on the Western Front, 
and such part of the French effort as was available after the exhausting strain of the long defensive battle of Verdun. And it proved both the glory and the graveyard of Kitchener's army dash those citizen volunteers who, instantly answering the call in 1914, had formed the first national army of Britain. The Somme offensive had its genesis at the Chantilly Conference of the Allied Commanders on December 5, 1915. Joffre, in his appreciation of the situation, claimed that the autumn offensives in Champagne and Dartois, including Luz, had brought brilliant tactical results, and ascribed the failure to develop these into a strategical success, partly to bad weather and partly to a temporary shortage of ammunition. The essential for the next effort was that the higher command must have no anxiety as regards ammunition, and for this reason it could not be undertaken in less than three months. By early February he had realized that the date must be later still, if, as was essential, the Russians were to attack simultaneously and the British were to take an adequate share with their newly raised armies. At a meeting with Haig he emphasized the view that a broad frontage of attack was the method of success, and to this end desired a combined offensive by the French and British Brasdissus Brasdissus, with the attacking line of one ally prolonging that of the other ally. Joffre envisaged the French attacking with 40 divisions on a 25-mile front from La Sine to the Somme, and the British attacking thence to Hebuan, 14 miles, with 25 divisions, or as near that number as possible. The British official history remarks that Joffre's decision to make the offensive in a sector which might be considered the strongest for defence, on the Western Front, seems to have been arrived at solely because the British would be bound to take part in it. The reasons advanced by General Joff will hardly bear examination. Even Fock, if it was not his habit to weigh tactical difficulties, disliked the choice of sector as being a strategic dead end. Haag would have preferred to make his attack in Flanders, on the lines of the offensive which he carried out in 1917, assisted by a landing on the Belgian coast. Joff also pressed the British to make a preparatory attack north of the Somme in April, and another in May to draw in the enemy's reserves, so easing the way for the Franco-British main blow. Haig preferred to trust in one great stroke, with all the forces available and when they were fully prepared. Although Haig's attitude was justified by the incompleteness of his resources and by the barrenness of such preparatory attacks the previous autumn, the critic is compelled to recognize that Joff had the experience of history on his side and that the experience of the war was to show that decisive offensives were vain until the enemy's reserves had been attracted elsewhere. But Haig was unquestionably right in maintaining that any such preparatory attacks, to fulfill their object, should only precede the general offensive by ten days or a fortnight. He suggested that the British might deliver one such attack if the French made others. This idea did not appeal to Joffre who, according to Poincare, had now in mind a war of attrition which must be chiefly carried out by our allies, England, Russia, and even Italy. So discussions continued. It is amusing to note that the British staff took refuge in the explanation dash the British army is ready to do its full share, but we cannot cope with the politicians, who, after the Germans, are our worst enemies. Eventually, at a conference on February 14, an agreement was reached by which Haig accepted Joff's plan for the Somme offensive, dated for July 1, while Joff gave up his demand for preparatory offensives. The result of the postponement of the Allied offensive, whether inevitable or not, was to yield the initiative to the Germans, and their attack at Verdun, from February 21 onwards, impaired the whole of the Allied plan on campaign in 1916. Yet such a possibility had not even been mentioned at the conference on the 14th. On February 22, Joffre asked the British to aid him by relieving part of his troops in the north. Haag accordingly hastened the relief of the French 10th Army, round Arras, which was sandwiched between his own 1st and 3rd Armies. Allenby's 3rd Army side slipped northwards, and the newly formed 4th Army, under Orlinson took over its front between Maricourt and Hebuin. The British are now held a continuous 80-mile front from Ypres almost to the Somme. As the French were drained of their strength at Verdun, so did their share of the Somme plan evaporate. 
ultimately their front of attack shrank from 25 miles to 8, and their force from 40 divisions to 16, of which only 5 attacked on July 1st. From now onwards the British were to take up the main burden of the Western Front campaign and, because of this fact alone, July 1, 1916, is a landmark in the history of the war. Nevertheless, Haig did not adjust his aims to the shrinkage of resources. It is true that he continued preparations for an attack at Messines, and formed an alternative plan, to switch his reserves thither in case of complete failure. But he does not seem to have foreseen the case of mixed success and failure, always the greater probability in war. And for this want of elasticity his plan suffered in execution. Realism was equally lacking. The hopeful intention of the British command was, in the first stage, to break the German front between Maricourt and Sir, in the second stage to secure high ground between Bapaume and Ginchy, while the French seized that round Sailly and Rancourt, in the third stage to wheel to the left and roll up the German flank as far as Arras. So enlarging the breach. With this object all available troops, including cavalry, would work northwards, from the line Bape or Miramont, while a cooperating attack was launched against the German front southwest of Arras. Fourthly, was to come a general advance towards Cambrai Y. What a contrast between intention and achievement. In outline, the plan was shrewdly designed, and Haig was wise to take such long views. But he does not seem to have looked clearly enough at the ground beneath his feet. The very belief in such far reaching possibilities suggests a failure to diagnose the actual conditions. There was a fundamental unrealism in a plan which, while discarding the old and ever new master key of surprise, made no pretense to provide a substitute. The main attack, on a 14 mile front between Maricourt and Sir, was entrusted to Rawlinson's 4th Army of 18 divisions of which eleven were to lead the attack, with five in close reserve. Only two, together with a cavalry division, were in army reserve. But Haig also placed at Rawlinson's disposal, for exploiting success, a force of two cavalry divisions under Goff, with a corps of two divisions to follow. Two divisions of the third army were to make a subsidiary attack round Gomcourt. The artillery concentration totaled 1,537 guns, 467 being heavy. This meant one gun to every 20 yards of front, a record at that time, although far eclipsed by later concentrations. It was double that of the Germans for their great Dunajek breakthrough, but the defenses on the Russian front a year before could not be compared with the network of wire and trenches on the Somme front. Another significant contrast was that whereas the French had 900 heavy guns, the British had less than half this number for a far wider front, one to every 57 yards. The British official history remarks that the problem facing the Allies was, in fact, that of storming a fortress, in which, according to history and precedent, there should be a main assault on the largest breach, or weakest spot, several subsidiary ones on minor breaches which must be strong enough to be converted into main assaults and carried through, and false attacks. Instead, the distribution of force was as uniform as the methods of attacks were stereotyped. The artillery, in any case deficient, was spread evenly along the whole frontage. It must be confessed that the problem was not appreciated at GHQ. What were the causes of this blindness? They had a pre-war base. It must be admitted that the problems of semi-siege warfare and the large concentration of guns necessary for the attack of great field defences had never been studied in practice by the general staff. Under the influence of General H. H. Wilson, the late Sir Henry Wilson, it had been content to follow French ideas as to the nature of the next war, and ignored and almost resented hearing of the information obtained by its intelligence branch as to the preparations being made and methods practiced at maneuvers by the Germans. To understand both the problem and the course of the battle, a brief description of the ground is necessary, for in few battles on the Western Front did topography have so important an influence or make so deep an impression on the minds of the combatants. From Perun, where the Somme makes a right angle turn south, 
A range of hills runs northwest, forming the watershed between the Somme and the basins of the Scarp and the Selt. This ridge, intersected by the narrow valley of the Little River Ainka, had been in German possession since the race to the Sea of October, 1914, and it gave the enemy command and observation over the Allied lines and the land behind them. For the first year this disadvantage mattered little, for when British troops relieved the French here in July, 1915, the front had ne'er and a condition of peacefulness astonishing to men accustomed to the incessant bickering of Ypres or La Bassi. Report said that in some places the troops of our ally went back for Dijayuna to villages hardly touched, close to the line, leaving only sentries in the trenches, that in another hamlet which stood in no man's land the sleeping accommodation was nightly shared between the opposing sides by tacit consent, I can vouch for the fact that in the first months after the British had taken over this front it was possible for battalions to drill undisturbed on fields in full view of the German lines. Whereas six months later billets several miles farther back were harassed by gunfire. The campaign policy of the French, except when engaged in active operations, was live and let live, and in retrospect there seems little doubt that it was wiser than the British policy of continual strafing. For when the Germans held the dominating positions as well as a superiority in ammunition and equipment these worrying tactics wore down the British troops more than the enemy attrition on the wrong side of the balance sheet. Further, they stirred the Germans to strengthen their trench defences, to develop by art the advantages of nature, so that the offensive came against an almost impregnable fortress instead of against the relatively weak defence system which existed in the autumn of 1915. Massfield, in his book The Old Front Line, expressed the situation aptly dash almost in every part of this old front our men had to go uphill to attack. The enemy had the lookout posts, with the fine views over France, and the sense of domination. Our men were down below, with no view of anything but of stronghold after stronghold, just up above, being made stronger daily. Today the tumbled desolation that was the Somme battlefield has passed. Though he underestimated the time, Massfield's instinct was correct that when the trenches are filled in and the plough has gone over them the ground will not keep the look of war. One summer with its flowers will cover most of the ruin that man can make, and then these places, from which the driving back of the enemy began, will be hard indeed to trace, even with maps. Sent away, Peel Trench, Munster Alley, and these other paths to glory will be deep under the corn and gleaners will sing at dead mule corner. Yet, while even memory finds it difficult to recapture the wartime aspect, a tranquil visit impresses the mind with the steepness of the ascent and the command from the ridge, even more than in days when progress was reckoned in yards and the contour was seen from the eye level of trenches and shell holes. From an artillery point of view there were advantages in attacking uphill, because the German trenches were more clearly displayed but in other ways it was a physical and psychological handicap, not only to the attacking infantry. Surprise, difficult in face of such commanding positions, was the more difficult because the art of concealing preparations, and of camouflage, had yet to be relearned. The construction of new hutments on both sides of the Ainka provided the Germans with the first clue, in February, and thenceforward signs continually multiplied. Falkenhayn contemplated an attempt to dislocate the British offensive, but found that he could not spare the necessary troops. If the vast preparations had not given it away, a bombardment of a week's duration would in any case have announced the coming assault. Even earlier, a censorship error in allowing publication of a speech to munition workers by the Minister of Labour, Mr Arthur Henderson, on June 2nd, had given the German commander a hint of its early delivery. The one redeeming factor was that despite accurate predictions and warnings of the attack both from the immediate army command, the second, and from agents abroad, Falkenhayn continued to believe that it was only a preliminary to the real blow farther north, apparently feeling that British preparations were too blatant to be true. In consequence he withheld reinforcements, and not until July 5 was he convinced that the Somme was Haig's chosen battleground. 
In the meantime he dismissed the chief of staff of the second army for having been right and asking for more. This divergence of views in the German command left the British a chance which was to be forfeited by a divergence of views in their own command. The extent of this difference, and its effects, has only come to light in recent years. For the offensive was only a few weeks old when the story was spread by officially inspired apologists that Haig was throughout aiming at a campaign of attrition and had not dreamt of a breakthrough. This denial was vehemently maintained for years, long after the war, it forms one of the most elaborate perversions of historical truth that has come to light. The smoke screen, composed of particles of truth and dishonesty mixed was finally dissipated by the publication of the official history in 1932. This revealed that Joffre was only contemplating an attrition battle, and that Rawlinson inclined to the same view, while Haag, the middleman, both sought and believed in a breakthrough. His judgment dictated the British aim. But Rawlinson's doubts led to the British plan being a compromise of method, which made it largely unsuitable to either aim. In view of his comparatively small resources in artillery, and the depth of the German position, Rawlinson favoured a prolonged bombardment and an advance by limited stages. The first inevitably diminished the chances of surprise, the most potent compensation for small resources, while the second was a check on exploiting any success that was gained, giving the enemy time to recover and to bring up reserves. Haig justly realized the latter defect and also inclined to a short bombardment, but, perhaps, being an untechnically minded cavalryman, he skimmed over the problem of cutting the wire entanglements that governed the approach to the enemy's position. After discussion Rawlinson was allowed his long bombardment, but was ordered to swallow part of the German second position, as well as the first, at one gulp. The official history while showing that a breakthrough could hardly have had decisive results, and even suggesting that it would merely have created a dangerous salient, implies that a breakthrough was possible. But not in the way it was attempted. For his breakthrough aim, Haig actually relied on the one means in which he was, by all advice, too limited. His artillery advisor told him that he was stretching his artillery too much. Rawlinson expressed the fear that he was asking too much of the force available, that its gun power would be spread too thinly for effect, and that an attempt to bite off part of the second position would be a gamble. Nevertheless, it was to that gamble that Haig decided to commit his subordinates and their men. Increasing optimism was shown by Haig as the day of battle drew nearer, though French resources, and consequently their share, were steadily shrinking owing to the drain of Verdun. What is perhaps more remarkable is the way his chief subordinates joined in the chorus of optimism, singing so loudly as apparently to drown the doubts they had felt during cool consideration of the problem. They not merely deferred to his judgment, they made it their own. Loyalty could go no further. Privately, Rawlinson was convinced that they, Haig's instructions, were based on false premises and on too great optimism. Yet he impressed on all at conferences and other times. That nothing could exist at the conclusion of the bombardment in the area covered by it, and the infantry would only have to walk over and take possession. This current of optimism was passed downwards with the result that even when the bombardment was proving ineffective, battalions which reported that the enemy machine guns had not been silenced were told by the divisional staffs that they were scared. Terrible words for an official history to record as being said to men who were about to pay with their lives for this disregard of their words. Because of its disastrous effects, the causes of this fantastic optimism demand analysis. With some officers in large degree, and perhaps most officers in some degree, care for their personal interests may have had an influence. Viewed fairly, that is no particular reproach to soldiers for in any profession where life careers are concerned it is human nature to follow the cue given from above. Ten, but a wider cause would seem to have been genuine self-delusion. In some cases this may have been induced by the confused idea of loyalty-blind loyalty- that the 19th century military system had fostered, even here, the Fourth Army instructions, which omitted so many tactical points of vital importance took pains to lay down with heavy emphasis that all criticism by subordinates, 
of orders received from superior authority will in the end recoil on the heads of the critics. But in other cases optimism was so buoyant as to need no inspiration from on high. Thus when Haag, anxious over the inadequate preparedness of one army corps, sent General Charteris thither with power to countermand its attack, for it had little chance of complete success, his envoy found the commander more than satisfied and saying exuberantly that he felt like Napoleon before the Battle of Austerlitz. So Charteris yielded to his desire, although he came back feeling very miserable. The official history suggests that the root of this fatal optimism among the higher command may be traced to an astounding failure to grasp the main lesson of previous experience, a lesson that most regimental soldiers had long since learned. The failures of the past were put down to reasons other than the stout use of the machine gun by the enemy and his scientifically planned defenses. Such expert reasoning is certainly one of the most remarkable recorded cases in all history of missing the wood for the trees. Rationally, it seems inexplicable that the bombardment should have been counted on to leave nobody alive in the opposing trenches. For, beyond Rawlinson's original doubts, there is the fact that he himself spread his limited artillery evenly along the front without regard to the strength and importance of any particular part, with the result that their fire was necessarily so dispersed that many strong points and machine gun posts were never touched. Moreover, a large proportion of the heavy guns available were of obsolete pattern and poor range, while much of the ammunition was defective. Thus the shells could not penetrate the dugouts in which the German machine gunners were sheltering, in waiting. Yet it is only on the assumption of a potentially overwhelming bombardment that we can understand at all the tactics adopted by the British command. One can hardly believe that anyone with a grain of common sense or any grasp of past experience would have launched troops to the attack by such a method unless intoxicated with confidence in the effect of the bombardment. The method is certainly an object lesson in supreme negation. The official history continues. Dash in the early discussions, Haig had said that corps were not to attack until their commanders were satisfied that the enemy's defenses had been sufficiently destroyed, but this condition seems to have been dropped as time passed. This carelessness to maintain an essential condition of all warfare, especially siege warfare, is another extraordinary fact. It would have been culpable in the commander of a company. Let us, in justice, record a redeeming point of precaution, or what might have been one. Haig had suggested tentatively that, before the mass of the infantry were launched, the result of the bombardment and the state of the defences might be tested by sending ahead patrols or small parties, such as the Germans had used at Verdun. But this suggestion was rejected by his army commanders. Was there anything that might have rescued success, or at least mitigated the sacrifice? Yes, if the British infantry could have reached the enemy trenches before the defenders were able to open fire. There were two ways in which this might have been achieved. By crossing either before the enemy could see to fire or before they were ready to fire. Without fog, natural or artificial, the only chance of the first lay in an assault during the darkness or in the dim light before dawn. We learn that a few commanders desired that at least the assault should be made at the first streak of light, before the enemy machine gunners could see their prey. We are told that Rawlinson himself accepted the suggestion and pressed his French neighbors to agree. But they had double his quantity of heavy guns and wanted good observation for them. So he agreed to the later hour apparently with little misgiving. The question that remained was whether the British infantry could cross no man's land before the barrage lifted. It was a race with death, the greatest of such races, run by nearly 60,000 men in the first heat. They were hopelessly handicapped. The whole mass, made up of closely packed waves of men, was to be launched together, without discovering whether the bombardment had really paralyzed the resistance. Under the 4th Army's instructions, those waves were to advance at a steady pace, symmetrically aligned like rows of nine pins ready to be knocked over. The necessity of crossing no man's land at a good pace, so as to reach the parapet before the enemy could reach it, was not mentioned. But to do so would have been physically impossible, for the heaviest handicap of all was that the infantryman was so heavily laden that he could not move faster than a walk. 
each man carried about 66 pound, over half his own body weight, which made it difficult to get out of a trench, impossible to move much quicker than a slow walk, or to rise and lie down quickly. Even an army mule, the proverbial and natural beast of burden, is only expected to carry a third of his own weight. The race was lost before it started, and the battle soon after. The barrage went on, the infantry could not go on, the barrage could not be brought back, and infantry reinforcements were pushed in just where infantry could not go on, a compound tragedy of errors. The bombardment began on June 24, the attack was intended for June 29, but was later postponed until July 1, owing to a momentary break in the weather. This postponement, made at French request, involved not only the spreading out of the ammunition over a longer period, and a consequent loss of intensity, but a greater strain on part of the assaulting troops, who, after being keyed up for the effort, had to remain another 48 hours in cramp trenches under the exhausting noise of their own gunfire and the enemy's retaliation, conditions made worse by torrential rain which flooded the trenches. July 1st dawned a day of broiling heat, and at 7 a.m., the bombardment rose to its height. Half an hour later the infantry advanced from their trenches, and thousands fell, strewing no man's land with their bodies, before the German front trench was even reached. For their opponents were the Germans of 1916, most stubborn and skillful fighters, while the shells flattened their trenches, they sheltered in dugouts or shell holes, and then as the barrage lifted dragged out their machine guns to pour an unslackening hail of lead into the unduly dense waves of the attackers, for 1916 marked the nadir of infantry attacks, the revival of formations that were akin to the 18th century in their formalism and lack of maneuvering power. Battalions attacked in four or eight waves, not more than a hundred yards apart, the men in each almost shoulder to shoulder, in a symmetrical well-dressed alignment and taught to advance steadily upright at a slow walk with their rifles held aslant in front of them, bayonets upwards, so as to catch the eye of the observant enemy. An excellent imitation of Frederick's infantry automata, with the difference that they were no longer advancing against muskets of an effective range of barely a hundred yards. It is hardly remarkable that by nightfall many battalions were barely a hundred strong. Only as the upstanding waves were broken up by the fire did advance become possible. For then human nature and primitive cunning reasserted themselves against authorized tactics, the more enterprising and still uncowed survivors formed little groups, usually under some natural leader, and worked their way by short rushes, and crawling from shell hole to shell hole, stalking the opposing machine guns and often progressing to a considerable depth with little further loss. But in many places packets of the enemy and nests of machine guns were left in their wake, to take heavy toll of the supports, in similarly dense formations. Thus, save in the south, the force of the tide slackened and later ebbed. Fricourt, on the right centre, formed a turning point both in the front and in the fortune of the day. The French, south of the Somme and north of it as far as Maricourt, gained all their objectives with slight loss. This success they owed partly to their more flexible tactics and heavier artillery concentration, partly to the lesser strength of the German defences, and to the fact that the attack here came as a tactical surprise to the Germans who had expected an attack only on the British front. Between Maricourt and Fricourt the British 13th Corps, 30th and 18th Divisions, reached its objectives, though with greater loss capturing Montauban. On its left the 15 Corps partially achieved its task of pinching out the bastion of Fricourt village in wood. The 7th Division turned one flank by capturing Marnitz, and on the other flank the 21st Division penetrated some half a mile into the German lines, holding on to a narrow tongue of captured land with both its own flanks in the air until Fricourt fell next day. But the 21st Division marked the boundary of success and all to the north was failure, with the heaviest British loss of any day's fighting in the war. One significant factor was the greater width of no man's land. In the three corps, fractions of the 34th Division pushed past La Boisle to Kintelmussen, but were forced to fall back. 
against the Villas the waves of the 8th Division beat practically in vain. A renewed attack was ordered for the afternoon dash wiser councils, however, prevailed. Northward, again, in the X Corps the assault of the 32nd Division was broken against the defences of Thpville dash only bulletproof soldiers could have taken Thpville this day. The 36th Ulster Division, however, celebrated the anniversary of the Boyne by penetrating deep into the German front past Thpville towards Grand Court. Unhappily, the Corps commander used his reserve to reinforce the division that was hopelessly held up and refused it to the Ulstermen who had made a hopeful opening. Thus their advanced parties were cut off, and at nightfall only small fractions of the German front trenches remained in British hands. The attack of the 8th Corps, 29th, 4th and 31st Divisions, on the left flank was shattered more abruptly, though here again a few isolated parties pressed through to Beaumont Hamel and Sir. A muddled argument over a question of one mine explosion led to the heavy artillery lifting ten minutes before the infantry assault, with fatal result. As for the subsidiary attack by the 7 Corps at Gomcourt, the failure of the 46th Division nullified the opening success of the 56th, while the value of the heavy sacrifice made by the Corps as a whole was nullified by the failure of the main offensive. The tally of prisoners who passed through the Corps cages that day is in some degree an index of the comparative initial success. 13 Corps, Congreve, 934, 15 Corps, Home, 517, 3 Corps, Pulteney, 32, X Corps, Moreland, 478, 8 Corps, Hunter Weston, 22. In contrast, the French had taken over 4,000 prisoners at little cost. The assault of their 20 Corps next to the British was cloaked by a river mist in crossing no man's land, and quickly overran the German first position. The French then proposed to push on, but gave up the idea on hearing that their British neighbours were held back by orders from the higher command. The French attack south of the Somme, by two divisions of the Colonial Corps in one of the 35, enjoyed a surprise effect through being delivered two hours later than elsewhere. It not only gained all its objectives, but was pushed beyond, and by nightfall was within reach of the German second position. For the French, in view of these results, July 1st may be counted a victory. But the major attack was that of the British, and here the Germans could justly claim success. For with only six divisions available, and roughly a regiment holding each British division's sector of attack, they had only yielded 1,983 prisoners and a small tract of ground to the assault of 13 British divisions. The high hopes built up beforehand had fallen to the ground, and the months of preparation and sowing had only garnered a bitter fruit. Yet although a military failure, July 1st was an epic of heroism, and, Better still, the proof of the moral quality of the new armies of Britain, who, in making their supreme sacrifice of the war, passed through the most fiery and bloody of ordeals with their courage unshaken and their fortitude established. All along the attacking line, these quondam civilians bore a percentage of losses such as no professional army of past wars had ever been deemed capable of suffering, without being broken as an effective instrument and they carried on the struggle, equally bitter, for another five months. Experience would improve their tactical action, still more their handling by the higher command, but no subsequent feats could surpass the moral standard of July 1st, a day of an intense blue summer beauty, full of roaring violence, and confusion of death, agony, and triumph, and from dawn till dark. All through that day little rushes of the men of our race went towards that no man's land from the bloody shelter of our trenches. Some hardly left our trenches, many never crossed the green space, many died in the enemy wire, many had to fall back. Others won across, and went farther and drove the enemy back from line to line till the battle of the Somme ended in the falling back of the enemy. That falling back, however, was long postponed and when it came was so timed as to discomfit the attackers far more than it advantaged them. Why did Haig persevere on the Somme after so disastrous a start, and discard the alternative he had prepared in the north? 
the official history has little doubt that the Messon's attack, carried out so successfully in 1917, would have had in 1916 a far better chance of decisive result, especially if combined with a coastal attack, than had an offensive astride the Somme. As late as June 5th. Haig had warned Rawlinson that if the Fourth Army attack met with considerable opposition he might decide to stop it and proceed with the Messins operation. The experience of July 1st certainly fulfilled his condition. Perhaps his continuance is best explained by the very marked bulldog element in his makeup. He hated to accept rebuff, to loosen his grip once he had got his teeth into the resistance. If repulsed everywhere he might have found it easier to switch his reserves north to Messins. But, having bitten into a slice of the German front, Haig wanted to go on and bite deeper. Why, then, did he not bite quicker on the one soft part? In part, because of a fog of war that was thickened by human frailty in facing facts. Behind the front the higher commanders had been rendering reports more rosy than the dim facts warranted and also apparently than their own belief. Capture of prisoners, but not the heavy casualties, were regularly reported. Ignorance in such conditions was natural, but deception less excusable. Meantime the opportunity of developing the success in the South went begging. Late on July 2nd, Haag, confronted with a difficult situation, decided to press the attack where success had been gained, instead of making a fresh frontal assault on the intact defences from Avila's northwards.